Chapter 26 Melnitsky remained a while at Korsen, and then pushed on to Beli at Tsirkov, where he established his capital. The horde was disposed in camp on the other side of the river, sending out parties through the whole province of Kiev. Pan Longin Podbipienta therefore had been grieving in vain over the dearth of Tartar heads. Skshetuski foresaw correctly that the Zaporozhans seized by Poniatowski at Kanyev gave false information. Tugai Bey not only had not departed, but had not gone even to Chigirin. What is more, new Tartar reinforcements came from every side. The petty sovereigns of Azov and Astrakhan, who had never been in Poland before, came with four thousand warriors. Twelve thousand of the Nogai horde came, and twenty thousand of the Belgorod and Budjak hordes, all sworn enemies hitherto of the Zaporozhans and the Cossacks. Now brothers and sworn allies against Christian blood. Finally the Khan Islam Jiriai himself came with twelve thousand from Parakop. The whole Ukraine suffered from these friends. Not only the nobles suffered, but the Russian people, whose villages were burned, cattle driven away, and whose wives and children were hurried into captivity. In those times of murder, burning, and bloodshed there was only one rescue for the peasant, and that was to flee to Melnitsky, where from being a victim he became a destroyer. And ravaged his own country. But at least his life was safe. Unhappy country. When rebellion broke out in it Pan Nikolai Patotsky punished and wasted it to begin with. Then the Zaporozhans and the Tartars, who came as if for its liberation, and now Yeremy Vishnievetsky hovered over it. Therefore all who were able fled to Melnitsky's camp. Even nobles fled, for other means of safety were not to be found. Thanks to this, Melnitsky increased in power. And if he remained long in belly at Tsirkov and did not move at once to the heart of the Commonwealth, it was above all to give order to these lawless and wild elements. In his iron hands they changed quickly into military strength. Skeleton regiments of trained Zaporozhans were at hand, the mob was divided among these. Colonels were appointed from Koshivoy Adamans of long standing, single parties were sent out to capture castles, and receive thereby training for battle. They were men valiant by nature, fitted beyond all others for war, used to arms, familiar with fire and the bloody front of battle, through Tartar raids. Two colonels, Hanja and Ostap, went to Nestorvar, which they captured, cutting to pieces all the Jews and nobles among its inhabitants. And beheading Prince Chetvertinsky's miller on the threshold of the castle. Ostap made the princess his captive. Others went in other directions, and success attended their arms. For a terror of the heart seized the Poles, a terror unusual to that people, who dropped the weapons from their hands and lost their strength. More than once it happened that the colonels importuned Melnitsky, why don't you move on Warsaw? Why do you stay resting here, getting information from wizards, and filling yourself with Gorelka, letting the Poles recover from their terror and assemble their men? More than once also the drunken crowd howled in the nighttime surrounding the quarters of Melnitsky, asking him to lead them against the Poles. The hetman had raised the rebellion and given it a terrible power, but now he began to see that this power was urging him forward to an unknown future. Therefore he gazed often into that future with uncertain eye, tried to solve the riddle of it, and in the face of that future was disturbed at heart. As has been said, among those colonels and adamants he alone knew what terrible power there was in the apparent weakness of the commonwealth. He had raised the rebellion, gained the victory at Jaltia Vodi, at Korsen had swept away the armies of the crown, but what further? He assembled the colonels then in council, and glancing at them with bloodshot eyes before which they all trembled, proposed the very same question, what further? What do you want? To go to Warsaw? Then Prince Vishnievetsky will be here, and kill your wives and children with the speed of lightning. He will leave only earth and water behind, and will follow to Warsaw, marching with the whole power of the nobles who will join him. Then, caught between two fires, we shall perish. If not in battle, impaled on stakes. You cannot depend on Tartar friendship. Today they are with us, tomorrow they may turn against us and rush off to the Crimea, or sell our heads to the Poles. Well, what more will you say? 
march on Vishniavetsky. He would detain our forces and those of the Tartar till armies could be enrolled in the heart of the Commonwealth and brought to his aid. Choose. The alarmed colonels were silent, and Melnitsky continued. Why are you silent? Why do you urge me no longer to go to Warsaw? If you know not what to do, then rely on me, and with God's help I will save my own head and yours, and win satisfaction for the Zaporozhian army and all the Cossacks. In fact, there remained one method, negotiation. Melnitsky knew well how much he could extort from the Commonwealth in that way. He calculated that the Diets would rather agree to liberal concessions than to taxes, levies of troops, and war, which would have to be long and difficult. Finally, he knew that in Warsaw there was a strong party, and at the head of it the king himself, news of whose death had not yet come, with the chancellor and many nobles who would be glad to hinder the growth of the colossal fortunes of the magnates of the Ukraine, and to create a power for the hands of the king out of the Cossacks. Conclude a permanent peace with them, and use those thousands of warriors for foreign wars. In these conditions Melnitsky might acquire a distinguished position for himself, receive the baton of Hetman from the king, and gain countless concessions for the Cossacks. This was why he remained long in Belia Tsirkov. He armed his men, sent general orders in every direction, collected the people, created whole armies, took possession of castles, for he knew they would negotiate only with power. But he did not move into the heart of the commonwealth. If he could conclude peace by negotiation, then either the weapon would drop from the hand of Vishniavetsky, or, if the prince would not lay it aside, then not Melnitsky, but Vishniavetsky would be the rebel carrying on war against the will of the king and the diets. He would move then on Vishniavetsky, but by command of the king and the commonwealth. And the last hour would have struck not for Vishniavetsky alone, but for all the kinglets of the Ukraine, with their fortunes and their lands. Thus meditated the self-created Zaporozhian hetman. Such was the pile that he built for the future. But on the scaffolding of this edifice the dark birds, care, doubt, fear, sat many a time, and ominous was their croaking. Will the peace party be strong enough in Warsaw? Will it begin negotiations with him? What will the Diet and the Senate say? Will they close their ears in the capital to the groans and cries of the Ukraine? Will they shut their eyes to the flames of conflagration? Will not negotiations be prevented by the influence of the magnates possessing those immeasurable estates, the preservation of which will be for their interest? And has the Commonwealth become so terror-stricken that it will forgive him? On the other hand, Melnitsky's soul was rent by the doubt. Has not the rebellion become too inflamed and too developed? Would those wild masses allow themselves to be confined within any limits? Suppose he, Melnitsky, should conclude peace, the cutthroats may continue to murder and burn in his name, or take vengeance on his head for their deluded hopes. Then that swollen river, that sea, that storm. An awful position. If the outbreak had been weaker, they would not negotiate with him, by reason of his weakness. But because the rebellion is mighty, negotiations, by the force of things, may be defeated. Then what will happen? When such thoughts besieged the weighty head of the hetman he shut himself up in his quarters, and drank whole days and nights. Then among the colonels and the mob the report went around, the hetman is drinking, and following his example, all drank. Discipline was relaxed, prisoners killed, fights sprang up, booty was stolen. The day of judgment was beginning, the reign of horror and ghastliness. Belia Tsirkov was turned into a real inferno. One day Vygovsky, a noble captured at Korsen and made secretary to the hetman, came in. He began to shake the drinker without ceremony, till seizing him by the shoulders he seated him on the low bench and brought him to his senses. What is it? What the plague, demanded Melnitsky. Rise up, hetman, and come to yourself, answered Vygovsky. An embassy has come. Melnitsky sprang to his feet, and in a moment was sober. Hi, there. He cried to the Cossack sitting at the threshold, Give me my cap and baton. Who has come? From whom? 
the priest Petroni Lasko, from Gushchi, from the Voivoda of Bratslav. From Pan Kaisel? Yes. Glory to the Father and Son, glory to the Holy Ghost and to the Holy Most Pure, said Melnitsky, making the sign of the cross. His face became clear, he regained his good humor, negotiations had begun. But that day there came news of a character directly opposed to the peaceful embassy of Pan Kaisel. It was stated that Prince Jeremy, after he had given rest to his army, wearied with its march through the woods and swamps, had entered into the rebellious country. That he was killing, burning, beheading, that a division sent under Skshetuski had dispersed a band of two thousand Cossacks with a mob and cut them to pieces. That the prince himself had taken Pogrebish, the property of the prince's Baraski, and had left only earth and water behind him. Awful things were related of the storm and taking of Pogrebish, for it was a nest of the most stubborn murderers. The prince, it was said, told the soldiers, kill them so they will feel they are dying. The soldiers therefore allowed themselves the wildest excesses of cruelty. Out of the whole town not a single soul escaped. Seven hundred prisoners were hanged, two hundred seated on stakes. Mention is made also of boring out eyes with augers and burning on slow fires. The rebellion was put down at once in the whole neighborhood. The inhabitants either fled to Melnitsky or received the Lord of Lubny on their knees with bread and salt, howling for mercy. The smaller bands were all rubbed out, and in the woods, as stated by fugitives from Samarodka, Spikina, Pleskov, Vaknovka, there was not a tree on which a Cossack was not hanging. And all this was done not far from Beliat Tsirkov and the many legioned armies of Melnitsky. So when Melnitsky heard of this he began to roar like a wounded aurochs. On one side negotiations, on the other the sword. If he marches against the prince, it will mean that he does not want the negotiations proposed through Pan Kaisel, the lord of Brusilov. His only hope was in the Tartars. Melnitsky jumped up and hurried to the quarters of Tugai Bey. Tugai Bey, my friend. Said he, after giving the usual salams, as you saved me at Jaltia Vodi in Korsan, save me now. An envoy has come here from the Voivoda of Bratslav, with a letter, in which the Voivoda promises satisfaction, and to the Zaporozhian army the restoration of its ancient freedom. On condition that I cease from war, which I must do to show my sincerity and goodwill. At the same time news has come that my enemy, Prince Vishnievetsky, has raised Pogrebish and left no man living. He is cutting down my warriors, impaling them, boring out their eyes with augers. I cannot move on him. To you I come, asking that you move on your enemy and mine with your Tartars, otherwise he will soon attack our camp here. The Mirza, sitting on a pile of carpets taken at Corson or stolen from the houses of nobles, swayed backward and forward some time, contracted his eyes as if for closer thinking. At last he said, Allah! I cannot do that. Why? asked Melnitsky. Because, as it is, I have lost for you bays and men enough at Jaltia Vodi in Corson, why should I lose more? Yeremy is a great warrior. I will march against him if you march, but not alone. I am not such a fool as to lose in one battle all that I have gained so far. Better send out my detachments for booty and captives. I have done enough for you unbelieving dogs. I will not go myself, and I will dissuade the Khan from going. I have spoken. You swore to give me aid. I did, but I swore to make war at your side, not instead of you. Go away from here. I let you take captives from my own people, gave you booty, gave you the hetmans. Yes, for if you had not I should have given you to them. I will go to the Khan. Be off, I tell you. The pointed teeth of the Mirza had already begun to gleam from under his mustache. Melnitsky knew that he had nothing to get from him, and it was dangerous to stop longer. He rose therefore and went in fact to the Khan. But he got the same answer from the Khan. The Tartars had their own minds and were looking for their own profit. Instead of venturing on a general battle against a leader who was considered invincible, they preferred to send out plundering parties and enrich themselves without bloodshed. 
Melnitsky returned in a rage to his own quarters, and from despair was going to the decanter again, when Vygovsky took it away from him. You will not drink, worthy hetman, said he. There is an envoy, and you must finish with him first. Melnitsky was furious. I will have you and the envoy impaled. I will not give you Gorelka. Are you not ashamed, when fortune has raised you so high, to fill yourself with Gorelka, like a common Cossack? Shaw. It must not be. News of the envoy's arrival has spread about the army, and the colonels want a council. It is not for you to drink now, but to forge the iron while it is hot. For now you can conclude peace and receive all you want, afterward it will be too late, and my life and yours are involved in this. You should send an envoy at once to Warsaw, and ask the king for favor. You are a wise head, said Melnitsky. Command them to ring the bell for counsel, and tell the colonels on the square that I shall come out directly. Vygovsky went out, and in a moment the bell was ringing for counsel. At the sound the Zaporozhian army began to assemble immediately. The leaders and colonels sat down, the terrible Krivonos, Melnitsky's right hand, Krachovsky, the sword of the Cossacks. The old and experienced Filin de Dialo, Colonel of Kropivnik, Fedor Loboda, of Periaslav, the cruel Fedorenko, of Kalnik. The wild Pushkarenko, of Poltava, whose command was composed of herdsmen alone, Shumiko, of Nijin, the fiery Chernoda, of Gadiak, Yakubovich, of Chigirin. Besides Nosek, Gladki, Adamovich, Gluck, Pulian, Panich. Not all the colonels were present, for some were on expeditions, and some were in the other world, sent there by Prince Yeremy. The Tartars were not invited this time to the council. The Brotherhood assembled on the square. The crowding multitudes were driven away with clubs and even with whirlbats, on which occasion cases of death were not wanting. Finally Melnitsky himself appeared, dressed in red, wearing his cap, the baton in his hand. By his side walked the priest Petroni Lasko, white as a dove. And on the other side Vygovsky, carrying papers. Melnitsky took a place among the colonels, and sat for a time in silence, then he removed his cap as a sign that the council was open. He rose and began to speak. Gentlemen, colonels, and adamans. It is known to you how we were forced to seize arms on account of the great injustices which we suffered without cause, and with the aid of the most serene Tsar of the Crimea. Demand from the Polish lords our ancient rights and privileges, taken from us without the will of His Majesty the King, which undertaking God has blessed. And having sent a terror upon our faithless tyrants, altogether unusual to them, has punished their untruth and oppression, and rewarded us with signal victories. For which we should thank him with grateful hearts. Since, then, their insolence is punished, it is proper for us to think how the shedding of Christian blood may be restrained, which the God of mercy and our orthodox faith command but not to let the sabers from our hands until our ancient rights and privileges are restored in accordance with the will of His Most Serene Majesty the King. The Voivoda of Bratslav writes me, therefore, that this may come to pass, which I too believe, for it is not we who have left obedience to His Majesty the King and the Commonwealth. But the Patotskis, the Kalinovskis, the Vishniavetskis, the Konietzbalskis, whom we have punished. Therefore a proper concession and reward is due to us from His Majesty and the Estates. I beg you therefore, gentlemen, to read the letter of the Voivoda of Bratslav, sent to me through Father Petroni Lasko, a noble of the Orthodox faith. And to determine wisely whether the spilling of Christian blood is to be restrained, and concessions and rewards made to us for our obedience and loyalty to the Commonwealth. Melnitsky did not ask whether the war was to be discontinued, but he asked for a decision to suspend the war. Immediately, therefore, murmurs of discontent were raised, which soon changed into threatening shouts, directed mainly by Chernota of Gadiak. Melnitsky was silent, but noted carefully where the protests came from, and fixed firmly in his memory those who opposed him. Vygovsky then rose with the letter of Kaisel in his hand. Zorko had brought a copy to be read to the Brotherhood. A deep silence followed. 
the Voivoda began the letter in these words. Chief of the Zaporojian Army of the Commonwealth. My old and dear friend, while there are many who understand you to be an enemy of the Commonwealth, I not only am thoroughly convinced myself of your loyalty to the Commonwealth. But I convince other senators and colleagues of mine of it. Three things are clear to me, first, that though the army of the Dnieper guards its glory and its freedom for centuries, it maintains always its faith to the king, the lords, and the commonwealth. Second, that our Russian people are so firm in their orthodox faith that every one of us prefers to lay down his life rather than to violate that faith in any regard. Third, that though there be various internal blood spillings, as now has happened, God pity us. Still we have all one country in which we were born and use our rights, and there is not indeed in the whole world another such rule and another such land as ours. With respect to rights and liberties. Therefore we are all of us in the same manner accustomed to guard the crown of our mother. And though there be various circumstances, as happens in the world. Still reason commands us to consider that it is easier in a free government to make known our injuries than having lost that mother, not to find another such, either in a Christian or a pagan world. Loboda of Periaslav interrupted the reading. He tells the truth, said he. He tells the truth, repeated other colonels. Not the truth. He lies, dog believer, screamed Chernoda. Be silent. You are a dog believer yourself. You are traitors. Death to you. Death to you. Listen, wait a while. Read. He is one of us. Listen, listen. The storm was gathering in good earnest, but Vygovsky began to read again. There was silence a second time. The Voivoda wrote, in continuation, that the Zaporojian army should have confidence in him, for they knew well that he, being of the same blood and faith, must wish it well. He wrote that in the unfortunate blood spilling at Kamaiki and Staryets, he had taken no part. Then he called on Melnitsky to put an end to the war, dismiss the Tartars or turn his arms against them, and remain faithful to the Commonwealth. Finally. The letter ended in the following words. I promise you, since I am a son of the Church of God, and as my house comes from the ancient blood of the Russian people, that I shall myself aid in everything just. You know very well that upon me in this Commonwealth, by the mercy of God, something depends, and without me war cannot be declared, nor peace concluded, and that I first do not wish civil war, etc. Now rose immediate tumult for and against, but on the whole the letter pleased the colonels, and even the brotherhood. Nevertheless, in the first moment it was impossible to understand or hear anything on account of the fury with which the letter was discussed. The brotherhood, from a distance, seemed like a great vortex, in which swarms of people were seething and boiling and roaring. The colonels shook their batons, sprang at and thrust their fists in one another's eyes. There were purple faces, inflamed eyes, and foam on the mouth. And the leader of all who called for war was Chernoda, who fell into a real frenzy. Melnitsky too, while looking at his fury, was near an outbreak, before which everything generally grew silent as before the roaring of a lion. But Krachovsky, anticipating him, sprang on a bench, waved his baton, and cried with a voice of thunder. Herding oxen is your work, not counseling, you outrageous slaves. Silence. Krachovsky wants to speak, cried Chernoda, first, who hoped that the famous colonel would speak for war. Silence. Silence shouted others. Krachovsky was respected beyond measure among the Cossacks, for the important services which he had rendered, for his great military brain, and wonderful to relate, because he was a noble. They were silent at once, therefore, and all waited with curiosity for what he would say. Melnitsky himself fixed an uneasy glance on him. But Chernoda was mistaken in supposing that the colonel would declare for war. Krachovsky, with his quick mind, understood that now or never might he obtain from the Commonwealth those starostaships and dignities of which he dreamed. He understood that at the pacification of the Cossacks they would try to detach and satisfy him before many others, with which Pan Patotsky, 
being in captivity, would not be able to interfere. On this account he spoke as follows. My calling is to give battle, not advice. But as we are in council, I feel impelled to give my present opinion, since I have earned your favor as well if not better than others. Why did we kindle war? We kindled present war for the restoration of our liberties and rights, and the voivoda of Bratslav writes that this restoration will take place. Therefore, either it will, or it will not. If it will not, then war, if it will, peace. Why spill blood in vain? Let them pacify us, and we will pacify the crowd, and the war will stop. Our father Melnitsky has arranged and thought out all this wisely, that we are on the side of His Majesty the King, who will give us a reward for that. And if the lordlings will oppose, then he will let us have our sport with them, and we will have it. I should not advise to send the Tartars off. Let them arrange themselves in camps in the wilderness, and stay till we have one thing or another. Melnitsky's face brightened when he heard these words. And now the colonels in immense majority, began to call for a suspension of war and an embassy to Warsaw, to ask the Lord of Brusilov to come in person to negotiate. Chernota still shouted and protested, but the colonel fixed threatening eyes on him and said. You, Chernota, Colonel of Gadiak, call for war and bloodshed. But when the light cavalry of Mikovsky advanced upon you at Corson, you squealed like a little pig, oh, brothers, my own brothers, save me, and you ran away in the face of your whole regiment. You lie, roared Chernota. I am not afraid of the Poles, nor of you. Krachovsky squeezed the baton in his hand and sprang toward Chernota. Others began also to belabor the Gadiak colonel with their fists. The tumult increased. On the square the Brotherhood bellowed like a herd of wild bulls. Then Melnitsky himself rose a second time. Gentlemen, colonels, friends, said he, you have decided to send envoys to Warsaw, to mention our faithful services to His Most Serene Majesty the King, and to ask for a reward. But also whoever wishes war may have it, not with the king nor the commonwealth, for we have never carried on war with either, but with our greatest enemy, who is now red with Cossack blood. Who at Staryets bathed himself in it, and still does not cease to bathe himself, and continues in his hatred of the Zaporozhian armies. To whom I sent a letter and envoys asking him to abandon that hatred, but who cruelly murdered my envoys, gave no answer to me, not paying respect to your chief through which he is guilty of contempt against the whole Zaporozhian army. And now, having come from the trans Dnieper, he has destroyed Pogrebish, punishing innocent people, for whom I have shed bitter tears. From Pogrebish, as I was informed this morning, he marched to Nymerov, and left no person alive there. And since the Tartars from fear and terror will not march against him, he will be seen soon on the way to destroy us here, innocent people against the will of our affectionate king and the whole commonwealth. For in his insolence he regards no man, and as he is now rebelling, so is he always ready to rebel against the will of his majesty the king. It grew very still in the assembly. Melnitsky drew breath and spoke on. God has rewarded us with a victory over the hetmans, but Yeremy is worse than the hetmans and all the kinglets, a son of Satan, living by pure injustice against whom I should march myself were it not that in Warsaw he would begin to cry, through his friends, that I do not want peace, and blacken our innocence before the king. That this should not happen, it is necessary that His Majesty the King and the whole Commonwealth should know that I do not want war, that I am sitting here in quiet. And that he first comes on us with war. Therefore I am not able to move, I must remain for negotiations with the Voivoda of Bratslav. That he, devil's son, should not break our power, it is necessary to make a stand against him and destroy his power as we did that of our enemies, those gentlemen. The hetmans at Jaltia Vodi and Corson. Therefore I ask some of you to go against him of your own will, and I will write to the king that that took place aside from me. And for our absolute defense against the hatred and attacks of Vishnyavetsky. Profound silence reigned in the assembly. Melnitsky continued. To whomsoever wishes to go on this undertaking I will give men enough, good men, 
and I will give cannon and artillerists. So that with God's aid he may sweep aside our enemy and gain a victory over him. But not one of the colonels stepped forward. Sixty thousand chosen men I will give, said crafty Melnitsky. Silence. And they were all fearless warriors, whose battle shouts had echoed more than once around the walls of Tsargrad. Twelve and perhaps for this very reason each one of them feared to lose the glory he possessed, by meeting the terrible Yeremy. Melnitsky eyed the colonels, who under the influence of that glance looked to the ground. The face of Vygovsky put on a look of satanic malice. I know a hero, said Melnitsky, mournfully, who would speak at this moment, and not avoid this work, but he is not among us. Bogan, exclaimed some voices. Yes. He has already swept away Yeremy's garrison at Vasilyevka, but they wounded him in the engagement, and he lies now in Sherkasi struggling with Mother Death. And since he is not here, there is no one here as I see. Where is Cossack renown? Where are the Pavlyuks, the Nalavikas, the Lobotas, and the Ostranitsas? A short, thick man, with a blue and gloomy face, and a mustache red as fire over a crooked mouth, and with green eyes, rose from the bench, pushed forward toward Melnitsky, and said, I will go. This was Maxim Krivonos. Shouts of glory to him rose in thunder, but he stood with his baton at his side, and spoke with a hoarse and halting voice. Do not think, Hetman, that I feel fear. I should have stood up at first, but I thought, there are better than I. But matters being as they are, I will go. Who are you? Turning to the colonels. You are the heads and the hands. But I have no head, only hands, and a sword. Once my mother bore me. War is my mother and my sister. Vishniavetsky slaughters, I will slaughter, he hangs, and I will hang. But you, Hetman, give me good warriors, for with a mob you can do nothing with Vishniavetsky. And so I go to take castles, kill, slaughter, hang. Death to the white hands. Another Adaman stepped forward. I will go with you, Maxim. This was Pulian. And Chernota of Gadiak, and Gladki of Mergorod, and Nosak will go with you, said Melnitsky. We will, said they, in one voice, for the example of Krivonos roused them, and courage entered them. Against Yeremy, against Yeremy, thundered shouts through the assembly. Cut. Slay. Repeated the Brotherhood, and after a time the council became a carousal. The regiments assigned to Krivonos drank deeply, for they were going to death. They knew this well themselves, but there was no fear in their hearts. Once our mother bore us, repeated they after their leader. And on this account they spared nothing on themselves, as is usual before death. Melnitsky permitted and encouraged this, the crowd followed their example. The legions began to sing songs in a hundred thousand voices. Horses let loose and prancing through the camp raised clouds of dust, and caused indescribable disorder. They were chased with cries and shouts and laughter. Great crowds loitered along the river, fired muskets, crowded and pushed to the quarters of the hetman himself, who finally ordered Yakubovich to drive them away. Then began fighting and confusion, till a drenching rain drove them all to the wagons and tents. In the evening a storm burst forth in the sky. Thunder rolled from one end of the clouds, to the other, lightning flashed through the whole country, now with white and now with ruddy blaze. In the light of these flashes Krivonos marched out of camp at the head of sixty thousand men, some from the best warriors, the rest from the mob. Chapter 27 Krivonos marched then from Belia Tsirkov through Skvira and Pogrebish to Maknovka. Wherever he passed, traces of human habitation vanished. Whoever did not join him perished under the knife. Grain was burned standing, with forests and gardens. At the same time the prince carried annihilation in his hand. After the raising of Pogrebish, and the baptism of blood which Pan Baranovsky gave to Nymarov, the prince's army destroyed a number of other considerable bands, and halted in camp at Regorod. Where during a month they scarcely got off their horses. They were weakened by toil, 
and death had decreased them notably. Rest was necessary, for the hands of these reapers in the harvest of blood had relaxed. The prince wavered, therefore, and thought whether it would not be better to go for a time to a more peaceable region to rest and recruit his forces, especially his horses. Which were more like skeletons of beasts than living creatures, since they had not eaten grain for a month, subsisting only on trampled grass. But after they had halted a week tidings were brought that reinforcements were coming. The prince went out to meet them, and really met Pan Yenish Tishkievich, the voevoda of Kiev, who came with fifteen hundred good men, and with him Pan Krzysztof Tishkievich, underjudge of Bratslav. Young Pan Aksak, quite a youth yet, but with a well-armed company of his own. And many nobles, such as the Senyats, the Palyabinskis, the Jatinskis, the Yelovitskis, the Kyrdiais, the Bogoslavskis, some with escorts, others without. The entire force formed nearly two thousand horse, besides attendants. The prince was greatly pleased, and invited thankfully to his quarters the voevoda, who could not cease wondering at the poverty and simplicity of the place. For the prince, by so much as he lived like a king in Lubny, by that much did he permit himself no comfort in the field, wishing to give an example to the soldiers. He lived therefore in one room, which the voevoda of Kiev, squeezing through the narrow door, was hardly able to enter, by reason of his enormous thickness. Till he ordered his attendant to push him from behind. In the cottage, besides the table, wooden benches, and a bed covered with horse skin, there was nothing except a little room near the door, in which an attendant slept, always ready for service. This simplicity greatly astonished the voevoda, who lived in comfort and carried carpets with him. He entered finally, and gazed with curiosity on the prince, wondering how so great a spirit could find its place in such simplicity and poverty. He had seen Yeremy from time to time at the diets in Warsaw, was in fact a distant relative of his, but did not know him intimately. Now, when he began to speak with him, he recognized at once that he had to do with an extraordinary man. And he, an old senator and soldier, who used to clap his senatorial colleagues on the shoulders, and say to Prince Dominic Zaslavsky, my dear, and was familiar with the king himself. Could not attain familiarity like this with Vishnievetsky, though the prince received him kindly, for he was thankful for the reinforcements. Worthy voevoda, said he, praise be to God that you have come with your people, for I have worked here to my last breath. I have noticed, by your soldiers, that they have worked, poor fellows, which disturbs me not a little, for I have come with the request that you hasten to save me. And is there hurry? Periculum in mora, periculum in mora. Ruffians to the number of several thousand have appeared, with Crivonos at their head, who, as I have heard, was sent against you. But having received information that you had moved on Konstantinov, he went there, and on the road has invested Maknovka, and has wrought such desolation that no tongue can describe it. I have heard of Krivonos, and waited for him here, but since I find that he has missed me, I must seek him. Really the affair will not bide delay. Is there a strong garrison in Maknovka? There are two hundred Germans in the castle, very good men, who will hold out yet for some time. But the worst is, that many nobles have assembled in the town with their families, and the place is fortified only by earthworks and palisades, and cannot resist long. In truth, the affair suffers no delay, repeated the prince. Then turning to his attendant, he said, Jelenksi, run for the colonels. The voevoda of Kiev was sitting meanwhile on a bench, and panting. He had some expectation of supper, for he was hungry, and liked good eating. Presently the tramp of armed men was heard, and the prince's officers entered, black, thin, bearded, with sunken eyes, with traces of indescribable labor on their faces. They bowed in silence to the prince and his guests, and waited for his words. Gentlemen, are the horses at their places? Yes, ready as always. It is well. In an hour we will move on Krivonos. Hi, said the voevoda of Kiev, and he looked in wonderment at Pan Krzysztof, the subjudge of Bratslav. The prince continued, Poniatowski and Verschel will march first, after them Baranowski will go with his dragoons, 
and in an hour we will move with the cannon of Wurzel. The colonels bowed and left the room, and soon the trumpets were heard sounding to horse. The voevoda of Kiev did not expect such haste, and did not indeed wish it, since he was hungry and tired. He counted on resting about a day with the prince, and then moving. Now he would have to mount his horse at once, without sleeping or eating. But, your highness, said he, are your soldiers able to reach Maknavka? I see they are terribly tired, and the road is a long one. Don't let your head ache over that. They go to a battle as to a concert. I see that, I see they are sulfurious fellows. But my men are road-weary. You have just said, periculum in mora. Yes, but we might rest for the night. We have come from near Melnik. Worthy Voivoda, we have come from Lubny and the trans -Nieper. We were a whole day on the road. We a whole month. The prince went out to arrange in person the order of march. The voevoda stared at the underjudge, struck his palms on his knees, and said. Ah! I have got what I wanted, you see. As God lives, he will kill me with hunger. Here is swimming in hot water for you. I come for aid, and think that after great solicitation they will move in two or three days. But now they won't give us time to draw breath. May the devil take them. The stirrup strap has galled my leg, my traitor of an attendant buckled it badly. My stomach is empty. The devil take them. Maknavka is Maknavka, but my stomach is my stomach. I am an old soldier, have fought in more wars probably than he has, but never in such helter-skelter fashion. Those are devils, not men. They don't eat, don't sleep, just fight. As God is dear to me, they never eat anything. They look like ghosts, don't they? Yes. But they have fiery courage, answered Pan Krishtof, who was in love with soldier life. God bless us, what disorder and tumult in other camps when it comes to marching, how much running, arranging wagons, sending for horses. But now, do you hear? The light cavalry is on the march. Is it possible? Why, this is terrible, said the voevoda. But young Pan Aksak clasped his boyish hands. Ah, that is a mighty leader, said he in ecstasy. Oh, there is milk under your nose. Snapped the voevoda. Cunctator too was a great leader. Do you understand? At this moment the prince came in. Gentlemen, to horse. We march. The voevoda did not restrain himself. Order something for us to eat. Prince, for I am hungry, cried he, in an outburst of ill humor. Oh, my worthy voevoda, said the prince, laughing and taking hold of him by the shoulder, forgive me, forgive me. With all my heart. But in war one forgets these things. Well, Pan Krishtof, haven't I told you that they don't eat? asked the voevoda turning to the underjudge of Bratslav. The supper did not last long, and a couple of hours later even the infantry had left Regorod. The army marched through Vinitsa and Lytton to Melnik. On the way Virchel met a Tartar party in Savarovka, which he and Volodyovsky destroyed, and freed a few hundred captives, almost all young women. There began the ruined country. All around were traces of the hand of Krivonos. Strajavka was burned, and its population put to death in a terrible manner. Apparently the unfortunates had resisted Krivonos. Therefore the savage chief had delivered them to sword and flame. On an oak tree at the entrance to the village hung Pan Strajavsky himself, whom Tishkievich's men recognized at once. He was entirely naked, and had around his neck an enormous necklace of heads strung on a rope, they were the heads of his wife and six children. Everything in the village itself was burned to the ground. They saw on both sides of the road a long row of Cossack candles, that is, people with hands raised above their heads, and tied to stakes driven into the ground. Wound around with straw steeped in pitch and set on fire at the hands. The greater part of them had only their hands burned, for the rain had evidently stopped the further burning. But those bodies were terrible, 
with their distorted faces and black stumps of hands stretched to heaven. The odor of putrefaction spread round about. Above the stakes whirled circles of ravens and crows, which at the approach of the troops flew away with an uproar from the nearer stakes to sit on the farther ones. A number of wolves galloped off before the regiments to the thicket. The men marched on in silence through the alley, and counted the th candles. There were between three and four hundred of them. They passed at length that unfortunate village, and breathed the fresh air of the field. But traces of destruction extended farther. It was the first half of July. The grain was almost ripe, for an early harvest was looked for. But entire fields were partly burned, partly trampled, tangled, trodden into the earth. It might have been thought that a hurricane had passed over the land. In fact, the most terrible of all hurricanes had passed, civil war. The soldiers of the prince had seen more than once rich neighborhoods ruined by Tartar raids, but such a storm, such mad destruction, they had never seen. Forests were burned as well as grain. Where fire had not devoured the trees the bark and leaves were swept from them by a tongue of fire, they were scorched by its breath, smoked, blackened, and the tree trunk stuck up like a skeleton. The voevoda of Kiev looked, and could not believe his eyes. Mediano, Zbar, villages, houses, nothing but burned ruins. On one side and another the men had run off to Krivonos. The women and children had been taken captive by that part of the horde which Virchel and Volodyovsky had crushed out. On the earth a wilderness. In the air flocks of ravens, crows, jackdaws, and vultures, which had flown hither, God knows whence, to the Cossack harvest. Fresher traces of the passage of troops were seen each moment. From time to time they came upon broken wagons, bodies of cattle and men not yet decayed, broken cups, brass kettles, bags of wet flour, ruins still smoking. Stacks of grain recently begun and left unfinished. The prince urged his regiments on to Melnik without drawing breath. The old voevoda seized himself by the head, repeating sadly. My Maknovka, my Maknovka. I see we shall not come in time. Meanwhile news was brought to Melnik that Maknovka was besieged, not by old Krivonos himself, but by his son with several thousand men. And that it was he who had committed such inhuman devastations along the road. The place was already taken, according to accounts. The Cossacks on capturing it had cut to pieces the nobles and the Jews, and taken the women of the nobles to camp, where a fate worse than death awaited them. But the castle, under the leadership of Pan Lyef, held out yet. The Cossacks stormed it from the Bernardine Monastery, in which they had put the monks to death. Pan Lyef, using all his strength and powder, gave no hope of holding out longer than one night. The prince therefore left the infantry, the guns, and the main strength of the army, which he ordered to go to Bistrika, and galloped on to the relief with the voevoda, Pan Krzysztof, Pan Aksak, and two thousand soldiers. The old voevoda was for delay, for he had lost his head. Maknovka is lost. We shall arrive too late. We would better leave it, defend other places, and provide them with garrisons. But the prince would not listen to him. The underjudge of Bratslav urged the advance, and the troops rushed to the fight. Since we have come thus far, we will not leave without blood, said the colonels, and they went on. About two miles and a half from Maknovka a few riders, moving as fast as their horses could carry them, halted in front of the troops. It was Pan Lyef and his companions. Seeing him, the voevoda of Kiev guessed at once what had happened. The castle is taken, he cried. It is, answered Pan Lyef. And that moment he fainted, for he was cut with swords, was shot through, and had lost much blood. But the others began to tell what had taken place. The Germans on the wall were cut down to the last man, for they preferred to die rather than yield. Pan Lyef had forced his way through the thick of the mob and the broken gates. In the rooms of the tower a few tens of nobles were defending themselves, to those speedy succor should be given. The cavalry swept on with all speed. 
Soon the town and castle were visible on a hill, and above them a dense cloud of smoke from the fire which had already begun. The day was coming to an end. The sky was flushed with gigantic golden and purple lights, which the troops mistook at once for a conflagration. By these flashes the Zaporozhian regiments could be seen. And dense masses of a mob rushing through the gates to meet the Polish troops, the more confidently since no one in the town knew of the approach of Yeremy. It was supposed that the Voivoda of Kiev alone was marching with succor. It was evident that Vodka had blinded them entirely, or the recent capture of the castle had inspired them with immeasurable insolence. For they descended the hill boldly, and only when they had reached the plain did they form for battle, which they did with great readiness, thundering with their drums and trumpets. In view of this a shout of joy went up from every Polish breast, and the voivoda of Kiev had an opportunity to admire a second time the discipline of Vishniewetsky's troops. Halting in view of the Cossacks, they formed at once in battle array, the heavy cavalry in the center, the light horse at the wings, so that there was no necessity of maneuvers. They could begin on the spot. Oh, Pan Krzysztof, what men, said the voivoda. They fell into order at once, they could give battle without a leader. But the prince, like a provident chief, flew, with baton in hand, between the companies, examined, and gave final orders. The evening twilight was reflected on his silver armor, and he was like a bright flame flying between the ranks, he alone glistening amid the dark armor. Three regiments formed the center of the foremost line. The first of these was led by the voivoda of Kiev himself, the second by young Pan Aksak, the third by Pan Krzysztof Tishkiewicz. After these, in the second line, were the dragoons under Baranovsky, and finally the gigantic hussars of the prince, led by Pan Yen. Vershal, Kushal, and Poniatowski occupied the wings. There were no cannon, for Wurzel had remained in Bystrica. The prince galloped to the voivoda, motioned with his baton, and said. Do you begin, because of the injustice done you? The voivoda in turn waved his hand, the soldiers bent in their saddles and moved on. It was evident at once by his style of leadership that the voivoda, though heavy and dilatory, for he was bent with age, was an experienced and valiant soldier. To spare his troops he did not start them at the highest speed, but led them slowly, quickening the march as he approached the enemy. He went himself in the front rank, with baton in hand. His attendant merely carried his long and heavy sword, but not heavy for the hand of the old voivoda. The mob on foot hurried with scythes and flails against the cavalry, in order to restrain the first impetus and lighten the attack for the Zaporozhans. When they were separated by only a few tens of yards, the people of Maknovka recognized the voivoda by his gigantic stature and corpulence, and began to cry out. Hi! Serene great mighty voivoda, the harvest is near, why don't you order out your subjects? Our respects, serene lord. We will perforate that stomach of yours. They sent a shower of bullets on the cavalry, but without harm, for the horses were going like a whirlwind and struck mightily. The clatter of flails and the sound of scythes were heard on the armor, then cries and groans. The lances opened a way in the dense mass of the mob, through which the infuriated horses rushed like a tempest, trampling, overturning, mashing. And as on the meadow when a rank of mowers advance, the rich grass disappears before them and they go on swinging the handles of their scythes, just so did the broad avalanche of the mob contract. Melt, disappear, pushed by the breasts of horses. Unable to keep their places, they began to waver. Then thundered the shout, Save yourselves! And the whole mass, throwing down scythes, flails, forks, guns, rushed back in wild dismay on the Zaporozhian regiments behind. But the Zaporozhians, fearing lest the fleeing throng should disorder their ranks, placed their lances against them. The mob, seeing this resistance, rushed with a howl of despair to both sides, but were immediately hurled back by Kushal and Poniatowski, who had just moved from the wings of the prince's division. The voivoda, now riding over the bodies of the mob, was in the front of the Zaporozhians and rushed toward them. They too rushed at him, wishing to answer momentum with momentum. 
They struck each other like two waves going in opposite directions, which when they meet form a foaming ridge. So horses rose before horses, the riders like a wave, the swords above the wave like foam. The voevoda discovered that he was not working with a mob now, but with stern and trained Zaporojian warriors. The two lines pressed each other mutually, bent, neither being able to break the other. Bodies fell thickly, for their man met man, and steel struck steel. The voevoda himself, putting his baton under his belt, and taking the sword from his attendant, worked in the sweat of his brow, puffing like a blacksmith's bellows. And with him the two Senyats, the Kyrdiais, the Bogoslavskis, the Yelovitskis, and the Polyabinskis wriggled as if in boiling water. But on the Cossack side the fiercest of all was Ivan Berdabut, the lieutenant colonel of the Kalnik regiment, a Cossack of gigantic strength and stature. He was the more terrible because he had a horse which fought as well as its master. More than one man reigned in his steed and drew back so as not to meet that centaur spreading death and desolation. The brother Senyat sprang at him, but the horse caught in its teeth the face of Andre the younger and mashed it in the twinkle of an eye. Seeing this, the elder brother, Raffle, struck the beast above the eyes, he wounded, but did not kill it, for the saber hit the great bronze button on the forehead of the horse. At that moment Berdabut plunged a weapon under the beard of Senyat, and deprived him of life. So fell the two brothers, and lay in their gilded armor in the dust, under the hoofs of horses. But Berdabut rushed on like a flame to more distant ranks, and struck in a flash the attendant of Prince Polyabinsky, a sixteen-year-old stripling, whose right shoulder he cut off together with the arm. Seeing this, Pan Urbansky, wishing to avenge the death of a relative, fired at Berdabut in the very face, but missed, only shot away his ear and dashed him with blood. Terrible then was Berdabut with his horse, both black as night, both covered with blood, both with wild eyes and distended nostrils, raging like a tempest. And Pan Urbanski did not escape death. For like an executioner, Berdabut cut off his head with a blow, and the head of old Jatinsky in his eightieth year, and the heads of the two Nikchemnys, each with one stroke. Others began to draw back with terror, especially as behind the Cossack gleamed a hundred Zaporojian sabers, and a hundred lances, already moistened in blood. The furious chief saw at last the voevoda, and giving an awful shout of joy, hurried toward him, hurling down horses and riders in his path. But the voevoda did not retreat. Trusting in his uncommon strength, puffing like a wounded wild boar, he raised the sword above his head and urging on his horse rushed to Berdabut. His end would have come without doubt, and fate had already caught in her shears the thread of his life, which she afterward cut in okra, had not Solnitsky, his sword-bearer, hurled himself like lightning on the Cossack and seized him by the waist before his sword was satisfied. While Berdabut was putting him aside, the Coyotes shouted, summoning assistance for the voevoda, several tens of people sprang forth at once, and separated him from Berdabut. Then a stubborn fight set in. But the wearied regiments of the voevoda began to yield to greater Zaporojian strength, draw back, and break ranks, when Pan Krzysztof, underjudge of Bratslav. And Pan Aksak hurried up with fresh regiments. True, new Cossack regiments rushed in at that moment to the fight. But still below stood the prince, with the dragoons of Baranovsky and the hussars of Skshetuski, who had taken no part as yet in the action. Then the bloody conflict raged anew. Darkness had already fallen, but flames had caught the outer houses of the town. The fire lighted the field of struggle, and both lines, Polish and Cossack, were seen distinctly pounding each other at the foot of the hill. The colors of the standards could be seen, and even the faces of the men. Verschel, Poniatowski, and Kuschel had already been in fire and action. For having finished with the mob, they struck the Cossack wings, which under their pressure began to move toward the hill. The long line of combatants bent its ends toward the town, and began to extend out more and more. For when the Polish wings advanced, the center, pressed by superior Cossack power, retreated toward the prince. Three new Cossack regiments went to break it. But at that moment the prince pushed on Baranovsky's dragoons, and these raised the strength of the combatants. 
the hussars alone remained with the prince. From a distance they seemed like a dark grove growing straight from the ground, a terrible avalanche of iron men, horses, and lances. The breeze of evening stirred the banners above their heads, and they stood quietly, not fretting for battle before the issue of command. Patient, for trained and experienced in many a fight they knew that their portion of blood would not miss them. The prince, in his silver armor, with gilded baton in hand, strained his eyes toward the battle. And on the left wing Skshetuski, standing a little sideways at the end, being lieutenant, his sleeve was rolled up on his shoulder, with arm bare to the elbow. And holding in his powerful hand a broadsword instead of a baton, waited calmly for the order. The prince shaded with his left hand his eyes from the glare of the burning. The center of the Polish half-circle retreated gradually toward him, overborne by superior power which was not long kept back by Pan Baranovsky, the same who had raised Nymirov. The prince saw, as if on his hand, the heavy work of the soldiers. The long lightning of sabers raised itself above the black line of heads, then vanished in the blows. Riderless horses dropped out of that avalanche of combatants, and neighing ran along the plain with floating mane, the flames of the burning for a background, they were like beasts of hell. The red banner floating for a time over the throng fell suddenly to rise no more. But the eye of the prince ran along the line of combat as far as the hill toward the town, where at the head of two picked regiments stood young Krivonos. Waiting the moment to hurl himself on the center and break the weakened ranks of the Poles. At length he started, running with a terrible shout straight on the dragoons of Baranovsky, but the prince was waiting for that moment too. Lead on, cried he to Skshetuski. Skshetuski raised his broadsword, and the iron host shot past. They did not run long, for the line of battle had approached them considerably. Baranovsky's dragoons opened to the right and left with lightning speed to clear a way for the hussars against the Cossacks. The hussars swept through this pass with their whole momentum against the victorious companies of Krivonos. Yeremy! Yeremy! shouted the hussars. Yeremy! repeated the whole army. The terrible name contracted the hearts of the Zaporozhans with a shudder of fear. In that moment they learned for the first time that it was not the voevoda of Kiev who was leading, but the prince himself. Besides, they were unable to resist the hussars, who crushed them with their weight as falling walls crush people standing beneath. The only safety for them was to open toward both sides, let the hussars through, and then strike them on the flanks. But those flanks were already guarded by the dragoons and light horse of Virchel, Kushel, and Poniatowski, who, having dislodged the Cossack wings, pushed them to the center. Now the form of battle changed, for the light regiments became as it were the two sides of a street, along the center of which flew the hussars with wild impetus, driving, breaking, pushing, overturning men and horses. And before them fled bellowing and howling the Cossacks to the hill and the town. If the wing of Virchel had been able to join the wing of Poniatowski, the Cossacks would have been surrounded and cut to pieces. But neither Virchel nor Poniatowski could make the junction by reason of the exceeding rush of fugitives, whom they struck, however, at the flanks till their arms grew weak from cutting. Young Krivonos, though valiant and furious, when he understood that his own inexperience had to meet such a leader as the prince, lost presence of mind and fled at the head of others to the town. Pan Kushal, who was nearsighted, standing at the flank, saw the fugitive, urged on his horse, and gave the young leader a saber-stroke in the face. He did not kill him, for his helmet turned the sword edge, but he sprinkled him with blood and deprived him still more of courage. He came near paying for the deed with his life, for that moment Berdabut turned on him with the remnant of the Kalnik regiment. Twice had Berdabut tried to make head against the hussars, but, twice pushed back and beaten by a power as if supernatural, he was obliged to give way with the rest. At last, having collected his men, he determined to strike Kushal on the flank and burst through his dragoons to the open field. But before he could break them the road to the town and the hill was so packed with people that a quick retreat became impossible. The hussars, in view of this press of men, restrained their onset, and having broken their lances, began to hew with swords. Then there was a struggle, 
confused, disorderly, furious, merciless, seething in the press, uproar, and heat, amid the steam from men and horses. Body fell upon body, horses' hoofs sank in the quivering flesh. At points the masses were so dense that there was no room for saber strokes, so they fought with the hilts, with knives, with fists. Horses began to whine. Here and their voices were heard, mercy, poles. These voices grew louder, increased, outsounded the clash of swords, the bite of iron on the bones of men, the groans and the terrible death rattle of the perishing. Mercy, mercy! was heard with increasing plaintiveness, but mercy shone not above that avalanche of stragglers as the sun above a storm, only the flames of the town shone above them. But Berdabut at the head of the men of Kalnik asked for no mercy. He lacked room for battle. He opened a way with his dagger. He met the big pan Jik, and punching him in the stomach rolled him from his horse. Jik, crying, O oh Jesus, raised himself no more from under the hoofs which tore out his entrails. There was room enough at once. Berdabut laid open with his saber the head and helmet of Sokolsky. Then he brought down, together with their horses, Pans Priyam and Chertovich, and there was still more room. Young Zenobia Skalski slashed at his head, but the saber turned in his hand and struck with its side. Berdabut gave Skalski a backhand blow with his left fist in the face, and killed him on the spot. The men of Kalnik followed him, cutting and stabbing with their daggers. A wizard! A wizard! The hussars began to cry out. Iron cannot harm him. He is frantic. He had foam on his mustaches, and rage in his eyes. At last Berdabut saw Skshatuski, and recognizing an officer by the upturned sleeve, rushed upon him. All held their breaths, and the battle stopped, looking at the struggle of the two terrible knights. Pan Yen was not frightened at the cry of, Wizard. But anger boiled in his breast at the sight of so much destruction. He ground his teeth and pushed on the enemy with fury. The horses of both were thrown on their haunches. The whistle of steel was heard, and suddenly the saber of the Cossack flew into pieces under the blow of the Polish sword. It seemed as if no power could save Berdabut, when he sprang and grappled with Skshatuski, so that both appeared to form one body, and a knife gleamed above the throat of the hussar. Death stood before the eyes of Pan Yen at that moment, for he could not use his sword. But quick as lightning he dropped the sword, which hung by a strap, and seized the hand of the enemy in his own. For a while the two hands trembled convulsively in the air. But iron must have been the grip of Pan Yen, for the Cossack howled like a wolf, and before the eyes of all the knife fell from his stiffened fingers as grain is squeezed out of its husk. Skshatuski let drop the crushed hand, and grasping the Cossack by the shoulder bent his terrible forehead to the pummel of the saddle, then drawing with his left hand the baton from his own belt. He struck once, twice. Berdabut coughed, and fell from his horse. At the sight of this the men of Kalnik groaned and hastened to take vengeance. Now the hussars sprang forward and cut them to pieces. At the other end of the hussar avalanche the battle did not cease for a moment, for the throng was less dense. Pan Longin, girt with Anusia's scarf, raged with his broadsword. The morning after the battle the knights looked with wonder on those places, pointing out shoulders cut off with armor, heads split from the forehead to the beard, bodies cut into halves. An entire road of men and horses. They whispered to one another, See, Podbipienta fought here. The prince himself examined the bodies. And though that morning he was very much afflicted by various reports, he wondered, for he had never seen such blows in his life. But meanwhile the battle seemed to approach its end. The heavy cavalry pushed on again, driving before it the Zaporojan regiments which were seeking refuge in the direction of the hill and the town. The regiments of Kushal and Ponyatovsky Bard returned to the fugitives. Surrounded on all sides, they defended themselves to the very last. But with their death they saved others, for two hours later when Volodyovsky entered the place in advance with his Tartars of the guard, he did not find a single Cossack. The enemy, taking advantage of the darkness, 
for rain had put out the fire, had seized the empty wagons of the town in a hurry, and forming a train with that quickness peculiar to Cossacks alone. Left the town, passed the river, and destroyed the bridges behind them. The few tens of nobles who had defended themselves in the castle were liberated. Then the prince commanded Virchel to punish the townspeople who had joined the Cossacks, and set out in pursuit of the enemy himself. But he could not capture the Tabor without cannon and infantry. The enemy having gained time by burning the bridges, for it was necessary to go far along the river around a dam to cross. Disappeared so quickly that the wearied horses of the prince's cavalry were barely able to come up with them. Still the Cossacks, though famous for fighting in Tabers, did not defend themselves so bravely as usual. The terrible certainty that the prince himself was pursuing them, so deprived them of courage that they despaired of escape altogether. Their end would surely have come, for after a whole night's firing Baranovsky had seized forty wagons and two cannon, had it not been for the voevoda of Kiev, who opposed further pursuit and withdrew his men. Between him and the prince sharp words arose, which were heard by many of the colonels. Why do you, asked the prince, wish to let the enemy escape, when you showed such bravery against them in battle? The glory which you won yesterday, you have lost today by negligence. I do not know, said the voevoda, what spirit lives in you, but I am a man of flesh and blood. After labor I need rest, so do my men. I shall always attack the enemy as I have today, when they present a front, but I will not pursue them when defeated and fleeing. Cut them to pieces, shouted the prince. What will come of that work? asked the voevoda. If we destroy these people, the elder Krivonos will come, burn, destroy, kill, as his son has in Strajavka, and innocent people will suffer for our rage. Oh, I see, said the prince, with anger, you belong with the chancellor and with those commanders of theirs, to the peace faction, which would put down rebellion through negotiations. But, by the living God, nothing will come of that as long as I have a saber in my fist. To this Tishkievich answered, I belong not to a faction, but to God, for I am an old man, and shall soon have to stand before him. And be not surprised if I do not wish to have too great a burden of blood, shed in civil war, weighing me down. If you are angry because the command passed you by, then I say that for bravery the command belonged to you rightly. Still perhaps it is better that they did not give it to you, for you would have drowned not the rebellion alone in blood, but with it this unhappy country. The Jupiter brows of Jeremy contracted, his neck swelled, and his eyes began to throw out such lightning that all present were alarmed for the voevoda. But at that moment Pan Yen approached quickly, and said. Your Highness, there is news of the elder Krivonos. Immediately the thoughts of the prince were turned in another direction, and his anger against the voevoda decreased. In the meanwhile four men were brought in who had come with tidings. Two of them were orthodox priests, who on seeing the prince threw themselves on their knees before him. Save us! Save us! cried they, stretching their hands to him. Whence do you come? We are from Polano. The elder Krivonos has invested the castle and the town, if your saber is not raised above his neck, we shall all perish. The prince answered, I know that a mass of people have taken refuge there in Polano, but mostly Russians, as I am informed. Your merit before God is that instead of joining the rebellion you oppose it and remain with your mother the commonwealth, still I fear some treason on your part, such as I found in Nymirov. Thereupon the envoys began to swear by all the saints in heaven that they were waiting for him as a savior, as prince, and that there was not a thought of treason in them. They spoke the truth. For Krivonos, having surrounded them with fifty thousand men, vowed their destruction for this special reason, that, being Russians, they would not join the rebellion. The prince promised them aid. But since his main forces were in Bistrika, he was obliged to wait. The envoys went away with consolation in their hearts. The prince turned to the voevoda, and said. Pardon me. I see now that we must let the young Krivonos go, so as to catch the old one. I judge therefore that you will not leave me in this undertaking. 
Of course not, answered the voivoda. Then the trumpets sounded the retreat to the regiments who had followed the Cossacks. It was necessary to rest and eat, and let the horses draw breath. In the evening a whole division arrived from Bystrika, and with it Pan Stakhovich, an envoy from the voivoda of Bratslav. Pan Kaisel wrote the prince a letter full of homage, saying that like a second Marius he was saving the country from the last abyss. He wrote also of the joy which the arrival of the prince from the trans roused in all hearts, and wished him success. But at the end of the letter appeared the reason for which it was written. Kaisel stated that negotiations had been begun, that he with other commissioners was going to belly at Tsirkov, and had hopes of restraining and satisfying Melnitsky. Finally he begged the prince not to press so hard on the Cossacks before negotiations, and to desist from military action as far as possible. If the prince had been told that all his trans possessions were destroyed, and all the towns leveled to the earth, he would not have been pained so acutely as he was over that letter. Skshetuski, Baranovsky, Zatsvilikovsky, the two Tishkievichi, and the Kyrdiais were present. The prince covered his eyes with his hands, and pushed back his head as if an arrow had struck him in the heart. Disgrace! Disgrace! God grant me to die rather than behold such things. Deep silence reigned among those present, and the prince continued. I do not wish to live in this commonwealth, for today I must be ashamed of it. The Cossack and the peasant mob have poured blood on the country, and joined pagandom against their own mother. The hetmans are beaten, the armies swept away. The fame of the nation is trampled upon, its majesty insulted, churches are burned, priests and nobles cut down, women dishonored. And what answer does the commonwealth give to all these defeats and this shame, at the very remembrance of which our ancestors would have died? Here it is. She begins negotiations with the traitor, the disgracer, the ally of the pagan, and offers him satisfaction. Oh, God grant me death! I repeat it, since there is no life in the world for us who feel the dishonor of our country and bring our heads as a sacrifice for it. The voivoda of Kiev was silent, and the underjudge of Bratslav answered after a while. Pan Kaisel does not compose the Commonwealth. Do not speak to me of Pan Kaisel, said the prince. For I know well that he has a whole party behind him. He has struck the mind of the primate, the chancellor, and Prince Dominic, and many lords who today in the interregnum bear rule in the commonwealth and represent its majesty. But rather disgrace it by weakness unworthy of a great people. For this conflagration is to be quenched by blood, and not by negotiations. Since it is better for a knightly nation to perish than to become low-lived and rouse the contempt of the whole world for themselves. The prince again covered his eyes with his hands. The sight of that pain and sorrow was so sad that the colonels knew not what to do by reason of the tears that came into their eyes. Your Highness, Zatsvilikovsky made bold to say, let them use their tongues, we will continue to use our swords. True, answered the prince. And my heart is rent with the thought of what we shall do farther on. When we heard of the defeat of our country we came through burning forests and impassable swamps, neither sleeping nor eating. Using the last power we had to save our mother from destruction and disgrace. Our hands drop down from toil, hunger is gnawing our entrails, wounds are torturing us, but we regard no toil if we can only stop the enemy. They say that I am angry because command has not come to me. Let the whole world judge if those are more fitted for it who got it. But I, gentlemen, Take God and you to witness that I as well as you do not bring my blood in sacrifice for rewards and dignities, but out of pure love for the country. But when we are giving the last breath in our bodies, what do they tell us? Well, that the gentlemen in Warsaw, and Pan Kaisel in Gushchi are thinking of satisfaction for our enemy. Infamy, infamy! Kaisel is a traitor, cried Baranovsky. Thereupon Pan Stakhovich, a man of dignity and courage, rose, and turning to Baranovsky, said. Being a friend of the voivoda of Bratslav, and an envoy from him. I permit no man to call him a traitor. His beard too has grown grey from trouble, and he serves his country according to his understanding, 
it may be mistakenly, but honorably. The prince did not hear this answer, for he was plunged in meditation and in pain. Baranovsky did not dare to pick a quarrel in his presence. He only fastened his eyes steadily on Pan Stakhovich, as if wishing to say, I shall find you, and put his hand on his sword hilt. Meanwhile Yeremy recovered from his reverie. And said gloomily, There is no other choice but to fail in upholding obedience, for during the interregnum they are the government, or the honor of our country for which we are laboring to devote. From disobedience flows all the evil in the commonwealth. Said the voivoda of Kiev, with seriousness. Are we therefore to permit the disgrace of our country? And if tomorrow we are commanded to go with ropes around our necks to Tugai Bay and Melnitsky, are we to do that for obedience's sake? Vito, called Pan Krzysztof. Vito, repeated Kyrdii. The prince turned to the colonels. Speak, veterans, said he. Pan Zatsvilikovsky began, Your Highness, I am seventy years old. I am an Orthodox Russian, I was a Cossack commissioner, and Melnitsky himself called me father, and ought rather to speak for negotiations. But if I have to speak for disgrace or war, then till I go to the grave I shall say war. War, said Skshetuski. War, war, repeated several voices, in fact those of all present. War, war. Let it be according to your words, said the prince, seriously, and he struck the open letter of Kaisel with his baton. Chapter 28 A day later, when the army halted in Riltsov, the prince summoned Pan Yen and said, Our forces are weak and worn out, but Krivonos has sixty thousand, and his army is increasing every day. For the mob is coming to him. Besides, I cannot depend on the voivoda of Kiev, for he belongs at heart to the peace party. He marches with me, it is true, but unwillingly. We must have reinforcements from some source. I learned a little while ago that not far from Konstantinov there are two colonels, Asinsky with the Royal Guard, and Karitsky. Take one hundred Cossacks of my guard, for safety, and go to these colonels with a letter from me, asking them to come here without delay, for in a couple of days I shall fall upon Krivonos. No one has acquitted himself of important missions better than you, therefore I send you, and this is an important mission. Skshetuski bowed, and set out that evening for Konstantinov, going at night so as to pass unnoticed, for here and there the scouts of Krivonos or squads of peasants were circling about. These formed robber bands in the forests and on the roads, but the prince gave orders to avoid battles, so that there should be no delay. Marching quietly therefore, he reached Visavadi at daylight, where he found both colonels, and was greatly rejoiced at the sight of them. Asinsky had a picked regiment of dragoons of the guard, trained in foreign fashion, and Germans. Karitsky had a regiment of German infantry, composed almost entirely of veterans of the Thirty Years' War. These were soldiers so terrible and skillful that in the hands of the colonel they acted like one swordsman. Both regiments were well armed and equipped. When they heard of joining the prince, they raised shouts of joy at once, as they were yearning for battles, and knew too that under no other leader could they have so many. Unfortunately both colonels gave a negative answer, for both belonged to the command of Prince Dominic Zaslavsky, and had strict orders not to join Vishnievetsky. In vain did Skshetuski tell them of the glory they might win under such a leader, and what great service they could render the country. They would not listen, declaring that obedience was the first law and obligation for military men. They said they could join the prince only in case the safety of their regiments demanded it. Pan Yen went away deeply grieved, for he knew how painful this fresh disappointment would be to the prince, and how greatly his forces were wearied and worn by campaigning. By continual struggling with the enemy, scattering isolated detachments, and finally by continual wakefulness, hunger, and bad weather. To measure himself in these conditions with an enemy tenfold superior in number would be impossible. Skshetuski saw clearly, therefore, that there must be delay in acting against Krivonos. For it was necessary to give a longer rest to the army and to wait for a new accession of nobles to the camp. Occupied with these thoughts, 
Skshatuski went back to the prince at the head of his Cossacks. He was obliged to go cautiously in at night, so as to escape the scouts of Krivonos and the numerous independent bands. Made up of Cossacks and peasants, sometimes very strong, which raged in that neighborhood, burning dwellings, cutting down nobles, and hunting fugitives along the high roads. He passed Baklai and entered the forests of Mshina, dense, full of treacherous ravines and valleys. Happily he was favored on the road by good weather after the recent rains. It was a glorious night in July, moonless, but crowded with stars. The Cossacks went along in a narrow trail, guided by the foresters of Mshina, very trusty men, knowing the forests perfectly. Deep silence reigned among the trees, broken only by the cracking of dry twigs under the horses' hoofs, when suddenly there came to the ears of Pan Yen and the Cossacks a kind of distant murmur. Like singing interrupted by cries. Listen, said the lieutenant, in a low voice, and he stopped the line of Cossacks. What is that? The old forester bent forward to him. Those are crazy people who go through the woods now and scream. Their heads are turned from cruelty. Yesterday we met a noblewoman who was going around looking at the pines and crying, Children! Children! It is evident that the peasants had killed her children. She stared at us and whined so that our legs trembled under us. They say that in all the forests there are many such. Though Pan Yen was a fearless man, a shudder passed over him from head to foot. Maybe it is the howling of wolves. It is difficult to distinguish. What wolves? There are no wolves in the woods now, they have all gone to the villages, where there are plenty of dead men. Awful times! Answered the knight, when wolves live in the villages, and people go howling through the woods. Oh, God, God! After a while silence came again. There was nothing to be heard but the sounds usual among the tops of the pine trees. Soon, however, those distant sounds rose and became more distinct. Oh! said one of the foresters, suddenly, it seems as though some large body of men were over there. You stay here, move on slowly. I will go with my companions to see who they are. Go! said Skshatuski. We will wait here. The foresters disappeared. They did not return for about an hour. Skshatuski was beginning to be impatient, and indeed to think of treason, when suddenly someone sprang out of the darkness. They are there, said he, approaching the lieutenant. Who? A peasant band. Many of them? About two hundred. It is not clear what is best to do, for they are in a pass through which our road lies. They have a fire, though the light is not to be seen, for it is below. They have no guards, and can be approached within arrowshot. All right, said Skshatuski. And turning to the Cossacks, he began to give orders to the two principal ones. The party moved on briskly, but so quietly that only the cracking of twigs could betray their march. Stirrup did not touch stirrup, there was no clattering of sabres. The horses, accustomed to surprises and attacks, went with a wolf's gait, without snorting or neighing. Arriving at the place where the road made a sudden turn, the Cossacks saw at once, from a distance, fires, and the indefinite outlines of people. Here Skshatuski divided his men into three parties, one remained on the spot, the second went by the edge along the ravine, so as to close the opposite exit. The third dismounted, and crawling along on hands and feet, placed themselves on the very edge of the precipice above the heads of the peasants. Skshatuski, who was in the second party, looking down, saw as if on the palm of his hand a whole camp, two or three hundred yards distant. There were ten fires, but burning not very brightly. Over these hung kettles with food. The odor of smoke and of boiling meat came distinctly to the nostrils of Skshatuski and the Cossacks. Around the kettles peasants were standing relying, drinking and talking. Some had bottles of vodka in their hands. Others were leaning on pikes, on the ends of which were impaled as trophies the heads of men, women, and children. The gleam of the fire was reflected in their lifeless eyes and grinning teeth. 
the same gleam lighted up the faces of the peasants, wild and cruel. There, under the wall of the ravine, a number of them slept, snoring audibly, some talked. Some stirred the fire, which then shot up clusters of golden sparks. At the largest fire sat, with his back to the ravine and to Skshetuski, a broad-shouldered old minstrel, who was thrumming on his lyre, in front of him was a half-circle of peasants. To the ears of Skshetuski came the following words. A.I. Grandfather, sing about the Cossack Halota. No, cried the others, sing of Maruzha Bogoslavka. To the devil with Maruzha. About the Lord of Potok. About the Lord of Potok, shouted the greatest number of voices. The grandfather struck his lyre with more force, coughed, and began to sing. Halt! Look around. Stand in amaze, thou who art master of many. Since thou wilt be equal to him who is owner of nothing on earth. For he who moves all things is manager now, the mighty, the merciful God. And he puts on his scales all our woes, and he weighs them to know. Halt! Look around. Stand in amaze, thou who dost soar. With thy mind seeing wisdom down deep and afar. The minstrel was silent, and sighed, and after him the peasant sighed. Every moment more of them collected around him. But Skshetuski, though he knew that all his men must be ready now, did not give the signal for attack. The calm night, the blazing fires, the wild figures, and the song about Nikolai Patotsky, still unfinished, roused in the night certain wonderful thoughts. Certain feelings and yearnings of which he could not himself give account. The uncured wounds of his heart opened, deep sorrow for the near past, for lost happiness, for those hours of quiet and peace, pressed his heart. He fell to thinking, and was sad. Then the grandfather sang on. Halt! Look around. Stand in amaze, thou who makest war. With arrows, bows, powder, and ball, with the sharp cutting sword. For knights, too, and horsemen, before thee were many. Who fought with such weapons and fell by the sword? Halt! Look around. Stand in amaze, forget thou thy pride. Thou who from Potok to Slavuta fairest, turn then this way. Innocent men thou taxed by the ears and strips them of will. Thou heedest no king, thou knowest no diet, art thy own single law. Hey! Be amazed, grow not enraged. Thou in thy power. With thy baton alone, as thou lustest, thou turnest the whole Polish land. The grandfather stopped again, and at that time a pebble slipped from under the arm of one of the Cossacks, which had been resting on it, and began to roll down, rattling as it fell. A number of peasants shaded their eyes with their hands, and looked up quickly into the tree, then Skshetuski saw that the time had come, and fired his pistol into the middle of the crowd. Kill! Slash! cried he. Thirty Cossacks fired as it were straight into the faces of the crowd, and after the firing slipped like lightning down the steep walls of the ravine, among the terrified and confused peasants. Kill! Slay! was thundered at one end of the ravine. Kill! Slay! was repeated by furious voices at the other end. Yeremy! Yeremy! The attack was so unexpected, the terror so great, that the peasants, though armed, offered no resistance. It had been related in the camp of the rebellious mob that Yeremy, by the aid of the evil spirit, was able to be present and to fight at the same time in a number of places. This time, his name falling upon men who expected nothing and felt safe, really like the name of an evil spirit, snatched the weapons from their hands. Besides, the pikes and scythes could not be used in the narrow place. So that, driven like a flock of sheep to the opposite wall of the ravine, hewn down with sabres through the foreheads and faces, beaten, cut up, trampled underfoot. In the madness of fear they stretched out their hands, and seizing the merciless steel, perished. The still forest was filled with the ominous uproar of the fight. Some tried to escape over the steep wall of the ravine, and wounding their hands with climbing, fell back on the saber's edge. 
Some died calmly, others cried for mercy, some covered their faces with their hands, not wishing to see the moment of death, others threw themselves on the ground, face downward. But above the whistling of sabres, the groans of the dying, rose the shout of the assailants, Yeremy! Yeremy! A shout which made the hair stand erect on the heads of the peasants, and death seem more terrible. The minstrel gave a blow on the forehead to one of the Cossacks, and knocked him down. Seized another by the hand, to stop the blow of the sabre, and bellowed from fear like a buffalo. Others, seeing him, ran up to cut him to pieces, but Skshetuski interfered. Take him alive! shouted he. Stop! roared the minstrel. I am a noble. Locker Latine. I am no minstrel. Stop, I tell you. Robbers, bullock drivers, sons of. But the minstrel had not yet finished his litany when Pan Yen looked into his face, and cried, till the walls of the ravine gave back the echo, Zagloba. And suddenly rushing upon him like a wild beast, he drove his fingers into the shoulders and thrust his face up to the face of the man, and shaking him as he would a pear tree. Roared, Where is the princess? Where is the princess? Alive, well, safe, roared back the minstrel, unhand me. The devil take you, you are shaking the soul out of me. Then that night, whom neither captivity nor wounds nor grief nor the terrible birdabut could bring down, was brought down by happiness. His hands dropped at his side, great drops of sweat came out on his forehead. He fell on his knees, covered his face with his hands, and leaning his head against the wall of the ravine, remained in silence, evidently thanking God. Meanwhile the unfortunate peasants had been slaughtered, and were lying dead on the ground, except a few who were bound for the executioner in the camp so as to torture a confession from them. The struggle was over, the uproar at an end. The Cossacks gathered around their leader, and seeing him kneeling under the rock, looked at him with concern, not knowing but he was wounded. He rose, however, with a face as bright as though the light of morning were shining in his soul. Where is she? asked he of Zagloba. In bar. Safe? The castle is a strong one. No attack is feared. She is under the care of Pani Slavashevska and with the nuns. Praise be to God in the highest, said the knight, and in his voice there trembled deep emotion. Give me your hand, I thank you from my very soul. Suddenly he turned to the Cossacks. Are there many prisoners? Seventeen. A great joy has met me, and mercy is in me, said Pan Yen. Let them be free. The Cossacks could not believe their ears. There was no such custom as that in the armies of Vishnyavetsky. The lieutenant frowned slightly. Let them go free, he repeated. The Cossacks went away, but after a while the first Esaul returned and said, They do not believe as, they do not dare to go. Are their bonds loose? Yes. Then leave them here, and to horse yourselves. Half an hour later the party was moving on again along the quiet, narrow road. The moon had risen, and sent long white streaks to the center of the forest and lighted its dark depths. Zagloba and Skshetuski, riding ahead, conversed together. But tell me everything about her that you know, said the knight. Then you rescued her from the hands of Bogan? Of course. And besides, when going away, I bound up his face so that he could not scream. Well, you acted splendidly, as God is dear to me. But how did you get to Bar? That is a long story, better at another time, for I am terribly tired, and my throat is dried up from singing to those rapscallions. Haven't you anything to drink? I have a little flask of Gorelka, here it is. Zagloba seized the flask and raised it to his mouth. A protracted gurgling was heard. And Pan Yen, impatient, without waiting the end, inquired further, Did you say well? What a question, answered Zagloba, everything is well in a dry throat. But I was inquiring about the princess. Oh, the princess. She is as well as a deer. Praise be to God on high. And she is comfortable in bar? 
as comfortable as in heaven, couldn't be more so. Everyone cleaves to her for her beauty. Pani Slavashevska loves her as her own daughter. And how many men are in love with her? You couldn't count them on a rosary. But she, in constant love for you, thinks as much of them as I do now of this empty flask of yours. May God give health to her, the dearest. Said Skshatusky, joyfully. Then she remembers me with pleasure? Remembers you? I tell you that I myself couldn't understand where she got breath for so many sighs. These sighs made everyone pity her, and most of all the little nuns, for she brought them to her side through her sweetness. Then she sent me too into these dangers, in which I have almost lost my life, to find you without fail and see if you were alive and well. She tried several times to send messengers, but no one would go. At last I took pity on her, and set out for your camp. If it hadn't been for the disguise, I should have laid down my head surely. But the peasants took me for a minstrel everywhere, as I sing very beautifully. Skshatusky became silent from joy. A thousand thoughts and reminiscences thronged into his head. Helena stood as if living before him, as he had seen her the last time in Razloji, just before leaving for the Sage, charming, beautiful, graceful, and with those eyes black as velvet. Full of unspeakable allurement. It seemed to him that he saw her, felt the warmth beating from her cheeks, heard her sweet voice. He recalled that walk in the cherry garden and the cuckoo, and those questions which he gave the bird, and the bashfulness of Helena. Indeed the soul went out of him. His heart grew weak from love and joy, in presence of which all his past sufferings were like a drop in the sea. He did not know himself what was happening to him. He wanted to shout, fall on his knees and thank God again, then inquire without end. At last he began to repeat. She is alive, well? Alive, well, answered Zagloba, like an echo. And she sent you out? Yes. And you have got a letter? I have. Give it to me. It is sewed into my clothes, besides, it is night now. Restrain yourself. I cannot. You see yourself. I see. Zagloba's answers became more and more laconic, at last he nodded a couple of times and fell asleep. Skshatusky saw there was no help. Therefore he gave himself up again to meditation, which was interrupted after a while by the tramp of a considerable body of cavalry approaching quickly. It was Ponyatovsky with Cossacks of the Guard, whom the prince had sent out to meet Skshatusky, fearing lest some harm might have met him. Chapter 29 it is easy to understand how the prince received the statement which Skshatusky made of the refusal of Asinsky and Karitsky. Everything had so combined that it needed such a great soul as that iron prince possessed, not to bend, not to waver, or let his hands drop. In vain was he to spend a colossal fortune on the maintenance of armies, in vain was he to struggle like a lion in a net. In vain was he to tear off one head of the rebellion after another showing wonders of bravery all for nothing. A time was coming in which he must feel his own impotence, withdraw somewhere to a distance, to a quiet place, and remain a silent spectator of what was being done in the Ukraine. And what was it that rendered him powerless? Not the swords of the Cossacks, but the ill will of his own people. Was it not reasonable for him to hope when he marched from the Trans Dnieper in May that when like an eagle from the sky he should strike rebellion? When in the general dismay and confusion he should first raise his sword over his head, the whole commonwealth would come to his aid, and put its power and its punishing sword in his hand? But what did happen? The king was dead, and after his death the command was put into other hands, and he, the prince, was passed by ostentatiously. That was the first concession to Melnitsky. The soul of the prince did not suffer for the office he had lost. But it suffered at the thought that the insulted commonwealth had fallen so low that it did not seek a death struggle, but drew back before one Cossack. And preferred to restrain his insolent right hand by negotiations. From the time of the victory at Maknovka worse and worse tidings were brought to the camp, first news of negotiations sent through Pan Kaisel. 
then news that Valinian Polesia was covered with the waves of insurrection. Then the refusal of the colonels, showing clearly how far the commander-in-chief, Prince Dominic Zaslavsky Ostrogsky, was hostile. During Skshetuski's absence Pan Korsh Zenkovich came to camp with information that all Ovruch was on fire. The people had been quiet, and not anxious for rebellion. But the Cossacks, coming under Krachovsky and Polksenjits, forced the mob to enter their ranks. Castles and villages were burned. The nobles who did not escape were cut to pieces, and among others old Pan Yelietz, a former servant and friend of the Vishniovetskys. In view of this, the prince had decided after a juncture with Asinsky and Karitsky to overwhelm Krivonos, and then move north toward Ovruch, and after an agreement with the hetman of Lithuania. To seize the rebels between two fires. But all these plans had fallen through now on account of the refusal of both colonels caused by Prince Dominic. For Yeremy, after all the marches, battles, and labors, was not strong enough to meet Krivonos, especially when not sure of the voevoda of Kiev, who belonged heart and soul to the peace party. Pan Yanish yielded before the importance and power of Yeremy, and had to go with him. But the more he saw his authority broken the more inclined was he to oppose the warlike wishes of the prince, as was shown at once. Skshetuski gave his account, and the prince listened to it in silence. All the officers were present, their faces were gloomy at the news of the refusal. All eyes turned to the prince when he said. Prince Dominic, of course, sent them the order. Yes, they showed it to me in writing. Yeremy rested his arms on the table and covered his face with his hands, after a while he said. This indeed is more than a man can bear. Am I to labor alone, and instead of assistance meet only obstructions? Could I not have gone to my estates in Sandomir and lived quietly? And what prevented me from doing so, except love of country? This is my reward for toil, for loss of fortune and blood. The prince spoke quietly, but such bitterness and pain trembled in his voice that all present were straitened with sorrow. Old colonels, veterans from Putival, Staryets, Kamaiki, and young men victorious in the last conflicts, looked at him with unspeakable sorrow in their eyes. For they knew what a heavy struggle that Iron Man was having with himself, how terribly his pride must suffer from the humiliation put upon him. He, a prince, by the grace of God. He, a voevoda in Russia, senator of the Commonwealth, must yield to some Melnitsky or Krivonos. He, almost a monarch, who recently had received ambassadors from foreign rulers, must withdraw from the field of glory, and confine himself in some little castle waiting for the outcome of a war directed by others or for humiliating negotiations. He, predestined for great things, conscious of ability to direct them, had to confess that he was without power. This suffering, together with his labors, was marked on his figure. He had become greatly emaciated, his eyes had sunk, his hair, black as the wing of a raven, had begun to grow gray. But a certain grand tragic calm was spread over his countenance, for pride guarded him from betraying his suffering. Well, let it be so, said he. We will show this unthankful country that we are able not only to fight, but to die for it. Indeed I should prefer a more glorious death, to fall in some other war than in a domestic squabble with serfs. Do not speak of death, interrupted the voevoda of Kiev. For though it is unknown what God has predestined to any man, still death may be far away. I do homage to your military genius and your knightly spirit. But I cannot take it ill either of the viceroy, the chancellor, or the commanders, if they try to stem civil war by negotiations, for in it the blood of brothers is flowing, and who? Unless a foreign enemy, can reap advantage from the stubbornness of both sides? The prince looked long into the eyes of the voevoda, and said emphatically. Show favor to the conquered, and they will accept it with thanks and will remember it. But you will be only despised by conquerors. Would that no one had ever done injustice to these people. But when once insurrection has flamed up, we must quench it with blood, not negotiations, if we do not, disgrace and destruction to us. Speedy ruin will come if we wage war each on his own account, answered the voevoda. 
Does that mean that you will not go on with me? I call God to witness that this is out of no ill will to you. But my conscience tells me not to expose my men to evident destruction, for their blood is precious, and will be of value to the commonwealth yet. The prince was silent a while. Then turning to his colonels, he said. You, my old comrades, will not leave me now. At these words the colonels, as if impelled by one power and one will, rushed to the prince. Some kissed his garments, some embraced his knees, others, raising their hands to heaven, cried. We are with you to the last breath, to the last drop of blood. Lead us, lead us. We will serve without pay. And let me die with you, cried young Pan Aksak, blushing like a girl. At sight of this the voevoda of Kiev was moved. But the prince went from one to another, pressed the head of each one, and thanked him. A mighty enthusiasm seized on young and old. From the eyes of the warriors sparks flashed. They grasped their sabers from moment to moment. I will live with you, die with you, said the prince. We will conquer, cried the officers. Against Cravonos. On Polano. Whoever wishes to leave us, let him leave. We will do without aid. We wish to share neither glory nor death. It is my will, said the prince, that before moving on Cravonos we take even a short rest to restore our strength. It is now the third month that we are on horseback, scarcely ever dismounting. The flesh is leaving our bones from excessive toil and change of climate. We have no horses, the infantry are barefoot. Let us go then to Zbaraj, there we will recruit and rest. Perhaps too some soldiers will join us, and we will move into the fire with new forces. When do you wish to start? asked old Zatsvilikovsky. Without delay, old soldier, without delay. Here the prince turned to the voevoda, and where do you wish to go? To Gliniani, for I hear that forces are collecting there. Then we will conduct you to a safe place, so that no harm may happen to you. The voevoda said nothing, for he felt rather ill at ease. He was leaving, and the prince still showed care for him and intended to conduct him. Was there irony in the words of the prince? The voevoda did not know. Still the voevoda did not abandon his design. For the colonels of the prince looked on him more inimically every moment, and it was clear that in any other less disciplined army there would have been an outbreak against him. He bowed and went out, and the colonels went, each to his own regiment to make ready for the march. Skshetuski alone remained with the prince. What kind of soldiers are in those regiments? Asked the prince. So good that you cannot find better. Dragoons drilled in German fashion, and with infantry of the guard, veterans of the Thirty Years' War. When I saw them I thought they were Roman legionaries. Many of them? Two regiments with the dragoons, just three thousand men. Oh, it is a pity, it is a pity. Great things might be done with their assistance. Suffering was already depicted on the face of the prince. After a while he said as if to himself. It is unfortunate that such commanders were chosen in times of defeat. Ostrog would be the right man if war could be put down with eloquence and Latin. Konyatspolsky is my brother-in-law and a warrior by nature, but he is young, without experience. Zaslavsky is worst of all. I know him of old. He is a man of small heart and narrow mind. His business is to slumber over the cup, not to manage an army. I do not speak of this in public, lest it might be thought that malice moves me, but I foresee terrible disaster, especially now, at this time, when such people have the helm in their hands. Oh, God, God, remove this cup from me. What will happen to this country? When I think of it I would prefer death, for I am greatly wearied, and I tell you that I shall not last long. My spirit is rushing to the war, but my body lacks strength. You should care more for your health, in which the whole country is deeply concerned, and which is already greatly injured by toil. The country thinks differently, it is evident, when it avoids me and drags the saber out of my hand. God grant when Prince Karl changes his cap for a crown, 
he will see whom to elevate and whom to punish, but you are powerful enough to care for no one at present. I will go my own way. The prince did not notice perhaps that, like the other, kinglets, he was carrying on a policy of his own. But if he had noticed it, he would not have abandoned it, for he felt clearly that that was the only one that could save the honor of the commonwealth. Again followed a moment of silence, soon broken by the neighing of horses and the sound of trumpets. The regiments were mustering for the march. These sounds roused the prince from meditation. He shook his head as if wishing to shake off suffering and evil thoughts, then he said. You had a quiet journey? I met, in the forest, a large body of peasants, a couple of hundred men whom I destroyed. Well done. And you took prisoners, for that is an important thing now? I did, but. But you have commanded them to be executed already? Is that true? No, I set them free. Yeremy looked with wonderment at Skshetuski, then his brows contracted suddenly. What was that for? Do you too belong to the peace party? Your Highness, I brought an informant, for among the peasants was a disguised noble who remained alive. I freed the others, for God showed mercy to me in comfort. I will bear the punishment. That noble was Pan Zagloba, who brought me tidings of the princess. The prince approached Pan Yen quickly. She is alive and well. Praise be to God on high, she is. And where is she? In Bar. That is a strong fortress, my boy. Here the prince raised his hands, and taking Skshetuski's head, kissed him a number of times on the forehead. I rejoice in your gladness, for I love you as a son. Pan Yen kissed the prince's hand with emotion, and though for many a day he would have willingly shed his blood for him, he felt again that at his command he would spring into rolling flames. To such a degree did that terrible and cruel Yeremy know how to win the hearts of the knights. Well, I do not wonder that you let those men go free. You will go unpunished. But he's a sharp fellow, that noble. Then he took her from the trans Dnieper to Bar, praise be to God. In these grievous times this is a real delight to me also. He must be a fox of no common kind. But let's have a look at this Zagloba. Skshetuski moved quickly toward the door. But at that moment it was opened suddenly, and there appeared in it the flaming head of Virchil, who had been on a distant expedition with the Tartars of the guard. Your Highness, cried he, panting, Crivonos has taken Polano, cut down ten thousand people, among them women and children. The colonels began to assemble again, and crowd around Virchil. The voevoda of Kiev hurried up also. The prince was astonished, for he had not expected such news. But Russians were shut up in there. It cannot be. Not a living soul escaped. Do you hear? Said the prince, turning to the voevoda. Negotiate with an enemy like that, who does not spare even his own. The voevoda snorted and said, Oh, the curs. If that is the case, then may the devils take it all. I will go with you. Then you are a brother to me, said the prince. Long live the voevoda of Kiev, said Zatsvilikovsky. Success to Concord. The prince turned again to Virchil. Where did they go after Polano? Unknown? To Konstantinov, probably. Oh, God save us! Then the regiments of Asinsky and Karitsky are lost, for they cannot escape with infantry. We must forget our wrongs and hurry to their aid. To horse. To horse. The face of the prince brightened with joy, and a glow enlivened his emaciated cheeks, for the path of glory was open before him again. Chapter 30 The army passed Konstantinov and halted at Rosolovtsy. For the prince calculated that when Karitsky and Asinsky would receive news of the taking of Polano, they would retreat to Rosolovtsy. And if the enemy should pursue them he would fall in among all the forces of the prince as into a trap, and thus meet with sure defeat. That forecast was justified in great part. The troops occupied their positions, and remained in silent readiness for the fight. 
smaller and larger scouting parties were sent in every direction from the camp. The prince, with a number of regiments, took his position in the village and waited. Toward evening Virchel's Tartars brought news that infantry was approaching from the direction of Konstantinov. Hearing this, the prince went out before the door of his quarters, surrounded by officers, and with them a number of the principal attendants, to look upon the arrival. Meanwhile the regiments, announcing themselves by sound of trumpet, halted before the village, and two colonels hastened, panting, and with all speed, to the prince to offer him their service. These were Asinsky and Karitsky. When they saw Vishniavetsky with a magnificent suite of knights, they were greatly confused, uncertain of their reception, and bowing profoundly, they waited in silence for what he would say. The wheel of fortune turns and brings down the haughty, said the prince. You did not wish to come at our request, but now you come at your own desire. Your Highness, said Asinsky, with firmness, we wished with all our souls to serve with you, but the order was definite. Let him who issued it answer for it. We beg pardon. Though we are innocent, for as soldiers we were obliged to obey and be silent. Then Prince Dominic has withdrawn the order, asked the prince. The order is not withdrawn, said Asinsky, but it is no longer binding, since the only salvation and refuge for our forces is with you. Under whose command we wish henceforth to live and serve and die. These words, full of manly power, and the form of Asinsky produced the very best impression on the prince and the officers. For he was a famous soldier, and though still young, not more than forty years of age, was full of warlike experience which he had acquired in foreign armies. Every military eye rested on him with pleasure. Tall, straight as a reed, with yellow mustaches brushed upward and a Swedish beard, he recalled completely by his uniform and stature the colonels of the Thirty Years' War. Karitsky, a Tartar by origin, resembled him in nothing. Low in stature and dumpy, he had a gloomy look, and his appearance was strange in a foreign uniform, not befitting his oriental features. He led a picked German regiment, and had a reputation for bravery as well as moroseness, and the iron rigor with which he held his soldiers. We wait the commands of your highness, said Asinsky. I thank you for your decision, and I accept your services. I know that a soldier must obey, and if I sent for you, it was because I was unaware of the order. Not only shall we pass henceforth good and evil times together, but I hope that you will be pleased with your new service. If you are pleased with us and with our officers. Very good. Said the prince. Is the enemy far behind you? Scouting parties are near, but the main force may arrive here tomorrow. Very well, we have time then. Order your regiments to march across the square, let me look at them, so I may know what kind of soldiers you bring me, and if much can be done with them. The colonels returned to their regiments, and soon after were marching at the head of them into the camp. Soldiers of the picked regiments of the prince hurried out like ants to look at their new comrades. The royal dragoons, under Captain Giza, marched in front with heavy Swedish helmets and lofty crests. They rode Podolian horses, but matched and well fed. These men, fresh and rested, with bright and glittering uniforms, had a splendid appearance in comparison with the emaciated regiments of the prince, in tattered uniforms, faded from rain and sun. After these followed Asinsky with his regiment, and in the rear Karitsky. A murmur of applause was heard among the prince's cavalry at the sight of the deep German ranks. Their collars red, on their shoulders shining muskets, they marched thirty in a rank, with the step of a single man, strong and thundering. Tall, sturdy fellows all of them, old soldiers who had been in more than one country and in more than one battle, for the most part veterans of the Thirty Years' War, skilled, disciplined. And experienced. When they marched up to the prince, Asinsky cried, Halt, and the regiment stood as if foot-bound to the earth. The officers raised their staffs, the standard-bearer raised his standard, and waving it three times, lowered it before the prince. Vorwärts, commanded Asinsky, Vorwärts. Repeated the officers, and the regiments advanced again. In the same way but in almost better form, did Karitsky present his troops. At the sight of all this the soldiers' hearts were rejoiced. 
And Yeremi, judge beyond judges, put his hands on his hips with delight, looked, and smiled, for infantry was just what he wanted. And he was sure that it would be difficult for him to find better in the whole world. He felt increased in power, and hoped to accomplish great things in war. The suite began to speak of different military topics and of the various kinds of soldiers to be seen in the world. The Zaporozhian infantry is good, especially behind entrenchments, said Slashinsky, but these are better, for they are better drilled. Of course a great deal better, said Migurski. But they are heavy men, said Virchel. If I had to do it, I should undertake to tire them out with my tartars in two days, so that on the third I could slaughter them like sheep. What are you talking about? The Germans are good soldiers. To this Pan Langin Podbipienta answered in his singing Lithuanian voice, how God in his mercy has endowed different nations with different virtues. As I hear, there is no cavalry in the world better than ours, and again neither our infantry nor the Hungarian can be compared with the German. Because God is just, remarked Zagloba. For instance, he gave you a great fortune, a big sword, and a heavy hand, but small wit. Zagloba has fastened on him like a horse leech, said Pan Yen, smiling. But Podbipienta contracted his eyes and spoke with the mildness usual to him, an outrage to hear. And he gave you too long a tongue. If you maintain that God did ill in giving me what I have, then you will go to hell with your virtue, for you wish to oppose his will. Oh, who can out-talk you? You talk and talk. Do you know how a man is different from an animal? How? By reason and speech. Oh, he has given it to him, he has given it to him, said Mokrski. If you don't understand why in Poland there is better cavalry and among the Germans better infantry, I will explain it to you. Why is it? Why is it? asked several voices. This is why, when the Lord God created the horse he brought him before men, so that they should praise his works. And on the bank stood a German, for the Germans are always pushing themselves everywhere. The Lord God showed the horse to the German, and asked, What is this? Pferd, answered the German. What? exclaimed the Creator, Do you say, P.F.E., to my work? But you will never ride on this creature, you lubber, or if you do, you will ride like a fool. Having said this, the Lord made a present of the horse to the pole. This is why the Polish cavalry is the best. Then the Germans began to hurry after the Lord on foot and to beg forgiveness of him, and that is why the Germans have become the best infantry. You have calculated everything very cleverly, said Podbipienta. Further conversation was interrupted by new guests, who hurried up with the tidings that approaching the camp were forces which could not be Cossacks, for they were not from Konstantinov. But from an entirely different direction, from the river's brutch. Two hours later those troops came on with such a thundering of trumpets and drums that the prince became angry and sent an order to them to be quiet, for the enemy was in the neighborhood. It turned out that they were followers of Samuel Lash, commander of the royal vanguard, an officer of the king, for the rest a celebrated adventurer, wrongdoer, turbulent, quarrelsome. But a great soldier. He led eight hundred men of the same stamp as himself, part nobles, part Cossacks, all of whom deserved hanging according to sound justice. But Yeremy was not afraid of the insubordination of these warriors, trusting that in his hands they would turn into obedient lambs, and make up in bravery and daring for their other defects. It was a lucky evening. On the previous day the prince, weighed down by the expected departure of the voivoda of Kiev, had determined to defer the war till the arrival of reinforcements and to retreat to some quiet place for a time. Today he was again at the head of nearly twelve thousand men. And although Cravonos had five times that number, still since the greater part of the rebel forces was formed of the rabble, the two armies might be considered of equal strength. Now the prince had no thought of rest. Shutting himself up with Lash, the voivoda of Kiev, Zatsvilikovsky, Maknitsky, and Asinsky, he held a council on the conduct of the war. It was determined to give Krivono's battle on the morrow, and if he did not appear himself, to go in search of him. 
it was already dark night. But since the recent rains, so annoying to the soldiers at Maknavka, the weather had continued to be splendid. On the dark vault of the heavens glittered swarms of golden stars. The moon appeared on high and whitened all the roofs of Rosolovtsi. No one in the camp thought of sleeping. All were conjecturing about tomorrow's battle, and preparing for it. Chatting in ordinary fashion, singing, and promising themselves great pleasure. The officers and the most distinguished attendants, all in excellent humor, gathered around a great fire, and passed the time with their cups. Tell us further, said they to Zagloba. When you were crossing the Dnieper, what did you do, and how did you reach Bar? Zagloba emptied a quart cup of mead, and said. Said Jam Anox Hamida Silla Precipitat. Swadent Sidera Cadentia Somnos. Said Si Tantus Amor Casus Cognoscara Nostros. Incipium. Gentlemen, if I should begin to tell all in detail, ten nights would not suffice, and surely mead would be required. For an old throat, like an old wagon, needs lubrication. It is enough if I tell you that I went to Corson, to the camp of Melnitsky himself with the princess, and took her out of that hell in safety. Jesus, Mary! Did you enchant them? cried Zatsvilikovsky. It is true that I enchanted them, said Zagloba, for I learned that hellish art when I was still in youthful years from a witch in Asia, who, having fallen in love with me, divulged all the secret tricks of her black art. But I could not enchant much, for it was trick against trick. Around Melnitsky are swarms of soothsayers and wizards, who have brought so many devils into his service that he uses them to work as he would peasants. When he goes to sleep, a devil has to pull his boots off, when his clothes are dusty, a devil beats them with his tail. When he is drunk, Melnitsky gives this or that devil a box on the snout, saying, you don't do your work well. The pious Pan Langin crossed himself, and said, with them the power of hell. With us the power of heaven. I was afraid the black fellows would betray me to Melnitsky, tell who I was, and whom I was conducting, but I conjured them into silence with certain words. I was afraid too that Melnitsky would know me, for I had met him in Chidron a year before, twice at Dopula's. There were also other colonels whom I knew. But my stomach had fallen in, my beard had grown to my waist, my hair to my shoulders, my disguise had changed the rest, no one recognized me. Then you saw Melnitsky himself, and spoke with him? Did I see Melnitsky? Just as I see you. More than that, he sent me as a spy into Podolia to distribute his manifestos among the peasants on the road. He gave me a baton as a safeguard against the Tartars, so that from Corson I went everywhere in safety. Peasants or men from below met me. I put the staff under their noses, and said, Smell this, children, and go to the devil. Then I ordered them everywhere to give me plenty to eat and drink, and they did. And wagons, too, for which I was glad, and I was always looking after my poor princess, lest she might give out after such great fatigues and terror. I tell you, gentlemen, that before we arrived at Bar she had recovered to such a degree that there were few people in Bar who didn't gaze at her. There are many pretty girls in that place, for the nobles have assembled there from distant regions, but in comparison with her they are as owls to a jay. The people admire her, and you would if you could see her. It must be they couldn't help it, said little Pan Volodyovsky. But why did you go to Bar? asked Migurski. Because I said to myself, I will not stop till I come to a safe place. I had no confidence in small castles, thinking that the rebellion might reach them. But if it should go to Bar, it would break its teeth there. Pan Andrei Patotsky has built up strong walls, and cares as much for Melnitsky as I do for an empty glass. Do you think that I did badly in going so far from the conflagration? If I had not, that Bogan would surely have pursued. And if he had caught up, I tell you he would have made tidbits of me for the dogs. You don't know him, but I do. May the devil fly away with him. I shall have no peace till they hang the man. God grant him that happy end, amen. And surely there is no one with whom he has such an account as with me. 
bearer. When I think of it a chill passes over me. So that now I am forced to use stimulants, though by nature I am opposed to drink. What do you say, interrupted Podbipienta? Why, my dear brother, you take up liquid like a well sweep. Don't look into the well, my dear man, for you will see nothing wise at the bottom. But a truce to this. Traveling then with the baton and manifestos of Melnitsky, I met no great hindrances. When I came to Vinitsa, I found there the troops of Pan Aksak, now present in this camp, but I had not put off my minstrel skin yet, for I feared the peasantry. But I got rid of the manifestos. There is a saddler there called Suhak, a Zaporojan spy, who was sending intelligence to Melnitsky. Through this fellow I sent off the manifestos. But I wrote such sentences on the backs of them that Melnitsky will surely order the saddler to be flayed when he reads them. But right under the very walls of Bar such a thing happened to me that I came very near being lost at the shore of refuge. How was that? How? I met some drunken soldiers, wild fellows, who heard how I called the princess, your ladyship, for I was not so careful then, being near our own people. And they began, what sort of minstrel is that? What sort of a lad is it whom he calls, your ladyship? Then they looked at the princess, and saw she was as beautiful as a picture. Bring her nearer to us, said they. I pushed her behind me into the corner, and to the saber. That is a wonder, said Volodyovsky, that you, dressed as a minstrel, had a saber at your side. That I had a saber? And who told you that I had a saber? I had not. But I grabbed a soldier's saber that lay on the table, for it was in a public house at Shapinsi, I stretched out two of my assailants in the twinkle of an eye. The others rushed on me. I cried, Stop, you dogs, for I am a noble. Next moment they called out, Stop! Stop! Scouts are coming. It appeared that they were not scouts, but Pani Slavashevska with an escort, whom her son was conducting, with fifty horsemen, young fellows. These stopped my enemies. I went to the lady with my story, and roused her feelings so that she opened the floodgates of her eyes. She took the princess into her carriage, and we entered bar. But do you think this is the end? No. Suddenly Slashinsky interrupted the narrative. But, look. Is that the dawn? What is it? Oh, it cannot be the dawn, said Skshatusky. Too early. It is toward Konstantinov. Yes. Don't you see it is brighter? As I live, a fire. At these words the faces of all became serious. They forgot the narrative and sprang to their feet. Fire. Fire, repeated several voices. That is Krivonos who has come from Polano. Krivonos with all his forces. The advance guard must have set fire to the town or the neighboring villages. Meanwhile the trumpets sounded the alarm in low notes. Just then old Zatsvilikovsky appeared suddenly among the knights. Gentlemen, said he, scouts have come with news. The enemy is in sight. We move at once. To your posts. To your posts. The officers hurried with all speed to their regiments. The attendants put out the fires, and in a few moments darkness reigned in the camp. But in the distance from the direction of Konstantinov the heavens reddened each moment more intensely and over a broader space. In this gleam the stars grew paler and paler. Again the trumpet sounded low. To horse, was heard through the mouthpiece. Indistinct masses of men and horses began to move. Amid the silence were heard the tramp of horses, the measured step of infantry, and finally the dull thump of Wurzel's cannon. From moment to moment the clatter of muskets or the voices of command were heard. There was something threatening and ominous in that night march, in those voices, murmurs, clatter of steel, the gleam of armor and swords. The regiments descended to the Konstantinov road, and moved over it toward the conflagration like a great dragon or serpent making its way through the darkness. But the luxuriant July night was drawing to a close. In Rosolovtsy the cocks began to crow, 
answering one another through the whole town. Five miles of road divided Rosolovtsy from Konstantinov, so that before the army on its slow march had passed half the interval dawn rose behind the brightness of the conflagration. Pale as if frightened, and filled the air more and more with light, winning from the darkness forests, woods, groves, the whole line of the highway and the troops marching upon it. It was possible to distinguish clearly the people, the horses, and the close ranks of infantry. The cool morning breeze rose and quivered among the flags above the heads of the knights. Virchel's Tartars marched in front, behind them Poniatowski's Cossacks, then the Dragoons, Wurzel's artillery, the infantry and Hussars last. Zagloba rode near Skshetuski. But he was somewhat uneasy in the saddle, and it was apparent that alarm was seizing him, in view of the approaching battle. Listen a moment. Said he to Skshetuski, in a low whisper as if he feared someone might overhear him. What do you say? Will the Hussars strike first? You say that you are an old soldier, and you don't know that Hussars are reserved to decide the battle at the moment when the enemy is straining his utmost power? I know that, I know that, but I wanted to be sure. A moment of silence ensued. Then Zagloba lowered his voice still more, and inquired further, Is this Kravonos with all his forces? Yes. How many men is he leading? Sixty thousand, counting the mob. Oh, the devil take him, said Zagloba. Pan Yen smiled under his mustache. Don't think that I am afraid, whispered Zagloba. But I have short breath, and don't like a crowd, for it is hot, and as soon as it is hot I can do nothing. I like to take care of myself in single combat. Not the head, but the hands win in this place. Here I am a fool in comparison with Podbipienta. I have on my stomach here those two hundred ducats which the prince gave me. But believe me I would rather have my stomach somewhere else. Tfo. Tfo. I don't like these great battles. May the plague bruise. Nothing will happen to you. Take courage. Courage? That is all I am afraid of. I fear that bravery will overcome prudence in me. I am too excitable. Besides, I have had a bad omen, when we sat by the fire two stars fell. Who knows, maybe one of them is mine. For your good deeds God will reward you and keep you in health. Well, if only he doesn't reward me too soon. Why didn't you stay in the camp? I thought it would be safer with the army. It is you will see that there is no great trouble. We are accustomed to this fighting, and custom is second nature. But here is the slutch and Vishavadi Stav already. In fact the waters of Vishavadi Stav, divided from the slutch by a long dam, glittered in the distance. The army halted at once along the whole line. Is this the place so soon? asked Zagloba. The prince will put the army in line, said Skshetuski. I don't like a throng. I tell you, I don't like a throng. Hussars on the right wing, was the command which came from the prince to Pan Yen. It was broad daylight. The fire had grown pale in the light of the rising sun, whose golden rays were reflected on the points of the lances, and it appeared as though above the hussars a thousand lights were gleaming. After its lines were arranged, the army concealed itself no longer, and began to sing in one voice, Hail, O ye gates of salvation! The mighty song resounded over the dewy grass, struck the pine grove, and sent back by the echo, rose to the sky. Then the shore on the other side of the dam grew black with crowds of Cossacks. As far as the eye could reach regiment followed regiment, mounted Zaporogians armed with long lances, infantry with muskets, and waves of peasants armed with scythes, flails, and forks. Behind them was to be seen, as if in fog, an immense camp or movable town. The creaking of thousands of wagons and the neighing of horses reached the ears of the prince's soldiers. But the Cossacks marched without their usual tumult, without howling, and halted on the other side of the dam. The two opposing forces looked at each other for some time in silence. Zagloba, keeping all the time close to Skshetuski, looked on that sea of people and muttered. Lord, 
why hast thou created so many ruffians? Melnitsky must be there with his mob and their vermin. Isn't that an outbreak, tell me? They will cover us with their caps. Ah! In the old time it was so pleasant in the Ukraine. They are rolling on, rolling on. God grant that the devils may roll you in hell, and all that is coming on us. May the glanders devour you. Don't swear. Today is Sunday. True, it is Sunday. Better think of God. Pater Noster, Caes and Celes, no respect to be looked for from these scoundrels, sanctificeter nomen tuum, what is going to be done on that dam? Adveniat regnum tuum, the breath is already stopped in my body, fiat voluntas tua, God choke you, you Hamans. But look! What is that? A division formed of a few hundred men separated from the dark mass and pushed forward without order toward the dam. That is a skirmishing party, said Skshatuski. Our men will go out to them directly. Has the battle begun, then, already? As God is in heaven. May the devil take them. Here the ill humor of Zagloba was beyond measure. And you are looking at it as a theater in carnival time, cried he, in disgust at Skshatuski, just as if your own skin were not in peril. I told you that we are used to it. And you will go to the skirmish too, of course? It is not very becoming for knights of picked regiments to fight duels with such enemies. No one does that who stands on dignity. But in these times no one thinks of dignity. Our men are marching already, cried Zagloba, seeing the red line of Volodyovsky's dragoons moving at a trot toward the dam. They were followed by a number of volunteers from each regiment. Among others went the Red Verschel, Kushal, Ponyatovsky, the two Karvichi, and Pan Langin Podbipienta from the Hussars. The distance between the two divisions began to diminish rapidly. You will see something, said Skshatuski to Zagloba, look especially at Volodyovsky and Podbipienta. They are splendid fighters. Do you see them? Yes. Well, look at them. You will have something to enjoy. Chapter 31 When the warriors drew near each other, they reined in their horses and opened in mutual abuse. Come on. Come on. We will feed the dogs with your carrion right away. Cried the prince's soldiers. Your carrion is not fit even for dogs, answered the Cossacks. You will rot here on the dam, you infamous robbers. For whom it is fated, that one will rot. But the fish will pick your bones soon. To the dung heaps with your forks, you trash. Dung forks are fitter for you than sabers. If we are trash, our sons will be nobles, for they will be born of your girls. Some Cossack, evidently from the trans Dnieper, pushed forward, and placing his palms around his mouth, cried with a loud voice, The prince has two nieces, tell him to send them to Krivonos. It grew dim in Volodyovsky's eyes when he heard this blasphemy, and he spurred his horse on to the Zaporozhian. Skshatuski, on the right wing with his hussars, recognized him from a distance, and cried to Zagloba, Volodyovsky is rushing on. Volodyovsky! Look there! There! I see, said Zagloba. He has already reached him. They are fighting. One, two. I see perfectly. It is all over. He is a swordsman, plague take him. At the second blow the Cossack fell to the ground as if struck by lightning, and fell with his head to his comrades, as an evil omen to them. Then a second sprang forward, in a scarlet contouche stripped from some noble. He fell upon Volodyovsky a little from the flank, but his horse stumbled at the very moment of the blow. Volodyovsky turned, and then could be seen the master. For he only moved his hand, making a light, soft motion, invisible, so to speak, but still the saber of the Zaporozhian sprang up, flew into the air. Volodyovsky seized him by the shoulder, and pulled him with his horse toward the Polish side. Save me, brothers, cried the prisoner. He offered no resistance, knowing that in case he did he would be thrust through that moment. 
he even struck his horse with his heels to urge him on. And so Volodyovsky led him as a wolf leads a kid. In view of this, a couple of tens of warriors rushed out from both sides of the river, for no more could find place on the dam. They fought in single combat, man with man, horse with horse, saber with saber. And it was a wonderful sight, that series of duels, on which both armies looked with the greatest interest, drawing auguries from them of the future success. The morning sun shone upon the combatants, and the air was so transparent that even the faces might be seen from both sides. Anyone looking from a distance would have thought that it was a tournament or games. But at one moment a riderless horse would spring from the tumult. At another, a body would tumble from the dam into the clear mirror of the water, which splashed up in golden sparks and then moved forward in a circling wavelet farther and farther from shore. The courage of the soldiers in both armies grew as they beheld the bravery of their own men and their eagerness for the fight. Each sent good wishes to its own. Suddenly Skshetuski clasped his hands and cried. Virchil is lost, he fell with his horse. Look! He was sitting on the white one. But Virchil was not lost, though he had indeed fallen with his horse, for they had both been thrown by Pulian, a former Cossack of Prince Yeremy, then next in command to Krivonos. He was a famous skirmisher, and had never left off that game. He was so strong that he could easily break two horseshoes at once. He had the reputation of being invincible in single combat. When he had thrown Virchil he attacked a gallant officer, Korishli Oxitz, and cut him terribly, almost to the saddle. Others drew back in fear. Seeing this, Pan Langin turned his Livonian mare against him. You are lost, cried Pulian, when he saw the foolhardy man. It can't be helped, answered Podbipienta, raising his saber for the blow. He had not, however, his Zervicaptor, that being reserved for ends too important to permit its use in desultory combat. He had left it in the hands of his faithful armor-bearer in the ranks, and had merely a light blade of blue steel engraved with gold. Pulian endured its first blow, though he saw in a moment that he had to do with no common enemy, for his sword quivered to the palm of his hand. He endured the second and the third blow. Then, either he recognized the greater skill of his opponent in fencing, or perhaps he wished to exhibit his tremendous strength in view of both armies, or, pushed to the edge of the dam. He feared to be thrown into the water by Pan Longin's enormous beast. It is enough that after he had received the last blow he brought the horses side by side, and seized the Lithuanian by the waist in his powerful arms. They grasped each other like two bears when they are fighting for a female. They wound themselves around each other like two pines which, having grown from a single stump, intertwine till they form but one tree. All held breath and gazed in silence on the struggle of the combatants, each one of whom was considered the strongest among his own. You would have said that both had become one body, for they remained a long time motionless. But their faces grew red. And only from the veins which swelled on their foreheads, and from their backs bent like bows, could you suspect under that terrible quiet the superhuman tension of the arms which crushed them? At length both began to quiver, but by degrees the face of Pan Longin grew redder and redder and the face of the Cossack bluer and bluer. Still a moment passed. The disquiet of the spectators increased. Suddenly the silence was broken by a hollow, smothered voice, Let me go. No, my darling. Something gave a sudden and terrible rattle, a groan was heard as if from under the ground, a wave of black blood burst from Pulian's mouth, and his head dropped on his shoulder. Pan Longin lifted the Cossack from his seat, and before the spectators had time to think what had happened, threw him on his own saddle and started on a trot towards Skshetuski's regiment. Vivat! cried the Vishniavetsky men. Destruction, answered the Zaporojans. Instead of being confused by the defeat of their leader, they attacked the enemy the more stubbornly. A crowded struggle followed, which the narrowness of the place made the more venomous. And the Cossacks in spite of their bravery would certainly have yielded to the greater skill of their opponents. Had it not been that suddenly the trumpets from the camp of Krivonos sounded a retreat. They withdrew at once, and their opponents, 
after they had stopped a while to show that they had kept the field, withdrew also. The dam was deserted. There remained on it only bodies of men and horses. As if in testimony of that which would be, and that road of death lay black between the two armies, but a light breath of wind wrinkled the smooth surface of the water and sounded plaintively through the leaves of the willows standing here and there above the banks of the pond. Meanwhile the regiments of Crivonos moved like countless flocks of starlings and plover. The mob went in advance, then the regular Zaporozhian infantry, companies of cavalry, Tartar volunteers, and Cossack artillery, and all without much order. They hurried before the others, wishing to force the dam by countless numbers, and then inundate and cover the army of the prince. The savage Krivonos believed in the fist and the saber, not in military art. Therefore he urged his whole power to the attack, and ordered the regiments marching from behind to push on those in front, so that they must go even if against their will. Cannonballs began to plunge into the water like wild swans and divers, causing no damage however to the prince's troops, by reason of the distance. The torrent of people covered the dam and advanced without hindrance. A part of that wave on reaching the river sought a passage, and not finding it turned back to the embankment, and marched in such a dense throng that, as Asinsky said afterward, one might have ridden on horseback over their heads, and so covered the embankment that not a span of free earth remained. Yeremy looked on this from the high shore, his brows wrinkled, and from his eyes flashed malicious lightning toward those crowds. Seeing the disorder and rush of the regiments of Krivonos, he said to Machnitsky, The enemy begin with us in peasant fashion, and disregarding military art, come on like beaters at a hunt. But they will not reach this place. Meanwhile, as if challenging his words, the Cossacks had come to the middle of the embankment. There they paused, astonished and disquieted by the silence of the prince's forces. But just at that moment there was a movement among these forces, and they retreated, leaving between themselves and the embankment a broad half-circle, which was to be the field of battle. Then the infantry of Karitsky opened, disclosing the throats of Wurzel's cannon, turned toward the embankment and in the corner formed by the slough and the embankment shone among the thickets along the bank the muskets of Asinsky's Germans. It was clear in a moment to military men on whose side the victory must be. Only a mad leader like Krivonos could rush to battle on conditions according to which he could not even pass the river in case Vishniavetsky wished to prevent him. But the prince permitted part of his enemy's army to cross the embankment so as to surround and destroy it. The great leader took advantage of the blunders of his opponents, who did not even consider that it was impossible to reinforce his men on the other bank. Except through a narrow passage over which no considerable number of men could be sent at one time. Practiced soldiers therefore looked with wonder at the action of Krivonos, who was not forced by anything to such a mad undertaking. He was forced by ambition alone and a thirst for blood. He had learned that Melnitsky, in spite of the preponderance of power under Krivonos, fearing the result of a battle with Yeremy, was marching with all his forces to his aid. Orders came not to deliver battle, but for that very reason Krivonos determined to deliver it. Having taken Polano, he got the taste of blood, and did not like to divide it with anyone. Therefore he hastened. He would lose half of his men, well, what of that? With the rest he would overwhelm the slender forces of the prince and cut them to pieces. He would bring the head of Vishniavetsky as a present to Melnitsky. The billows of the mob had reached the end of the embankment, passed it, and spread over the half-circle abandoned by Yeremy's army. But at this moment the concealed infantry of Asinsky opened upon them in the flank, and from the cannon of Wurzel there bloomed out long wreaths of smoke, the earth trembled from the roar and the battle began along the whole line. Clouds of smoke concealed the shores of the Sula, the pond, the embankment, and even the field itself, so that all was hidden, save at times the scarlet, glittering uniforms of the dragoons. And the crests gleaming over the flying helmets, as everything seethed in that terrible cloud. The bells of the town were ringing, and mingled their sad groans with the deep bellowing of the guns. From the Cossack camp regiment after regiment rolled on to the embankment. 
Those who crossed and reached the other side of the river extended in the twinkle of an eye into a long line and rushed with rage on the prince's regiments. The battle extended from one end of the pond to the bend in the river and the swampy meadows, which were flooded that rainy summer. The mob and the men of the lower country had to conquer or perish, having behind them water, toward which they were pushed by the infantry and cavalry of the prince. When the hussars moved forward, Zagloba, though he had short breath and did not like a throng, galloped with the others. Because in fact he could not do otherwise without danger of being trampled to death. He flew on therefore, closing his eyes, and through his head there flew with lightning speed the thought, stratagem is nothing, stratagem is nothing, the stupid win, the wise perish. Then he was seized with spite against the war, against the Cossacks, the Hussars, and everyone else in the world. He began to curse, to pray. The wind whistled in his ears, the breath was hemmed in his breast. Suddenly his horse struck against something, he felt resistance. Then he opened his eyes, and what did he see? Scythes, sabers, flails, a crowd of inflamed faces, eyes, mustaches, and all indefinite, unknown, all trembling, galloping, furious. Then he was transported with rage against those enemies, because they are not going to the devil, because they are rushing up to his face and forcing him to fight. You wanted it, now you have it, thought he, and he began to slash blindly on every side. Sometimes he cut the air, and sometimes he felt that his blade had sunk into something soft. At the same time he felt that he was still living, and this gave him extraordinary hope. Slay! Kill! he roared like a buffalo. At last those frenzied faces vanished from his eyes, and in their places he saw a multitude of visages, tops of caps, and the shouts almost split his ears. Are they fleeing? shot through his head. Yes. Then daring sprang up in him beyond measure. Scoundrels, he shouted, is that the way you meet a noble? He sprang among the fleeing enemy, past many, and entangled in the crowd began to labor with greater presence of mind now. Meanwhile his comrades pressed the Cossacks to the bank of the Sula, covered pretty thickly with trees, and drove them along the shore to the embankment, taking no prisoners, for there was no time. Suddenly Zagloba felt that his horse began to spread out under him, at the same time something heavy fell on him and covered his whole head, so that he was completely enveloped in darkness. Oh, save me, he cried, beating the horse with his heels. The steed, however, apparently wearied with the weight of the rider, only groaned and stood in one place. Zagloba heard the screams and shouts of the horsemen rushing around him, then that whole hurricane swept by and all was in apparent quiet. Again thoughts began to rush through his head with the swiftness of tartar arrows, what is this? What has happened? Jesus and Mary, I am in captivity. On his forehead drops of cold sweat came out. Evidently his head was bound just as he had once bound Bogan. That weight which he feels on his shoulder is the hand of a Cossack. But why don't they hang him or kill him? Why is he standing in one place? Let me go, you scoundrel, cried he at last, with a muffled voice. Silence. Let me go. I'll spare your life. Let me go, I say. No answer. Zagloba struck into the sides of his horse again with his heels, but again without result, the prodded beast only stretched out wider and remained in the same place. Finally rage seized the unfortunate captive, and drawing a knife from the sheath that hung at his belt, he gave a terrible stab behind. But the knife only cut the air. Then Zagloba pulled with both hands at the covering which bound his head, and tore it in a moment. What is this? No Cossack. Deserted all around. Only in the distance was to be seen in the smoke the red dragoons of Volodyovsky flying past, and farther on the glittering armor of the hussars pursuing the remnant of the defeated, who were retreating from the field toward the water. At Zagloba's feet lay a Cossack regimental banner. Evidently the fleeing Cossack had dropped it so that the staff hit Zagloba's shoulder, and the cloth covered his head. Seeing all this, and understanding it perfectly, that hero regained his presence of mind completely. Oh, 
Ho, said he, I have captured a banner. How is this? Didn't I capture it? If justice is not defeated in this battle, then I am sure of a reward. Oh, you scoundrels! It is your luck that my horse gave out. I did not know myself when I thought I was greater in strategy than in bravery. I can be of some higher use in the army than eating cakes. Oh, God save us! Some other crowd is rushing on. Don't come here, dog brothers, don't come this way. May the wolves eat this horse. Kill. Slay. Indeed, a new band of Cossacks were rushing toward Zagloba, raising unearthly voices, closely pursued by the armored men of Polyanovsky. And perhaps Zagloba would have found his death under the hoofs of their horses, had it not been that the hussars of Skshetuski, having finished those whom they had been pursuing, turned to take between two fires those onrushing parties. Seeing this, the Zaporojans ran toward the water, only to find death in the swamps and deep places after escaping the sword. Those who fell on their knees begging for quarter died under the steel. The defeat was terrible and complete, but most terrible on the embankment. All who passed that, were swept away in the half-circle left by the forces of the prince. Those who did not pass, fell under the continual fire of Wurzel's cannon and the guns of the German infantry. They could neither go forward nor backward. For Cravonos urged on still new regiments, which, pushing forward, closed the only road to escape. It seemed as though Cravonos had sworn to destroy his own men, who stifled, trampled, and fought one another, fell, sprang into the water on both sides, and were drowned. On one side were black masses of fugitives, and on the other masses advancing, in the middle, piles and mountains and rows of dead bodies, groans, screams, men deprived of speech. The madness of terror, disorder, chaos. The whole pond was full of men and horses, the water overflowed the banks. At times the artillery was silent. Then the embankment, like the mouth of a cannon, threw forth crowds of Zaporojans and the mob, who rushed over the half-circle and went under the swords of the cavalry waiting for them. Then Wurzel began to play again with his reign of iron and lead, the Cossack reinforcement barred the embankment. Whole hours were spent in these bloody struggles. Cravonos, furious, foaming at the mouth, did not give up the battle yet, and hurried thousands of men to the jaws of death. Yeremy, on the other side, in silver armor, sat on his horse, on a lofty mound called at that time the Kruja Majula, and looked on. His face was calm. His eye took in the whole embankment, pond, banks of the slutch, and extended to the place in which the enormous tabor of Cravonos stood wrapped in the bluish haze of the distance. The eyes of the prince never left that collection of wagons. At last he turned to the massive voivoda of Kiev, and said. We shall not capture the tabor today. How? You wished to. Time is flying quickly. It is too late. See. It is almost evening. In fact, from the time the skirmishers went out, the battle, kept up by the stubbornness of Krivonos, had lasted already so long that the sun had but an hour left of its whole daily half-circle. And inclined to its setting. The light, lofty, small clouds, announcing fair weather and scattered over the sky like white-fleeced lambs, began to grow red and disappear in groups from the field of heaven. The flow of Cossacks to the embankment stopped gradually, and those regiments that had already come upon it retreated in dismay and disorder. The battle was ended, and ended because the enraged crowd fell upon Cravonos at last, shouting with despair and madness. Traitor! You are destroying us! You bloody dog! We will bind you ourselves, and give you up to Yeremy, and thus secure our lives. Death to you, not to us. Tomorrow I will give you the prince and all his army, or perish myself, answered Cravonos. But the hoped for tomorrow had yet to come, and the present today was a day of defeat and disorder. Several thousand of the best warriors of the lower country, not counting the mob, lay on the field of battle, or were drowned in the pond and river. Nearly two thousand were taken prisoners. 
14 colonels were killed, not counting Sotniks, Esols, and other elders. Pulian, next in command to Krivonos, had fallen into the hands of the enemy alive, but with broken ribs. Tomorrow we will cut them all up, said Krivonos. I will neither eat nor drink till it is done. In the opposite camp the captured banners were thrown down at the feet of the terrible prince. Each of the captors brought his own, so that they formed a considerable crowd, altogether forty. When Zagloba passed by, he threw his down with such force that the staff split. Seeing this, the prince detained him, and asked. And you captured that banner with your own hands? At your service, your highness. I see that you are not only a Ulysses, but an Achilles. I am a simple soldier, but I serve under Alexander of Macedon. Since you receive no wages, the treasurer will pay you, in addition to what you have had, two hundred ducats for this honorable exploit. Zagloba seized the prince by the knees, and said, Your favor is greater than my bravery, which would gladly hide itself behind its own modesty. A scarcely visible smile wandered over the dark face of Skshetuski. But the night was silent, and even later on he never said anything to the prince, or anyone else, of the fears of Zagloba before the battle. But Zagloba himself walked away with such threatening mien that, seeing him, the soldiers of the other regiments pointed at him, saying, He is the man who did most today. Night came. On both sides of the river and the pond thousands of fires were burning, and smoke rose to the sky in columns. The wearied soldiers strengthened themselves with food and gorelka, or gave themselves courage for tomorrow's battle by relating the exploits of the present day. But loudest of all spoke Zagloba, boasting of what he had done, and what he could have done if his horse had not failed. I can tell you, said he, turning to the officers of the prince, and the nobles of Tishkievich's command, that great battles are no novelty for me. I was in many of them in Moldavia and Turkey. But when I was on the field I was afraid, not of the enemy, for who is afraid of such trash, but of my own impulsiveness, for I thought immediately that it would carry me too far. And did it? It did. Asks Kshetuski. The moment I saw Virchel falling with his horse, I wanted to gallop to his aid without asking a question. My comrades could scarcely hold me back. True, said Skshetuski, we had to hold you in. But, interrupted Karvich, where is Virchel? He has already gone on a scouting expedition, he knows no rest. See then, gentlemen, said Zagloba, displeased at the interruption, how I captured the banner. Then Virchel is not wounded, inquired Karvich again. This is not the first one that I have captured in my life, but none cost me such trouble. He is not wounded, only bruised, answered Azulevic, a Tartar, and has gulped water, for he fell head first into the pond. Then I wonder the fish didn't die, said Zagloba, with anger, for the water must have boiled from such a flaming head. But he is a great warrior. Not so great, since a half John 13 was enough for him. Tfu. It is impossible to talk with you. You might learn from me how to capture banners from the enemy. Further conversation was interrupted by the youthful Pan Aksak, who approached the fire at that moment. I bring you news, gentlemen, said he, with a clear half-childish voice. The nurse hasn't washed his bib, the cat has drunk his milk, and his cup is broken, muttered Zagloba. But Pan Aksak paid no attention to this fling at his youth, and said, they are burning Pulian. The dogs will have toast, said Zagloba. And he is making a confession. The negotiations are broken. Kaisel is nearly wild. Mel 14, Hops, is coming with all his forces to help Krivonos. Hops? What Hops? Who is making anything of Hops? If Hops are on the road, there will be beer then. We don't care for hops, said Zagloba, looking at the same time with fierce, haughty eyes at those around. Mel is coming. But Krivonos didn't wait, therefore he lost. Yes, he played and lost. Six thousand Cossacks are already in Maknavka. Two thousand Bogan is leading. Who? 
Who? asked Zagloba instantly, in a changed voice. Bogan. Impossible. That is the confession of Pulion. Ah, here is a cake for you, grandmother, cried Zagloba, piteously. Can they get here soon? In three days. But on the way to battle they will not hurry too much, so as not to tire their horses. But I will hurry, muttered Zagloba. Oh, angels of God, save me from that ruffian. I would gladly give my captured banner if that water burner would only break his neck on the way to this place. I hope too that we shall not wait here long. We have shown Cravonos what we can do, and now it is time to rest. I hate that Bogan so much that I cannot call to mind his devilish name without abomination. I did make a choice. I couldn't stay in bar. Bad luck brought me here. Don't worry yourself, whispered Skshatuski, for it is a shame. Between you and me nothing threatens you here. Nothing threatens me? You don't know him. Why, he might creep up to us now among the fires here. Zagloba looked around disquieted. And he is as enraged at you as at me. God grant me to meet him, said Pan Yen. If that is a favor, then I have no wish to receive it. In my character of Christian I forgive him all his offenses willingly, but on condition that he be hanged two days before. I am not alarmed, but you have no idea what surpassing disgust seizes me. I like to know with whom I have to deal, if with a noble, then a noble. If with a peasant, then a peasant, but he is a sort of incarnate devil, with whom you don't know what course to take. I ventured many a thing with him. But such eyes as he made when I bound his head, I cannot describe to you, to the hour of my death I shall remember them. I don't wish to rouse the devil while he sleeps. Once is enough for a trick. I will say to you also that you are ungrateful, have no thought of that unhappy woman. How so? Because, said Zagloba, drawing the knight away from the fire, you stay here and gratify your military caprice and fancy by fighting day after day, while she is drowning herself in tears. Waiting in vain for an answer. Another man with real love in his heart and pity for her grief wouldn't do this, but would have sent me off long ago. Do you think then of returning to Bar? Even today, for I have pity on her. Pan Yen raised his eyes yearningly to the stars and said. Do not speak to me of insincerity. For God is my witness that I never raise a bit of bread to my mouth or take a moment of sleep without thinking of her first, and nothing can be stronger in my heart than the thought of her. I have not sent you with an answer hitherto because I wish to go myself to be with her at once. And there are no wings in the world and no speed which I would not use could they serve me in going to her. Then why don't you fly? Because I cannot before battle. I am a soldier and a noble therefore I must think of honor. But today we are after the battle, therefore we can start, even this minute. Pan Yen sighed. Tomorrow we attack Cravonos. I don't understand your ways. You beat young Cravonos, old Cravonos came, and you beat old Cravonos. Now what's his name, not to mention him in an evil hour, Bogan, will come, you will beat him. Melnitsky will come. Oh, what the devil! And as it will go on this way it would be better for you to enter into partnership with Podbipienta at once, than there would be a fool with continence plus his mightiness Skshatuski. Total two fools and one continence. Let's have peace, for, as God lives, I will be the first to persuade the princess to put horns on you, and at bar lives Andre Patotsky, and when he looks at her fire flashes out of his eyes. Tfo. If this should be said by some young fellow who had not seen a battle and wanted to make a reputation, then I could understand. But not you, who have drunk blood like a wolf, and at Maknavka, I am told, killed a kind of infernal dragon of a man-eater. I swear, by that moon in heaven, that you are up to something here, or that you have got such a taste of blood that you like it better than your bride. Skshatuski looked involuntarily at the moon, which was sailing in the high starry heavens like a ship above the camp. You are mistaken, said he, after a while. I do not want blood, nor am I working for reputation, 
but it would not be proper to leave my comrades in a difficult struggle in which the whole regiment must engage, nemini excepto. In this is involved knightly honor, a sacred thing. As to the war it will undoubtedly drag on, for the rabble has grown too great. But if Melnitsky comes to the aid of Krivonos, there will be an intermission. Tomorrow Krivonos will either fight or he will not. If he does, with God's aid he will receive dire punishment, and we must go to a quiet place to draw breath. During these two months we neither sleep nor eat, we only fight and fight. Day and night we have nothing over our heads, exposed to all the attacks of the elements. The prince is a great leader, but prudent. He does not rush on Melnitsky with a few thousand men against legions. I know also that he will go to Zberaj, recruit there, get new soldiers, nobles from the whole commonwealth will hurry to him, and then we shall move to a general campaign. Tomorrow will be the last day of work, and after tomorrow I shall be able to accompany you to Bar with a clean heart. And I will add, to pacify you, that Bogan can in no wise come here tomorrow and take part in the battle. And even if he should I hope that his peasant star will pale, not only before that of the prince, but before my own. He is an incarnate Beelzebub. I have told you that I dislike a throng. But he is worse than a throng, though I repeat it is not so much from fear as from an unconquerable aversion I have for the man. But no more of this. Tomorrow comes the tanning of the peasants' backs, and then to bar. Oh, those beautiful eyes will laugh at the sight of you, and that face will blush. I tell you, even I feel lonely without her, for I love her as a father. And no wonder. I have no legitimate children. My fortune is far away, for it is in Turkey, where my scoundrelly agents steal it all. And I live as an orphan in the world, and in my old age I shall have to go and live with Podbipienta at Mishikishki. Oh, no, don't let your head ache over that. You have done something for us. We cannot be too thankful to you. Further conversation was interrupted by some officer who passing along inquired, Who stands there? Virchel! exclaimed Skshetuski, recognizing him by his voice. Are you from the scouting party? Yes, and now from the prince. What news? Battle tomorrow. The enemy are widening the embankment, building bridges over the Styra and Slutch, and on the morrow wish to come to us without fail. What did the prince say to that? The prince said, All right. Nothing more? Nothing. He gave no order to hinder them, and axes are chopping, they will work till morning. Did you get informants? I captured seven. All confess that they have heard of Melnitsky, that he is coming, but probably far away yet. What a night! Yes, you can see as in the day. And how do you feel after the fall? My bones are sore. I am going to thank our Hercules and then sleep, for I am tired. If I could doze a couple of hours, good night. Good night. Go you to sleep also, said Skshetuski to Zagloba, for it is late, and there will be work tomorrow. And the next day a journey, said Zagloba. They turned, said their prayers, and then lay down near the fire. Soon the fires began to go out one after another. Silence embraced the camp. But the moon cast on the men's silver rays, with which it illumined every little while new groups of sleepers. The silence was broken only by the universal, mighty snoring, and the call of the sentinels watching the camp. But sleep did not close the heavy lids of the soldiers long. Scarcely had the first dawn whitened the shadows of night when the trumpets in every corner of the camp thundered the reveille. An hour later the prince, to the great astonishment of the knights, drew back along the whole line. Chapter 32 But it was the retreat of a lion needing room for a spring. The prince purposely allowed Krivonos to cross so as to inflict on him the greater defeat. In the very beginning of the battle he had the cavalry turned and urged on as if in flight, seeing which the men of the lower country and the mob broke their ranks to overtake and surround him. Then Yeremy turned suddenly, and with his whole cavalry struck them at once so terribly that they were unable to resist. The prince's troops pursued them five miles to the crossing, 
then over the bridges, the embankment, and two miles and a half to the camp, cutting and killing them without mercy. The hero of the day was the sixteen-year-old Pan Aksak, who gave the first blow and produced the first disorder. Only with such an army, old and trained, could the prince use such stratagems, and feign flight which in any other ranks might become real. This being the case, the second day ended still more disastrously for Crivonos than the first. All his field pieces were taken, and a number of flags, among them several royal flags captured by the Cossacks at Korsan. If the infantry of Koritsky and Asinsky with the cannon of Wurzel could have followed the cavalry, the camp would have been taken at a blow. But before they came up it was night, and the enemy had already retreated a considerable distance, so that it was impossible to reach them. But Zatsvilikovsky captured half the camp, and with it enormous supplies of arms and provisions. The crowd seized Krivonos twice, wishing to give him up to the prince and the promise of an immediate return to Melnitsky barely sufficed to save him. He fled therefore with the remaining half of his tabor, with a decimated army, beaten and in despair, and did not halt till he reached Maknovka, where when Melnitsky came up. In the moment of his first anger, he ordered him to be chained by the neck to a cannon. But when his first anger had passed the Zaporozhian hetman remembered that the unfortunate Krivonos had covered Volinia with blood, captured Polano, and sent thousands of nobles to the other world. Left their bodies without burial, and had been victorious everywhere till he met Yeremy. For these services the Zaporozhian hetman took pity on him, and not only ordered him to be freed immediately from the cannon, but restored him to command. And sent him to Podolia to new conquests and slaughters. The prince now announced to his army the rest so much desired. In the last battle it had suffered considerable losses, especially at the storming of the Tabor by the cavalry, behind which the Cossacks defended themselves with equal stubbornness and adroitness. Five hundred soldiers were killed, Colonel Mokersky, severely wounded, died soon after, Pan Kushal, Ponyatovsky, and young Aksak were shot, but not dangerously. And Zagloba, becoming accustomed to the throng, took his place manfully with the others, struck twice with a flail, he fell on his back, and being unable to move, lay as dead in Skshetuski's wagon. Fate hindered the plan of going to Bar. For they could not start immediately, especially since the prince had sent Pan Yen, at the head of a number of troops, as far as Zaslav, to exterminate the bands of peasants assembled there. The knight went without mentioning Bar to the prince, and during five days burned and slaughtered till he cleared the neighborhood. At last, even the soldiers became wearied beyond measure by the uninterrupted fighting, distant expeditions, ambuscades, and watching. He decided therefore to return to the prince, who, as he was informed, had gone to Tarnopol. On the eve of his return he stopped at Sukhojinsi, on the Komor. He disposed his soldiers in the village, took his lodgings for the night in a peasant's cottage, and because he was greatly wearied from labor and want of rest, fell asleep at once. And slept like a stone all night. About morning, when half asleep, half awake, he began to doze and dream. Wonderful images were in movement before his eyes. It seemed to him that he was in Lubni, that he had never left the place, that he was sleeping in his room in the armory, and that Gensian, as was his wont in the morning, was bustling around with clothes and preparing for his master's rising. Gradually, however, consciousness began to scatter the phantoms. He remembered that he was in Sukhojinsi, not in Lubni. Still the form of his servant did not dissolve in mist, and Pan Yen saw him continually sitting under the window, occupied in oiling armor straps, which had shrunk considerably from the heat. But he still thought that it was a vision of sleep, and closed his eyes again. After a while he opened them. Gensian was sitting under the window. Gensian, called Skshetuski, is that you, or is it your ghost? The young fellow, frightened by the sudden call, dropped the breastplate on the floor with a clatter, spread his arms, and said, Oh, for God's sake! Why do you scream, my master, that I am like a ghost? I am alive and well. And you have come back? But have you sent me off? Come here to me, let me embrace you. The faithful youth fell upon the floor, 
and caught Skshetuski by the knees. Skshetuski kissed him on the forehead with joy, and repeated, You are alive, you are alive. Oh, my master, I cannot speak from joy that I see you again in health. You shouted so that I let the breastplate fall. The straps have shrunk up, it is clear that you have had no one. Praise be to thee, O oh God. Oh, my dear master. When did you come back? Last night. Why didn't you wake me up? Why should I wake you up? I came early to take your clothes. Where did you come from? From Gushchi. What were you doing there? What has happened to you? Tell me. Well, you see the Cossacks came to Gushchi, which belongs to the Voivoda of Bratslav, to plunder and burn, and I was there earlier, for I went there with Father Patroni Lasko. Who took me to Melnitsky from Gushchi? For the Voivoda sent him to Melnitsky with letters. I went back with him, therefore, and at that time the Cossacks were burning Gushchi. And they killed Father Patroni for his love to us, and no doubt they would have killed the Voivoda too, if he had been there. Though he belongs to their church and is their great benefactor. But speak clearly and don't confuse things, for I cannot understand. You have been with the Cossacks, then, and spent some time with Melnitsky. Is that true? Yes, with the Cossacks, for when they took me in Chigirin they thought I was one of their men. Now put on your clothes, my master. Dress, oh, Lord bless me, everything you have is worn out, so there is nothing to lay hands on. But don't be angry with me because I did not deliver in Rosloji the letter which you wrote in Kudak. That rascal, Bogan, took it from me, and had it not been for that fat noble I should have lost my life. I know, I know. It is not your fault. That fat noble is in the camp. He has told me everything just as it was. He has also stolen from Bogan the lady, who is in good health and living at Bar. Praise be to God for that. I knew too that Bogan didn't get her. Then of course the wedding is not far away. It is not. From here we shall go by orders to Tarnapal, and from there to Bar. Thanks be to God on high. He will surely hang himself, that Bogan. But a witch has already foretold him that he will never get her of whom he is thinking, and that a pole will have her. That pole is surely you. How do you know this? I heard it. I must tell you everything in order, and do you dress, my master, for they are cooking breakfast for you. When I was going in the boat from Kudak we were a long time sailing, for it was against the current, and besides the boat got injured, and we had to repair it. We were going on then, going on, my master, going on. Go on. Go on, interrupted Skshetuski, impatiently. And we came to Chigirin, and what happened to me there you know already. I do. I was lying there in the stable without a sight of God's world. And then Melnitsky came immediately after the departure of Bogan, with a tremendous Zaporozhian force. And as the Grand Hetman had previously punished a great many Chidron people for their love to the Zaporozhians, many of them were killed and wounded. Therefore the Cossacks thought that I was from Chidron. They didn't kill me, but gave me necessary provisions and care, and didn't let the Tartars take me, though they let them do everything else. When I came to myself I began to think what I was to do. Those rascals by this time had gone to Corson and defeated the Hetmans. Oh, my master, what my eyes saw is not to be described. They concealed nothing from me, knew no shame, because they took me for one of themselves. I was thinking whether to flee or not, but I saw it would be safer to remain until a better opportunity should offer itself. When they began to bring in from the battlefield at Corson cloths, silver, plate, precious stones, oh, my master, my heart nearly burst, and my eyes almost came out of my head. Such robbers. They sold six silver spoons for a thaler, and later for a quart of vodka, a golden button or brooch or a hat cockade you might buy with a pint. Then I thought to myself, why should I sit idle? Let me make something. With God's help I will return some time to the Gensians at Podlesia, where my parents are living. I will give this to them, 
for they have a lawsuit with the Yavorskis, which has been going on now for fifty years, and they have nothing to continue it with. I bought then so much stuff of every kind that it took two horses to carry it. This was the consolation of my sorrows, for I was terribly grieved on your account. Oh, Gensian, you are always the same, you must have profit out of everything. What is the harm, if God has blessed me? I do not steal. And if you gave me a purse for the road to Rosloji, here it is. I ought to return it, for I didn't go to Rosloji. Saying this, the young fellow unbuckled his belt, took out the purse, and placed it before the knight. Skshatuski smiled and said. Since you had such good luck, you are surely richer than I. But keep the purse. I thank you very humbly. I have collected a little, with God's favor. My father and mother will be glad, and my grandfather, who is now ninety years old. But they will continue their lawsuit with the Yavorskis till the last penny, and send them out with packs on their backs. You will also be the gainer, for I shall not mention that belt you promised me in Kudak, though it suited me well. Yes, for you have already reminded me. Oh, such a son of a... a regular insatiable wolf. I don't know where that belt is, but if I promised, I will give you, if not that one, another. I thank you, my master, said he, embracing Skshatuski's knees. No need of that. Go on, tell what happened. The Lord then sent me some profit among the robbers. But I was tormented from not knowing what had happened to you, and lest Bogan had carried off the lady. Till they brought me word that he was lying in Sherkasi barely alive, wounded by the prince's men. I went to Sherkasi, since, as you are aware, I know how to make plasters and dress wounds. The Cossacks knew that I could do this. Well, Donietz, a colonel, sent me to Sherkasi, and went with me himself to nurse that robber. There a burden fell from my heart, for I heard that our young lady had escaped with that noble. I went then to Bogan. I was thinking, will he know me or not? But he was lying in a fever, and at first didn't know me. Later on he knew me, and said, you were going with a letter to Rosloji? Yes, I answered. Then he said again, I struck you in Chidron? Yes. Then you serve Pan Skshatuski? I am serving no one now, I replied. I had more evil than good in that service, therefore I chose to go to the Cossacks for freedom. And I am nursing you now for ten days, and am restoring you to health. He believed me, and became very confidential. I learned from him that Rosloji was burned, that he had killed the two princes. The other Kurtsevichi wished at first to go to our prince, but could not, and escaped to the Lithuanian army. But the worst was when he remembered that fat noble. Then, my master, he gnashed his teeth like a man cracking nuts. Was he long sick? Long, long. His wounds healed quickly, then they opened again, for he didn't take care of them at first. I sat many a night with him, may he be cut up, as with some good man. And you must know, my master, that I swore by my salvation to take vengeance on him. And I will keep my oath, though I have to follow him all my life, for he maltreated me, an innocent person, and pounded me like a dog. And I am no trash, either. He must perish at my hand unless somebody else kills him first. I tell you that about a hundred times I had a chance, for often there was no one near him but me. I thought to myself, shall I stab him or not? But I was ashamed to kill him in his bed. It was praiseworthy of you not to kill him while sick and weak. That would be the deed of a peasant, not of a noble. And you know, my master, I had the same thought. I recollected too that when my parents sent me from home my grandfather blessed me, and said, Remember, you dunce, that you are a noble. Have ambition, serve faithfully. But don't let any man trample on you. He said also that when a noble acts in peasant fashion the Lord Jesus weeps. I recalled that phrase and I restrained myself. I had to let the chance pass. And now he was more confidential. More than once he asked, How shall I reward you? 
And I said, Any way you wish, and I cannot complain. He supplied me bountifully, and I took all he gave me. For I thought to myself, Why should I leave it in the hands of a robber? On his account others gave me presents. For I tell you, my master, that there is no one so beloved as he, both by the men from below and the mob, though there is not a noble in the commonwealth who has such contempt for the mob as he. Here Genzian began to twist his head as if he remembered and wondered at something. And after a while he said. He is a strange man, and it must be confessed that he is altogether of noble nature. And that young lady, but he loves her. Oh, mighty God, but he loves her. As soon as he was a little restored, Dantsavna came to him to soothsay, but she told him nothing good. She is a brazen-faced giantess who is in friendship with devils, but she is a good-looking woman. When she laughs you would swear that a mare was neighing in the meadow. She has white teeth so strong that she might chew up a breastplate. When she walks the ground trembles. And, by the evident visitation of God, my good looks attracted her. Then she wouldn't pass without catching me by the head or the sleeve and jerking me. More than once she said, Come. But I was afraid that the devil might break my neck if I went, and then I should lose all I had gathered, so I answered, Haven't you enough of others? She said, You please me. Though you are a stripling, you please me. Be off, base vile. I said. Then said she again, I like you, I like you. But you saw the soothsaying? I did, and I heard it. There was a sort of smudge, a seething and squeaking, and shadows, so that I was frightened. She was standing in the middle of the room, looking stern, with sullen black brows, and repeated, The pole is near her. The pole is near her. Chilly. Hook. Chilly. The pole is near her. Then she poured wheat into a sieve, and looked. The grains went around like insects, and she repeated, Chilly. Hook. Chilly. The pole is near her. Oh, my master, if he were not such a robber it would be sad to look at his despair. After every answer she gave he used to grow white as a shirt, fall on his back, clasp his hands over his head, twist and whine. And beg forgiveness of the princess that he came with violence to Rosloji and killed her cousins. Where art thou, Cuckoo, the loved one, the only one? I would have borne you in my arms, and now I cannot live without you. I will not approach you. I will be your slave if my eyes can only see you. Then he remembered Zagloba again, ground his teeth, bit the bed, till sleep overpowered him, and in sleep he groaned and sighed. But did she never prophesy favorably for him? I don't know, my master, for he recovered, and besides I left him. The priest Lasco came, so Bogan arranged that I should go with him to Gushchi. The robbers there found out that I had property of different kinds, and I too made no secret of the fact that I was going to help my parents. And they didn't rob you? Perhaps they would have done so, but fortunately there were no Tartars there then, and the Cossacks did not dare to rob me from fear of Bogan. Besides they took me for one of their own. Even Melnitsky himself ordered me to keep my ears open and report what would be said at the Voivodas, if there should be a meeting there. May the hangman light his way. I went then to Gushchi. Kravonos's detachments came and killed Father Lasko. I buried half my treasure, and escaped with the rest when I heard that you were near Zoslov. Praise be to God on high that you are in good health, and that you are preparing for your wedding. Then the end of every evil will come. I told those scoundrels who went against the Prince our Lord, that they wouldn't come back. They have caught it. Now maybe the war is over. How over? It is only beginning now with Melnitsky. And you will fight after the wedding? But did you think that cowardice would seize me at the wedding? I didn't think that. I know that whomsoever it seizes, it won't seize you. I just ask. For when I take to my parents what I have collected I should like to go with you. Maybe God will help me to avenge my wrong on Bogan. For since it is not proper to take an unfair advantage, where shall I find him, if not in the field? 
he will not hide himself. What a determined fellow you are. Let everyone have his own. And as I promised to follow him to Turkey, it cannot be otherwise. And now I will go with you to Tarnopol, and then to the wedding. But why do you go to Bar by Tarnopol? It is not on the road in any way. I must take home my regiment. I understand. Now give me something to eat, said Pan Yen. I've been looking out for that. The stomach is the main thing. After we have eaten we will start at once. Praise be to God for that, though my poor nag is worn to death. I will order them to give you a pack horse, you can ride on it. Thank you humbly, said Jensian, smiling with delight at the thought that including the purse and the belt a third present had come to him now. Chapter 33 Pan Yen rode at the head of the prince's squadrons, but to Zbaraj instead of Tarnopol, for a new order had come to march to the latter place. And on the road he told his faithful attendant his own adventures, how he had been taken in captivity at the Sage, how long he had remained there. And how much he had suffered before Melnitsky had liberated him. They advanced slowly. For though they had no trains or baggage, their road lay through a country which was so ruined that the greatest exertions were necessary to obtain provisions for men and horses. In places they met crowds of famished people, especially women and children, who implored God for death or Tartar captivity, for then, though in bonds, they would be fed. And still it was harvest time in that rich land flowing with milk and honey. But the parties of Cravonos had destroyed everything that could be destroyed, and the remnant of the inhabitants fed themselves on the bark of the trees. Near Yampol they first entered a country which was not so much injured by war, and having had more rest and provisions in plenty, they went with hurried march to Zbaraj. Where they arrived in five days after leaving Sukhojintsi. There was a great concourse in Zbaraj. Prince Yeremi was there with his whole army, and besides him no small number of soldiers and nobles had come. War hung in the air, nothing else was mentioned. The town and neighborhood were swarming with armed men. The peace party in Warsaw, maintained in its hopes by Pan Kaisel, the voevoda of Bratslav, had not given up, it is true, negotiations. And continued to believe that it would be possible to allay the storm with them. Still they understood that negotiations could have results only when there was a powerful army to support them. The Diet of Convocation was held therefore amidst the threatenings and thunderings of war such as usually precede an outbreak. The general militia was called out, and enlisted soldiers were concentrated. And though the chancellor and commanders still believed in peace, the war feeling was predominant in the minds of the nobles. The victories won by Prince Yeremi fired the imagination. The minds of men were burning with a desire for vengeance on the peasants, and a desire to pay back for Jaltia Vodi and Corson, for the blood of so many thousands who had died martyrs' deaths. For the disgrace and humiliation. The name of the terrible prince was bright with the sunlight of glory, it was on every lip, in every heart. And together with that name was heard, from the shores of the Baltic to the wilderness, the ominous word, War. 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 Signs in the heavens announced it also, the excited faces of the populace, the glittering of swords, the nightly howling of dogs before the cottages, and the neighing of horses. Catching the odor of blood. War. Iskuchin men through all the lands and districts and houses and villages drew out their old armor and swords from the storehouses. The youths sang songs about Yeremi. The women prayed before altars. And armored men were marching to the field in Prussia and Livonia as well as in Great Poland and populous Mazovia, and away to God's own Carpathian peaks, and the dark pine forests of Beskid. War lay in the nature of things. The plundering movement of the Zaporoji and the popular uprising of the Ukraine mob demanded some higher watchwords than slaughter and robbery. Then a struggle against serfdom and the land grabbing of magnates. Melnitsky knew this well and taking advantage of the slumbering irritation from mutual abuses and oppressions, of which there was never a lack in those harsh times. He changed a social into a religious struggle, kindled popular fanaticism, 
and dug in the very beginning between the two camps an abyss which could be filled neither with parchments nor negotiations. But only with blood. Wishing for negotiations from his soul, he wished them only to secure his own power, but afterward, what was to be afterward the Zaporojan hetman did not think. He did not look into the future and had no care for it. He did not know, however, that that abyss which he had created was so great that no negotiations could fill it, at least in such a time as he, Melnitsky, could demand. The quick politician did not guess that he would not be able to enjoy in peace the bloody fruits of his life. And still it was easy to understand that when the armed legions should stand before each other, the parchment for the inscription of treaties would be the field, and the pens, swords, and lances. Events tended, by the force of things, toward war, and even ordinary people, led by instinct alone, felt that it could not be otherwise. And throughout the whole commonwealth the eyes of men were turned more and more to Yeremy, who from the beginning had proclaimed a war of life and death. In the shadow of his gigantic figure the Chancellor, the Voivoda of Bratslav, and the commanders were more and more effaced, and among them the powerful Prince Dominic, formal commander-in-chief. Their importance drooped, and obedience to their government decreased. The army and the nobles were ordered to march to Lvov and then to Gliniani, which they did accordingly in larger and larger divisions. The regular troops assembled, and after them men of the nearest provinces, but immediately fresh events began to threaten the authority of the Commonwealth. Now not only the less disciplined squadrons of the militia, not only the private troops, but the regular soldiers when at the place of muster refused obedience to the commanders. And in defiance of orders marched to Zberage to place themselves under the command of Yeremy. This was done first by the nobles of Kiev and Bratslav, who had previously served in large part under Yeremy. They were followed by the nobles of Rus and Lubolsk, and these by the troops of the crown, and it was not difficult to understand that all would follow in their steps. Yeremy, who had been slighted, neglected by design, was becoming, by the force of things, the hetman and supreme leader of all the power of the commonwealth. The nobles and the army, devoted to him soul and body, waited only for his nod. Authority, war, peace, the future of the commonwealth, rested in his hands. Each day he grew, for each day new squadrons marched to him, and he was becoming so gigantic that his shadow began to fall not only on the chancellor and the commanders, but on the senate, on Warsaw. And the whole commonwealth. In circles hostile to him, those of the chancellor at Warsaw and in the camp of the commander-in-chief, in the suite of Prince Dominic, and around the voevoda of Bratslav. They began to mutter against his measureless ambition and pride. The affair of Gadiak was mentioned, when the insolent prince came with four thousand men to Warsaw, and entering the senate, was ready to hew down all, not excepting the king himself. What might not be expected from such a man, and what must he be now after that Xenophontine return from the trans -Nieper? After all those military advantages and victories which had given him such an immense reputation? To what unendurable haughtiness must that favor of the soldiers and the nobles raise him? Who will stand against him today? What will become of the commonwealth in which one citizen rises to such power that he can trample upon the will of the Senate? And snatch away their authority from the leaders appointed by the commonwealth? Does he intend really to decorate Prince Karl with the crown? He is Marius, it is true, but God grant that he become not a Coriolanus or a Catalan, for he is equal to both in ambition and pride. Thus did they speak in Warsaw and in military circles, especially in the suite of Prince Dominic, the rivalry between whom and Yeremy had caused no little damage to the commonwealth. But that Marius was sitting that moment at Zbarage, gloomy, unconsulted. Recent victories gave no light to his countenance. Whenever some new squadron of regulars or district militia appeared at Zbarage he went out to see it, determined its value at a glance, and immediately fell into musing. Soldiers gathered around him with shouts, fell on their knees before him, crying, Hail, invincible chief, Slavonic Hercules! We will stand by thee to the death. But he answered, My respects to you, gentlemen. We are all soldiers of Christ, and I am too insignificant in rank to be the steward of your blood. 
and he returned to his quarters, fled from men, struggled in solitude with his thoughts. In this way whole days passed. Meanwhile the town was in a tumult with swarm after swarm of new troops. The militia drank from morning till night, walking along the streets, they raised quarrels and disputes with officers of foreign levy. The regular soldiers, feeling also the reins of discipline relaxed, indulged in eating, drinking, and play. Every day there were new guests. Consequently new feasts and amusements with the young women of Zbaraj. The troops crammed every street, were stationed too in the neighboring villages. And what a variety of horses, arms, uniforms, plumes, chain armor, and steel caps, uniforms of various provinces. It seemed like a general carnival to which half the commonwealth had come. At one moment dashes in a carriage of some magnate, gilt or purple, drawn by six or eight plumed horses, ahead of it outriders in Hungarian or German liveries. Attending it household genissaries, Cossacks or Tartars. At another some legionaries appear glittering in velvet or satin without armor, and thrust apart the crowds with their Anatolian or Persian steeds. The plumes of their caps and brooches at their necks are glittering with brilliants and rubies, but all make way for them in sign of respect. Here before a balcony stands an officer of the country infantry, with fresh, bright collar, a long staff in his hand, pride in his face, a village heart in his breast. Farther on glitter the rising helmets of the dragoons, the caps of the German infantry, lynx-skin caps of the militia, servants on errands squirm about as if in hot water. Here and there the streets are packed with wagons, in one place the wagons enter, squeaking mercilessly, every place is full of shouts, and cries of, out of the road. Curses of servants, disputes, fights, neighing of horses. The narrower streets are packed to such a degree with hay and straw that it is impossible to squeeze through. Amidst this multitude of bright uniforms glittering with all the colors of the rainbow, amidst velvet and cloths and shining satin glittering with brilliance. How strangely appear the regiments of the prince, haggard, tattered, emaciated, with rusty armor, faded and torn uniforms. Soldiers of the best regiments look like wandering minstrels, worse than the attendants from other commands. But all bow before these rags, before this rust and shabbiness, for they are the banners of heroes. War is a cruel mother. Like Saturn, she devours her own children, and whom she does not devour, she gnaws as a dog gnaws bones. Those faded uniforms signify stormy nights, marches amidst the rage of the elements or the burning of the sun. That rust on the steel means the unwiped blood of the man himself, of the enemy, or both together. So the Vishnyavetsky men had the first place everywhere. They were the storytellers in the taverns and the quarters, and others were listeners. Sometimes a spasm would seize one of the listeners, and striking his hands on his hips, he would say, May the bullet strike you, for you are devils, not men. But they would answer, Not ours the merit, but the leaders, whose like the round of the earth has not shown to this day. All feasts therefore ended in shouts, Vivat Yeremi. Vivat the prince Voivoda, the leader of leaders, the hetman of hetmans. The nobles, after they had drunk a while, would rush out on the streets and fire guns and muskets. The prince's men warned them that their freedom was but for a time, that a moment would come when the prince would take them in hand and enforce discipline such as they had never heard of. They took advantage of the opportunity all the more. Let us rejoice while we are free, they cried. When the time for obedience comes we will listen, for we have someone to obey who is not baby nor Latin nor featherbed. And the unfortunate Prince Dominic always came out worst, for the soldiers' tongues ground him to bran. They said that he prayed whole days, and in the evening hung to the handle of a mug, spat on his stomach, and with one eye open inquired, what is that? They said also that he took jalap at night, and that he saw as many battles as there were depicted on his carpet by Dutch art. No one defended him any longer, and no one pitied him. And those who were in open opposition to military discipline attacked him most savagely. But all were surpassed by Zagloba, with his satire and ridicule. He had already recovered from the pain in his back, and was now in his element. 
How much he ate and drank it is vain to describe, for the thing passes human belief. Crowds of nobles followed and surrounded him continually, and he related, talked, and bantered with those who entertained him. He looked down, as an old soldier, on those who were going to war, and said to them, with all the pride of experience. Gentlemen. You know as much about the hardships of war as a nun does of marriage. You have fresh clothes, and perfumed, the odor of which, though pleasant, I shall try in the first battle to keep on the lee side of me. The man who has not snuffed military garlic does not know how it draws tears. No one will bring you, gentlemen, your mug of hot beer of a morning, or your wine punch. The stomach will fall away from you, and you will shrink up like a pancake in the sun. Believe me, experience is the foundation of everything. I have been in many straits, and have captured more than one flag, but I must tell you, gentlemen, that none came to me with such difficulty as that at Konstantinov. The devil take those Zaporogians. Seven sweats, I tell you, gentlemen, came out of me before I seized the flagstaff. You may ask Pan Yen, who killed Berdabut. He saw it with his own eyes, and admired the deed. But now all you have to do is to shout in the ear of any Cossack Zagloba, and you will see what he will tell you. But why do I talk to you, who only know how to kill flies on the walls with the palms of your hands? But how was it, how, asked a crowd of young men. Well, gentlemen, do you want my tongue to get red-hot with turning in my mouth, like an axle in a wagon? Then you must pour wine around it, said the nobles. We might do that, answered Zagloba, and glad to find grateful listeners, he told them all, from the journey to Galitz and the flight from Rosloji, to the capture of the banner at Konstantinov. They listened with open mouths. Sometimes they murmured when, glorifying his own bravery, he presumed too much on their lack of experience, but he was invited and entertained each day in a new place. The time was passed, then, in pleasure and tumult at Zbaraj, till old Zatsvilikovsky and others of a more serious turn wondered that the prince suffered these feasts so long. But Yeremy remained in his own quarters. It was evident that he gave rein to the soldiers, so that all might taste every enjoyment before new conflicts. Skshetuski arrived now, and dropped as it were at once into a whirlpool of boiling water. He wanted rest in the circle of his companions. But still more did he wish to visit Bar, to go to his loved one, and forget all his past troubles, all his fears and sufferings, in her embrace. He appeared before the prince therefore without delay, to report on his expedition to Zaslav and obtain leave of absence. He found the prince changed beyond recognition, so that he was astonished at his appearance, and asked in his mind, Is this the chief whom I saw at Maknovka and Konstantinov? For there stood before him a man bent with the burden of care, with sunken eyes and shriveled lips, as if suffering from a grievous internal disease. When asked for his health he answered briefly and dryly that he was well, so the knight did not dare inquire further. Having made his report, he began immediately to ask for two months' absence from the squadron, that he might marry and take his wife to Skshetushevo. On hearing this the prince woke as it were from sleep. The expression of kindness habitual to him reappeared on his gloomy face, and embracing Pan Yen, he said. This is the end of your suffering. Go, go. May God bless you. I should like to be at your wedding myself, for I owe that to Kurtsevichavna, as the daughter of Vasily, and to you as a friend. But at this time it is impossible for me to move. When do you wish to start? Today, if I could, your highness. Then set out tomorrow. You cannot go alone. I will give you three hundred of Virchel's Tartars to bring her home in safety. You will go quickest with them, and you will need them, for bands of ruffians are wandering about. I will give you a letter to Andrei Patatsky, but before I write to him, before the Tartars come, and before you are ready, it will be tomorrow evening. As your highness commands. I make bold to request further that Volodyovsky and Podbipienta go with me. Very well. Come again tomorrow morning for my farewell and a blessing. I should like also to send your princess a present. She is of a noted family. You will both be happy, 
because you are worthy of each other. The knight knelt and embraced the knees of his beloved chief, who repeated several times. God make you happy. God make you happy. But come again tomorrow morning. Still the knight did not go. He lingered as if wishing to ask for something else. At last he broke out, Your Highness. And what more do you say? asked the prince, mildly. Pardon my boldness, but, my heart is cut, and from sorrow comes great boldness. What affects your highness? Does trouble weigh you down, or is it disease? The prince put his hand on Skshetuski's head. You cannot know this, said he, with sweetness in his voice. Come tomorrow morning. Skshetuski rose and went out with a straightened heart. In the evening old Zatsvilikovsky came to Skshetuski's quarters, and with him little Volodyovsky, Pan Longin, and Zagloba. They took their seats at the table, and Gentsian came into the room bearing a keg and glasses. In the name of father and son, cried Zagloba. I see that your man has risen from the dead. Gentsian approached, and embraced Zagloba's knees. I have not risen from the dead, for I did not die, thanks to you for saving me. Then Skshetuski added, and afterward he was in Bogan service. Oh, that fellow would find promotion in hell, said Zagloba. Then, turning to Gensian, he said, you couldn't have found much joy in that service, here is a thaler for pleasure. Thank you humbly, said Gensian. He, cried Pan Yen, is a perfect rogue. He bought plunder of the Cossacks. You and I couldn't purchase what he has now, even if you were to sell all your estates in Turkey. Is that true? asked Zagloba. Keep my thaler for yourself, and grow up, precious sapling, for if you'll not serve for a crucifix, you will serve at least for a gallows tree. The fellow has a good eye. Here Zagloba caught Gensian by the ear, and pulling it, continued, I like rogues, and I prophesy that you will come out a man, if you don't remain a beast. And how does your master Bogan speak of you, hi? Gensian smiled, for the words and caress flattered him, and answered, Oh, my master, when he speaks of you, he strikes fire with his teeth. Oh, go to the devil, cried Zagloba, in sudden anger. What are you raving about? Gensian went out. They began to discuss the journey of the morrow, and the great happiness which was awaiting Pan Yen. Mead soon improved Zagloba's humor. He began to talk to Skshetuski, and hint of christenings, and again of the passion of Pan Andrei Patotsky for the princess. Pan Longin sighed. They drank, and were glad with their whole souls. Finally the conversation touched upon military events and the prince. Skshetuski, who had not been in the camp for many days, asked. Tell me, gentlemen, what has happened to our prince? He is somehow another man, I cannot understand it. God has given him victory after victory. They passed him by in the command. What of that? The whole army is rushing to him now, so that he will be hetman without anyone's favor, and will destroy Melnitsky. But it is evident that he suffers, and suffers from something. Perhaps the gout is taking hold of him, said Zagloba, sometimes when it gets a pull at me in the great toe. I am despondent for three days at a time. I tell you, brothers, said Podbipienta, nodding his head, I haven't heard this myself from the priest Mukovetsky. But I heard that he told someone why the prince is so tormented, I do not say this myself. He is a kindly man, good, and a great warrior, why should I judge him? But since the priest says so, but do I know that it is so? Just look, gentlemen, at this Lithuanian, cried Zagloba. Am I not right in making fun of him, since he doesn't know human speech? What did you wish to say? You circle round and round, like a rabbit about her nest, but cannot come to a point. What did you really hear? asked Skshetuski. Well, since for that, they say that the prince has shed too much blood. He is a great leader, but knows no measure in punishment, and now sees, it seems, everything red, red in the daytime, red at night, as if a red cloud were surrounding him. Don't talk nonsense! shouted Zatsvilikovsky, with rage. 
those are old wives' tales. There was no better master for the rabble in time of peace, and as to his knowing no mercy for rebels, well, what of that? That is a merit, not an offence. What torments, what punishments, would be too great for those who have deluged the country in blood, who have given their own people captive to Tartars, who know neither God, king, country, nor authorities? Where will you show me such monsters as they, where such cruelties as they have perpetrated on women and little children? Where can you find such criminal wretches? For them the impaling stake and the gallows are too much. Tfu, tfu. You have an iron hand, but a woman's heart. I saw how you whined, when they were burning Pulion, that you would rather have killed him on the spot. But the prince is no old woman, he knows how to reward and how to punish. What is the use of telling me such nonsense? But I have said, father, that I don't know, explained Pan Langin. The old man puffed for a long time yet, and smoothing his milk-white hair, muttered, Red, hum. Red, that's news. In the head of him who invented that it is green, and not red. A moment of silence followed, but through the windows came the uproar of the reveling nobles. Little Volodyovsky broke the silence reigning in the room. Well, father, what do you think can be the matter with our prince? Hum, said the old man, I am not his confidant, therefore I do not know. He is thinking of something, he is struggling with himself, a hot battle of some kind, it cannot be otherwise, and the greater the soul, the fiercer the torture. The old knight was not mistaken. For in that same hour the prince, the leader, the conqueror, lay in the dust in his own quarters, before the crucifix, and was fighting one of the most desperate battles of his life. The guards at the castle of Zberage called out midnight, but Yeremy was still conversing with God and with his own lofty soul. Reason, conscience, love of country, pride, perception of his own power and great destiny, were turned into combatants within his breast, and fought a stubborn battle with one another. From which his breast was bursting, his head was bursting, and pain contorted all his limbs. Now, in spite of the primate, the chancellor, the senate, the generals, against the will of the government, the regular soldiers, the nobles, the foreign troops in private service. We're going over to that conqueror, in one word, the whole commonwealth was placing itself in his hands, taking refuge under his wings, committing its fortune to his genius. And in the person of its choicest sons was crying, Save, for you alone can save. In one month or in two there will be at Zberage one hundred thousand warriors, ready for a struggle to the death with the serpent of civil war. Here pictures of a future surrounded with light immeasurable, of glory and power, began to pass before the eyes of the prince. Those who wish to pass him by and subdue him are trembling, and he takes those iron legions and leads them into the steppes of the Ukraine. To victories and triumphs such as history has not yet known. The prince feels in himself corresponding power, and from his shoulders wings shoot forth like the wings of the archangel Michael. And at that moment he turns into such a giant that the whole castle, all Zberage, all Russia, cannot contain him. As God lives, he will rub out Melnitsky, he will trample the rebellion, he will bring back peace to the fatherland. He sees extended plains, legions of troops, he hears the roar of artillery. A battle! A battle! Victory unheard of, unparalleled! Legions of bodies, hundreds of banners, cover the bloodstained steppe, and he tramples on the body of Melnitsky, and the trumpets sound victory, and that sound flies from sea to sea. The prince rises, rushes up, extends his hands to Christ, around whose head is a mild purple light. Oh, Christ, Christ, he cries, thou knowest, thou sayest that I can. Tell me that I should do this. But Christ hung his head on his breast, and was as silent, as sorrowful as if he had been crucified the moment before. To thee be the praise, cried the prince. Non mihi, non mihi, said nomini tua de glorium. To the glory of the faith of the Church and of all Christianity. Oh, Christ, Christ! And a new image opened before the eyes of the hero. That career was not ended by the victory over Melnitsky. 
The prince, having destroyed the rebellion, grows strong on its body. He becomes gigantic in power. Legions of Cossacks are joined to legions of Poles, and he goes farther, strikes the Crimea, reaches the terrible dragon in his den. He erects the cross where hitherto bells had never called the faithful to prayer. He will go also to those lands which the princes Vishniavetsky have already trampled with the hoofs of their horses, and will extend the boundaries of the commonwealth, and with them the church. To the remotest corners of the earth. Where then is the limit to this impetus, where the bounds to this glory, power, and strength? There are none whatever. The pale light of the moon falls into the chamber of the castle, but the clock beats a late hour, and the cocks are crowing. It will soon be day. But will it be a day in which with the sun in heaven a new sun will shine upon earth? Yes, it will. The prince would be a child and not a man if he did not do this, if for any reasons whatever he drew back before the voice of these destinies. Now he feels a certain calm, which the merciful Christ had evidently poured on him, praise to him for that. His mind has become more sober. He takes in more easily too with the eyes of his soul the condition of the country and all its affairs. The policy of the Chancellor and those magnates in Warsaw, as well as of the Voivoda of Bratslav, is evil, and destructive for the country. To trample the Zaporoji first, and squeeze an ocean of blood out of it, break it, annihilate it, bend, and conquer, and then only acknowledge that everything is finished, to restrain all oppression. To introduce order, peace, being able to kill, to restore to life, that was the only path worthy of that great, that lordly commonwealth. It might have been possible perhaps to choose another path long before, but not now. What in truth could negotiations lead to then? Armed legionaries stand against one another in thousands. And even if negotiations were concluded, what power could they have? No, no. Those are dream visions, shadows, a war extended over whole ages, a sea of tears and blood for the future. Let them take the only course which is great, noble, full of power, and he will wish and ask for nothing more. He will settle again in Lubny, and will wait quietly till the terrible trumpets call him to action again. Let them take it? But who? The Senate? The Stormy Diet? The Chancellor? the primate, or the commanders. Who, besides him, understands this great idea, and who can carry it out? If such a man can be found, it is well. But where is he? Who has the power? He alone, no one else. To him the nobles come, to him the armies gather, in his hand is the sword of the commonwealth, but the commonwealth when the king is on the throne. But now when there is no king the will of the people rules. It is the supreme law, expressed not only in the diets, not only through deputies, the senate, and chancellors, not only through written laws and manifestos. But still more powerfully, more emphatically, more definitely, by action. And who rules in action? The knightly estate. And this knightly estate is assembling at Zberage, and says to him, You are the leader. The whole commonwealth without voting gives him authority by the power of events, and repeats, you are the leader. And should he draw back? What appointment does he wish besides? From whom is he to expect it? Is it from those who are endeavouring to ruin the commonwealth and to conquer him? Why should he, why should he? Is it because when panic seized upon all, when the hetmans went into captivity, and the armies were lost, magnates hid themselves in their castles. And the Cossack put the foot on the breast of the commonwealth, he alone pushed away that foot and raised from the dust the fainting head of that mother. Sacrificed for her everything, life, fortune, saved her from shame, from death, he the conqueror. Let him who has rendered more service, take the power. Let it rest in the hands of the man to whom it belongs more of right. He will resign that burden willingly, and say to God and the commonwealth, Let thy servant depart in peace. For he is wearied, greatly weakened, and besides he is sure that neither the memory of him nor his grave will disappear. But if there is no such person, he would be doubly and trebly a child and not a man if he should resign that power, 
that bright path, that brilliant, immense future. In which lies the salvation of the commonwealth, its power, glory, and happiness. And why should he? The prince raised his head again proudly, and his flaming glance fell on Christ. But Christ hung his head on his breast, and remained in silence as painful as if they had crucified him the moment before. Why should he? The hero pressed his heated temples with his hands. Maybe there is an answer. What is the meaning of those voices which amidst the golden rainbow visions of glory, amidst the thunder of coming victories, amidst the forebodings of grandeur, of power? Call out so mercilessly to his soul, O, oh, halt, unfortunate one! What means that unrest which goes through his breast like the shudder of alarm? What means it that when he shows himself most clearly and convincingly that he ought to take the power, something there in the depths of his conscience whispers, you deceive yourself? Pride misleads you, Satan promises you the glories of the kingdom? And again a fearful struggle began in the soul of the prince. Again he was carried away by a whirlwind of alarms, uncertainty, and doubts. What are the nobles doing who join him instead of the commanders? Trampling on law. What is the army doing? Violating discipline. And is he, a citizen, is he, a soldier, to stand at the head of lawlessness? Is he to cover it with his own dignity? Is he to give an example of insubordination, arbitrariness, disregard of law, and all merely to receive power two months earlier? For if Prince Karl shall be elected to the throne, power will not pass him by. Is he to give such a fearful example to succeeding ages? For what will happen? Today Prince Yeremy acts in this way. Tomorrow, Konyetspolsky, Patotsky Ferlay, Zamoyski, or Lubomirsky. And if each one, without reference to law and discipline, acts according to his own ambition. If the children follow the example of their fathers and grandfathers, what future is before that unhappy country? The worms of arbitrariness, disorder, self-seeking have so gnawed the trunk of that commonwealth, that under the axe of civil war the rotten wood is scattered, the dry limbs fall from the tree. What will happen when those whose duty it is to guard and save it as the apple of the eye put fire under it? What will happen then? Oh, Jesus, Jesus! Melnitsky too shields himself with the public good, and does nothing else, still he rises up against law and authority. A shudder passed through the prince from his feet to his head. He wrung his hands. Am I to be another Melnitsky, O Christ? But Christ hung his head on his breast, and was as painfully silent as if crucified the moment before. The prince struggled on. If he should assume power, and the chancellor, the senate, and the commanders should proclaim him a rebel, then what would happen? Another civil war? And then the question. Is Melnitsky the greatest and most terrible enemy of the commonwealth? More than once she has been invaded by still greater powers. When 200,000 armored Germans marched at Grunwald on the regiments of Yagello, and when at Kodum half Asia appeared in the fight, destruction seemed still nearer. And what had become of these hostile powers? No, the Commonwealth is not in danger from wars, and wars will not be her destruction. But why, in view of such victories, of such reserved power, of such glory, is she, who crushed the Knights of the Cross and the Turks? So weak and incompetent that she is on her knees before one Cossack, that her neighbors are seizing her boundaries, that nations are ridiculing her, that no one listens to her voice. Or regards her anger, and that all are looking forward to her destruction. Ah! It is specifically the pride and ambition of magnates, each one acting by himself, self-will is the cause of it. The worst enemy is not Melnitsky, but internal disorder, waywardness of the nobles, weakness and insubordination of the army, uproar of the diets, brawls, disputes, confusion, weakness. Self-seeking, and insubordination, insubordination, above all. The tree is rotting and weakening from the heart. Soon will men see how the first storm will throw it, but he is a parricide who puts his hand to such work. Cursed be he and his children to the tenth generation. Go then, O conqueror of Nimirov, Pogrebish, Maknovka, Konstantinov, 
go, Prince Voivoda, go, snatch command from leaders, trample upon law and authority. Give an example to posterity how to rend the entrails of the mother. Terror, despair, and fright were reflected in the face of the prince. He screamed terribly, and seizing himself by the hair, fell in the dust before the crucifix. The prince repented, and beat his worthy head on the stone pavement, and from his breast struggled forth the dull voice. O oh God, be merciful to me a sinner. O oh God, be merciful to me a sinner. God, be merciful to me a sinner. The rosy dawn was already in the sky, and then came the golden sun and lighted the hall. In the cornices the chattering of sparrows and swallows began. The prince rose and went to rouse his attendant Jelensky, who was sleeping on the other side of the door. Run, said he, to the orderlies, and tell them to summon to me from the castle and the town the colonels of the regular army and of the militia. Two hours later the hall began to be filled with the mustached and bearded forms of warriors. Of the prince's people there came old Zatsvilikovsky, Polyanovsky, Pan Yen with Zagloba, Vertzel, Magnitsky, Volodyovsky, Vershal, Ponyatovsky, almost all the officers to the ensigns, except Kushal, who was in Podolia on a reconnaissance. From the regular army came Asinsky and Karitsky. Many of the more distinguished nobles were unable to rise from their featherbeds so early. But no small number, even of these, were assembled, among them personages of various provinces, from castellans to sub-chamberlains. Murmurs and conversation resounded, and there was a noise as in a hive, but all eyes were turned to the door through which the prince was to come. All grew silent as the prince entered. His face was calm and pleasant, only his eyes reddened by sleeplessness, and his pinched features testified of the recent struggle. But through that calm and even sweetness appeared dignity and unbending will. Gentlemen, said he, last night I communed with God and my own conscience as to what I should do. I announce therefore to you, and do you announce to all the knightly order, that for the sake of the country and that harmony needful in time of defeat, I put myself under the commanders. A dull silence reigned in the assembly. In the afternoon of that day, in the court of the castle three hundred of Virchel's Tartars stood ready to journey with Pan Yen. And in the castle the prince was giving to the officers of the army a dinner which at the same time was a farewell feast to our knight. He was seated therefore by the prince as the bridegroom. And next to him sat Zagloba, for it was known that his daring management had saved the bride from mortal peril. The prince was in good spirits, for he had cast the burden from his heart. He raised the goblet to the success of the future couple. The walls and windows trembled from the shouts of those present. In the anteroom was a bustle of servants, among whom Genzian had the lead. Gentlemen, said the prince, let this third goblet be for posterity. It's a splendid stock. God grant that the apples may not fall far from the tree. From this falcon may noble falcon at spring. Success to them. Success to them. In thanks, cried Pan Yen, emptying an enormous goblet of Malmozy. Success to them. Success to them. Cressite et multiplicamini. You ought to furnish half a squadron, said old Zatsvilikovsky, laughing. Oh, he will fill the army entirely. I know him, said Zagloba. The nobles roared with laughter. Wine rose to their heads. Everywhere were to be seen flushed faces, moving mustaches, and the good feeling was increasing every moment. Just then at the threshold of the hall appeared a gloomy figure, covered with dust, and in view of the table, the feast, and the gleaming faces, it stopped at the door as if hesitating to enter. The prince saw it first, wrinkled his brows, shaded his eyes, and said. But who is there? Ah, that is Kushal. From the expedition. What news do you bring? Very bad, your highness. Said the young officer, with a strange voice. Suddenly silence reigned in the assembly, as if someone had put it under a spell. The goblets raised to the lips remained halfway. All eyes were turned to Kushal, on whose wearied face pain was depicted. It would have been better had you not spoken, 
since I am joyful at the cup, said the prince. But since you have begun, speak to the end. Your Highness, I too should prefer not to be an owl, for these tidings halt on my lips. What has happened? Speak. Bar is taken. Chapter 34 On a certain calm night a band of horsemen, about twenty in number, moved along the right bank of the Valadinka in the direction of the Dniester. They went very slowly, the horses almost dragging one foot after the other. A short distance in front of the others rode two, as it were an advance guard. But evidently there was no cause for guarding or being on the watch, since for a whole hour they had been talking together instead of looking at the country about them. Reining in their horses every little while, they looked at the party behind, and one of them called out at this moment, slowly there. Slowly. And the others went still more slowly, scarcely moving. At last the party, pushing out from behind the eminence which had covered them with its shadow, entered the open country, which was filled with moonlight. And then it was possible to understand the reason of their careful gait. In the center of the caravan two horses abreast carried a swing tied to their saddles, and in this swing lay the form of some person. The silver rays lighted its pale face and closed eyes. Behind the swing rode ten armed men. From their lances without bannerets, it was evident that they were Cossacks. Some led packhorses, others rode by themselves. But while the two riders in front seemed to pay not the least attention to the country about them, those behind glanced around on every side with unquiet and alarm. And still the region seemed to be a perfect desert. Silence was unbroken save by the noise of the horse's hoofs and the calling of one of the riders in front, who from time to time repeated his warning, slowly. Carefully. At length he turned to his companion. Horpana, is it far yet? he inquired. The companion called Horpana, who in reality was a gigantic young woman disguised as a Cossack, looked at the starry heavens and replied. Not far. We shall be there before midnight. We shall pass the enemy's mound, the Tartar Valley, and right there is the Devil's Glen. Oh, it would be terrible to pass that place between midnight and cockcrow. It's possible for me, but for you it would be terrible, terrible. The first rider shrugged his shoulders and said, I know the devil is a brother to you, but there are weapons against the devil. Devil or not, there are no weapons, answered Horpana. If you, my falcon, had looked for a hiding place through the whole world for your princess, you could not have found a better. No one will pass here after midnight unless with me, and in the glen no living man has yet put foot. If anyone wants soothsaying, he waits in front of the glen till I come out. Never fear. Neither Pole nor Tartar will get there, nor anyone, anyone. The Devil's Glen is terrible, you will see for yourself. Let it be terrible, but I say that I shall come as often as I like. If you come in the daytime. Whenever I please. And if the devil stands in my road, I'll seize him by the horns. Oh, Bogan, Bogan. Oh, Dantsovna, Dantsovna, don't trouble yourself about me. Whether the devil takes me or not is no concern of yours, but I tell you this, take counsel with your devils when you please, if only no harm comes to the princess. But if anything happens to her, then neither devils nor vampires will tear you from my grasp. Oh, they tried to drown me once when I lived with my brother on the dawn, another time the executioner was going to cut my head off in Yampol, I didn't care for that. But this is another thing. I will guard her out of friendship for you, so that no spirit will make a hair of her head fall, and in my hands she is safe from men. She won't escape you. And, you owl, if you talk this way, why do you prophesy evil? Why do you hoot in my ear, pull at her side? Pull at her side? It was not I that spoke, but the spirits. But now perhaps there is a change. I will prophesy for you tomorrow on the water of the mill wheel. On the water everything is clearly visible, but it is necessary to look a long time, you will see yourself. But you are a furious dog, if the truth is told, you are angry and wish to kill one. Conversation was interrupted, 
and only the striking of the horse's feet against the stones was heard, and certain sounds from the direction of the river, like the chirping of crickets. Bogan paid not the least attention to these sounds, though they might astonish one in the night. He raised his face to the moon and fell into deep thought. Horpina, said he, after a while. What? You are a witch, you must know whether or not it is true that there is an herb of some kind that whoever drinks of it must fall in love, Lubistka, is it? Yes, Lubistka. But unfortunately for you, Lubistka will not help. If the princess hadn't fallen in love with someone else, then you might give it to her, but if she is in love, do you know what will happen? What? She will love the other man still more. Oh, perish with your Lubistka. You know how to prophesy evil, but you don't know how to help. Listen to me. I know other herbs which grow from the earth, whoever drinks them will be like a stump two days and two nights, knowing nothing of the world. I will give her those herbs, and then. The Cossack shuddered in his saddle, and fixed on the witch his eyes gleaming in the darkness. What are you croaking about? he asked. Then you can, said the witch, and burst into loud laughter like the neighing of a mare. This laughter resounded with ill omened echo through the windings of the glen. Wretch, said Bogan. Then the light of his eyes went out gradually, he dropped again into meditation, and at length began to speak as if to himself. No, no. When we captured Bar, I rushed first to the monastery, so as to defend her from the drunken crowd and smash the head of any man who should come near her. But she stabbed herself with a knife, and now has no consciousness of God's world. If I lay a finger on her, she will stab herself again, or jump into the river if you are not careful, ill-fated that I am. You are at heart a pole, not a Cossack, if you will not constrain the girl in Cossack fashion. That I were a pole, that I were a pole! cried Bogan, grasping the cap on his head with both hands, for pain had seized him. The Polish woman must have bewitched you, muttered Horpina. Ai! If she has not, answered he, sadly, may the first bullet not pass me, may I finish my wretched life on the impaling stake. I love one in the world, and that one does not love me. Fool! cried Horpina, with anger, but you have got her. Hold your tongue, cried he, with rage. If she lays hands on herself, then what? I'll tear you apart and then myself. I'll break my head against a rock, I'll gnaw people like a dog. I would have given my soul for her, Cossack fame. I would have fled beyond the Jagerlik from the regiments to the end of the earth, to live with her, to die at her side. That's what I would have done. But she stabbed herself with a knife, and through whom? Through me. She stabbed herself with a knife. Do you hear? That's nothing. She will not die. If she dies, I will nail you to the door. You have no power over her. I have none, I have none. Would she had stabbed me, it would have been better had she killed me. Silly little Pole. She should have been kind to you. Where will she find your superior? Arrange this, and I will give you a pot of ducats and another of pearls. In bar we took booty not a little, and before that we took booty too. You are as rich as Prince Jeremy, and full of fame. They say Cravonos himself is afraid of you. The Cossack waved his hand. What is that to me if my heart is sore? And silence came again. The bank of the river grew wider and more desolate. The pale light of the moon lent fantastic forms to the trees and the rocks. At last Horpina said. This is the enemy's mound. We must ride together. Why? It is a bad place. They reined in their horses, and after a while the party coming on behind joined them. Bogan rose in the stirrups and looked into the cradle. Is she asleep? he asked. She is sleeping as sweetly as an infant, answered an old Cossack. I gave her a sleeping dose, said the witch. Slowly, carefully. Said Bogan, fixing his eyes on the sleeper, don't wake her. The moon is looking straight into her face, my dear one. 
It shines quietly, it will not wake her, whispered one of the Cossacks. The party moved on. Soon they arrived at the enemy's mound. It was a low hill lying close to the river and sloping like a round shield on the earth. The moon covered the place entirely with its beams, lighting up the white stones scattered over the whole extent of it. In some spots they lay singly. In others they formed heaps, as it were fragments of buildings, ruined castles, and churches. Here and there stone slabs stuck up, planted endwise in the earth like gravestones in a cemetery. The whole mound was like a great ruin, and perhaps in other ages, long before the days of the Yagellons, human life flourished upon it. Now not only the mound but the whole neighborhood as far as Rashkov was an empty waste, in which wild beasts alone found refuge, and in the night evil spirits held their dances. The party had scarcely reached half the height of the mound, when the light breeze which had been blowing hitherto changed into a regular whirlwind, which began to encircle the mound with a certain gloomy, ominous whistling. And then it appeared to the Cossacks that among those ruins were heard heavy sighs, issuing as it were from straightened breasts, sad groans, laughter, wailing, and puling of infants. The whole mound began to be alive, to call with various voices. From behind the stones lofty dark figures seemed to look, shadows of strange forms glided along quietly among the slabs. Far off in the darkness gleamed lights like the eyes of wolves. Finally, from the other end of the mound, from among the thickest heaps and piles, was heard a low guttural howling, to which other howling responded at once. Vampires! whispered a young Cossack, turning to the old Assal. No, werewolves, answered the old Assal, in a still lower voice. O oh Lord, have mercy on us! said others in terror, removing their caps and crossing themselves devoutly. The horses began to point their ears forward and snort. Horpina, riding at the head of the party, muttered unintelligible words, as it were a sort of satanic paternoster. When they had arrived at the other end of the mound, she turned and said, well, it is over. We are safe now. I had to keep them back with a charm, for they were very hungry. A sigh of relief came from every breast. Bogan and Horpina rode ahead again, but the Cossacks, who a little while before had held their breaths, began to whisper and talk. Each one remembered what had happened to him when he met ghosts or werewolves. We couldn't have passed without Horpina, said one. She is a powerful witch. And our Adaman does not fear even the werewolf. He didn't look, didn't listen, only turned toward his princess. If what happened to me happened to him, he wouldn't have been so free from danger, said the old Asal. And what happened to you, father of Savuyu? Once, while riding from Riamentarovka to Gulapoli, I passed near some mounds at night, and I saw something jump from a grave behind me on the saddle. I looked. It was a little child, blue and pale. Evidently the Tartars had taken it captive with its mother and it had died without baptism. Its eyes were burning like candles, and it wailed and wailed. It jumped from the saddle to my neck, and I felt it biting me behind the ear. Oh Lord, save us! It is a vampire. I had served long in Wallachia, where there are more vampires than people but where there are weapons against them. I sprang from the horse and thrust my dagger into the ground. Avant! Disappear! And it groaned, seized the hilt of the dagger, and slipped down along the edge under the grass. I cut the ground in the form of a cross and rode off. Are there so many vampires in Wallachia, father? Every other Wallachian after death becomes a vampire, and the Wallachian vampires are the worst of all. They call them Brukalaki. And who is stronger, father, the werewolf or the vampire? The werewolf is stronger, but the vampire is more stubborn. If you are able to get the upper hand of the werewolf, he will serve you, but vampires are good for nothing except to follow blood. The werewolf is always adamant over the vampires. And Horpina commands the werewolves? Yes, surely. As long as she lives she will command them. If she had not power over them, then the Adaman would not give her his cuckoo, for werewolves thirst for maiden's blood above all. 
but I have heard that they have no approach to an innocent soul. To a soul they have not, but to a body they have. Oh, it would be a pity. She is a beauty. Blood and milk. Our father knew what to take in bar. Avsevuyu smacked his tongue. There is no denying it, she is a golden pole. But I am sorry for her, said a young Cossack. When we were putting her in the swing she clasped her white hands and begged, saying, Kill me. Do not ruin me, unfortunate one. No harm will come to her. Further conversation was interrupted by the approach of Horpina. Hey! Young men, said the witch, this is Tartar Valley, but don't fear, it is terrible here only one night in the year. Right after it is the Devil's Glen, and then my place. In fact, the howling of dogs was soon heard. The party entered the mouth of the glen, running at right angles to the river, and so narrow that four horses could hardly enter it abreast. At the bottom of this chasm flowed a rivulet, changing color in the light of the moon like a snake, and running quickly to the river. But as the party pushed on, the precipitous and jagged walls receded from each other, leaving a rather roomy, slightly ascending valley, enclosed at each side with cliffs. The place was covered here and there with lofty trees. No wind was blowing. Long, dark shadows of the trees lay on the ground, and in the spaces flooded with the light of the moon certain white, round, or prolonged objects gleamed sharply. In which the Cossacks recognized with terror the skulls and leg bones of men. They looked around therefore with distrust, marking their foreheads from time to time with the cross. Soon a light glimmered in the distance between the trees, and at that same time two terrible dogs ran up, enormous, black, with gleaming eyes, barking and howling at the sight of the men and horses. At the voice of Horpina they stopped, however, and began to run around the riders, sneezing and panting. They are not what they seem, whispered the Cossacks. They are not dogs, said old Avsevuyu, in a voice betraying deep conviction. Just then a cottage became visible behind the trees, back of it a stable, farther and higher up another dark building. The cottage appeared strong and well built, and in its windows a light was shining. This is my dwelling, said Horpina to Bogan, and up there is the mill which grinds grain for us. And I tell fortunes from the water on the wheel. I will tell yours. Your princess will live in the best chamber. But if you wish to ornament the walls, we can remove her to the other side immediately. Stop and dismount. The party halted, and Horpina began to cry, Cherimus, I say. Cherimus. A figure holding a bunch of burning pitch pine came out in front of the cottage, and raising the torch, began to look in silence at those present. It was an old man, an ugly creature, small, quite a dwarf, with a flat, square face, and slanting eyes, like cracks. What sort of devil are you? asked Bogan. Don't ask him, said the giantess. His tongue is cut out. Come nearer and listen, continued the witch, it is better, perhaps, to carry the princess to the mill. The Cossacks will fit up her chamber, and drive nails that would wake her up. The Cossacks, having dismounted, began to untie the swing carefully. Bogan watched over everything with the greatest care and carried the head of the swing himself when it was taken to the mill. The dwarf lighted the way in advance with the torch. The princess, put to sleep by Horpina with a decoction of somniferous herbs, did not wake, her eyelids merely trembled a little from the light of the torch. Her face appeared alive from those red gleams. Perhaps, also, wonderful dreams soothed the girl, for she smiled sweetly during the journey, which was like a funeral. Bogan looked at her, and it appeared to him that his heart would break the ribs in his breast. My darling, my cuckoo, whispered he quietly. And the terrible though beautiful face of the chief became mild, and flamed with the great light of love, which had seized him, and was seizing him every moment the more, as fire. Forgotten by the traveller, seizes the wild step. Horpina, walking at his side, said, when she wakes from this sleep she will be well. Her wound will heal, and she will be well. Glory be to God. Glory be to God, 
answered the chief. The Cossacks began to loosen from six horses great packs in front of the cottage, and to take out the booty, rich stuffs, carpets, and other valuables taken at bar. A good fire was kindled in the room, and when some brought in new tapestry, others put it up to the wooden walls of the room. Bogan not only thought of a safe cage for his bird, but he determined so to furnish it that captivity should not seem unendurable. He came soon from the mill and directed the work himself. The night was passing away, and the moon had already removed its pale light from the summits of the cliffs. In the cottage were still heard the muffled blows of hammers. The simple room had become more like a chamber, when the walls were covered with drapery and the floor carpeted. The sleeping princess was brought back and placed on soft cushions. Then all grew silent, except that in the stable for some time yet bursts of laughter were heard in the stillness like the neighing of a horse, the young which was wrestling with the Cossacks. Giving them fisticuffs and kisses. Chapter 35 The sun was high when the princess opened her eyes from sleep on the following day. Her glance rested first on the ceiling, and remained there long, than it took in the whole room. In her breast returning consciousness struggled still with the remnants of sleep and visions. On her face were depicted wonder and disquiet. Where is she, whence did she come, and in whose power is she? Is she dreaming yet, or is she awake? What means the splendor with which she is surrounded? What has happened to her? At that moment the awful scenes of the taking of Bar rose before her as if in life. She remembered everything, the slaughter of thousands of nobles, townspeople, priests, nuns, and children. The faces of the mob smeared in blood, their necks and heads wound around with the still steaming entrails, the drunken uproar, that day of judgment for the ruined town. Finally the appearance of Bogan and her seizure. She remembered also how in a moment of despair she had fallen upon a knife held by her own hand, and the cold sweat stood on her temples. It was evident that the knife slipped along her shoulder, for she suffers only a little pain. But immediately she feels that she is alive, that strength and health are returning to her, and finally she remembers that she has been born a long time somewhere in a swing. But where is she now? In some castle, is she saved, rescued, out of danger? And again her eyes wandered around the room. The windows in it were small, square, as in a peasant's cottage, and the world outside could not be seen through them, for instead of panes opound glass, they were fitted with pieces of white membrane. Was it really a peasant's cottage? No, for the unbounded luxury within bears witness against that. Instead of a ceiling over her head was an enormous piece of purple silk on which were embroidered golden stars and a moon, the walls were entirely hung in brocade. On the floor lay a many-colored carpet, covered as with living flowers. In front of the fireplace was a Persian rug. Golden fringes, silks, velvets, everywhere, from the walls of the ceiling to the pillows on which her head is reposing. The bright light of day, penetrating the window membranes, lighted up the interior, but was lost in the purple, dark violet and sapphire colors of the velvet, forming a kind of enchanted rainbow darkness. The princess marveled, did not believe her eyes. Was this some witchery, or had not the troops of Yeremy rescued her from the hands of Cossacks and put her away in one of the prince's castles? She clasped her hands. Oh, holy most pure! Grant that the first face to appear at the door shall be the face of my guardian and friend. Then through the heavy fringed bed curtain came to her the flowing sound of a distant lute, and at the same time a voice began to accompany with the familiar song. Oh! This loving! is worse than sickness. Sickness I can live through. And grow well again. But my faithful loving. I cannot part with while I live. The princess raised herself, and the longer she listened the wider stared her eyes from terror. At last she screamed and fell as if dead on the cushions. She recognized the voice of Bogan. Her scream passed evidently through the walls of the chamber, for after a while the heavy curtain rustled, and the chief himself appeared on the threshold. Kurtsevichovna covered her eyes with her hands, and her whitened and quivering lips repeated, as if in a fever, Jesus, Mary. 
Jesus, Mary. And yet the sight which so terrified her would have rejoiced the eyes of more maidens than one, for there was a blaze from the apparel and the countenance of the young hero. The diamond buttons of his uniform glittered like stars in heaven, his dagger and sabre were covered with precious stones. His coat of silver cloth and his scarlet contouche doubled the beauty of his brunette face. And he stood before her, lithe, dark-browed, magnificent, the beauty of all the Ukraine heroes. But his eyes were in mist, like stars curtained by haze, and he looked on her with obedience. And seeing that fear did not leave her face, he began to speak in a low, sad voice. Have no fear, princess. Where am I? Where am I? asked she, looking at him through her fingers. In a safe place, far from war. Fear not, my dear soul. I brought you here from Bar, so that no harm might come to you from man or war. The Cossacks spared no one in Bar, you alone came out alive. What are you doing here? Why do you pursue me? I pursue you. Oh, merciful God! And the chief extended his arms as a man who is confronted by a great injustice. I fear you terribly, she said. And why do you fear? If you say so, I shall not move from the door. I am your slave, I will sit here at the door and look into your eyes. Evil I do not wish you. Why do you hate me? Oh, merciful God! You thrust a knife into your body at the sight of me, though you have known me long, and knew that I was going to defend you. You know I am not a stranger to you, but a heartfelt friend, and you stabbed yourself with a knife. The pale cheeks of the princess were suddenly suffused with blood. I preferred death to disgrace, and I swear, if you do not respect me, I will kill myself, even if I were to lose my soul. The eyes of the maiden flashed fire, and the chief knew that there was no trifling with the princely blood of the Kurtsevichi. For in her frenzy she would carry out her threat, and a second time would point the knife with more success. He made no answer, therefore, merely advanced a couple of steps toward the window, and sitting on bench covered with gold brocade, hung his head. Silence lasted for a time. Be at rest, said he. While my head is clear, while Mother Gorelka does not heat my brain, you are for me like an image in the church. But since I found you in bar I have ceased to drink. Before that I drank and drank, drowning my sorrow with Mother Gorelka. What could I do? But now I take to my mouth neither sweet wine nor spirits. The princess was silent. I will look on you, he continued, comfort my eyes with your face, then go. Give me back my liberty, said she. But are you in captivity? You are mistress here. And where do you want to go? The Kurtsevichi have perished, fire has devoured villages and towns, the prince is not in Lubny, he is marching against Melnitsky and Melnitsky against him, war is everywhere, blood is flowing. Every place is filled with Cossacks and Tartars and soldiers. Who will have sympathy and respect for you? Who will defend you, if not I? The princess raised her eyes, for she remembered that there was another in the world who would give her protection, sympathy, and defense. But she would not speak his name, so as not to rouse the fierce lion. Deep sorrow therefore pressed her heart. Was he for whom her soul was yearning still alive? While in bar she knew that he was, for immediately after the departure of Zagloba she heard Skshetuski's name coupled with the victories of the terrible prince. But from that time how many days and nights had passed, how many battles might have been fought, how many perils have reached him. News of him could come to her then only through Bogan, of whom she neither wished nor dared to inquire. Her head then dropped on the cushions. Am I to remain a prisoner here? Asked she, with a groan. What have I done to you, that you follow me like misfortune? The Cossack raised his head, and began to speak so quietly that scarcely could he be heard. What have you done to me? I know not, but this I do know, that if I am misfortune to you, you too are misfortune to me. If I had not loved you, I should have been free as the wind in the field, free in heart and in soul, and full of glory as was Konashevich Sahedakni himself. 
Your face is my misfortune, your eyes are my misfortune, neither freedom is dear to me, nor Cossack glory. What were beauties to me, till from being a child you had grown to be a woman? Once I captured a galley with maidens the most beautiful, for they were on the way to the Sultan, and no one of them touched my heart. The Cossack brothers played with them. Then I ordered a stone to the neck of each, and into the water they went. I feared no man, I minded nothing. I went with war against the pagan. I took booty, and like a prince in his castle was I in the steppe. And today what am I? I sit here, I am a slave. I crave a kind word from you and cannot receive it. I have never heard it, even when your aunt and your cousins gave you to me. Oh, if you, girl, had been different to me, then what has come to pass would not have been. I should not have stricken down your cousins, I should not have joined fraternal hands with rebellion and peasants, but through you I have lost my mind. If you had wished to lead me anywhere, you could have led me where you liked, and I should have given you my blood, my soul. Now I am steeped in blood of nobles. But in old times I killed only Tartars, and brought you booty, that you might be clothed in gold and jewels like cherubim of the Lord. Why did you not love me, then? Oh, it is heavy and sad at my heart. I cannot live with you nor without you, nor far away nor near you, neither on the mountain nor in the valley, my dove, my precious heart. But forgive me that I came for you to Rosloji in Cossack style, with sabre and fire, but I was drunk with anger at the princes, and I drank Garelka on the way, unhappy outlaw. But afterward, when you escaped me, I howled like a dog, and my wounds tortured me, and I could not eat. I begged death to take me. And you want me to yield you now, to lose you a second time, my dove, my heart. The chief stopped, for his voice broke in his throat, and he began to groan. Helena's face grew red and pale by turns. The more of measureless love there was in Bogan's words, the greater the gulf which opened before her, bottomless, and without hope of rescue. The Cossack rested a while, regained self-command, and continued. Ask what you like. See how the room is decorated. This is mine, this is booty from Bar, which I brought for you on six horses. Ask what you wish, yellow gold, shining garments, bright jewels, willing slaves. I am rich, I have enough of my own, and Melnitsky will not spare treasures on me, and Krivonos will not spare them. You will be like Princess Vishnievetsky. I will win castles for you, give you half the Ukraine, for though I am a Cossack, not a noble, I am a Bunchik Adaman. Under me are ten thousand men, more than Prince Yeremy commands. Ask what you like, only not to flee from me, only stay with me and love me, O oh my dove. The princess raised herself on the cushions. She was very pale, but her sweet and marvelous face expressed such unbroken will, pride, and power that the dove was most like an eagle at that moment. If you are waiting for my answer, said she, then know that if I had even a lifetime to groan out in captivity with you, never, never should I love you, God be my aid. Bogan struggled with himself a moment. Do not tell me such things, said he, with a hoarse voice. Do not speak to me of your love, it brings me shame and offense. I am not for you. The chief rose. And for whom, then, are you, Princess Kurtsevichovna? And whose would you have been in bar but for me? Whoso saves my life to give me shame and captivity is my enemy, not my friend. And do you suppose that the peasants would have killed you? The thought is terrible. The knife would have killed me, but you wrenched it from me. And I will not give it up, for you must be mine, burst out the Cossack. Never. I prefer death. You must and will be. Never. Well, if you were not wounded, after what you have told me, I should send my Cossacks to Rashkov today and have a monk brought here, and tomorrow I should be your husband. Then what? It is a sin not to love your husband and fondle him. A.I. You high mighty lady, the love of a Cossack is an offense, an anger to you. And who are you that I am for you a peasant? Where are your castles and boyars and troops? 
At what are you angry, at what are you offended? I took you in war, you are a captive. If I were a peasant, I should teach you reason on the white shoulders with the whip, and without a priest would have enough of your beauty, if I were a peasant, not a knight. Angels of heaven, save me, whispered the princess. But in the meanwhile greater and greater fury rose to the face of Bogan, and anger seized him by the hair. I know, said he, why you're offended, why you resist me. You preserve for another your maiden modesty. But in vain, as I live, as I am a Cossack. Nakedness 15 The noble. The insincere, miserable Pole barely saw you, merely turned with you in the dance, death to him, and took you captive altogether. Then let the Cossack suffer, break his head. But I will reach this Pole, and I will order him torn out of his skin, will nail him up. Do you know that Melnitsky is marching on the Poles, and I go with him? And I will find your dove even under the ground, and when I return I will throw his head at your feet as a present. Helena did not hear the last words of the Ataman. Pain, anger, wounds, emotion, terror, took her strength, an immeasurable weakness came upon all her limbs, her eyes, and her thoughts grew dark, and she fell into a swoon. The chief stood some time, pale from anger, with foam on his lips. Then he saw the lifeless head hanging back powerless, and from his lips went out a roar almost unearthly. It is all over with her. Horpina! Horpina! And he threw himself on the floor. The giantess rushed into the room with all speed. What is the matter? Help! Help! cried Bogan. I have killed her, my soul, my light. What? Did you scold her? I have killed her, I have killed her, groaned he, and he wrung his hands over his head. But Horpina, approaching the princess, soon discovered that it was not death, but a deep faint, and putting Bogan outside the door, began to assist her. The princess opened her eyes after a time. My dear, there is nothing the matter with you, said the enchantress. You were frightened at him, I see, and darkness settled on you, but the darkness will pass and health will come. You are like a nut, my girl, you have longed to live in the world and enjoy happiness. Who are you? asked the princess, with a weak voice. I. Your servant, for he so ordered it. Where am I? In the devil's glen. A pure wilderness here, you will see no one but him. Do you live here? My farm is here. I am Dantsovna. My brother is a colonel under Bogan. He leads young heroes, and I stay here, and will care for you in this golden chamber. From a cottage it has become a bower, so that light gleams from it. He has brought all this for you. Helena looked at the lively face of the young woman, and it seemed to her full of sincerity. But will you be good to me? The white teeth of the young witch gleamed in a smile. I shall. Why shouldn't I? But do you be good also to the Ataman? He is a falcon, he is a glorious hero, he will. Here the witch bent to the ear of Helena, whispered something, then burst into laughter. Be off, screamed the princess. Chapter 36 Two days later in the morning Horpina sat with Bogan under the willow near the mill wheel, and looked at the water foaming on it. You will be careful of her, you will guard her, you will not let your eye off her, so that she shall never leave the glen. The glen has a narrow neck near the river, but there is space enough here. Order the neck to be filled with stones, and we shall be as if in the bottom of a jug. When I need to go out I shall find a way. How do you live here? Cherimus plants corn under the cliffs, cultivates grapes, and snares wild fowl. With what you have brought she will want nothing unless birds milk. Have no fear. She will not leave the glen and no one will know of her unless your men say she is here. I have made them swear silence. They are faithful fellows, they will say nothing, even if straps were torn from their skin. But you said yourself that people came here to you as to a soothsayer. Sometimes they come from Rashkov, and sometimes when they hear of me they come from God knows what places. But they stay at the river, no one enters the glen, for they are afraid. 
you saw the bones. These were people who wished to enter, their bones are lying around. Did you kill them? Whoever killed them, killed them. Those in search of soothsaying wait at the opening of the glen and I go to the wheel. What I see in the water, I tell them. I shall examine for you directly, but I don't know whether anything will be seen, for it does not always appear. If only you see nothing bad. If I see something bad, you will not go. And in that case it would be better not to go. I must. Melnitsky sent me a letter to Bar to return, and Krivonos ordered me. The Poles are marching on us now with great forces, so we must concentrate. When will you come back? I know not. There will be a great battle such as has not been yet. Either death to us or to the Poles. If they beat us, I will hide here, if we are victorious, I will come for my cuckoo and take her to Kiev. And if you perish? Being a witch, it is for you to tell. But if you perish? Once my mother bore me. Oh, Shaw. But what shall I do with the girl, twist her neck, or how? But touch her with your hand and I will have you drawn on a stake with oxen. The chief fell into gloomy thought. If I perish, tell her to forgive me. Ah, she is a thankless pole that for such love she does not love. If I were wooed in that way, I should not resist you. Saying this, Horpina nudged the chief in the side twice, showing all her teeth in laughter. Go to the devil, said the Cossack. Oh, be quiet. I know that you are not for me. Bogan looked into the foaming water on the wheel as if he wished himself to soothsay. Horpina, said he after a while. Well, what is it? When I have gone will she be sorry for me? If you are not willing to constrain her in Cossack fashion, then perhaps it is better for you to go. I will not, I cannot, I dare not. I know that she would die. Then maybe it is better for you to go. While she sees you she will not wish to know you, but when she has been a couple of months with me and Cherimus, you will be dearer to her. If she were well, I know what I should do. I should bring a priest from Rashkov and have a marriage celebrated, but now I am afraid, for if she were frightened, she would die. You have seen yourself. Leave us in peace. What do you want of a priest and a marriage? You are not a real Cossack. I want neither Pole nor Russian priest here. There are Dobruja Tartars in Rashkov, you want to get them on our shoulders too, and if you should bring them, how much of the princess would you see? What has got into your head? Go your way and come back. But look in the water and tell me what you see. Tell the truth and don't lie, even if you should see me dead. Dantsovna approached the mill stream and raised a gate holding back the water at the fall. All at once the swift current rushed with redoubled force, the wheel began to turn more swiftly, until at last it was covered with liquid dust. The foam, beaten fine, rolled under the wheel like boiling water. The witch bent her eyes into the boiling mass and seizing the tresses near her ears, began to cry. I call. I call. Appear. In the oaken wheel, in the white foam, in the clear mist, whether evil, whether good, appear. Bogan approached and sat at her side. His face denoted fear and feverish curiosity. I see. Screamed the witch. What do you see? The death of my brother. Two bullocks are drawing him on a stake. To the devil with your brother, muttered Bogan, who wished to know something else. For a time was heard only the thunder of the wheel whirling around in fury. Blue is my brother's head, how blue! The ravens are tearing it, said the witch. What else do you see? Nothing. Oh, how blue! I call. I call. In the oaken wheel, in the white foam, in the clear mist, appear. I see. What? A battle. The Poles are fleeing before the Cossacks. And I am pursuing? I see you too. You encounter a little knight. Her. 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 Be on your guard against the little knight. And the princess? 
she is not there. I see you again, and with you someone who is betraying you, your false friend. Bogan was devouring with his eyes at one instant the foam, at another Horpina. And at the same time he worked with his brain to aid the soothsaying. What friend? I don't see. I don't know whether old or young. Old, he must be old. Maybe he is old. I know who he is. He has betrayed me once already. An old noble with a blue beard and a white eye. Death to him. But he is not a friend of mine. He is lying in wait for you, I see again, stop. The princess is here too, she is in a crown, a white dress, above her a hawk. That is I. Maybe it is. A hawk, or a falcon. A hawk. That is I. Wait. All has vanished. In the oaken wheel, in the white foam, oh. Oh. Many soldiers, many Cossacks, oh, many, like trees in the forest or thistles in the steppes. And you are above all, they are bearing three bunchic standards before you. And the princess is with me? She is not, you are in the camp. The wheel roared till the whole mill trembled. Oh, how much blood, how much blood! How many corpses, wolves above them, ravens above them, plague above them! Corpses and corpses, far away nothing but corpses, nothing to be seen but blood. Suddenly a breath of wind whirled the mist from the wheel, and at the same time higher up above the mill appeared the deformed Cherimus with a bundle of wood on his shoulders. Cherimus, let down the sluice, cried the girl. When she had said this she went to wash her hands and face in the stream, and the dwarf stopped the water at once. Bogan sat in thought. He was roused first by the coming of Horpina. You saw nothing more, he asked. What appeared, appeared, I shall see nothing more. And you are not lying? By my brother's head, I spoke the truth. They were impaling him, drawing him on with oxen. I grieve for him. But death is written not for him alone. Oh, what bodies appeared! Never have I seen so many there will be a great war in the world. And you saw her with a hawk above her head? Yes. And was she in a wreath? In a wreath and a white robe. And how do you know that that hawk was I? I spoke to you of that young Polish noble, maybe it was he? The girl wrinkled her brows and grew thoughtful. No, said she after a while, shaking her head, if it had been the pole, it would have been an eagle. Glory to God! Glory to God! I will go now to the Cossacks to prepare the horses for the road. We go tonight. So you are going surely? Melnitsky has ordered, and Kravonos too. You know well that there will be a great war, for I read the same in Bar in a letter from Melnitsky. Bogan in reality could not read, but he was ashamed of it, he did not wish to pass for illiterate. Then go, said the witch. You are lucky, you will be Hetman. I saw three bunchucks above you as I see these fingers. And I shall be Hetman and marry the princess, I cannot take a peasant. You would talk differently with a peasant girl, but you are afraid of her. You should be a Pole. I am no worse. Bogan now went to the stable to the Cossacks, and Horpina set about preparing dinner. In the evening the horses were ready for the road, but the chief was in no hurry to depart. He sat on a roll of carpets in the chamber, with lute in hand, and looked on his princess, who had risen from the couch, but had thrust herself into the other corner of the room, and was repeating in silence the rosary without paying any heed to the chief, just as if he had not been in the room. He, on the contrary, followed with his eyes every movement of hers, caught with his ears every sigh, and knew not what to do with himself. From time to time he opened his mouth to begin conversation, but the words would not leave his throat. The face pale, silent, and with an expression of decisive sternness in the brows and mouth, deprived him of courage. Bogan had not seen this expression on the princess before, and involuntarily he remembered similar evenings at Rosloji, which appeared before him as if real, how they sat. 
he and the Kurtsevichi around an oaken table, the old princess husking sunflower seeds, the princes throwing dice from a cup, he looking on the beautiful princess just as he was looking now. But in the old time he was happy, for then he told of his expeditions with the Zaporogians, she listened, and at times her dark eyes rested on his face. And her open red lips showed with what interest she listened. Now she would not even look. Then when he played on the lute she would listen and look, till the heart melted within him. And, wonder of wonders, he is now master of her, he has taken her with armed hand, she is his captive, his prisoner, he can command her. But nevertheless in the old time he felt himself nearer, more her equal in rank. The Kurtsevichi were her cousins, she was as a sister. She was not only his cuckoo, falcon, dearest, dark-browed, but also a relative. Now she sits before him a proud lady, gloomy, silent, merciless. Ah, but anger is boiling within him. He would like to show her what it means to slight a Cossack, but he loves this merciless woman, he would shed his blood for her. But how many times had anger seized his breast? When suddenly an unseen hand, as it were, grasps him by the hair, and a voice shouts in his ear, Stop! He belches forth something like a flame, beats his forehead on the earth, and stops. The Cossack squirms now, for he feels that he is oppressive to her in that room. Let her but smile and give a kind word, he would fall at her feet and go to the devil, to drown in Polish blood all his grief and anger together with the insult put upon him. But in that room he is like a captive before that princess. If he had not known her of old, if she were a pole taken from the first noble castle, he would have more daring. But she is Princess Helena, for whom he had asked the Kurtsevichi, and for whom he was willing to give up Rosloji and all he had. And the more ashamed he is of being a slave before her, the less bold is he. An hour passed. From before the cottage came the murmur of the talk of the Cossacks, who were surely in their saddles and waiting for the Ataman, but the Ataman was in torture. The bright light of the torch falls on his face, on the rich contouche, and on the lute. And she, if she would even look. The Ataman felt bitter, angry, sad, and awkward. He would like to bid farewell with tenderness, and he fears the parting, fears that it will not be such as from his soul he desires, fears to go away in bitterness, anger, and pain. Oh, if she were not that Princess Helena, the Princess Helena stabbed with a knife, threatening death with her own hand, but dear, dear, and the more cruel and proud, the dearer is she. Then a horse neighed near the window. The chief mustered courage. Princess, said he, it is already my hour for the road. She was silent. And you will not say to me, with God? Go, with God, said she, with dignity. The Cossack's heart was pressed. She said the words he wanted, but not in the way he wanted. Well I know, said he, that you are angry with me, that you hate me, but I tell you that another would have been worse to you than I. I brought you here, for I could not do otherwise. But what harm have I done you? Have not I treated you well, like a queen? Tell me yourself. Am I such an outlaw that you will not give me a kind word? And, moreover, you are in my power. I am in the power of God, said she, with the same dignity as before, but because you restrain yourself in my presence, I thank you for that. Then I go with even such a word. Maybe you will regret me, maybe you will be sorry. Helena was silent. I am sorry to leave you here alone, said Bogan, sorry to go away, but I must. It would be easier for me if you were to smile, if you were to give a crucifix with a sincere heart. What can I do to appease you? Give me back my freedom, and God will forgive you all, and I will forgive and bless you. Maybe you will forgive me yet, maybe you will be sorry yet that you have been so harsh to me. Bogan wished to buy a word of farewell, even for half a promise which he did not think of keeping, and got what he wanted. For a light of hope gleamed in Helena's eyes and the harshness vanished from her face. She crossed her arms on her breast and fixed a clear glance on him. If you would only. Well, I don't know, said the Cossack, in a low voice, 
for shame and pity seized him at the same time by the throat. I cannot now, I cannot. The Tartars are in the wilderness, their parties are going everywhere. The Dobruja Tartars are moving from Rashkov. I cannot, for it is terrible. But when I come back, I am a child in your presence, you can do what you like with me, I don't know, I don't know. May God inspire you. May the Holy Most Pure inspire you. God go with you. And she stretched out her hand to him. Bogan sprang forward and fastened his lips on it. Suddenly he raised his head, met her look of dignity, and dropped her hand. Then retreating toward the door, he bowed to his girdle in Cossack fashion, bowed again at the door, and disappeared behind the curtain. Soon there came through the window animated conversation, a clatter of arms, and later the words of a song in several voices. Glorious fame will rise. Among the Cossacks. Among the heroes. For many a year. Till the end of time. The voices and clatter retreated, and grew fainter each moment. Chapter 37 The Lord has wrought an evident miracle in her favor already, said Zagloba to Volodyovsky in Podbipienta, while sitting in Skshetuski's quarters, an evident miracle, I say. In permitting me to wrest her from the grasp of those dogs and to guard her the whole way. Let us hope that he will be merciful to her and to us once more. If she is only living. Something whispers to me that Bogan has carried her away. For just think, the informants tell us that after Pulian he has become the second in command, may the devils command him, therefore he must have been present at the taking of Bar. He might not have found her in that crowd of unfortunates, for twelve thousand people were cut to pieces there, said Volodyovsky. Oh, you don't know him. I would swear that he knew she was in Bar. It cannot be but he has saved her from slaughter and taken her somewhere. You do not give us much consolation. For in Skshetuski's place, I should rather have her perish than fall into his scoundrelly hands. The other is no consolation, for if she has perished, she was disgraced. Desperation! exclaimed Volodyovsky. Desperation, repeated Pan Langin. Zagloba pulled his beard, at last he burst out, may the mange devour the whole race of curs. May the pagans twist bowstrings out of their entrails. God created all nations, but the devil created these sons of Sodom. May barrenness strike the trash. I did not know that sweet lady, said Volodyovsky, gloomily, but I would that misfortune met me rather than her. Once in my life I saw her, said Pan Langin. But when I think of her, life is a burden of regret. You describe your own feelings, said Zagloba. But what do you think of me, who loved her like a father, and rescued her from that misery, what do you think of me? And what do you think of Pan Yen, asked Volodyovsky. The knights were in despair and sank into silence. Zagloba came to himself first. Is there no help? he asked. If there is no help, it is our duty to take vengeance, said Volodyovsky. Oh, if God would only give a general battle, sighed Pan Langin. It is said that the Tartars have already crossed the river, and formed a camp in the steppe. We cannot leave her, said Zagloba, the poor thing, without undertaking something for her rescue. I have battered my old bones around the world enough already. It would be better for me now to lie somewhere in a baker's shop quietly, for warmth's sake. But for her I would go again even to Stambul. I would put on a peasant's coat again and take a lute, on which I cannot look without disgust. You are fertile in stratagems, think of something, said Podbipienta. A great many plans have gone through my head already. If Prince Dominic had half as many, Melnitsky would be disemboweled and hanging by the legs on a gibbet. I have already spoken of this to Skshetuski, but you can say nothing to him at present. Sorrow has seared him, and drags him down more than sickness. You see to it that his reason is not disturbed. It often happens that from great grief the mind, like wine, changes until it is completely soured. Yes, yes, answered Pan Langin. Volodyovsky started up impatiently, and asked, What are your plans then? My plans? 
Well, first we must find out whether she, poor dear, may the angels guard her from every evil, is alive yet. And this we can do in two ways, either we shall find among the princes Cossacks trusty and sure men, who will undertake to escape to the Cossacks, mingle among Bogan's men. And find out something from them. I have Russian dragoons, interrupted Volodyovsky, I will find such men. Wait a moment, or catch an informant from those scoundrels who took bar, maybe they know something. They all look at Bogan as at a rainbow, because his devilish daring pleases them. They sing songs about him, may their throats rot, and one talks to another about what he did and what he didn't do. If he has carried off our unfortunate lady, then it is not hidden from them. Well, we can send men to inquire, and to catch an informant also, remarked Podbipienta. You have struck the point. If we discover that she is alive, that is the chief thing. Now, since you wish sincerely to help Pan Yen, put yourself under my orders, for I have most experience. We will disguise ourselves as peasants, and try to find out where he has concealed her, and once we know that, my head for it, we shall get her. I and Pan Yen risk most, for Bogan knows us, and if he should catch us, our own mothers wouldn't recognize us afterward, but he hasn't seen either of you. He has seen me, said Podbipienta, but that is nothing. Maybe too the Lord will give him into our hands, said Volodyovsky. Well, I don't want to look at him, said Zagloba. May the hangman look at him. We must begin carefully, so as not to spoil the whole undertaking. It cannot be that he alone knows of her concealment, and I assure you, gentlemen, that it is safer to inquire of someone else. Maybe too the men whom we send out will discover. If the prince only permits, I will select trusty men, and send them even tomorrow. The prince will permit it, but that they will discover anything, I doubt. Listen, gentlemen. Another method occurs to me, instead of sending out people or seizing informants, to disguise ourselves as peasants and start without delay. Oh, that is impossible, cried Volodyovsky. Why impossible? Don't you know military service? When a body of troops is mustered nemini excepto, it is sacred. Even if his father and mother were dying, a soldier would not ask leave of absence, for before battle this would be the greatest deed of disgrace which a soldier could commit. After a general engagement, when the enemy is defeated it is permissible, but not before. And consider, Skshetuski at first wanted to rush off, fly away, and rescue her, but he did nothing of the kind. He has a reputation, the prince is fond of him. And he made no request, for he knows his duty. Ours is public duty, and this is a private matter. I do not know how it is in some other land, though I think it is the same everywhere. But with the prince our voevoda it is an unheard of thing to ask leave before a battle, especially for officers. Though Skshetuski's soul were rent, he would not go with such a proposition to the prince. He is a Roman and a rigorist, I know, said Zagloba. But if someone should give the prince a hint, maybe he would grant permission of his own instance, to Skshetuski and to you. That would not enter his mind. The prince has the whole commonwealth on his mind. Do you think that now, when there is a rush of the most important affairs, affecting the whole nation, he would take up any private question? And even if he should give a permission unasked, which is unlikely, as God is in heaven, no one of us would leave the camp at present. For we too owe our first service to our unhappy country, not to ourselves. I am aware of that. I am acquainted with service from of old. Therefore I told you that this method passed through my head, but I did not say that it stayed there. Besides, to tell the truth, while the power of the rabble stands untouched we could not do much. But when they are defeated and hunted down, when their only thought will be to save their own throats, we can go among them boldly and get information more easily. Oh, if the rest of the army would only come up at once. If it does not, we shall surely die of weariness at this Kalgansky Cayman. If our prince had the command, we should be moving now. But Prince Dominic, it is evident, stops often for refreshments, since he is not here yet. He is expected in three days. God grant as soon as possible. 
But Konyatsbalski will be here today? Yes. At that moment the door opened, and Skshatuski entered. His features seemed as if chiseled out of stone by pain, such calm and cold came from them. It was strange to look on that young face, as severe and dignified as though a smile had never appeared on it. And it would have been easy to imagine that if death were to strike it there would be little change. Skshatuski's beard had grown halfway to his breast, in which beard, among hairs black as the raven's wing, here and there were winding silver threads. His comrades and trusty friends guessed at his suffering, for he did not exhibit it. He was self-possessed, apparently calm, and almost more diligent, in his military service than usual, and entirely occupied with the impending war. We have been speaking of your misfortune, which is at the same time our own, said Zagloba, for God is our witness that we can console ourselves with nothing. This, however, would be a barren sentiment if we were to aid you only in shedding tears. Therefore we have determined to shed blood also, to rescue the unfortunate lady, if she still walks upon the earth. God reward you, said Skshatuski. We will go with you even to Melnitsky's camp, said Volodyovsky. God reward you, repeated Skshatuski. We know that you have sworn to seek her, living or dead. Therefore we are ready, even today. Skshatuski, having seated himself on a bench, fixed his eyes on the ground and made no answer. At last anger got control of Zagloba. Does he intend to give her up, thought he. If he does, God be with him. I see there is neither gratitude nor memory in the world. But men will be found yet to rescue her, or I shall have to yield my last breath. Silence reigned in the room, interrupted only by the sighs of Pan Langin. Meanwhile little Volodyovsky approached Skshatuski and shook him by the shoulder. Where are you from now? asked he. From the prince. What news? I am going out on a reconnaissance tonight. Far? To Yarmolintsy, if the road is clear. Volodyovsky looked at Zagloba, and they understood each other at once. That is toward Bar, muttered Zagloba. We will go with you. You must go for permission, and ask if the prince has not appointed other work for you. We will go together. I have also something else to ask. They rose and went. The quarters of the prince were some distance away, at the other end of the camp. In the antechamber they found a crowd of officers from different squadrons. For forces were marching from every direction to Kulgansky Cayman. All were hurrying to offer their services to the prince. Volodyovsky had to wait some time before he and Podbipienta were permitted to stand before the face of their chief. But to make up for this, the prince gave them permission at once to go, and to send out some Russian dragoons, who, feigning desertion from the camp, should escape to Bogan's Cossacks and inquire about the princess. To Volodyovsky he said. I will find various duties for Skshatuski myself, for I see that suffering has settled in him and is eating him up. I am unspeakably sorry for him. Has he said nothing to you about her? But little. At first he wanted to go at random among the Cossacks, but he remembered that the squadron is mustered in full, that we are at the service of the country, which must be saved before aught else. Therefore he did not appear before you at all. God alone knows what is taking place within him. And is trying him severely. Watch over him, for I see that you are a trusty friend of his. Volodyovsky bowed low and went out, for at that moment the voevoda of Kiev entered with the starosta of Stavnik and Pan Denhoff, and a number of other military dignitaries. Well, what is the result? asked Pan Yen. I go with you, but first I must go to my squadron, for I have a number of men to send out. Let us go together. They went. And with them Podbipienta, Zagloba, and old Zatz Vilikovsky, who was on the way to his squadron. Not far from the tents of Volodyovsky's dragoons they met Pan Lash, walking, or rather staggering, at the head of a number of nobles, for he and his comrades were completely drunk. At the sight of this Zagloba sighed. The two men had fallen in love with each other at Konstantinov, because, from a certain point of view, they had natures as much alike as two drops of water. 
For Pan Lash, though a formidable knight, and terrible against pagans as few men were terrible, was also a notorious drinker and feaster, who loved, above all things, to pass the time free from battle, prayers, attacks, and quarrels, in the circle of men like Zagloba, to drink with might and main, and listen to jokes. He was a roisterer on a grand scale, who himself alone had caused so much disturbance, had so many times risen up against the law, that in any other state he would have lost his life long before. More sentences than one were hanging over him, but even in time of peace he troubled himself little about those, and now, in time of war, everything passed into forgetfulness all the more. He joined the prince at Rosolovtsi, and had rendered no small service at Konstantinov, but since they had halted at Zberage he had become quite unendurable, through the tumults which he raised. No one had given regular count or calculation to the wine that Zagloba had drunk at his quarters, or the stories he had told, to the great delight of the host, who urged him to come every day. But since the news of the taking of Bar, Zagloba had become gloomy, lost his humor and vivacity, and no longer visited Pan Lash. Pan Lash, indeed, thought that the jovial nobleman had gone somewhere from the army, when suddenly he saw him. He extended his hand, and said, my greetings to you. Why don't you come to see me? What are you doing? I am attending Skshatuski, answered Zagloba, gloomily. The colonel did not like Skshatuski on account of his dignity, and nicknamed him, the grave. He knew of his misfortune perfectly well, for he was present at the banquet in Zberage when news of the capture of Bar came in. But being of unrestrained nature, and drunk at the moment, he did not respect human suffering, and seizing the lieutenant by the button, inquired. So, then, you are crying for a girl? And was she pretty, hey? Let me go, please, said Skshatuski. Wait. On my way to service you cannot command me. I am free of you. Wait. Said Lash, with the stubbornness of a drunken man. You have service, but I have none. There is no one to command me here. Then lowering his voice, he repeated the question, but she was pretty, hey? The lieutenant frowned, I tell you, sir, better not touch a sore spot. Not touch? Never fear. If she was pretty, she is alive. Skshatuski's face was covered with a deathly pallor, but he restrained himself, and said, I hope I shall not forget with whom I am talking. Lash stuck out his eyes. What? Are you threatening me, threatening me, for one little wench? Go your way, shouted old Zatsvilikovsky, trembling with anger. Ah, sneaks, rabble, lackeys, roared the commander. Gentlemen, to your sabers. Drawing his own, he sprang at Skshatuski. But that moment the steel whistled in Skshatuski's hand, and the saber of the commander hopped like a bird through the air, and staggered by the blow, he fell his whole length on the ground. Skshatuski did not strike again. He became pale as a corpse, as if stunned, and that moment a tumult arose. From one side rushed in the soldiers of the commander. From the other Volodyovsky's dragoons hurried like bees from a hive. Many hastened up, not knowing what the matter was, sabers began to rattle. Any moment the tumult might have changed into a general battle. Happily Lash's comrades, seeing that Vishnyavetsky's men were arriving every moment, made sober from fear, seized the commander and started off with him. In truth, if Lash had had to do with other and less disciplined forces, they would have cut him into small pieces with their swords. But old Zatsvilikovsky, recollecting himself, merely cried, Stop, and the sabers were sheathed. Nevertheless there was excitement throughout the whole camp, and the echo of the tumult reached the ears of the prince just as Pan Kushal, who was on duty, rushed into the room in which the prince was holding counsel with the voivoda of Kiev, the starosta of Stavnik, and Pan Denhoff, and shouted, Your Highness, the soldiers are fighting with sabers. At that moment Lash, pale and beside himself with rage, but sober, shot in like a bomb. Your Highness, Justice. It is in this camp as with Melnitsky, no respect for blood or rank. 
dignitaries of the crown are slashed with sabers. If your highness will not mete out justice, will not punish with death, then I myself will mete it out. The prince sprang up from the table. What has happened? Who has attacked you? Thy officer, Skshatuski. Genuine astonishment was reflected on the face of the prince. Skshatuski? Suddenly the doors were opened, and in walked Zatsvilikovsky. Your Highness, I was a witness, said he. I have not come here to give reasons, but to demand punishment, cried Lash. The prince turned and fastened his eyes upon him. Stop! Stop, said he, quietly and with emphasis. There was something so terrible in his eyes and in his hushed voice that Lash, though notorious for insolence, became silent at once, as if he had lost his speech, and the spectators grew pale. Speak, said the prince to Zatsvilikovsky. Zatsvilikovsky described the whole affair, how the commander, led by an ignoble sentiment, unworthy not only of a dignitary but of a noble, began to blaspheme against the suffering of Pan Skshatuski, and then rushed upon him with a sabre. With moderation, in truth unusual to his age, the lieutenant had used his weapon only to ward off the aggressor. Finally the old man ended his story thus. And since, as your highness knows, up to my seventieth year lying has not stained my lips, nor will it while I live. I could not under oath change one word in my story. The prince knew that Zatsvilikovsky's words were equal to gold, and besides he knew Lash too well. He gave no answer then, he merely took a pen and began to write. When he had finished he looked at the commander. Justice will be meted out to you, said he. The commander opened his mouth and wished to speak, but somehow the words did not come to him. He merely put his hand on his hip, bowed, and went out proudly from the room. Jelensky, said the prince, you will give this letter to Pan Skshatuski. Volodyovsky, who had not left the lieutenant, was astonished somewhat at seeing the messenger come in, for he was sure that they would have to appear at once before the prince. The messenger left the letter and went out in silence. When he had read it Skshatuski handed the letter to his friend. Read, said he. Volodyovsky glanced at it, and shouted, Promotion to the head of the regiment. And seizing Skshatuski by the neck, he kissed him on both cheeks. A full lieutenant in the Hussar regiment was almost a military dignitary. The captain of that one in which Skshatuski served was the prince himself, and the titular lieutenant was Pan Sufchinsky, of Sunchi, a man already old and out of service. Skshatuski had long performed the active duties of both offices, a condition of service often found in regiments like his, in which the first two places were not infrequently merely titular offices. Captain in the royal regiment was the king himself, in that of the primate, the primate. The lieutenant and captain in both were high dignitaries of the court. They were actually commanded by deputies, who on this account were called in ordinary speech colonels and lieutenants. Such an actual lieutenant or colonel was Skshatuski. But between the actual filling of the office, between the dignity accorded in current speech and the real one, there was still a great difference. In the present instance, by virtue of his appointment, Skshatuski became one of the first officers of the prince. But while his friends were overflowing with joy, congratulating him on his new honor, his face did not change for a moment, but remained just the same, severe and stone-like. For there were not offices nor dignities in the world that could brighten it. He rose, however, and went to thank the prince. Meanwhile little Volodyovsky walked up and down in his quarters rubbing his hands. Well, well, he said, appointed lieutenant in the Hussar squadron in youthful years. I think this has happened to no one before. If God would only return his happiness, said Zagloba. That is it, that is it. Did you see that he did not quiver? He would prefer resigning, said Pan Longin. Gentlemen, sighed Zagloba. What wonder! I would give these five fingers of mine for her, though I captured a banner with them. Sure enough. But Pan Sufchinsky must be dead, remarked Volodyovsky. He is surely dead. Who will take the lieutenancy then? 
The banneret is a stripling, and performs the duties only since the battle at Konstantinov. This question remained unanswered. But the colonel himself, Skshetuski, brought the answer to it when he returned. My dear sir, said he to Pan Podbipienta, the prince has appointed you lieutenant. Oh, my God, my God! groaned Pan Longin, placing his hands together as if in prayer. He might as well have appointed his Livonian mare, muttered Zagloba. Well, and the scouting party? asked Volodyovsky. We shall go without delay, answered Skshetuski. Has the prince given orders to take many troops? One Cossack and one Wallachian squadron, five hundred men altogether. Hello! That is an expedition, not a party. If that is the case, it is time for us to take the road. To the road, to the road, repeated Zagloba. Maybe God will help us to get some tidings. Two hours later, precisely at sunset, the four friends rode out from Kalgansky Cayman toward the south. About the same time Lash left the camp with his men. A multitude of knights from different regiments witnessed his departure, not sparing shouts and sneers. The officers crowded around Pan Kushal, who told the reason why the commander was dismissed, and how it happened. I delivered the order of the prince, said Kushal. And you may believe it was a perilous mission, gentlemen, for when he read it he began to bellow like a bullock when branded with iron. He was rushing at me with a sword, a wonder he didn't hit me. But it appears that he saw Pan Karitsky's Germans surrounding his quarters, and my dragoons with spears in their hands. Then he began to shout, All right. All right. I'll go away, since they drive me off. I'll go to Prince Dominic, who will receive me thankfully. I will not, said he, serve with minstrels. But as I am lash, I will have vengeance, as I am lash, and from that sneak, said he, I must have satisfaction. I thought he would stifle from venom. He slashed the table from rage time after time. And I tell you, gentlemen, that I am not sure some evil will not come on Skshetuski, for there is no trifling with the commander. He is a stubborn and proud man, who has never yet allowed an offense to pass. He is daring, and a dignitary besides. What can touch Skshetuski under the protection of the prince? asked one of the officers. The commander, though ready for everything, will be wary of such a hand. Meanwhile the lieutenant, knowing nothing of the vows which the commander had made against him, withdrew at the head of his party farther and farther from the camp, turning his way toward Ajagovtsi to the Bug and Medvedovka. Though September had withered the leaves on the trees, the night was calm and warm as in July. For such, indeed, was that whole year, in which there was scarcely any winter, and in spring everything was in bloom at a time when in former years deep snow was still lying on the steppes. After a rather moist summer, the first months of autumn were dry and mild, with clear days and bright moonlight nights. They travelled along the easy road, not taking special care, for they were still too near the camp to be threatened by any attack. They rode briskly. Skshetuski ahead with a few horsemen, and behind him Volodyovsky, Zagloba, and Podbipienta. Look, gentlemen, how the light of the moon shines on that hill, whispered Zagloba. You might swear that it is day. It is said that only in time of war are there such nights, so that spirits may leave their bodies without knocking their heads against trees in the dark. Like sparrows against the crosspieces in a barn, and more easily find the way. Today is Friday, the day of the Saviour, in which poisonous vapours do not issue from the ground, and evil powers have no approach to men. I feel somehow easier, and hope takes possession of me. That is because we are now on the way and will undertake some rescue. The worst thing, in grief, is to sit in one place. When you get on horseback, all your despair flies down from the shaking, till you shake it off completely and entirely. I do not believe, whispered Volodyovsky, that you can shake off everything in that way, for example, love, which clings to the heart like a wood tick. If love is genuine, said Pan Longin, then even if you should wrestle with it as with a bear, it would throw you. Having said this, 
Padbipienta relieved his swollen breast with a sigh which was like the puff of a blacksmith's bellows. But little Volodyovsky raised his eyes to heaven, as if seeking among the stars that one which was shining on Princess Barbara. The horses began to snort in the whole company, and the soldiers answered, Health, health. Then all was silent till some melancholy voice began to sing in the rear ranks. You are going to the war, my boy. You are going to the war. Your nights will be cold. And your days will be hot. Old soldiers say that horses always snort as a good omen, as my deceased father used to tell me, said Volodyovsky. Something whispers, as it were, in my ear, that we are not going for nothing, answered Zagloba. God grant that some consolation enter the heart of the lieutenant, sighed Pan Langin. Zagloba began to nod and turn his head like a man who is unable to conquer some idea, and at last said. Something altogether different is in my head, and I must get rid of the thought. For I cannot endure it. Have you noticed that for some time Skshatuski, I am not sure, maybe he dissembles, but still he, as it were, thinks less than any of us of saving that unfortunate lady. Nonsense! said Volodyovsky. It is his disposition never to confess anything to anyone. He has never been different. Yes, that's so far as it goes. But just remember, when we gave him hope, he said, God reward you, both to me and to you, as coldly as if it had been some common affair. And God is witness, on his part that was black in gratitude. For what that poor woman has wept and grieved for him could not be inscribed on an ox hide. I have seen it with my own eyes. Volodyovsky shook his head. It cannot be that he has given her up, though it is true that the first time when that devil seized her from him in Rosloji, he despaired so that we feared he would lose his mind. But now he shows more reflection. If God has poured peace into his soul, it is better. As true friends, it is our duty to be comforted by this. Volodyovsky then spurred his horse and sped on toward Pan Yen, but Zagloba rode for some time in silence by the side of Podbipienta. Are you not of my opinion, that if there were no love affairs a power of evil would cease in the world? Whatever God has destined to anyone, will not avoid him, answered the Lithuanian. But you never answer to the point. That is one affair, and this is another. Who caused the destruction of Troy, hey? And isn't this war about fair locks? Melnitsky wanted Chaplinsky's woman, or Chaplinsky wanted Melnitsky's, and we are breaking our necks on account of their sinful desires. Those are dishonorable loves. But there are honorable ones, through which the glory of God is increased. Now you have hit the point better. But are you going soon to work in that vineyard yourself? I hear that a scarf is bound to you for the war. Ah. Uh, Brother! Brother! But three heads are in the way, are they? Ah, that's the truth. Well, I tell you, give a good blow, and cut them off at once from Melnitsky, the Khan, and Bogan. Oh, if they would only stand in a row! said Pan Langin, in a voice full of emotion, raising his eyes to heaven. Meanwhile, Volodyovsky rode by Skshatuski and looked from under his helmet in silence at his pallid face, till at last their stirrups touched. Yen, said he, it is bad for you to forget yourself. I am not forgetting myself, I am praying, answered Skshatuski. That is a holy and praiseworthy thing. But you are not a monk, to be occupied in prayer alone. Pan Yen turned his suffering face slowly to Volodyovsky, and inquired with a dull voice, full of deathly resignation, Tell me, Michael, what is left to me now but a monk's habit? It remains to you to rescue her, answered Volodyovsky. I will do that, if it takes my last breath. But even if I should find her alive, will it not be too late? Preserve me, O oh God, for I can think of everything, only not of that, God save my reason. I desire nothing more than to rescue her from those infamous hands and let her find an asylum, such as I myself shall seek. Evidently it was not the will of God. Let me pray, Michael, and don't touch my bleeding wound. Volodyovsky's heart was pressed. 
he wished still to console his friend, to speak of hope. But the words would not pass his lips, and they rode on in dull silence. Only the lips of Skshetuski moved rapidly in prayer, with which he wished evidently to drive away terrible thoughts. But the little knight was afraid when he looked at that face in the moonlight, for it seemed to him altogether like the face of a monk, stern, emaciated by fasting and mortification. And then that voice began again to sing, in the rear. You will find when the war is over, poor fellow. You will find when the war is over. Everything empty at home. And your skin full of wounds. Chapter 38 Skshetuski so marched with his detachment that he rested during the day in forests and ravines, throwing out pickets carefully, and pushed forward only in the night. Whenever he approached a village he usually surrounded it so that not a man went out, took provisions, feed for his horses, but above all collected information concerning the enemy. Then he marched away without inflicting harm on the people. But when out of sight he changed his road abruptly, so that the enemy in the village might not know in what direction he had gone. The object of his expedition was to discover whether Krivonos with his forty thousand men was still besieging Kamenets, or having given up the fruitless siege. Was marching to assist Melnitsky so as to join him for a general engagement. And further what the Dobruja Tartars were doing, whether they had crossed the Dnieper already and joined Krivonos, or were still on the other bank. These were important items for the Polish army, which the commanders should have tried to obtain, but being men without experience, it did not enter their heads to do so. Yeremy therefore took that burden on himself. If it should appear that Krivonos, with the hordes of Belgorod and Dobruja, had abandoned the siege of the impregnable Kamenets and was marching to Melnitsky, then it behooved them to attack the latter as quickly as possible before he had grown to his highest power. Meanwhile the commander-in-chief, Prince Dominik Zaslavsky Ostrogsky, was not hastening, and at the time of Skshetuski's departure he was expected at the camp in two or three days. Evidently he was feasting along the road, according to his custom, and felt well. But the most favorable moment for breaking the power of Melnitsky was passing, and Prince Yeremy was in despair at the thought that if the war should be carried on further in this fashion. Not only Krivonos and the forces beyond the Dniester would come to Melnitsky in season, but also the Khan himself at the head of all the forces from Perikop, Nogai, and Azov. There were tidings in camp that the Khan had already crossed the Dnieper, and was moving westward day and night with two hundred thousand horse. But day after day passed, and Prince Dominic did not arrive. It became more and more likely that the troops at Kalgansky Cayman would have to meet forces five times more numerous. And in case of defeat nothing would prevent the enemy from breaking into the heart of the Commonwealth at Krakow and Warsaw. Krivonos was the more dangerous in this, that in case the commanders wished to push into the heart of the Ukraine, he, by going from Kamenets directly northward to Konstantinov, could bar their retreat, and in every case they would be taken then between two fires. Skshetuski determined therefore not only to gain information concerning Krivonos, but to check him. Penetrated with the importance of this task, on the accomplishment of which the fate of the whole army was in part dependent, he risked willingly his own life and the lives of his soldiers. Though that undertaking might have been considered insane or mad if the young knight had had the intention of checking with five hundred men in an offensive battle the forty thousand men of Krivonos reinforced by the hordes of Belgorod and Dobruja. But Skshetuski was too experienced a soldier to rush into insane undertakings. And he knew perfectly well that in case of battle the torrent would sweep over the bodies of himself and his men in an hour. He seized upon other means. He gave out among his own soldiers that they were merely the advance guard of a whole division of the terrible prince, and this report he spread everywhere in all the farms, villages, and towns through which it came to him to pass. And in truth it spread like a flash of lightning along Zbruch, Smotrik, Studenitsa, Ushka, Kalusik. And from them it reached the Dniester and flew on farther as if driven by the wind from Kamenets to Yagerlik. It was repeated by Turkish pashas in Kodim, the Zaporozhans in Yampol, and the Tartars in Rashkov. And again was heard that famous cry, Yerema is coming. 
from which the hearts of the rebellious people sank, and from which they trembled, knowing neither the day nor the hour. And no one doubted the truth of the report. The commanders would fall upon Melnitsky, and Yeremy on Krivonos, that lay in the order of things. Krivonos himself believed in it, and his hands dropped. What was he to do? Move on the prince? At Konstantinov there was another spirit in his men and he had more troops, still they were beaten, decimated, barely escaped with their lives. Krivonos was sure that his Cossacks would fight madly against all other armies of the Commonwealth, and against every other leader. But with the approach of Yeremy they would speed away like a flock of swans before an eagle, or like the thistledown of the steppes before the wind. To wait for the prince at Kamenets was still worse. Krivonos determined to hurry eastward as far as Bratslav, to avoid his evil spirit and move toward Melnitsky. He knew, it is true, that circling around in this way he would not arrive in time, but at least he would hear of the results in season, and plan for his own safety. A new report came with the wind, that Melnitsky was already defeated. Skshetuski had spread it purposely, as he had the previous report. This time the unfortunate Krivonos knew not what to do. Later he determined all the more to march to the east and push on as far as possible into the steppes, maybe he would meet the Tartars and find shelter among them. But first of all he wished to be sure, therefore he looked carefully among his colonels to find a man trusty and prepared for everything, so as to send him with a party to get information. But the choice was difficult. There was a lack of volunteers, and it was absolutely necessary to find a man who in case he should fall into the hands of the enemy would not disclose the plans of retreat, even if burned with fire. Impaled on a stake, or broken on a wheel. At last Krivonos found the man. One night he gave the order to call Bogan, and said to him. Do you hear, Yurku, my friend Yurema is marching on us with a great force. We shall all perish, unfortunates. I have heard that he is coming, you have already spoken of that, father. But why should we perish? We cannot withstand him. We could another, but not Yeremy. The Cossacks are afraid of him. But I am not afraid of him. I cut to pieces a regiment of his at Vasilyevka beyond the Dnieper. I know that you are not afraid of him. Your fame of a Cossack and a hero is equal to his as a prince. But I cannot give him battle, for my Cossacks are unwilling. Remember what they said at the council, how they rushed on me with sabers because I wanted to lead them to slaughter. Then we will go to Melnitsky, there we shall find blood and booty. They say that Melnitsky is already defeated. I do not believe that, Father Maxim. Melnitsky is a fox, he will not strike the poles without the Tartars. I think so too, but we must find out. Then we could go around this devil of a Yeremy and join Mel, but we must have information. Now, if someone who has no fear of Yeremy were to go with a party and take prisoners, I should fill his cap with ruddy sequins. I'll go, Father Maxim, not for sequins, but for Cossack, for heroic glory. You are the next adamant to me, and since you are willing to go, you will become first adamant yet over the Cossacks, good hero, for you are not afraid of Yeremy. Go, my falcon, and hereafter you have but to ask for what you want. Well, I tell you, if you were not going I should go myself, but it is not for me to go. No. For if you were to go, father, the Cossacks would say that you were saving your head and would scatter over the world, but when I go their courage will increase. Shall I give you many men? I will not take many, it is easier to hide and approach with a small force. But give me about five hundred good warriors, and my head for it, I will bring you informants, not soldiers, but officers from whom you will learn everything. Go at once. They are firing cannon from Kamenets with joy, salvation to the Poles and destruction to us innocents. Bogan went out, and began to prepare at once for the road. His heroes, as was the fixed practice on such occasions, drank to the verge of destruction, before Mother Death should clasp them to her breast. He too drank with them till he was snorting from Gorelka. He frolicked and reveled, then had a barrel filled with tar, and just as he was, 
in brocade and serge, sprang into it, sank a couple of times, once over his head. And shouted. I am black as Mother Night. Polish eyes won't see me now. He rolled himself on Persian carpets, sprang on his horse and rode away. After him clattered, amid the darkness of night, his trusty heroes, followed by shouts, glory. Luck. Skshetuski had already pushed on to Yarmolintsi, where, meeting opposition, he baptized the townspeople in blood, and having told them that Prince Yeremy would arrive next day, gave rest to his wearied horses and men. Then assembling his officers in council, he said to them, So far God has given us success. I see also, by the terror which seizes the peasants, that they take us for the advance guard of the prince, and believe that his whole force is following. We must look out, however, that they do not bethink themselves when they see that one company is going everywhere. And shall we go about in this way long? asked Zagloba. Till we find out what Krivonos has determined. Then we may not come in time for the battle at the camp? Maybe not. Well, I am not glad of that, said Zagloba. My hand has become a little exercised on the ruffians at Konstantinov. I captured something from them there, but that is a trifle. My fingers are itching now. Perhaps you will get more fighting than you expect, answered Pan Yen, seriously. How is that? asked Zagloba, rather alarmed. Why, any day we may come upon the enemy, and though we are not here to bar the road with arms, we shall have to defend ourselves. But to return to the subject. We must occupy more country, so they may know of us in several places at once, cut down the obstinate here and there, so as to spread terror, and everywhere circulate reports. Therefore I think we must separate. So I think, said Volodyovsky. We shall increase in their eyes, and those who escape to Krivonos will talk about legions. Well, lieutenant, you are leader here, give the orders, said Podbipienta. I will go through Zinkov to Solidkovitz, and farther if I can, said Skshetuski. You, Podbipienta, will go straight down to Tatarjiski, and you, Michael, go to Kupin, and Zagloba will press on to Zbruch, near Satanov. I, exclaimed Zagloba. Yes. You are a man of thought and full of stratagems. I supposed you would undertake the enterprise willingly, but if not, Sergeant Kosmak will lead the fourth party. I will take it under my command, cried Zagloba, who was suddenly dazzled by the thought that he would be the leader of a separate party. If I asked, it was because I am sorry to part with you. But have you experience in military matters? asked Volodyovsky. Have I experience? It hadn't yet come into the head of any stork to make a present of you to your father and mother when I was commanding larger bodies of men than this. I served all my life in the army, and should have served to this moment had it not been for the moldy biscuit that stuck in my stomach and stayed there three years. I had to go for a bezoar to Galitz, the details of which journey I will tell in proper time, but now I am in a hurry for the road. Go on, then, and spread the reports that Melnitsky is beaten, and that the prince has passed Ploskarov, said Skshetuski. Don't take the first informant that comes along. But when you meet scouting parties from Kamenets, try to get people who are able to give information about Krivonos, for those whom we have now tell contradictory stories. I hope I may meet Krivonos himself. I hope he will want to go on a scouting expedition. I should give him pepper and ginger. Don't be afraid. I will teach the ruffians to sing, and dance for that matter. In three days we shall meet again at Yarmolintsi, and now each one to his journey, said Skshetuski. And I beg of you to spare your men. In three days at Yarmolintsi, repeated Volodyovsky, Zagloba, and Podbipienta. Chapter 39 When Zagloba found himself alone at the head of his party, he felt uncomfortable somehow and terribly alarmed, and would have given much to have at his side Skshetuski, Volodyovsky, or Pan Langin. Whom in his soul he admired with all his might, and near whom he felt completely safe, so blindly did he believe in their resources and bravery. At first, therefore, he rode rather gloomily at the head of his party, 
and looking around suspiciously on every side, measured in his mind the dangers which he might meet. And muttered. It would always be livelier if some one of them were here. To whatever God predestined a man, for that he created him, and those three ought to have been born horseflies, for they love to sit in blood. They are in war just as other men are at the cup, or like fish in water. War is their play. They have light stomachs, but heavy hands. I have seen Skshetuski at work, and I know what skill he has. He hurries through men as monks through their prayers. That's his favorite work. That Lithuanian, who has no head of his own, is looking for three strange heads, and he has nothing to risk. I know that little fellow least of all, but he must be a wasp of no common kind, judging from what I saw at Konstantinov, and what Skshetuski tells me about him, he must be a wasp. Happily he is marching not far from me, and I think that I shall do better to join him, for if I know where to go may the ducks trample me. Zagloba felt so lonely in the world that he took pity upon his own loneliness. Indeed, muttered he. Every man has someone to look to, but how is it with me? I have neither comrade nor father nor mother. I am an orphan, and that is the end of it. At that moment the sergeant, Kosmak, approached him. Commander, where are we marching to? asked he. Where are we marching to? repeated Zagloba. What? Suddenly he straightened himself in the saddle and twisted his mustache. To Kamenets, if such should be my will. Do you understand? The sergeant bowed and withdrew in silence to the ranks, unable to explain to himself what the commander was angry at. But Zagloba cast threatening glances at the neighborhood, then grew quiet and muttered further. If I go to Kamenets, I'll let a hundred blows of a stick be given on the soles of my feet. Turkish fashion. Tfo. Tfo. If I only had one of those fellows with me, then I should feel more courage. What shall I begin to do with these people? I would rather be alone, for when alone a man trusts to stratagem. But now there are too many of us for stratagems and too few for defense. A very unfortunate idea of Skshetuski's to divide the detachment. And where shall I go? I know what is behind me, but who shall tell me what is in front, and who shall assure me that the devils there haven't set some snare? Krivonos and Bogan, a nice pair, may the devils flay them. God defend me at least from Bogan. Skshetuski wants to meet him, may the Lord listen to him, I wish him the same as I wish myself, for I am his friend, Amen. I'll work on to Zbruch, return to Yarmolintsi, and bring them more informants than they want themselves. That is not difficult. Kosmak now approached. Commander, some horsemen are visible behind the hill. Let them go to the devil. Where are they, where? There, on the other side of the hill, I saw flags. Troops? They appear to be troops. May the dogs bite them. Are there many of them? You can't tell, for they are far away. We might hide here behind these rocks and fall on them unawares, for their road lies this way. If their numbers are too great, Pan Volodyovsky is not far off. He will hear the shots and hasten to our aid. Daring rose suddenly to Zagloba's head like wine. It may be that despair gave him such an impulse to action. Possibly hope that Volodyovsky was still near. Enough that he waved his naked saber, rolled his eyes terribly, and cried. Hide behind the rocks. We will show those ruffians, the trained soldiers of the prince turned behind the rocks, and in the twinkle of an eye placed themselves in battle array, ready for a sudden attack. An hour passed. At last the noise of approaching people was heard. An echo bore the sounds of joyful songs. And a moment later the sounds of fiddles, bagpipes, and a drum reached the ears of the men lurking in ambush. The sergeant came to Zagloba again, and said. They are not troops, commander, nor Cossacks. It is a wedding. A wedding? I'll play a tune for them, let them wait a bit. Saying this, he rode out, and after him the soldiers, and formed in line on the road. After me, cried Zagloba, threateningly. 
The line moved on a trot, then a gallop, and passing around the cliff, stood suddenly in front of the crowd of people, frightened and confused by the unexpected sight. Stop! Stop! was the cry from both sides. It was really a peasant wedding. In front rode the piper, the flute player, the fiddler, and two drummers, already somewhat intoxicated, and playing dance music out of tune. Behind them was the bride, a brisk young woman in a dark jacket, with hair flowing over her shoulders. She was surrounded by her bridesmaids, singing songs and carrying wreaths in their hands. All the girls were sitting on horseback, man fashion, adorned with wildflowers. They looked at a distance like a party of handsome Cossacks. In another line rode the bridegroom on a sturdy horse, with his groomsmen, having wreaths on long poles, like pikes. The rear of the party was brought up by the parents of the newly married and guests, all on horseback. In light wagons strewn with straw were drawn a number of kegs of gorelka, mead, and beer, which belched out a pleasant odor along the rough, stony road. Halt! Halt! was shouted from both sides. The wedding party was confused. The young girls raised a cry of fear, and drew back to the rear. The young men and elder groomsmen rushed forward to protect the young women from the unexpected attack. Zagloba sprang before them, and brandishing his saber, which gleamed in the eyes of the terror-stricken peasants, began to shout. Ha, huh, you bullock drivers, dog tails, rebels! You wanted to join the insurrection. You are on the side of Melnitsky, you scoundrels. You are going to spy out something, you are blocking the road to troops, raising your hand against nobles. Oh, I'll give it to you, you foul spirits of curs. I'll order you to be fettered, to be impaled, O oh rascals, pagans. Now you will pay for all your crimes. A groomsman, old, and white as a dove, jumped from his horse, approached the noble, and holding his stirrup humbly, began to bow to his girdle and implore. Have mercy, serene knight. Do not ruin poor people. God is our witness that we are innocent. We are not going to a rebellion. We are going from the church at Gusiatin. We crowned our relative Dimitri, the blacksmith, with Xenia, the cooper's daughter. We have come with a wedding and with a dance. These are innocent people, whispered the sergeant. Out of my sight. They are scoundrels, they have come from Kravonoza's to a wedding, roared Zagloba. May the plague kill him, cried the old man. We have never looked on him with our eyes. We are poor people. Have mercy on us, serene lord, and let us pass, we are doing harm to no man, and we know our duty. You will go to Yarmolintsi in fetters. We will go wherever you command. Our lord, it is for you to command, for us to obey. But you will do us a kindness, serene knight. Order your soldiers to do us no harm, and you yourself pardon us simple people. We now beat to you humbly with the forehead, to drink with us to the happiness of the newly married. Drink, your mercy, to the joy of simple people, as God and the Holy Gospels command. But don't suppose that I forgive you if I drink, said Zagloba, sharply. No, no, my lord, exclaimed with joy the old man, we don't dream of it. Hey, musicians! cried he, strike up for the serene night, because the serene night is kind, and you, young men, hurry for mead, sweet mead for the night, he will not harm poor people. Hurry, boys, hurry! We thank you, our lord. The young men ran with the speed of wind to the kegs. And immediately the drum sounded, the fiddles squeaked sharply, the piper puffed out his cheeks and began to press the windbag under his arm. The groomsmen shook the wreaths on the poles, in view of which the soldiers began to press forward, twirl their mustaches, laugh, and look at the bride over the shoulders of the young fellows. The song resounded again. Terror had passed away, and here and there too was heard the joyful, Yuha! Yuha! Zagloba did not become serene-browed in a moment. Even when a quart of mead was brought to him, he still muttered to himself, Oh, the scoundrels, the ruffians! 
Even when he had sunk his mustaches in the dark surface of the mead, his brows did not unwrinkle. He raised his head, winked his eyes, and smacking his lips, began to taste the liquid. Then astonishment, but also indignation, was seen on his face. What times we live in, muttered he. Trash are drinking such mead. O Lord, thou sayest this, and dost not hurl thy bolts. Then he raised the cup and emptied it to the bottom. Meanwhile the emboldened wedding guests came with their whole company to beg him to do them no harm and let them pass. And among them came the bride Xenia, timid, trembling, with tears in her eyes, blushing and beautiful as the dawn. When she drew near she joined her hands. Be merciful, our Lord. And she kissed the yellow boot of Zagloba. The heart of the noble became soft as wax in a moment. He loosened his leather girdle, began to fumble in it, and finding the last gold sequin of those which Prince Yeremy had given him, he said to Xenia. Here. May God bless thee, as he does every innocence. Emotion did not permit further speech, for that shapely dark-browed Xenia reminded him of the princess whom Zagloba loved in his own fashion. Where is she now, poor girl, and are the angels of heaven guarding her, thought he, completely overpowered, ready to embrace everyone and become a brother to all. The wedding guests, seeing this lordly act, began to shout from joy, to sing, and crowding up to him to kiss his clothes. He is kind, was repeated in the crowd. He is a golden pole. He gives away sequins, he does no harm, he is a kind lord. Glory to him, luck to him. The fiddler quivered, he worked so hard, the hands of the drummers grew weary. The old cooper, evidently a coward to his innermost lining, had held himself in the rear till that moment. Now he pushed forward, together with his wife, the cooperess, and the ancient blacksmithess, the mother of the bridegroom. And now they began such a bowing to the girdle and insistent invitation to the house for the wedding, because it was a glory to have such a guest, and a happy augury for the young couple. If not, harm would come to them. After them bowed the bridegroom and the dark-browed Xenia, who, though a simple girl, saw in a twinkle that her request was more effective than any other. The best men shouted that the farm was near, not out of the night's road, that the old cooper was rich, and would set out mead far better than this. Zagloba gazed at the soldiers. All were moving their mustaches as rabbits do their whiskers, foreseeing for themselves various delights in the dance and the drinks. Therefore, though they did not ask to go, Zagloba took pity on them, and after a while the groomsmen, the young women, and the soldiers were making for the farm in most perfect harmony. In fact the farm was near, and the old cooper rich. The wedding therefore was noisy, all drank heavily, and Zagloba so let himself out that he was the first in everything. Soon strange ceremonies were begun. Old women took Xenia to a chamber, and shutting themselves in with her, remained a long time. Then they came forth and declared that the young woman was as a dove, as a lily. Thereupon joy reigned in the assembly, there rose a shout, glory. Happiness. The women began to clap their hands, the young fellows stamped with their feet. Each one danced by himself, with a quart cup in his hand, which he emptied to fame and happiness, before the door of the chamber. Zagloba danced also, distinguishing the importance of his birth by this only, that he drank before the door, not a quart, but half a gallon. Then the friends of the cooper and the blacksmith's wife conducted young Dmitri to the door, but since young Dmitri had no father, they bowed down to Zagloba to take his place. Zagloba consented, and passed in with the others. During this time all became quiet in the house, but the soldiers drinking in the yard before the cottage shouted, crying, Allah! From joy, in Tartar fashion, and fired from pistols. The greatest rejoicing and uproar began when the parents appeared again in the main room. The old cooper embraced the blacksmith's wife with delight, the young men came to the cooper's wife and raised her from her feet. And the women glorified her because she had guarded her daughter as the eye in her head, kept her as a dove and a lily. Then Zagloba opened the dance with her. They began to stamp in front of each other. And he, keeping time with his hands, 
dropped into the prasyatka, sprang so high, and beat the floor with his metal-shod heels in such fashion that bits flew from the planks. And sweat poured from his forehead in abundance. They were followed by others, those who had space dancing in the room, and those who had not in the yard, the maidens with the young men and soldiers. From time to time the cooper had new kegs brought out. Finally the whole wedding feast was transferred from the house to the yard. Piles of dry thistles and pitch pine were set on fire, for a dark night had settled down, and the rejoicing had changed to drinking with might and main. The soldiers fired from their pistols and muskets as in time of battle. Zagloba, purple, steaming in perspiration, tottering on his feet, forgot what was happening to him, where he was. Through the steam which came from his hair he saw the faces of his entertainers, but if he were to be impaled on a stake he couldn't tell what sort of entertainers they were. He remembered that he was at a wedding, but whose wedding was it? Ha! It must be the wedding of Pan Yen and the princess. This idea seemed to him the most probable, and finally stuck in his head like a nail, and filled him with such joy that he began to shout like a madman, Long life! Let us love each other, brothers. And every little while he filled new half gallons. To your success, brothers. To the health of the prince. Prosperity to us. May this paroxysm of our country pass. Then he covered himself with tears, and stumbled going to the keg, and stumbled more and more, for on the ground, as on a field of battle, lay many a motionless body. O oh God, cried Zagloba, thou hast no longer any manhood left in this commonwealth. There are but two men who can drink, one Pan Lash, and the other Zagloba. As for the rest, my God, my God! And he raised his eyes in sorrow to the sky. Then he saw that the heavenly bodies were no longer fastened quietly in the firmament like golden nails, but some were trembling as if they wished to spring from their settings. Others were whirling in a round dance, a third party of them were dancing the Kazachka face to face with each other. Then Zagloba fell into terribly deep thought, and said to his musing soul. Is it possible that I alone in the universe am not drunk? But suddenly the earth itself quivered, like the stars, in a mad whirl, and Zagloba fell his whole length on the ground. Soon awful dreams came to him. It seemed as if nightmares were sitting on his breast, pressing him, squeezing him to the ground, binding him hand and foot. At the same time tumult and as it were the sound of shots struck his ears. A glaring light passed his closed lids, and struck his eyes with an unendurable flash. He wished to rouse himself, to open his eyes, and he could not. He felt that something unusual was happening to him, that his head was dropping back as if he were being carried by hands and feet. Then fear seized him, he felt badly, very badly, very heavy. Consciousness returned in part, but strangely, for in company with such weakness as he had never felt in his life. Again he tried to move. But when he could not, he woke up more and opened his eyelids. Then his gaze met a pair of eyes which were fastened on him eagerly. Their pupils were black as coal, and so ill-omened that Zagloba, now thoroughly awake, thought at the first moment that the devil was looking at him. Again he closed his eyes, and again he opened them quickly. Those eyes looked at him continually, stubbornly. The countenance seemed to him familiar. All at once he shivered to the marrow of his bones, cold sweat covered him, and down his spine to his feet passed thousands of ants. He recognized the face of Bogan. Chapter 40 Zagloba lay bound hand and foot to his own saber, which was passed across behind his knees, in that same room in which the wedding was celebrated. The terrible chief sat at some distance on a bench, and feasted his eyes on the terror of the prisoner. Good evening, said he, seeing the open lids of his victim. Zagloba made no answer, but in one twinkle of an eye came to his senses as if he had never put a drop of wine to his mouth. The ants which had gone down to his heels returned to his head, and the marrow in his bones grew cold as ice. They say that a drowning man in the last moment sees clearly all his past, that he remembers everything, and gives himself an account of that which is happening to him. 
such clearness of vision and memory Zagloba possessed in that hour, and the last expression of that clearness was a silent cry, unspoken by the lips. He will give me a flaying now. And the leader repeated, with a quiet voice, Good evening. Brr, thought Zagloba, I would rather go to the Furies. Don't you know me, Lord Noble? With the forehead, with the forehead. How is your health? Not bad, but as to yours, I'll occupy myself with that. I have not asked God for such a doctor, and I doubt if I could digest your medicine, but the will of God be done. Well, you cured me, now I'll return thanks. We are old friends. You remember how you bound my head in Rosloji, do you not? Bogan's eyes began to glitter like two carbuncles, and the line of his mustaches extended in a terrible smile. I remember, said Zagloba, that I might have stabbed you, and I did not. But have I stabbed you, or do I think to stab you? No. For me you are a darling, a dear, and I will guard you as the eye in my head. I have always said that you are an honorable cavalier, said Zagloba, pretending to take Bogan's words in earnest. At the same time through his mind flew the thought, it is evident that he is meditating some special delicacy for me. I shall not die in simple style. You speak well, continued Bogan. You too are an honorable cavalier, so we have sought and found each other. What is true is that I have not sought you, but I thank you for the good word. You will thank me still more before long, and I will thank you for this, that you took the young woman from Rosloji to Bar. There I found her. And I would ask you to the wedding, but it will not be today nor tomorrow, there is war at present, and you are an old man, perhaps you will not live to see it. Zagloba, notwithstanding the terrible position in which he found himself, pricked up his ears. To the wedding, he muttered. But what did you think? asked Bogan. That I was a peasant, to constrain her without a priest, or not to insist on being married in Kiev. You brought her to Bar not for a peasant, but for an Ataman and a Hetman. Very good. Thought Zagloba. Then he turned his head to Bogan. Give the order to unbind me, said he. Oh, lie a while, lie a while. You will go on a journey. You are an old man, and you need rest before the road. Where do you wish to take me? You are my friend, so I will take you to my other friend, Krivonos. Then we shall both think how to make it pleasant for you. It will be hot for me, muttered Zagloba, and again the ants were walking over his back. At last he began to speak. I know that you are enraged at me, but unjustly, God knows. We lived together, and in Chidurin we drank more than one bottle. I had for you the love of a father for your knightly daring, a better love you did not find in the whole Ukraine. Isn't that true? In what way have I crossed your path? If I had not gone with you to Rosloji, we should have lived to this day in kind friendship, and why did I go if not out of friendship for you? And if you had not become enraged, if you had not killed those unhappy people, God is looking at me, I should not have crossed your path. Why should I mix in other men's affairs? I would have preferred to see the girl yours, but through your Tartar courtship my conscience was moved, and besides it was a noble's house. You yourself would not have acted otherwise. I might, moreover, have swept you out of the world with the greatest gain to myself. And why did I not do it? Because I am a noble. Be ashamed of yourself too, for I know you wish to take vengeance on me. As it is, you have the girl in your hands. What do you want of me? Have not I guarded as the eye in my head this your property? Since you have respected her it is to be seen that you have knightly honor and conscience. But how will you extend to her the hand which you steep in my innocent blood? How will you say to her, the man who led you through the mob and the Tartars I delivered to torment? Have shame, and let me go from these bonds and from this captivity into which you have seized me by treachery. You are young, and know not what may meet you, and for my death God will punish you in that which is dearest to you. Bogan rose from the bench, pale with rage, and approaching Zagloba, began to speak in a voice stifled with fury. Unclean swine! I will have straps torn from you, 
I'll burn you on a slow fire, I'll drive spikes into you, I'll tear you into rags. In an access of fury he grasped at the knife hanging from his belt, and for a moment pressed it convulsively in his hand. The edge was already gleaming in Zagloba's eyes, when the chief restrained himself, thrust the knife back into the scabbard, and cried, Boys! Six Zaporojans came into the room. Take that Polish carrion, throw it into the stable, and guard it as the eye in your head. The Cossacks took Zagloba, two by his hands and feet, one behind by the hair, and carrying him out of the house bore him through the yard. And threw him on a dung heap in the stable standing at one side. Then they closed the door. Complete darkness surrounded the prisoner, but in the cracks between the wall planks and through holes in the thatch the dim light of night penetrated here and there. After a while Zagloba's eyes grew accustomed to the darkness. He looked around, and saw there were no pigs in the stable, nor Cossacks. The conversation of the latter, however, reached him clearly through all the four walls. Evidently the whole building was surrounded closely, but in spite of these guards Zagloba drew a long breath. First of all, he was alive. When Bogan flashed his knife above him he was convinced that his last moment had come, and he recommended his soul to God, it is true with the greatest fear. But evidently Bogan decided to save him for a death incomparably more complicated. He desired not only to take revenge, but to glut himself with vengeance on the man who had stolen from him the beauty, belittled his Cossack glory, and covered him with ridicule. Swaddling him like a baby. It was therefore a gloomy prospect for Pan Zagloba. But he was comforted by the thought that he was still living, that likely they would take him to Kravonos and begin to torture him there, and consequently he had a few. Perhaps a number of days before him. In the meanwhile he lay in the stable alone, and could in the midst of the quiet night think of stratagems. That was the one good side of the affair. But when he thought of the bad ones the ants began to travel over his spine in thousands. Stratagems. If a pig lay here in this stable, he would have more stratagems than I, for they would not tie him crosswise to a saber. If Solomon had been bound in this way, he would have been no wiser than his trousers or my boot heel. Oh, my God, my God, for what dost thou punish me? Of all people in the world I wanted most to avoid this scoundrel, and such is my luck that he is just the man I have not avoided. I shall have my skin dressed like Svoboda cloth. If another had taken me, I might promise to join the rebellion and then run away. But another would not have believed me, and this one least of all. I feel my heart dying within me. The devils have brought me to this place. Oh, my God! My God! But after a while Zagloba thought that if he had his hands and feet free, he might more easily use some stratagem. Well, let him try. If he could only push the sword from under his knees, the rest would go on more easily. But how was he to push it out? He turned on his side, he could do nothing, then he fell into deep thought. Next he began to rock himself on his back with increasing rapidity, each moment pushing himself half the length of his body ahead. He got heated. His forehead was in greater perspiration than during the dance. At times he stopped and rested, at times he interrupted the work, for it appeared some one of the Cossacks was coming to the door. Then he began with renewed ardor. At last he pushed himself forward to the wall. After that he began to sway in another direction, not from head to foot, but from side to side, so that every time he struck lightly against the wall with the saber, which was pushed in this way from under his knees, moving more and more toward the middle of the stable from the side of the hilt. Zagloba's heart began to beat like a hammer, for he saw that this method might be effectual. He worked on, trying to strike with the least noise, and only when the conversation of the Cossacks was louder than the light blow. At last the moment came when the end of the sheath was on a line with his wrist and his knee, and further striking against the wall could not push it out. But hanging from the other side was a considerable and much heavier part of the saber, taking into consideration the hilt with the cross usually on sabers. Zagloba counted on that cross. He began to rock himself for the third time, but now the great object of his efforts was to turn himself with his feet toward the wall. 
Attaining this, he began to push himself up with his feet. The saber still clung under his knees and his hands, but the hilt became more and more involved in the uneven surface of the ground. At length the cross caught rather firmly. Zagloba pushed the last time. For a moment Joy nailed him to the spot, the saber had dropped out. He removed his hands then from his knees, and though they were still bound he caught the saber with them. He held the scabbard with his feet and drew out the blade. To cut the bonds on his feet was the work of a moment. It was more difficult in the case of his hands. He was obliged to put his saber on the ground with the edge up, and draw the cords along the edge until he had cut them. When he had done this he was not only free from bonds, but armed. He drew a long breath, then made a sign of the cross and began to thank God. But it was very far yet from the cutting of the bonds to the rescuing of himself from the hands of Bogan. What further? asked Zagloba of himself. He found no answer. The stable was surrounded by Cossacks, there were about a hundred. A mouse could not have passed through unobserved, and what could a man as bulky as Zagloba do? I see that I am beginning to come to the end of my resources, said he to himself. My wit is only good to grease boots with, and you could buy better grease than it from the Hungarians at the fair. If God does not send me some idea, then I shall become roast meat for the crows. But if he does send me an idea, then I promise to remain in continents like Pan Langin. The louder conversation of the Cossacks behind the wall interrupted his thoughts. He sprang up and put his ear to a crack between the timbers. The dry pine gave back the voices like the sounding board of a lute. And where shall we go from here, Father of Savuyu? asked one voice. To Kamenets, of course, said another. Nonsense. The horses can barely drag their legs, they will not get there. That's why we stop here, they will have rest by morning. A moment of silence followed, then the first voice was heard lower than before. And it seems to me, father, that the Ataman is going from Kamenets to Yampol. Zagloba held his breath. Be silent if your young head is dear to you, was the answer. Another moment of silence, but from behind the other walls came whispering. They are all around, on the watch everywhere, muttered Zagloba, and he went to the opposite wall. Meanwhile were heard the noise of chewing oats and the snorting of horses evidently standing right there. Among these horses the Cossacks were lying on the ground and talking, for their voices came from below. Ah! said one, we have come here without sleeping, eating, or feeding our horses, so as to go on the stake in the camp of Yeremi. The people who have fled from Yarmolintsi saw him as I see you. What they tell is a terror. He is as big as a pine tree, in his forehead are two firebrands, and he has a dragon under him for a horse. Lord, have mercy on us. We ought to take that pole with the soldiers and be off. How be off, when as it is the horses are just dying? A bad fix, brother. If I were the Ataman, would cut off the heads of those poles, and go back to Kamenets, even on foot. We will take him with us to Kamenets, and there our Ataman will play with him. The devils will play with you first, muttered Zagloba. And, indeed, in spite of all his fear of Bogan, and maybe especially because of that, he had sworn that he would not yield himself alive. He was free from bonds, and he had a saber in his hands, he would defend himself. If they cut him to pieces, all right, but they wouldn't take him alive. The snorting and groaning of horses excessively road-weary drowned the sound of further conversation, and immediately gave a certain idea to Zagloba. If I could get through the wall, thought he, and jump on horseback suddenly, it is night, and before they could see what happened I should be out of sight. It is hard enough to chase through the ravines and valleys by sunlight, but what must it be in the dark? God grant me an opportunity. But an opportunity was not to be obtained easily. It was necessary either to throw down the wall, and to do that he would have to be pan podbipienta, or to burrow under it like a fox. And then they would surely hear, discover, and seize the fugitive by the neck before he could touch the stirrup with his foot. A thousand stratagems crowded into Zagloba's head. 
but for the very reason that they were a thousand no one of them presented itself clearly. It cannot be otherwise, only with my life can I pay, thought he. Then he went toward the third wall. All at once he struck his head against something hard. He felt, it was a ladder. The stable was not for pigs, but for buffaloes, and half the length it had a loft for straw and hay. Zagloba without a moment's hesitation climbed up. Then he sat down, drew breath, and began slowly to pull up the ladder after him. Well, now I am in a fortress, he muttered. Even if they should find another ladder, they couldn't bring it here very quickly, and if I don't split the forehead of the man who comes here, then I'll give myself to be smoked into bacon. Oh, devil take it, he burst out after a while, in truth they cannot only smoke me, but fry and melt me into tallow. But let them burn the stable if they wish, all right. They won't get me alive. And it is all the same whether the crows eat me raw or roasted. If I only escape those robber hands, I don't care for the rest, and I have hope that something will happen yet. Zagloba passed easily, it is evident, from the lowest despair to hope, in fact, such hope entered him as if he were already in the camp of Prince Yeremy. But still his position had not improved much. He was sitting on the loft, and he had a saber in his hand, he might ward off an attack for some time, but that was all. From the loft to freedom was a road like jumping from the stove on your forehead, with this difference, that below the sabers and pikes of the Cossacks watching around the walls were waiting for him. Something will happen, muttered Zagloba, and approaching the roof he began to separate quietly and remove the thatch, so as to gain for himself an outlook into the world. This was easily done, for the Cossacks talked continually under the walls, wishing to kill the tedium of watching. And besides there sprang up a rather strong breeze, which deadened with its movement among the neighboring trees the noise which was made in removing the bundles. After a time the aperture was ready. Zagloba stuck his head through it and began to look around. The night had already begun to wane, and on the eastern horizon appeared the first glimmer of day. By the pale light Zagloba saw the whole yard filled with horses, in front of the cottage rows of sleeping Cossacks, stretched out like long indefinite lines. Farther on the well-sweep and the trough, in which water was glistening, and near it again a rank of sleeping men and a number of Cossacks with drawn sabers in their hands walking along that line. There are my men, bound with ropes, muttered Zagloba. Bah, he added after a while, if they were mine. But they are the princes. I was a good leader to them. There is nothing to be said on that point. I led them into the mouth of the dog. It will be a shame to show my eyes if God returns me freedom. And through what was all this? Through lovemaking and drinking. What was it to me that trash were marrying? I had as much business at this wedding as at a dog's wedding. I will renounce this traitorous mead, which crawls into the legs, not the head. All the evil in the world is from drinking. For if they had fallen upon us while sober, should have gained the victory in a trice and shut Bogan up in this stable. Zagloba's gaze fell again on the cottage in which the chief was sleeping, and rested at its door. Sleep on, you scoundrel, he muttered, sleep. And may you dream that the devils are skinning you, a thing which will not miss you in any case. You wanted to make a sieve out of my skin. Try to crawl up to me here and we shall see if I do not cut yours so that it wouldn't do to make boots for a dog. If I could only get myself out of this place, if I could only get out. But how? Indeed the problem was not to be solved. The whole yard was so packed with men and horses that even if Zagloba had got out of the stable, even if he had pushed through the thatch and sprung on one of the horses that stood right there, he could in no wise have pushed to the gate. And then how was he to get beyond the gate? Still, it seemed to him that he had solved more than half the problem. He was free, armed, and he sat in the loft as in a fortress. What the devil good is there, thought he, in getting out of the rope if you are to be hanged with it afterward? And again stratagems began to bustle in his head. But there were so many of them that he could not choose. Meanwhile the light increased, the places around the cottage began to emerge from the shadow. 
the thatch of the cottage was covered as if by silver. Zagloba could distinguish accurately particular groups. He could see the red uniforms of his men, who were lying around the well, and the sheepskin coats under which the Cossacks were sleeping near the cottage. Then suddenly some figure rose from the rank of the sleepers and began to pass with slow step through the yard, halting here and there near men and horses. Speaking for a moment with the Cossacks who were guarding the prisoners, and at last approached the stable. Zagloba supposed at first that it was Bogan, for he saw that the guard spoke to that figure as subordinates to a superior. Eh! He muttered, if I had a musket now, I would show you how to cover yourself with your feet. At this moment the figure raised its head, and on its face fell the grey light of the morning. It was not Bogan, but the Sotnik Golody, whom Zagloba recognized at once, for he knew Golody well from the time of his own intimacy with Bogan in Chigirin. Well, boys, you are not asleep? said Golody. No, father, though we should like to sleep. It is about time to change guard. It will be changed immediately. And that devil's imp has not got away? No, no. Unless the soul has gone out of him, father, for he hasn't moved. Ah! He is an old fox. But look, see what he is doing, for he would go through the ground. This minute. Answered a number of Cossacks, going to the door of the stable. Throw out hay from the mow. Rub the horses. We will start at sunrise. All right, father. Zagloba, leaving at once his lookout in the opening of the thatch, crawled to the hole in the floor. At the same moment he heard the creak of the wooden hinges and the rustling of the straw under the feet of the Cossacks. His heart beat like a hammer in his breast, and he pressed the hilt of the saber in his hand. Renewing in his soul the oath that he would resign himself to be burned with the stable or be cut to pieces rather than be taken alive. He expected every moment that the Cossacks would raise a fearful uproar, but he was deceived. For a time he heard them walking more and more quickly through the whole stable. At last one said. What the devil is the matter? I can't find him. We threw him in here. He isn't a werewolf, is he? Strike a light, Vasily, it is as dark here as in a forest. A moment of silence followed. Evidently Vasily was looking for flint and tinder, while the other Cossacks began to call in a low voice, Where are you? Kiss the dog's ear, muttered Zagloba. Steel struck flint, a cluster of sparks flashed forth and lighted the dark interior of the stable and the heads of the Cossacks in their caps, then deeper darkness came down again. He is not here. He is not here, cried excited voices. That moment one sprang to the door. Father Golody. Father Golody. What's the matter? cried the Sotnik, approaching the door. There is no pole. How, no pole? He has gone into the ground, he isn't anywhere. Oh God, have mercy on us. We struck fire, he is not here. Impossible. Oh, you will catch it from the Adaman. Has he escaped, or how is it? You have been asleep. No, father, we have not slept. He didn't get out of the stable on our side. Be quiet. Don't wake the Adaman. If he hasn't gone out, then he must be here. Have you looked everywhere? Everywhere. On the loft too? How could he crawl on the loft when he was bound? You fool! If he hadn't unbound himself, he would be here. Look on the loft. Strike a light. Sparks flashed again. The news flew in a moment among all the guards. They began to crowd to the stable with the haste usual on sudden occasions, hurried steps were heard, hurried questions and still more hurried answers. Advices crossed one another like swords in battle. To the loft. To the loft. But watch outside. Don't wake the adamant, if you do, there will be terror. The ladder is gone. Bring another. There is none anywhere. Run to the cottage, see if there is one there. Oh, curse the pole. 
Go up the corners to the thatch, get in through the thatch. Impossible. For the roof projects and is fastened with planks. Bring the lances, we will go up on the lances. Ah, the dog. He has hauled up the ladder. Bring the lances, roared Golati. Some ran for the lances, while others stretched their heads up toward the loft. Already scattered light penetrated through the open door into the stable. And with its uncertain gleam was to be seen the square opening in the loft, black and silent. From below were heard single voices. Now, Sir Noble, let down the ladder and come. You won't get away, anyhow, why put people to trouble? Come down, oh, come down. Silence. You are a wise man. If it would do you any good, you might stay up there. But since it won't help you, come down of your own accord, be a good fellow. Silence. Come down. If you don't, we will skin your head and throw you head first into the dung heap. Zagloba was as deaf to threats as to coaxing, sitting in the dark like a badger in his hole, preparing for a stubborn defense. He only grasped his saber tighter, panted a little, and whispered his prayers. Lances were now brought, three of them tied together, and placed with their points to the opening. The thought flashed through Zagloba's mind to grasp and draw them up, but he thought that the roof might be too low, and he couldn't draw them up entirely. Besides, others would be brought at once. Meanwhile the stable became crowded with Cossacks. Some held torches, others brought from wagons all kinds of ladders and poles, every one of which turned out to be too short. These they lashed together hurriedly with straps, for it was really difficult to climb on the lances. Still they found volunteers. I'll go, called a number of voices. Wait for the ladder. Said Golati. And what harm is it, father, to try on the lances? Vasily will climb, he goes like a cat. Let him try. But others began to joke immediately. Be careful. He has a saber. He will cut your head off. Look out. He will grab you by the head, drag you in, and treat you as a bear would. But Vasily didn't allow himself to be frightened. He knows, said Vasily, that if he should lay a finger on me the adamant would give him the devil to eat, and you, brothers. This was a warning to Zagloba, who sat quietly, and did not even mutter. But the Cossacks, as is usual among soldiers, got into good humor, for the whole affair began to amuse them. So they kept on teasing Vasily. There will be one blockhead less in the white world. He won't think how we shall pay him for your head. He is a bold hero. Ho, ho. He is a werewolf. The devil knows into what form he has turned already. He is a wizard. Can't tell, Vasily, whom you will find there behind the opening. Vasily, who had already spat on his palms and was just grasping the lances by the stem, stopped suddenly. I'll go against a pole, said he, but not against the devil. But now the ladders were lashed together and placed at the opening. It was difficult to climb them, too, for they bent immediately where they were tied, and the slender round cracked under the feet, which were placed on the lowest one to try. But Golody himself began to ascend, while going, he said. My dear noble, you see that there is no joking here. If you have made up your mind to stay up there, stay. But don't fight, for we will get you anyhow, even if we have to pull the stable to pieces. Have sense. At last his head reached the opening and went through it slowly. All at once the whiz of a saber was heard. The Cossack screamed fearfully, tottered, and fell, with his head cut in two. Cut! Slash! roared the Cossacks. A fearful tumult began in the stable. Shouts and cries were raised, which were overborne by the thundering voice of Zagloba. Oh, you scoundrels, you man-eaters, you basilisks! I'll cut you to pieces, you mangy ruffians! You'll know a knightly hand! Attacking honest people by night, shutting a noble in a stable! Scoundrels! Come to me by ones or by twos, only come! Come along! 
but you'll leave your heads on the dung heap, for I'll hew them off, as I live. Cut! Cut! shouted the Cossacks. We will burn the stable. I'll burn it myself, you oxtails, and you with it. Several, several at a time, shouted an old Cossack. Support the ladder, prop it with lances, take bundles of hay on your heads and go on. We must get him. Then he mounted, and with him two comrades. The rounds began to break, the ladders bent still more. But more than twelve strong hands seized them by the sides propped by the lances, others thrust the points of lances through the opening to ward off the blows of the saber. A few moments later three bodies fell on the heads of those standing below. Zagloba, heated by his triumph, bellowed like a buffalo, and poured out such curses as the world had never heard, and from which the souls of the Cossacks would have died within them. If fury had not begun to possess them. Some thrust their lances into the loft, others hurried on the ladders, though sure death waited them in the opening. Suddenly a shout was heard at the door, and into the stable rushed Bogan himself. He was without a cap, in trousers and shirt, in his hand was a drawn saber, and in his eyes fire. Through the thatch, he shouted. Tear the thatch apart and take him alive. But Zagloba, seeing him, roared, Ruffian, just come up here. I'll cut off your nose and ears. I won't touch your neck, for that belongs to the hangman. Well, are you afraid, my urchin? Then Zagloba said to the Cossacks, Tie that scoundrel for me, and you will all be pardoned. Well, gallows bird. Well, Jew's picture. I am alone here, only show your head on this loft. Come, come. I shall be glad to see you, I'll give you such a reception that you'll remember it with your father the devil, and your mother a harlot. The poles of the roof now began to crack. It was evident the Cossacks were up there and tearing through the thatch. Zagloba heard, but fear didn't deprive him of power, he was as if drunk with the battle and with blood. I'll spring to the corner and perish there, thought he. But that instant gunshots were heard in the yard. A number of Cossacks rushed to the stable. Father! Father! they shouted. This way! Zagloba at the first moment did not understand what had happened, and was astonished. He looked down through the opening, there was no one there. The rafters were not cracking. What is it? What has happened? he cried aloud. Ah! I understand. They want to burn the stable, and fire from pistols at the roof. Then was heard the uproar of people, more terrible every moment, and the tramp of horses. Shouts mixed with howls and the clatter of steel. My God, that must be a battle! thought Zagloba, springing to the opening in the thatch. He looked, and his legs bent under him with delight. In the yard a battle was raging, and soon Zagloba beheld the terrible defeat of Bogan's Cossacks. Attacked on a sudden, struck with fire from pistols placed at their heads and breasts, pushed to the fences, to the cottage and outhouses, cut with swords, thrown down by the rush of horses. Trampled with their hoofs, the Cossacks perished almost without resistance. The ranks of red-uniformed soldiers, cutting furiously and pressing on the fugitives, did not allow them to form, to use their sabers, to draw breath, or to reach their horses. Only detached groups defended themselves. Some, favored by the disturbance, uproar, and smoke, succeeded in reaching their loosened saddle girths, and perished before they touched the stirrups with a foot. Others, throwing away lances and sabers, disappeared under the fences, got stuck between the posts, or jumped over the top, shouting and crying with unearthly voices. It seemed to the unfortunates that Prince Jeremy himself had fallen upon them unexpectedly, and was shivering them with his whole power. They had no time to come to their minds to look around. The shouts of the victors, the whistle of sabers, and the rattle of shots chased them like a storm. The hot breath of horses was on their necks. Save yourselves, men, was heard on every side. Slay! Kill, was the response of the assailants. 
At last Zagloba saw little Volodyovsky as, standing near the gate at the head of a number of soldiers, he gave directions with his baton and voice. And sometimes rushed on his grey horse into the whirl, and then the moment he turned or struck, a man fell without uttering a sound. Oh, but he was a master beyond masters, little Volodyovsky, and a soldier, blood and bone. He did not lose sight of the battle, but making a correction here and there, returned again, looked and corrected, like the director of an orchestra, who at times plays himself, at times stops. Watching carefully over all, so that each man may fill his part. When he saw this, Zagloba stamped on the floor of the loft till the dust rose. He clapped his hands and shouted. Slay the dog brothers. Kill them. Flay them. Cut, slash, H-E-W, kill. On to them, on. Saber them to a man. Thus he shouted and jumped till his eyes were inflamed from exertion, and he lost vision for a moment. But when he regained his eyesight he saw a still more beautiful spectacle. There, at the head of a number of Cossacks, was Bogan, rushing away on horseback like lightning, without a cap, in his shirt and trousers, and after him, at the head of his soldiers. Little Volodyovsky. Slay, shouted Zagloba, that's Bogan. But his voice did not reach them. That moment Bogan with his heroes was over the fence, Volodyovsky over the fence. Some remained behind. Horses fell under others in the leap. Zagloba looked. Bogan is on the plain, Volodyovsky is on the plain. Then the Cossacks scatter in their flight, and soldiers in their pursuit. Individual pursuit begins. Zagloba's breath died within his breast, his eyes were almost bursting through his lids, for what does he see? Volodyovsky is almost on the neck of Bogan, like a hound on a wild boar. The chief turns his head, raises his saber, they fight. Zagloba shouts. Still another moment, and Bogan falls with his horse. And Volodyovsky, leaving him, hurries after the others. But Bogan is alive, he rises from the ground and runs to a pile of rocks surrounded with bushes. Hold him. Hold him, roared Zagloba. That's Bogan. Then a new band of Cossacks hurry on, who till that moment had been hiding on the other side of the rocks, but now discovered, seek a new way of escape. Pushed by soldiers who are about half a furlong behind. This party comes up to Bogan, bears him away, disappears from sight in the turns of the ravine, and after it disappear the soldiers. In the yard it was silent and empty. For the soldiers of Zagloba, rescued by Volodyovsky, chased after the Cossacks and pursued with the others the scattered enemy. Zagloba let down the ladder, slipped from the loft, and coming out of the stable into the yard, said, I am free. Then he began to look around. In the yard lay a number of Zaporozhian bodies and some poles. He walked slowly among them, and examined each carefully. At length he knelt over one of them. Soon he rose with a canteen in his hand. It is full, he muttered, and placing it to his mouth he raised his head. Not bad. Again he looked round, and again he repeated, but with a much clearer voice, I am free. He went to the cottage. On the threshold he came upon the body of the old cooper, whom the Cossacks had killed there. He disappeared inside. When he came out, around his hips, over a coat soiled with manure, glittered Bogan's belt, thickly embroidered with gold, at the belt a knife with a great ruby in the hilt. God has rewarded bravery, he muttered, for the belt is pretty full. Ah, you wretched robber, I have hope that you will not escape. That little hop of my thumb, may the bullet strike him. Is a lively piece, just like a wasp. I knew he was a good soldier, but to drive Bogan as he would a white-faced mare, I did not expect that of him. That there should be such strength and courage in such a little body. Bogan might carry him on a string at his belt. May the bullet strike Volodyovsky, but better, may God give him luck. He couldn't have known Bogan, or he would have finished him. Foo! How it smells of powder here, enough to pierce the nose. 
but if I didn't get out of a scrape this time such as I have never been in before. Praise to God. Well, well, but so to drive Bogan. I must examine this Volodyovsky again, for it must be there is a devil sitting inside of him. Zagloba sat on the threshold of the stable in meditation, and waited. Presently there appeared at a distance on the plain soldiers returning from the victory, and at their head rode Volodyovsky. When he saw Zagloba, Volodyovsky galloped up, and springing from his horse, came to him. Do I see you once more, called he, at a distance. Me, in my own person, said Zagloba. God reward you for coming with reinforcements in time. Thanks be to God that I came in time, said the little knight, pressing the palm of Zagloba with joy. But where did you hear of the straits in which I was? The peasants of this place gave information. Oh, and I thought they betrayed me. Why should they? They are honest. The newly married barely got off with their lives, and what happened to the others they know not. If they are not traitors, then they are killed by the Cossacks. The master of the house lies near the door. But what of that? Tell me, is Bogan alive, did he escape, he without a cap, in the shirt and trousers, whom you threw with his horse? I hit him on the head, but it is too bad that I didn't know him. But tell me, my good Zagloba, what is the best you have done? What have I done, repeated Zagloba. Come, Pan Michael, and see. He took him by the hand and led him into the stable. Look at that. Volodyovsky saw nothing for a while, for he had come in from the light. But when his eyes had become used to the darkness he saw bodies lying motionless on the dung heap. And who cut down these men, asked he, in astonishment. I, said Zagloba. You have asked what I did. Here it is before you. But, said the young officer, how did you do it? I defended myself up there. They stormed me from below and through the roof. I don't know how long it was, for in battle a man doesn't reckon time. It was Bogan, with a strong force and chosen men. He will remember you, he will remember me too. At another time I will tell you how I fell into captivity, what I passed through, and how I settled Bogan, for I had an encounter of tongues with him. But now I am so wearied that I can scarcely stand. Well, repeated Volodyovsky, it is not to be denied you defended yourself manfully. But I will say this, you are a better swordsman than general. Pan Michael, said the noble, it is no time for discussion. Better thank God, who has sent down to us today so mighty a victory, the memory of which will not soon vanish from among men. Volodyovsky looked with astonishment at Zagloba, since it had appeared to him hitherto that he alone had gained that victory which Zagloba evidently wished to share with him. But he only looked, shook his head, and said, Let it be so. An hour later the two friends, at the head of their united parties, moved on to Yarmolintsy. Almost no one was missing from Zagloba's men, for sprung upon in their sleep, they offered no resistance. Bogan, being sent specially for informants, had given orders not to kill, but to take prisoners. Chapter 41 Bogan, though a brave, clear-sighted leader, had no luck in this expedition against the supposed division of Prince Yeremy. He was merely confirmed in the belief that the prince had really moved his whole force against Krivonos. For this was the information given by the captives from among Zagloba's men, who believed most sacredly that the prince was marching after them. Nothing remained then for the unfortunate Adaman but to withdraw with all speed to Krivonos, but the task was not easy. Scarcely on the third day was a party of two hundred and a few tens of Cossacks collected around him. The others had either fallen in the fight, were lying wounded on the field of struggle, or were wandering yet among the ravines and reeds, not knowing what to do, how to turn, or where to go. Besides, the party left to Bogan was not good for much, for it was beaten, inclined to flee at every alarm, demoralized, frightened. And it was made up too of chosen men. Better soldiers it would be difficult to find in the whole sage. But the heroes didn't know with what a small force Pan Volodyovsky had struck them, and that, thanks only to the unexpected attack on sleeping and unprepared men, 
could he inflict such a defeat? They believed most sacredly that they had been fighting, if not with the prince himself, at least with a strong detachment several times more numerous than it was. Bogan raged like fire. Cut in the hand, run over, sick, beaten, he had let his inveterate enemy out of his hands, and belittled his own fame. For now those Cossacks who on the eve of the defeat would have followed him blindly to the Crimea, to hell, and against the prince himself, had lost faith and courage. And were thinking only how to carry their lives out of the defeat. Still Bogan had done everything that a leader was bound to do. He had neglected nothing, he had established pickets at a distance from the house. And rested only because the horses which had come from Kamenets almost at one course were altogether unfit for the road. But Volodyovsky, whose youth had been passed in surprising and hunting Tartars, approached the pickets like a fox in the night, seized them before they could shout or fire, and fell upon them in such fashion that Bogan could escape only in his shirt and trousers. When the chief thought of this the light grew dark in his eyes, his head swam, and despair gnawed his soul like a mad dog. He who on the Black Sea had rushed upon Turkish galleys, and galloped on the necks of Tartars to Perikop, and lighted up the eyes of the Khan with the blaze of his villages. And under the hand of the prince near Lubny itself had cut a garrison to pieces at Vasilyevka, had to flee in his shirt. Bareheaded and without a saber, for he had lost that too in his meeting with the little knight. So at the stopping places where the horses were fed, when no man was looking, the chief seized himself by the head and cried, Where is my Cossack glory, where my saber friend? When he cried in this way a wild raving carried him away, and then he drank as if he were not a creature of God, and wanted to march against the prince. Attack all his forces, perish and disappear for the ages. He wished it, but the Cossacks did not. Though you kill us, father, we will not go, was their gloomy answer to his outbursts. And vainly in accesses of fury he cut at them with his saber and singed their faces with his pistol, they would not, they did not go. You would have said that the ground was slipping away from the adamant's feet, for this was not the end of his misfortune. Fearing on account of probable pursuit to go straight to the south, and thinking that perhaps Cravonos had already given up the siege, he rushed straight to the east and came upon the party of Pan Podbipienta. Pan Longin, wakeful as a stork, did not permit an attack, but falling first on Bogan, defeated him the more easily because his Cossacks were unwilling to fight. When he had defeated him he turned him over to Skshetuski, who beat him worst of all. So that Bogan, after long wanderings in the steppes with a few horses only, without glory, without Cossacks, without booty, without informants, made his way back at last to Krivonos. But the wild Krivonos, usually so terrible to subordinates whom fortune did not favor, was not angry this time. He knew from his own experience what an affair with Yeremy meant. Therefore he even petted Bogan, comforted him, quieted him, pacified him, and when he fell into a violent fever, gave orders to nurse and cure him with all care. The four officers of the prince, having filled the country with terror and dismay, returned safely to Yarmolintsi, where they remained several days to give rest to the men and horses. There, when they came into the same quarters, they gave to Skshetuski, each in turn, an account of what had happened to them and what they had accomplished. Then they sat down by the bottle to relieve their hearts in friendly converse and satisfy their mutual curiosity. But Zagloba gave little chance to any man to speak. He had no desire to listen, but wished only that others should listen to him, in truth it came out that he had the most to tell. Gentlemen, said he, I fell into captivity, it is true. But fortune turns around. Bogan has been all his life victorious, but we beat him this time. That is how it is usually in war. Today you tan people, tomorrow they tan you. But God punished Bogan because he fell upon us, sleeping sweetly the sleep of the just, and roused us in such a dishonorable way. Ho, ho! He thought to terrify me with his filthy tongue. But I tell you here, gentlemen, that I cornered him so that he lost his boldness, became confused, and said what he didn't want to say. What's the use of talking long? If I hadn't got into captivity, 
Pan Michael and I would not have defeated him. I say both of us, because in this affair magna pars fui, and I shall not cease to insist on it to my death. So God give me health. Hear my reasons further, if I and Volodyovsky had not beaten him, then Podbipienta would not have beaten him, and further Skshatusky would not have beaten him. And finally if we hadn't beaten him he would have beaten us, and who was the cause that this didn't take place? Ah! It is with you as with a fox, said Pan Longin. You wave your tail here, slink away there, and always get out. It's a foolish hound that runs after his own tail, for he will not catch it and will not smell anything honorable, and besides will lose his wind. How many men have you lost? Twelve in all, and some wounded, they didn't strike us very hard. And you, Pan Michael? About thirty, for I fell upon them unawares. And you, Lieutenant? As many as Pan Longin. And I lost two. See yourselves who is the best leader. That's the question. Why did we come here? On the service of the prince, to get news of Krivonos. Well, I tell you, gentlemen, that I first got news of him, and from the best source, because I got it from Bogan. And I know that he is at Kamenets, but he thinks of raising the siege, for he is afraid. I know this openly. But I know something else which will put joy into your heart, and of which I have not spoken because I wanted that we should counsel about it together. I was sick till now, for weariness overpowered me, and my bowels rose up against that villainous binding on a stick. I thought my blood would boil over. Tell us, for God's sake! cried Volodyovsky, have you heard anything of our unfortunate lady? Yes, God bless her, said Zagloba. Skshatusky rose to his full height and then sat down. There followed such a silence that the buzzing of the mosquitoes was heard on the windows till Zagloba began again. She lives, I know that certainly, she is in Bogan's hands. Gentlemen, it is a terrible thing, however, God has not permitted harm or disgrace to meet her. Bogan himself told me this, he who would rather boast of something else. How can that be? How can that be? asked Skshatusky, feverishly. If I lie, may a thunderbolt strike me, said Zagloba, with importance, for this is a sacred thing. Listen to what Bogan said when he wished to jeer at me before I settled him at last. Did you think, said he, that you brought her to bar for a peasant? That I was a peasant to constrain her by force, that I was not to be married in Kiev in the church, and monks sing for me, and three hundred candles burn for me, me, an adaman, a hetman. And he stamped his feet and threatened me with his knife, for he thought he was frightening me, but I told him to frighten the dogs. Skshatusky had now recovered himself. His monk's face lighted up, gladness and uncertainty played on it again. Where is she now, where is she? he asked hurriedly. If you have found that out, then you have come from heaven. He did not tell me that, but two words are enough for a wise head. Remember, gentlemen, he jeered me all the while till I planted him, and then he went in. First I'll take you, said he, to Cravonos, and then I would invite you to the wedding, but now there is war, so it will not come off soon. Think of it, gentlemen, not come off soon. Therefore we have plenty of time. Secondly, think, first to Cravonos, then to the wedding, therefore in no way is she at the camp of Cravonos, but somewhere farther, where the war has not reached. You are a man of gold, said Volodyovsky. I thought at first, said the delightfully flattered Zagloba, that maybe he had sent her to Kiev. But no, for he said he would go for the wedding to Kiev with her. If they will go, it means that she is not there. And he is too shrewd to take her there now, for if Melnitsky should push into Red Russia, Kiev could be taken easily by the Lithuanian forces. Surely, surely, cried Pan Longin. Now, as God is just to me, no man could change minds with you. But I shouldn't change with everyone, lest I might get soup instead of reason, a thing which might easily happen among the Lithuanians. Oh, he is beginning again, said Pan Longin. Well, since she is not with Krivonos nor in Kiev, where is she? 
there's the difficulty. If you have worked it out, then tell me quickly, for fire is burning me, said Skshatuski. Beyond Yampol, said Zagloba, and rolled his one sound eye triumphantly. How do you know? inquired Volodyovsky. How do I know? Here is how, I was sitting in the stable, for that brigand had me shut up in the stable, may the wild boars rip him, and the Cossacks were talking among themselves all around. I put my ear to the wall then, and what did I hear? Now maybe the Adaman will go beyond Yampol, said one, and then the other answered, be silent, if your young head is dear to you. I'll give my neck that she is beyond Yampol. Oh, as sure as God is in heaven, cried Volodyovsky. He did not take her to the wilderness. Therefore, according to my head, he must have hidden her somewhere between Yampol and Yagerlik. I was once in that region when the judges of the king and the Khan met. For in Yagerlik, as you know, cattle questions of the boundary are tried, of which cases there is never a lack. Along the whole Dniester there are ravines, hidden places, and reeds in which living by themselves are people who know no authority, dwell in the wilderness, and see no neighbors. He has hidden her surely among such wild solitaries, for he would be surest of her there. But how can we go there now, when Cravonos bars the way? asked Pan Longin. Yampol too, I hear, is a nest of robbers. To this Skshatuski replied, though I had to risk my life ten times, I should try to save her. I will go disguised and look for her. God will help me, I shall find her. I will go with you, Yen, said Volodyovsky. And I as a minstrel with my lute. Believe me, gentlemen, that I have more experience than any of you. But since the lute has disgusted me to the last degree, I'll take bagpipes. I too shall be good for something, said Podbipienta. Of course, added Zagloba. Whenever we need to cross the Dnieper you will carry us over, like Saint Christopher. I thank you for my soul, gentlemen, said Pan Yen, and I accept your readiness with a willing heart. There is nothing to be compared with trusty friends, of whom as I see providence has not deprived me. May the great God grant me to repay you with my health and property. We are all as one man. Shouted Zagloba. God is pleased with concord and you will find that we shall soon see the fruit of our labors. Then nothing else remains to me, said Skshatuski, after a moment's silence, but to deliver up the squadron to the prince, and start at once. We will go by the Dniester, along through Yampol to Yagerlik, and look everywhere. But if, as I hope, Melnitsky is already crushed or will be before we reach the prince, then public service will not be in the way. Certain regiments will go to the Ukraine, to finish the remnant of the rebellion, but they will get on without us. Wait, said Volodyovsky, doubtless after Melnitsky, Kravonos's turn will come. Maybe we shall go together with the regiments to Yampol. No, we must go there before, answered Zagloba. But first of all give up the squadron, so as to have free hand. I hope, too, that the prince will be satisfied with us. Especially with you. That's true, for I shall bring him the best news. Believe me, I expect a reward. When shall we take the road? We must rest till morning, said Volodyovsky. Let Skshatuski command, however, for he is chief here, but I forewarn you, if we start today my horses will all give out. I know that it is impossible to start today, said Skshatuski, but I think after good oats we can go tomorrow. They started on the following day. According to the orders of the prince, they were to return to Zbaraj and wait further orders. They went consequently through Kuzmin, aside from Felsten, to Volochysk, from which the old highway led through Hlebanovka to Zbaraj. The roads were bad, for rain was falling, though quietly. Pan Longin, going ahead with one hundred horses, broke up a few disorderly bands that had gathered around the rear of the forces of the commander-in-chief. At Volochysk they stopped for the night. But they had barely begun a pleasant sleep after the long road, when they were roused by an alarm, and the guards informed them that cavalry detachments were approaching. Immediately came the news that it was Virchel's Tartar squadron, therefore their own men. 
Zagloba, Pan Longin, and Volodyovsky met at once in Skshatusky's room. And right after them rushed in, like a storm, an officer of the light cavalry, breathless and covered with mud. When he had looked at him, Skshatusky cried out, Virchil. Yes, it is I, said the newly arrived, unable to catch his breath. From the prince? Yes. Oh for breath, breath. What news? All over with Melnitsky? All, over with, the Commonwealth. By the wounds of Christ, what do you say? Defeat. Defeat, disgrace, shame, without a battle, a panic, oh. Oh. Skshatusky could not believe his ears. But speak. Speak, in the name of the living God. The commanders. Ran away. Where is our prince? Retreating, without an army, I am here from the prince, the order to Lvov, at once, they are pursuing us. Who? Virchil, Virchil, come to your senses, man. Who is pursuing? Melnitsky and the Tartars. In the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Ghost, cried Zagloba. The earth is opening. But Skshatusky understood already what the matter was. Questions later on. Now to horse. To horse. To horse. The hoofs of the horses under Virchil's Tartars were clattering by the windows. The townspeople, roused by the arrival of troops, burst from their houses with lanterns and torches in their hands. The news flew through the town like lightning. The alarm was sounded. The town, silent a moment before, was filled with yells, tramping of horses, shouting of orders, and wailing of Jews. The inhabitants wishing to leave with the troops got ready wagons, in which they put their wives and children, with feather beds. The mayor, at the head of a number of citizens, came to beg Skshatusky not to depart at once, but to convoy the inhabitants even to Tarnopol. Skshatusky would not listen. For the order received was explicit, to go to Lvov as fast as his breath would let him. They hurried away therefore, and on the road Virchil, recovering breath, told what had happened, and how. Since the commonwealth has been a commonwealth, said he, never has it borne such a defeat. Tsetsora, Jaltia Vodi, Korsan, are nothing in comparison. Skshatusky, Volodyovsky, and Pan Langin bent down to the necks of their horses, now grasping their own heads, now raising their hands to heaven. The thing passes human belief, said they. But where was the prince? Deserted by all, thrust aside on purpose, he did not command, in fact, his own division. Who had command? No man, and all men. I have been long in service, I have eaten my teeth in war, and yet up to this day I have not seen such armies and such leaders. Zagloba, who had no great love for Virchil and knew him but little, began to shake his head and smack his lips. At last he said, My dear sir, either your vision is confused, or you have taken some partial defeat for a general one, for what you relate passes imagination completely. That it passes imagination, I confess, and I'll say more to you, that I should gladly give my head to be severed if by some miracle it should appear that I am mistaken. But how did you get to Volochysk first after the defeat? For I don't wish to admit that you were the first to run away. Where, then, are the forces in flight? In what direction are they fleeing? What has happened to them? Why didn't the fugitives get ahead of you? To all these questions I seek an answer in vain. Virchil at any other time would not have permitted such questions, but at that moment he could think of nothing but the defeat. Therefore he merely answered. I came first to Volochysk, for the others are retreating to Ajagovtsi, and the prince hurried me off on purpose toward the place in which he thought you were. So the avalanche might not catch you through hearing the news too late. And secondly, because the five hundred horse which you have are no small comfort to him, for the greater part of his division is killed or in flight. Wonderful things, said Zagloba. It's a terror to think of. Desperation seizes one, the heart is cut, tears flow, said Volodyovsky, wringing his hands. The country destroyed, 
disgrace after death, such forces dispersed, lost. It cannot be that there is anything but the end of the world and the approach of the last judgment. Don't interrupt him, said Skshetuski, let him tell all. Virchow was silent for a time, as if collecting his strength, nothing was heard but the plashing of hoofs in the mud, for rain was falling. It was still the depth of night, and very dark, because cloudy. And in that darkness and rain the words of Virchow, who began thus to speak, had a wonderful sound of ill omen. If I had not expected to fall in battle, I should have lost my reason. You speak of the last judgment, and I think it will come soon, for everything is going to pieces, wickedness rises above virtue, and Antichrist is walking through the world. You have not seen what took place, but if you are not able to bear even the story of it, how is it with me, who saw with my own eyes the defeat and measureless disgrace? God gave us a happy beginning in this war. Our prince, after getting satisfaction at Kalgansky Cayman from Pan Lash, gave the rest to oblivion, and made peace with Prince Dominic. We were all pleased with this concord, really a blessing of God. The prince gained a second victory at Konstantinov, and took the place, for the enemy left it after the first storm. Then we marched to Palavtsi, though the prince did not advise going there. But immediately on the road various machinations were manifest against him, ill will, envy, and evident intrigue. He was not listened to in councils, no attention was paid to his words, and above all, efforts were made to separate our division, so that the prince should not have it all in hand. If he should oppose, the blame of defeat would be thrown on him. He was silent, therefore, suffered and endured. By order of the commander-in-chief the light cavalry, together with Wurzel and the cannon. Colonel Machnitsky, Asinsky, and Karitsky, were detached, so that there remained with the prince only the Hussars and Zatsvilikovsky, two regiments of dragoons, and I. With a part of my squadron, altogether not more than two thousand men. And they paid no attention to the prince, he was despised, and I heard how the clients of Prince Dominic said, they won't say now, after the victory, that it came through Vishnevetsky. And they said openly that if such a measurable glory covered Yeremy, his candidate, Prince Karl, could carry the election, and they want Casimir. The whole army was infected with factions, so that harangues were held in circles, as if they were sending delegates to the diets. They were thinking of everything but battle, just as if the enemy had been beaten already. But if I were to tell you of the feasting and the applauding, you would not believe me. The legions of Pyrrhus were nothing in comparison with those armies, all in gold, jewels, and ostrich feathers, with two hundred thousand camp followers. Legions of wagons followed us, horses dropped dead under the weight of gold-tipped and silken tents, wagons were breaking under provision chests. You would have thought we were going to the conquest of the world. Nobles of the general militia shook their sticks, saying, this is how we will pacify the trash, and not kill them with swords. We old soldiers, accustomed to fighting without talking, had a foreboding of evil at the sight of this unheard of pride. Then began tumults against Kaisel, that he was a traitor. And tumults for him, that he was a worthy senator. They cut one another with sabres when they were drunk, there were no commanders of camps, no one looked after order, there was no general. Each one did what he liked, went where it pleased him best, stopped, took his place where it suited him, and the camp followers raised such an uproar. Oh, merciful God! That was a carnival, not a campaign, a carnival at which the salvation of the commonwealth was danced away, drunk away, ridden away, and chaffered away, to the last bit. But we are still alive, said Volodyovsky. And God is in heaven, added Skshetuski. A moment of silence followed. Then Virchow said. We shall perish totally, unless God performs a miracle and ceases to chastise us for our sins and shows us unmerited mercy. At times I do not believe myself what I saw with my own eyes, and it seems to me that a nightmare was choking me in my sleep. Tell further, said Zagloba, you came to Palavtsi, and then what? We stopped. What the commanders counseled I know not. At the last judgment they will answer for that. If they had struck Melnitsky at once he would have been shattered and swept away, 
as God is in heaven, in spite of disorder, insubordination, tumult, and want of a leader. On their side was panic among the rabble, they were already taking counsel how to give up Melnitsky and the elders, and he himself was meditating flight. Our prince rode from tent to tent, begged, implored, threatened. Let us strike, said he, before the Tartar comes. He tore the hair from his head. Men looked at one another, but did nothing and nothing. They drank, they had meetings. Reports came that the Tartars were marching, the Khan with two hundred thousand horsemen. The commanders counseled and counseled. The prince shut himself up in his tent, for they had set him aside altogether. In the army they began to say that the Chancellor had forbidden Prince Dominic to give battle, that negotiations were going on. Still greater disorder appeared. At last the Tartars came, but God gave us luck the first day. The prince and Pan Asinski fought, and Pan Lash did very well. They drove the Tartar horde from the field, cut them up considerably. But afterward, here Virchel's voice died in his breast. But afterward, asked Zagloba. Came the terrible, inexplicable night which I remember. I was on guard with my men by the river, when on a sudden I heard firing of cannon in the Cossack camp as if in applause, and I heard shouts. Then it occurred to me that yesterday it was said in the camp that the whole Tartar force had not arrived yet, only Tugai Bay with a part. I thought then, if they are making such uproarious applause, the Khan must have come in his own person. Then in our camp rose a tumult. I hurried thither with a few men. What's the matter? They shout to me, the commanders have gone. I hasten to Prince Dominic's quarters, he is not to be found, to Ostrog, he is gone, to Konyatspolsky, he is not there. Jesus of Nazareth. Soldiers are flying over the square, there are shouts, tumult, yells, blazing torches. Where are the commanders? Where are the commanders, cry some. To horse. To horse, cry others. Still others, save yourselves, brothers. Treason. Treason. Hands are raised to heaven, faces are pale, eyes wild. They rush, trample, suffocate one another, mount their horses, flee weaponless at random. Others leave helmets, breastplates, arms, tents. The prince rides up at the head of the hussars in his silver armor, with six torches around him. He stands in the stirrups and cries, I am here, gentlemen. Rally around me. What can he do? They don't hear him, don't see him, they rush on his hussars, break their ranks, overturn horses and men. We were barely able to save the prince himself. Then over the trampled out fires, in darkness, like a damned up torrent, like a river, the whole army in wild panic rush from the camp, flee, scatter, disappear. No more an army, no more leaders, no more a commonwealth, nothing but unwashed disgrace and the foot of the Cossack on your neck. Here Virchel began to groan and to pull at his horse, for the madness of despair had caught him. This madness he communicated to the others, and they rode on in that rain and night as if bewildered. They rode a long time. Zagloba broke silence first. Without battle. Oh, the rascals! Oh, such sons of, you remember what lordly figures they cut at Zbarage, how they promised to eat Melnitsky without pepper and salt. Oh, the scoundrels! How could they, shouted Virchel. They ran away after the first battle gained over the Tartars and the mob, after a battle in which the general militia fought like lions. The finger of God is in this, said Skshatuski. But there is some secret too, which must be explained. If the army had fled, why that sort of thing happens in the world, said Volodyovsky. But here the leaders left the camp first, as if on purpose to lighten the victory for the enemy and give the army to slaughter. True, true, said Virchel. It is said even that they did this on purpose. On purpose? By the wounds of Christ, that cannot be. It is said they did so on purpose, but why? Who can discover, who can guess? May their graves crush them, 
may their race perish, and only a memory of infamy remain behind them, said Zagloba. Amen, said Skrzytuski. Amen, said Volodyovsky. Amen, repeated Pan Longin. There is one man who can save the fatherland yet, if they give him the baton and the remaining power of the commonwealth. There is only one, for neither the army nor the nobles will hear of another. The prince, said Skrzytuski. Yes. We will rally to him, we will perish with him. Long live Yeremy Vishniavetsky! cried Zagloba. Long life, repeated a few uncertain voices. But the cry died away immediately. For when the earth was opening under their feet and the heaven seemed falling on their heads, there was no time for shouts. Day began to break, and in the distance appeared the walls of Tarnopol. Chapter 42 The first wrecks from Palavtsi reached Lvov at daybreak, September 26. And with the opening of the gates the news spread like lightning through the city, rousing incredulity in some, panic in others, and in still others a desperate desire for defense. Skrzytuski with his party arrived two days later, when the whole city was packed with fugitive soldiers, nobles, and armed citizens. They were thinking of defense, for the Tartars were expected any moment, but it was not known yet who would stand at the head of the defense or how it would begin. For this reason disorder and panic prevailed everywhere. Some fled from the place, taking their families and their property with them, dwellers in the region round about sought refuge in the city. Those departing and arriving crowded the streets, fought for passage, every place was filled with wagons, packs, bags, horses, soldiers from the greatest variety of regiments. On every face was seen either uncertainty, feverish expectation, despair, or resignation. Every little while terror broke out like a sudden whirlwind, and the cries were heard, They are coming! They are coming! And the crowd swept like a wave, sometimes running straight ahead infected with the madness of alarm. Until it appeared that another one of the fragments of the wreck was coming, fragments which increased more and more. But how sad was the sight of these soldiers who a short time before had marched in gold and plumes, with song on their lips and pride in their eyes, to that campaign against peasants. Today, torn, starved, emaciated, covered with mud, on wasted horses, with shame in their faces, more like beggars than knights, they could only rouse pity. If there was time for pity in that place against the walls of which the whole power of the enemy might soon hurl itself. And each one of those disgraced knights comforted himself in this alone, that he had so many thousands of companions in shame. All concealed themselves in the first hour, so that afterward when they had recovered they might spread complaints, blame, scatter curses with threats, drag along through the streets. Drink in the shops, and only increase disorder and alarm. For each one repeated, the Tartars are here, right here. Some saw conflagrations in the rear, others swore by all the saints that they had been forced to defend themselves against scouting parties. The crowd surrounding the soldiers listened with strained attention. The roofs and steeples of the churches were covered with thousands of curious people. The bells tolled alarm, and crowds of women and children suffocated one another in churches in which amid flaming tapers shone the most holy sacrament. Skrzytuski pushed slowly from the Galician gate with his party through dense masses of horses, wagons, soldiers, city guilds standing under their banners. And through people who looked with wonder at that squadron entering the town, not in disorder, but in battle array. Men shouted that succor was coming and again joy justified by nothing took possession of the throng, which swayed forward in order to see Skrzytuski's stirrups. Soldiers too ran up, crying, These are Vishniavetsky men. Long live Yeremy! The pressure became so great that the squadron was barely able to push forward step by step. At length a party of dragoons appeared opposite, with an officer at the head. The soldiers pushed aside the throng, and the officer cried, out of the road. Out of the road. And struck with the side of his sword those who failed to clear the way quickly. Skrzytuski recognized Kushal. The young officer greeted his acquaintance heartily. What times? What times, said he. 
Where is the prince? asked Pan Yen. You would have killed him with anxiety if you had delayed. He is looking for you and your men intently. He is now at the church of the Bernardines. I am sent out to keep order in the city, but the Grosweyer has just taken it in hand, and I will go with you to the church. There is a council there at this moment. In the church? Yes. They will offer the command to the prince, for the soldiers declare that they will not defend the town under another leader. Let us go, I have urgent business also with the prince. The united parties moved on. Along the road Skshatuski inquired about everything that was passing in Lvov, and if defense was already determined on. That is just the question under consideration, said Kushal. The citizens want to defend themselves. What times? People of insignificant position show more courage than nobles and soldiers. But the commanders, what has happened to them? Are they not here, and will there not be opposition to the prince? No, unless he makes it himself. There was a fitter time to give him the command. It is late now. The commanders dare not show their faces. Prince Dominic merely took refreshments in the archbishop's palace, and went away immediately. He did well, for you cannot believe what hatred there is for him among the soldiers. He is gone already, and still they cry, Give him up. We will cut him to pieces. It is sure he would not have escaped such a fate. The royal cupbearer, Osterog, arrived here first, and he began to talk against the prince. But now he sits in silence, for a tumult rose against him. They laid all the blame on him to his face, and he only gulps his tears. In general it is awful, what is going on, such times have come. I say to you, thank God that you were not at Palavtsi, that you did not flee from the place, for it is a real miracle to us who were there that we did not lose our senses altogether. And our division? Exists no longer, scarcely anything is left, Wurzel gone, Machnitsky gone, Zatsvilikovsky gone. Wurzel and Machnitsky were not at Palavtsi, for they remained in Konstantinov. That Beelzebub, Prince Dominic, left them there so as to weaken the power of our prince. Old Zatsvilikovsky has vanished like a stone in water. God grant he has not perished. And of all the soldiers have many come here? In number sufficient, but what of that? The prince alone could use them, if he would take the command, they will obey no one else. The prince was terribly alarmed about you and the soldiers. This is the only sound squadron. We were already mourning for you. At present he is the happy man for whom people are mourning. They rode in silence for a time, looking at the crowd and listening to the shouts and yells, the Tartars. The Tartars. In one place they beheld the terrible sight of a man torn to pieces by the mob on suspicion of being a spy. The bells were tolling incessantly. Will the horde be here soon? asked Zagloba. The devil knows, maybe today. This city will not defend itself long, for it cannot hold out. Melnitsky is coming with two hundred thousand, besides Tartars. Capet, answered Zagloba. It would have been better for us to have gone on at breakneck speed. What have we gained so many victories for? Over whom? Over Cravonos, over Bogan, devil knows whom else. But, said Kushal, in a low voice, turning to Skshatuski, Yen, has God not comforted you in any way? Have you not found the one whom you were seeking? Have you not at least learned something? No time to think of that, said Skshatuski. What do I and my affairs signify in view of what has happened? All is vanity, vanity, and death at the end. It seems to me that the whole world will perish before long, said Kushal. Meanwhile they reached the Bernardine church, which was blazing with light. Immense crowds stood before the door. But they could not enter, for a line of men with halberds closed the passage, admitting only the most important officers of the army. Skshatuski ordered his men to form a second line. Come, said Kushal, half the commonwealth is in this church. They entered. Kushal had not exaggerated greatly. All who were best known in the army and city had assembled for council, 
including the voivoda, the castellans, the colonels, the captains, officers of foreign regiments, the clergy. As many nobles as the church could hold, a multitude of military of the lower grades, and a number of the town councillors with the Grosweyer at their head, who was the leader of the citizens. The prince too was present, the royal cupbearer, and one of the commanders, the voivoda of Kiev, the starosta of Stavnik, Vessel, Artsyshevsky, and Asinsky. They sat in front of the great altar, so that the public might see them. The council was held hastily and excitedly, as is usual on such occasions. Speakers stood on benches and implored the elders not to yield the city to the hands of the enemy without defending it. Even if we have to perish, the city will detain the enemy, the commonwealth will recover. What is needed for defense? There are walls, there are troops, there is determination, only a leader is wanted. And after speeches of this kind, through the crowd flew murmurs which passed into loud shouts. Excitement seized the assembly. We will perish, we will perish willingly, they cry. We will wipe out the disgrace of Palavtsi, we will shield the fatherland. And they began to shake their sabers, and the naked edges glittered in the blaze of the candles. Others cried, Be quiet. Let the deliberations be orderly. Shall we defend or not defend? Defend. Defend, roared the assembly till the echo thrown back from the arches repeated, Defend. Who is to be the leader? Who should be the leader? Prince Jeremy, he is a leader, he is a hero. Let him defend the city, let the commonwealth give him the baton. Long life to him. Then such a thundering roar burst forth from a thousand lungs that the walls trembled and the glass rattled in the windows of the church. Prince Jeremy. Prince Jeremy. Long life to Prince Jeremy. Long life, victory to him. A thousand sabers flashed, all eyes were turned to the prince. He rose calmly with wrinkled brow. There was silence at once, as if only poppy seeds were falling. Gentlemen, said the prince, with a resonant voice, which in that silence reached every ear. When the Cimbri and the Teutons fell upon the Commonwealth of Rome no one would accept the consulate till Marius took it. But Marius had a right to take it, for there were no leaders appointed by the Senate. And I in the present straits would not avoid power, since I wished to serve my dear country with my life. But I cannot accept the command since I should offend the country, the Senate, and the authorities, and a self-elected chief I will not be. Among us is the man to whom the commonwealth has given the baton of command, the cupbearer of the crown. Here the prince could speak no further. For hardly had he mentioned the cupbearer when there rose a terrible din and the clattering of sabers. The crowd swayed and there was a burst as of powder on which a spark has fallen. Away with him! Destruction to him! Parit was heard in the throng. Parit! Parit! was roared louder and louder. The cupbearer sprang from his seat, pale, with drops of cold sweat on his forehead. And then threatening figures approached the stalls, near the altar, and ominous words were heard, Give him here. The prince, seeing whither this was tending, rose and stretched out his right hand. The crowds restrained themselves, thinking that he wished to speak. There was silence in the twinkle of an eye. But the prince wished merely to allay the storm and tumult, not to permit the shedding of blood in the church. When he saw that the most threatening moment had passed, he took his seat again. On the second chair from the voivoda of Kiev sat the unfortunate cupbearer. His gray hair had dropped upon his breast, his hands were hanging, and from his mouth came words interrupted by sobs, O oh Lord, for my sins I accept the cross with resignation. The old man might rouse pity in the hardest heart, but a crowd is generally pitiless. Again therefore the tumult began when the voivoda of Kiev rose and gave a sign with his hand that he wanted to speak. He was a partner in the victories of Jeremy, therefore they listened to him willingly. He turned to the prince then, and in the most feeling words adjured him not to reject the baton of command and not to hesitate to save the country. When the commonwealth is perishing, let laws slumber let not the appointed chief save it, but him who has the most power to save. 
Take the command, then, invincible leader, take it and rescue, not this city alone, but the whole commonwealth. Behold I, an old man, with the lips of the commonwealth implore you, and with me all ranks of people, all men, women, and children, save us. Save us. Here followed an incident which moved all hearts. A woman in mourning approached the altar, and casting at the feet of the prince her golden ornaments and jewels, knelt before him, and sobbing loudly, cried out, We bring you our goods. We give our lives into your hands. Save us, save us, for we perish. At the sight of this senators, soldiers, and then the whole throng roared with a mighty cry, and there was one voice in that church, Save us. The prince covered his face with his hands. And when he raised his head tears were glittering in his eyes. Still he hesitated. What would become of the dignity of the commonwealth if he should accept the command? Then rose the cupbearer of the crown. I am old, said he, unfortunate, and crushed. I have a right to resign the charge which is beyond my powers, and to place it on younger shoulders. Here in the presence of this crucified God and of all the knighthood, I deliver the baton to you, take it. And he extended the insignia to Vishnevetsky. A moment of such silence followed that flies on the wing could be heard. At last the solemn voice of Yeremy was heard, For my sins, I accept it. Then a frenzy of enthusiasm ruled the assembly. The crowds broke the benches, fell at the feet of Vishnevetsky, cast down their money and treasures before him. The news spread like lightning through the whole city. The soldiers were losing their senses from joy, and shouted that they wished to go against Melnitsky, the Tartars, the Sultan. The citizens thought no longer of surrender, but of defense to the last drop of blood, the Armenians brought money of their own accord to the city hall, before anything was said of a levy. The Jews in the synagogue raised an uproar of thanksgiving, the guns on the walls thundered forth the glad tidings, along the streets was firing of muskets, pistols, and guns. Shouts of, long life! Continued all night. Anyone not knowing the state they were in might suppose that the city was celebrating a triumph or some solemn festival. And still three hundred thousand enemies, an army greater than any which the German emperor or the king of France could place in the field. An army wilder than the legions of Tamerlane, might at any moment invest the walls of that city. Chapter 43 A week later, on the morning of the 6th of October, news as unexpected as terrible burst upon Lvov. Prince Yeremy, with the greater part of the army, had left the city secretly and had gone it was unknown whither. Crowds gathered before the archbishop's palace. They would not believe the report at first. The soldiers insisted that if the prince had gone, he had gone without doubt at the head of a powerful division on a reconnaissance of the surrounding country. It appeared, they said, that lying spies had spread reports announcing Melnitsky and the Tartars at any moment, for since September 26 ten days had passed, and the enemy was not yet in sight. The prince wished undoubtedly to convince himself of the danger by actual inspection, and after obtaining intelligence would return without fail. Besides, he had left a number of regiments, and everything was ready for defense. The last was true. Every disposition had been made, the places marked out, the cannon planted on the walls. In the evening Captain Sikotsky arrived at the head of fifty dragoons. He was surrounded immediately by the curious, but would not speak with the crowd, and went directly to General Artsyshevsky. Both called the Grosweyer, and after consultation they went to the city hall. There Tsikotsky informed the astonished councillors that the prince had gone, not to return. At the first moment the hands of all dropped at their sides, and some insolent lips uttered the word, traitor. But that moment Artsyshevsky, an old leader famed for achievements in the Dutch service, rose and began to speak as follows to the military and the councillors. I have heard the injurious word. Which I wish no one had spoken, for even despair cannot justify it. The prince has gone and will not return. But what right have you to force a leader on whose shoulders the salvation of a whole country rests to defend your city only? What would have happened if the enemy had surrounded in this place the remaining forces of the commonwealth? 
There are neither supplies of food nor of arms for so many troops here. I tell you this, and you may trust in my experience, that the greater the force shut up here, the shorter the defense would be, for hunger would overpower you sooner than the enemy. Melnitsky cares more for the person of the prince than for your city. Therefore, when he discovers that Vishnyavetsky is not here, that he is collecting new troops and may come with relief, he will let you off more easily, and agree to terms. You are murmuring today. But I tell you that the prince, by leaving this city and threatening Melnitsky from outside, has saved you and your children. Bear up, and defend yourselves. If you can detain the enemy some time, you may save your city, and you will render a memorable service to the Commonwealth. For during that time the prince will collect forces, arm other fortresses, rouse the torpid commonwealth, and hasten to your rescue. He has chosen the only road of salvation. For if he had fallen here, with his army overcome by hunger, then nothing could stop the enemy, who might march on Krakow, on Warsaw, and flood the whole country, finding resistance in no place. Therefore, instead of murmuring, hurry to the walls, defend yourselves and your children, your city and the whole commonwealth. To the walls. To the walls, repeated many of the more daring. The Grosweyer, an energetic and bold man, answered, Your determination pleases me, and you know that the prince did not go away without planning defense. Everyone here knows what he has to do, and that has happened which should have happened. I have the defense in hand, and I will defend to the last. Hope returned again to timid hearts. Seeing this, Tsikotsky said in conclusion. His Highness informs you also that the enemy is at hand. Lieutenant Skrzytuski struck on a party of two thousand Tartars whom he defeated. The prisoners say that a great power is marching behind them. This news made a deep impression. A moment of silence followed, all hearts beat more quickly. To the walls, said the Grosweyer. To the walls. To the walls, repeated the officers and citizens present. Meanwhile a tumult was raised outside the windows. The uproar of a thousand voices, which mingled in one undistinguishable roar like the sound of the waves of the sea. Suddenly the doors of the hall were thrown open with a crash, and a number of citizens burst into the room. And before the councillors had time to inquire what had happened, shouts were raised, flames in the sky flames in the sky. The word has become flesh, said the Grosweyer. To the walls. The hall was deserted. Soon the thunder of cannon shook the walls, announcing to the inhabitants of the city, the suburbs and villages beyond, that the enemy was coming. In the east the heavens were red as far as the eye could see. One would have said that a sea of fire was approaching the city. The prince meanwhile had thrown himself on Zamost, and having dispersed on the road the party which Tsikotsky had mentioned to the citizens, occupied himself with repairing and arming that fortress, naturally strong, which he made impregnable in a short time. Skshtuski, with Pan Langin and a part of the squadron, remained in the fortress with Pan Weyer, the starosta of Valets. The prince went to Warsaw to obtain from the Diet means to assemble new forces, and also to take part in the election which was near. The fortunes of Vishnyavetsky and the whole Commonwealth hung upon that election. For if Prince Karl were chosen the war party would win, and the prince would receive chief command of all the forces of the Commonwealth. And it would perforce come to a general struggle for life and death with Melnitsky. Prince Casimir, though famous for his bravery and altogether a military man, was justly considered an adherent of the policy of Ossolinsky, the Chancellor. Therefore of the policy of negotiations with the Cossacks, and considerable concessions to them. Neither brother was sparing of promises, and each struggled to gain partisans for himself, considering therefore the equal power of both parties, no one could foresee the result of the election. The partisans of the Chancellor feared that Vishnyavetsky, thanks to his increasing fame and the favor which he possessed among the knighthood and the nobles, would carry the balance of minds to the side of Prince Karl. Yeremy, for these reasons, desired to support his candidate in person. Therefore he hastened to Warsaw, 
sure that Zamost would be able to hold in check for a long time the whole power of Melnitsky and the Crimea. Lvov, according to every probability, might be considered safe. For Melnitsky could in no wise spend much time in capturing that city, since he had before him the more powerful Zamost, which barred his way to the heart of the Commonwealth. These thoughts strengthened the resolution of the prince, and poured consolation into his heart, torn by so many terrible defeats of the country. Hope possessed him that even if Casimir were elected, war would be unavoidable, and the terrible rebellion would have to be drowned in a sea of blood. He hoped that the Commonwealth would again put forth a powerful army, for negotiations were only possible in so far as a powerful army sustained them. Flattered by these thoughts, the prince went under the protection of a few squadrons, having with him Zagloba and Pan Volodyovsky. The first of whom swore by everything that he would carry the election of Prince Karl, for he knew how to talk to the brother nobles and how to manage them. The second commanded the escort of the prince. At Sanitsa, not far from Minsk, a delightful though unexpected interview awaited the prince. For he met Princess Griselda, who was going from Brest-Litovsk to Warsaw for safety, with the reasonable hope that the prince would go there too. They greeted each other with emotion after a long separation. The princess, though she had an iron soul, rushed with such weeping into the embrace of her husband that she could not compose herself for several hours, for, oh! How many were the moments in which she had no hope of seeing him again, and still God granted him to return more famous than ever, covered with praise. Such as had never yet beamed upon one of his house, the greatest of leaders, the one hope of the commonwealth. The princess, tearing herself time after time from his breast, glanced through her tears at that face emaciated and embrowned. At that lofty forehead on which cares and toils had ploughed deep furrows, at those eyes inflamed with sleepless nights. And again she shed plentiful tears, and all her ladies wept too from the depths of their excited hearts. When after a time she and the prince had become calm, they went to the house of the priest, and their inquiries were made for friends, attendants, and knights, who as it were belonged to the family. And with whom the memory of Lubny was bound up. The prince quieted the princess concerning Skshetuski. First of all explaining that he had remained in Zamost only because he did not wish to lose himself in the noise of the capital on account of the suffering which God had sent him and preferred to heal the wounds of his heart in military service. Then he presented Zagloba and told of his deeds. Vir incomparabilis, said he, who not only saved Kurtsevichovna from Bogan, but took her through the camps of Melnitsky and the Tartars. Later he was with us to his great glory, and fought admirably at Konstantinov. Hearing this, the princess did not spare praise on Zagloba, giving him her hand to kiss repeatedly, and promising a still better reward at a proper time. And the, Vir incomparabilis, bowed, veiling his heroism with his modesty. Then, he strutted and looked at the ladies in waiting. For though he was old and did not promise himself much from the fair sex, still it was pleasant to him that the ladies had heard so much of his bravery and his deeds. But morning was not absent from this otherwise glad greeting. For mentioning the grievous times of the commonwealth, how often did the prince reply to the questions of the princess about various knights, killed, killed, lost. Then young women were saddened, for more than one name was mentioned among the dead that was dear. So gladness was mingled with grief, tears with smiles. But the most afflicted of all was Volodyovsky, for in vain did he look around and cast his eyes on every side, Princess Barbara was not there. It is true that amid the toils of war and continual battles, skirmishes, and campaigns, that cavalier had forgotten her somewhat, for he was by nature as prone to love as he was inconstant. But now, when he saw the young ladies of the princess once more, when before his eyes the life at Lubny stood as if actual, he thought to himself that it would be pleasant for him too if the moment of rest should come to sigh and occupy his heart again. Since this did not happen, however, but sentiment, as if through malice, sprang up in him anew, Volodyovsky suffered grievously, and looked as if he had been drenched in a pouring rain. He hung his head upon his breast, his slender mustaches, which usually curled upward like those of a maybug till they reached his nose, were hanging too, 
his upturned nose had grown long. The usual serenity had vanished from his face, and he stood silent. Did not even move when the prince gave unusual praise to his bravery and superiority, for what mattered all praises to him when she could not hear them? Finally Anuzhia Borzobagata took pity on him, and though they had had quarrels, she determined to comfort him. With this object, keeping her eyes on the princess, she pushed unobserved toward the knight, and at last was by his side. Good day, said she, we have not seen each other for a long time. Oh, Panna Anna, answered Pan Michael, in sadness, much water has flowed past since then. We meet again in unpleasant times, and not all of us. True, not all. So many knights have fallen. Here Anuzhia sighed, then continued, after a time, and we are not the same in number, for Panna Senantavna has married, and Princess Barbara has remained with the wife of the Voivoda of Vilna. And she is going to marry, of course. No, she is not thinking much of that. But why do you ask? Having said this, Anuzhia closed her dark eyes till two thin lines were left, and looked sideways from under her lashes at the night. Oh, through goodwill for the family, answered Pan Michael. Oh, that is proper, answered Anuzhia, for Pan Michael has a great friend in Princess Barbara. More than once she inquired. Where is that knight who in the tournament at Lubni took off most Turkish heads, for which I gave him a reward? What is he doing? Is he still alive, and does he remember us? Pan Michael raised his eyes in thankfulness to Anuzhia, first he was comforted, and then he observed that Anuzhia had improved beyond measure. Did Princess Barbara really say that? As true as life, and she remembered, too, how you were riding over the ditch for her when you fell into the water. And where is the wife of the Voivoda of Vilna now? She was with us in Brest, and a week ago went to Belsk, from there she will go to Warsaw. Pan Volodyovsky looked at Anuzhia a second time, and could not restrain himself, but Panna Anuzhia has attained such beauty that one's eyes ache in looking at her. The girl smiled thankfully. Pan Michael only says this to capture me. I wanted to do so in my time, said he, shrugging his shoulders. God knows I tried to, but failed. And now I wish well to Pan Podbipienta, for he was more fortunate. And where is Pan Podbipienta? inquired Anuzhia, dropping her eyes. In Zamost, with Skshatuski. He has become lieutenant in the squadron, and must attend to service, but if he knew whom he could see here, as God is in heaven he would have taken leave and come with long steps. He is a great knight, and deserving of every love. And in war, he met no accident? It seems to me that you wish to ask, not about that, but about the three heads that he wanted to cut off. I do not believe that he really wanted to do that. But you would better, for without that there will be nothing. And he is not slow in looking for a chance, either. At Maknovka, when we went to examine the places where he had struggled in the throng of battle, the prince himself went with us. And I tell you I have seen many a fight, but such execution I shall not see again while I live. When he puts on your scarf for battle, he does awful things. He will find his three heads, be at rest on that point. May each find what he seeks, said Anuzhia, with a sigh. Then Volodyovsky sighed, raised his eyes, and looked suddenly toward one corner of the room. From that corner peered a visage, angry, excited, and entirely unknown to him, armed with a gigantic nose, and mustaches great as two bushes on a tavern sign, which moved quickly. As if from pent-up passion. One might be terrified at that nose, those eyes and mustaches, but little Volodyovsky was by no means timid. Therefore he only wondered, and turning to Anuzhia asked. What sort of figure is that over there in the corner, which looks at me as if it wished to swallow me whole? And moves its mustaches just like an old tomcat at prayers? What? said Anuzhia, showing her white teeth, that's Pan Karlamp. What sort of pagan is he? He is no pagan at all, but a light horse captain in the squadron of the Voivoda of Vilna, who is escorting us to Warsaw, and has to wait for the Voivoda there. Let Pan Michael not come in his way, for he is a dreadful man-eater. 
I see that, I see that. But if he is a man-eater, there are others fatter than I. Why should he wet his teeth at me instead of them? Because, said Anusia, and she laughed quietly. Because? Because he is in love with me, and has told me that he will cut to pieces every man who approaches me. And now, believe me, it is only out of regard for the prince and princess that he restrains himself. Were it not for them, he would pick a quarrel with you at once. Here you've got it, said Volodyovsky, merrily. That's how it is, Panna Anna. It was not for nothing, I see, that we sang, Tartars carry captive prisoners, you seize captive hearts. You remember, I suppose? You cannot move, you know, without making someone fall in love with you. Such is my misfortune, answered Anusia, dropping her eyes. Ah, Panna Anna is a Pharisee. And what will Pan Langin say to this? How am I to blame if this Pan Karlamp pursues me? I can't endure him, and I don't want to look at him. But see to it that blood is not shed on your account. Podbipienta is so mild that you could heal a wound with him, but in love affairs it is dangerous to joke with him. If he cuts Karlamp's ears off, I shall be glad. When she had said this, Anusia whizzed off like a top, and tripped to the other side of the room to Carboni, the physician of the princess, to whom she began to whisper something with animation. And then converse. But the Italian fastened his eyes on the ceiling, as if carried away by ecstasy. Meanwhile Zagloba approached Volodyovsky, and began in merry mood to wink his one sound eye. Pan Michael, he asked, what sort of crested lark is that? That is Panna Anusia Borzobagata, lady-in-waiting to the princess. Ah, she is a pretty little rogue, eyes like plates, a pug as if painted, and a neck, uf. Oh, she'll pass, she'll pass. My congratulations to you. Oh, give us peace. She is betrothed to Podbipienta, or the same as betrothed. To Podbipienta. My dear sir, have fear of the Lord's wounds. Why, he has made vows of celibacy. And besides, the disproportion between them. He could carry her at his collar, she might sit on his mustaches, like a fly. Ah! She will manage him yet. Hercules was stronger, but a woman trapped him. Yes, if she only doesn't give him horns, though I should be the first to help that about, as I am Zagloba. There will be more than you of that sort, though in truth the girl is of good stock and honest. This is too bad, for she is young and pretty. You are an honorable cavalier, and that is why you praise her, but she is a lark. Beauty attracts people. For example, that captain over there is desperately in love with her. Shaw. But look at that raven with whom she is talking now. What sort of devil is he? That is an Italian, Carboni, the physician of the princess. Look, Pan Michael, how his lanterns are lighted up, and his eyeballs roll as if in delirium. Oh, it is bad for Pan Langin. I know something of this business, for I had more than one experience in my youth. Another time I'll tell you of all the scrapes in which I have been, or if you wish you can listen this minute. Zagloba began to whisper in the ear of the little knight, and to wink with more vigor than usual. But the end of the visit came. The prince seated himself by the princess in the carriage, that they might talk all they wished after the long absence. The ladies occupied carriages, the knights mounted their horses, and all moved on. The court went in advance, and the troops at some distance in the rear. For those parts were peaceable, and the squadrons were needed for ostentation alone, not safety. They went from Sanitsa to Minsk, and thence to Warsaw, stopping frequently for plentiful refreshments, according to the custom of the time. The road was so thronged that it was barely possible to move at a walk. All were going to the election, from near neighborhoods and from distant Lithuania. So that here and there were met lordly households, whole trains of gilded carriages, surrounded by haydukes, gigantic Turkish grooms dressed in Turkish costumes. After which marched household troops, now Hungarian, now German, now Genissaries, 
now Cossack detachments, and finally squadrons of the matchless heavy cavalry of the Poles. Each one of the more important personages tried to appear in the most showy manner and with the greatest retinues. Among the numerous cavalcades belonging to magnates, came also the smaller local and district dignitaries. Every little while single wagons of nobles appeared from out the dust, covered with black leather and drawn by two or four horses. And in each sat a noble with a crucifix or an image of the Most Holy Lady hung on a silk ribbon around his neck. All were armed, a musket on one side of the seat, a saber on the other. Former or actual officers of squadrons also had lances sticking out two yards behind the seat. Under the wagons were dogs, either setters or hounds, not for use, for they were not going to the chase, but for the amusement of the owner. Behind were stable boys leading horses covered with cloth to protect rich saddles from dust or rain. Farther on were drawn squeaking wagons with willow-bound wheels, in which were tents and supplies of provisions for servants and masters. When at times the wind blew the dust from the highway into the fields, the whole road was uncovered and changed like a hundred-colored serpent, or a ribbon artistically woven from gold and brocade. Here and there on the road were heard orchestras of Italians or Genissaries, especially before the squadrons of royal or Lithuanian escort, of which there was no lack in this throng. For they had to go in the company of the dignitaries. And every place was full of shouts, calls, questions, disputes, since precedence was not yielded willingly by one to another. From time to time mounted servants and soldiers galloped up to the retinue of the prince, demanding the road for such or such a dignitary, or to ask who was traveling. But when the answer came to their ears, the voevoda of Rus, immediately they informed their masters, who left the road free, or if they were in advance, turned aside to see the passing retinue. At places of refreshment the nobles gathered in crowds to feast their eyes with a sight of the greatest warrior of the commonwealth. Cheers also were not lacking, to which the prince answered with thanks, first by reason of his innate politeness, and secondly wishing with that affability to win adherence for Prince Karl. Of which he gained not a few by his appearance alone. With equal curiosity did they look on the squadrons of the prince, those Russians, as they were called. They were not so tattered and haggard as after the battle at Konstantinov, for the prince had given them new uniforms at Zamost. But they were always gazed at as wonders from beyond the sea, since in the opinion of those dwelling in the neighborhood of the capital they came from the end of the earth. Marvels were related of those mysterious steppes and pine groves in which such a knighthood was born. They wondered at their sunburnt complexions, embrowned from the winds of the Black Sea. At their haughtiness of look, and a certain freedom of bearing acquired from their wild neighbors. But after the prince, most eyes were turned on Zagloba, who, noticing that he was the center of admiration, looked with such haughtiness and pride, and turned his eyes so threateningly that it was whispered at once in the crowd, this must be the foremost knight of them all. And others said, he must have let a power of souls out of their bodies, he is as fierce as a dragon. When words like these came to the ears of Zagloba, his only thought was to conceal his inward delight by still greater fierceness. Sometimes he answered the crowd, Sometimes he joked with them, but especially with squadrons of the Lithuanian escort, in which the men of the heavy cavalry wore golden, and of the light. Silver loops on their shoulders. At sight of this Zagloba would call out, Pan Loop, there is a hook on you. More than one officer frowned, gritted his teeth, and grasped his saber. But remembering that that was a warrior from the squadron of the Voivoda of Rus who took such liberty, he spat at last, and let the matter drop. Nearer Warsaw the throng became so dense that it was only possible to push forward at a walk. The election promised to be more crowded than usual. For nobles from remote Russian and Lithuanian districts, who by reason of the distance could not have come for the election itself, assembled now at Warsaw for safety. The day of election was still distant, for the first sessions of the Diet had barely begun. But they had assembled a month or two in advance, so as to locate themselves in the city, renew acquaintance with this one and that, seek for promotion here and there. Eat and drink at the houses of great lords, and enjoy luxury in the harvest of the capital. 
The prince looked with sadness through the windows of his carriage on those crowds of knights, soldiers, and nobles, on that wealth and luxury of costume. Thinking what forces could be formed of them, what armies could be put in the field. Why is this commonwealth, so powerful, populous, and rich, filled with valiant knights, so weak that it is not able to settle with one Melnitsky in the Tartar savagery? Why is this? The legions of Melnitsky could be answered with other legions if those nobles, those soldiers, that wealth and substance. Those regiments and squadrons were willing to serve public as well as private interests. Virtue is perishing in the commonwealth, thought the prince, and the great body is beginning to decay. Manhood has long since begun to disappear in pleasant leisure. It is not warlike toil that the army and the nobles love. The prince was right so far. But of the shortcomings of the commonwealth he thought only as a warrior and a chieftain who wanted to turn all men into soldiers and lead them against the enemy. Bravery could be found, and was found, when wars a hundred times greater threatened soon after. It lacked still something more, which the soldier prince at that moment saw not, but which his enemy, the chancellor of the crown, an abler statesman than Jeremy, did see. But behold in the grey and azure distance appeared indistinctly the pointed towers of Warsaw. Further meditations of the prince ceased. He issued orders, which the officer on duty bore immediately to Volodyovsky. In consequence of these orders Pan Michael galloped from the carriage of Anusia, around which he had been hovering hitherto, to bring up the squadrons which had lagged considerably in the rear. To strengthen the line and lead it on in order. He had ridden barely a few paces when he heard someone rushing after him. It was Pan Karlamp, captain of the light cavalry of the Voivoda of Vilna, Anuzhia's worshipper. Volodyovsky held in his horse, for he understood at once that it would surely come to some quarrel, and Pan Michael loved such things from his soul. Karlamp came up with him, and at first said nothing, he only puffed, and moved his mustaches threateningly, as if looking for words. With the forehead, with the forehead, pan dragoon. With the forehead, pan escort. How do you dare to call me escort, demanded Karlamp, grinding his teeth, me an officer and a captain, hey? Volodyovsky began to throw up a hatchet which he held in his hand, turning his whole attention as it were to catching it by the handle after every turn, and answered as if unwillingly. For I am not able to recognize rank by the loop. You offend a whole body of officers with whom you are not equal. How is that? asked with pretended simplicity the rogue Volodyovsky. For you serve in the foreign levy. Put yourself to rest, said Pan Michael. Though I serve in the dragoons, I belong to that body of officers and not of the light, but of the heavy cavalry of the voevoda. You can talk with me therefore as with an equal or as with a superior. Karlamp reined himself in a little seeing that he had not to do with so insignificant a person as he had thought. But he did not cease to grit his teeth, for the coolness of Pan Michael brought him to still greater rage. Why do you get in my way? I see that you are seeking a quarrel. Maybe I am. And I will tell you this, here Karlamp bent to the ear of Volodyovsky and finished in a lower voice, that I'll trim your ears if you come in my way before Panayana. Volodyovsky began again to throw up the hatchet very diligently, as if that were the special time for such amusement, and answered in a tone of persuasiveness, Oh, my benefactor! Permit me to live a little yet. Let me go. Oh, no! Nothing will come of that, you won't escape me, said Karlamp, seizing the little knight by the sleeve. I will not get away from you, said Pan Michael, with a mild voice. But now I am on service, and am going with the order of the prince my master. Let go my sleeve, let go, I beg you, for otherwise what shall I, poor devil? Do unless I go at you with this hatchet and tumble you from the horse? Hear the voice of Volodyovsky, submissive at first, hissed with such venom that Karlamp looked at him with involuntary astonishment and dropped his sleeve. Oh, it is all one, said he. You will give me a chance in Warsaw. I'll look after you. I won't hide, but how can we fight in Warsaw, be so kind as to instruct me? I have never been there yet in my life. I am a simple soldier, but
but I have heard of court-martials which execute a man for drawing his sabre in the presence of the king or during an interregnum. It is evident that you have never been in Warsaw, and that you are an ignorant clown. Since you are afraid of court-martials and don't know that in the interregnum a chapter is in session with which the question is easier, and you may be sure they won't take my head for your ears. Thank you for the information, and I will ask you for information frequently. For I see that you are a man of no ordinary experience, and I, since I practice only the lowest of the rudiments, am barely able to make an adjective agree with a noun. And if I wanted to call, which God forbid, your honor a fool, then I know that I should say stultus, and not stulta or stultum. Here Volodyovsky began again to throw up the hatchet, and Karlamp was astonished again. The blood rushed to his face, and he pulled his saber out of the scabbard. But in the twinkle of an eye the little knight, putting his hatchet under his knee, drew his own. For a moment they looked at each other, like two stags, with distended nostrils, and with fire in their eyes. But Karlamp considered that he would have an affair with the voevoda himself if he fell upon his officer going with an order, therefore he sheathed his saber. Oh, I'll find you, you son of a such a one, said he. You'll find me, you'll find me, you fish broth, said the little knight. And they parted, one going to the cavalcade, the other to the squadrons, which had approached considerably during this time. So that through the clouds of dust was heard the clatter of the hoofs on the hard road. Volodyovsky straightened the cavalry and the infantry to the proper line, and moved to the head. After a while Zagloba trotted up to him. What did that scarecrow of the sea want of you? Asked he of Volodyovsky. Oh, nothing, he called me out to a duel. Here is trouble for you, he will punch a hole through you with his nose. Look out, Pan Michael, that you don't cut off the biggest nose in the commonwealth, for you will have to raise a separate mound over it. Happy is the voevoda of Vilna. Others must send scouting parties out to look for the enemy, but this one could send them for miles. But why did he challenge you? Because I rode by the carriage of Anusia Borzobogata. You ought to have told him to go to Pan Langin at Zamost. He would have dressed him with pepper and ginger. That fish broth fellow has struck badly. It is evident that he has less luck than his nose. I said nothing to him about Pan Podbipienta, said Volodyovsky, for he might have dropped me. I'll pay court now to Anusia with redoubled fervor out of spite. I want to have my sport too, what better employment can we have in Warsaw? We'll find it, Pan Michael, we'll find it, said Zagloba, winking. When in my younger years I was a deputy from the squadron in which I served, I traveled through the whole country, but such life as I found in Warsaw I found nowhere else. You say it is different from what we have in the Transnieper? Of course it is. I am very curious, said Pan Michael. After a while he added, Still, I'll trim the mustaches of that fish broth, for they are too long. Chapter 44 A number of weeks passed. The nobles assembled in greater and greater numbers for the election. The population of the city increased tenfold. For with the crowds of nobles poured in thousands of merchants and shopkeepers of the whole world, from distant Persia to England beyond the sea. On the field of Vola a booth was built for the Senate, and around it whitened already thousands of tents, with which the spacious meadows were entirely covered. No one could tell yet which of the two candidates, Prince Casimir, the Cardinal, or Karl Ferdinand, the Bishop of Plotsk, would be elected. On both sides great were the efforts and exertions made. Thousands of pamphlets were given to the world, relating the merits and defects of the candidates. Both had numerous and powerful adherents. On the side of Karl stood, as is known, Prince Jeremy, who was the more terrible for his opponents, as it was always likely that he would draw after him the inferior nobles. Who were enamored of him. And with the inferior nobles lay the ultimate decision. But neither did Casimir lack power. Seniority was in his favor. On his side was the influence of the Chancellor. The primate appeared to incline to him. On his side stood the majority of the magnates, each of whom had numerous clients. 
And among the magnates also was Prince Dominic Zaslavsky Ostrogsky, voivoda of Sandomir, with greatly injured reputation after Palavtsi and even threatened with prosecution. But always the greatest lord in the Commonwealth, nay, even in all Europe, and able at any moment to throw the immense weight of his wealth into the scale of his candidate. Still the adherents of Casimir more than once had bitter hours of doubt. For as has been said, everything depended on the inferior nobles, who, beginning from the 4th of October, had camped in crowds around Warsaw and were coming still in thousands from every side of the Commonwealth, and who in an incalculable majority declared for Prince Karl. Attracted by the magic of Vishniavetsky's name and the liberality of the prince in public objects. Karl was a good manager and wealthy, he did not hesitate at that moment to devote considerable sums to the formation of new regiments which were to be placed under command of Yeremy. Casimir would have followed his example willingly. It was certainly not greed that held him back, but just the opposite, excessive liberality, the immediate result of which was an insufficiency, and continual lack of money in his treasury. Meanwhile both sides were canvassing. Every day messengers were flying between Nyaporent and Yablana. Casimir in the name of his own seniority and brotherly affection adjured Karl to resign. But the bishop held back, answering that it would not become him to contemn the fortune which might meet him, since that fortune was in the free gift of the commonwealth. And was his to whom the Lord had designed it. Time passed, the term of six weeks was approaching, and together with it the Cossack storm. News had come that Melnitsky, having raised the siege of Lvov, which had ransomed itself after a number of assaults, had invested Zamost. And night and day was storming that last rampart of the Commonwealth. It was said too that besides the delegates whom Melnitsky had sent to Warsaw with a letter and declaration that as a noble of Poland he would give his vote to Casimir. There were nobles hidden among the crowd, and that the city itself was full of disguised Cossack elders whom no one could detect, for they had come like regular and wealthy nobles. Differing in nothing, even in speech, from other electors, especially those from the Russian provinces. Some, as was said, had crept in through simple curiosity to look at the election and Warsaw. Others to spy, to obtain news, to hear talk about the war, how many troops the Commonwealth thought of putting in the field, and what grants it proposed for the levies. Perhaps there was much truth in the reports concerning these guests. For among the Zaporozhian elders were many nobles who had become Cossacks, who had picked up some Latin and therefore were not to be recognized in any way. Besides, in the distant steppes Latin did not flourish as a rule, and such princes as the Kurtsevichi did not know it any better than Bogan and other Adamans. But reports like these with which the election field as well as the city were filled, together with news of the movements of Melnitsky and the Cossack Tartar expeditions, which had reached. It was said, the Vistula, filled people's minds with alarm, and more than once became causes of tumult. In the crowd of nobles to cast on a man the suspicion of being a Zaporozhian in disguise was enough to ensure his being sabred into small pieces before he could show who he was. In this way innocent men might perish and the dignity of deliberations be destroyed, especially since with the custom of the time sobriety was not too much observed. The chapter, Propter Securitatum Loci, concerning public peace, was inadequate to stop the endless quarrels in which people were cut down for the slightest cause. But if those tumults, saber-slashings, and drinking bouts alarmed orderly people, penetrated with a love of good and peace, through the danger with which they threatened the country. On the other hand the reckless, the disorderly, the gamblers and disturbers felt as it were in their element. They considered this as their own special season, their day of harvest, and the more boldly permitted themselves various misdeeds. It is needless to add that among these Zagloba was first. His primacy was secured by his great fame as a knight, his unquenchable thirst upheld by a supply of drink, a tongue so tan that it had no equal. And by a self-confidence which nothing could shake. But he had at times his attacks of melancholy, then he shut himself up in a room or a tent, and did not go out, or if he did go he was in angry humor, inclined to quarrels and genuine fighting. It happened, in fact, that in such a humor he hacked up Pan Dunchevsky badly, only because he had knocked against his saber in passing. 
At such times he endured only the presence of Pan Michael, to whom he complained that a longing for Skshetuski and the poor young lady was devouring him. We have deserted her, Pan Michael, he used to say, we have betrayed her like Judas into godless hands. Don't excuse yourself to me with your nemini excepto. What is happening to her, Pan Michael, tell me that. In vain Pan Michael explained that had it not been for Palavtsi, they would have been searching for the poor young lady. But that now when the whole power of Melnitsky separated them from her it was an impossible thing. Zagloba did not yield himself to consolation, but fell into still greater passion, cursing by what the world stands on, featherbed, baby, and Latin. 16. But these periods of gloom were of short duration. When they were over Zagloba, as if wishing to reward himself for lost time, generally reveled and drank more than ever. He spent his time in taverns in company with the mightiest drinkers or with women of the capital, in which occupation Pan Michael held him trusty companionship. Pan Michael, a soldier and a splendid officer, possessed not, however, a farthing's worth of that seriousness which misfortune and suffering had developed, for instance, in Skshetuski. Volodyovsky understood his duty to the Commonwealth in this way, he killed whomsoever he was ordered to kill, cared for naught else. He knew nothing of public questions. He was always ready to bewail a military defeat, but it never entered his head that quarrels and tumults were as harmful to public affairs as defeats. In one word, he was a thoughtless young man who, having entered the bustle of the capital, sank in it to his ears, and stuck like a thistle to Zagloba, for he was his master in license. He went therefore with him among the nobles, to whom Zagloba at his cups related things uncreated, winning at the same time adherence for Prince Karl, he drank with him, protected him when necessary. They both circled around in the field of election and the city like flies in a pot, and there was no corner into which they did not crawl. They were at Nyaporent and in Yablana. They were at all the feasts and dinners given by magnates, they were at taverns, they were everywhere, and took part in everything. Pan Michael's youthful hand was restive. He wanted to exhibit himself, and to prove at the same time that the nobility of the Ukraine was better than any other and that the soldiers of the prince were higher than all. They went therefore to seek adventures on purpose among the poles of the kingdom, as the most skilled with the sword, and specially among the partisans of Prince Dominic Zaslavsky, for whom both felt a particular hatred. They engaged only with the most celebrated champions, men of undoubted and settled fame, and plotted the quarrels beforehand. You pick the quarrel, said Pan Michael, and then I will step in. Zagloba, very skillful in fence and by no means timid in dueling with a brother noble, did not always agree to have a substitute, especially in affairs with adherents of Zaslavsky. But when it was a question with some famous swordsman, he halted in the dispute. If the noble was eager for the sword and challenged, Zagloba said, My good sir, should be without conscience if I were to expose you to evident death by fighting with you myself. Better try my little son and pupil here, and I am not sure that you will be able to manage him. After such words Volodyovsky appeared on the scene with his little upturned mustaches, nose in the air, and gaping face. Whether accepted or not, he opened the fight, and being in truth a master above masters, he generally stretched out his antagonist after a few blows. In this fashion the two found sport from which their fame increased among restless spirits and the nobles, but especially the fame of Pan Zagloba, for it was said, if the pupil is such a man. What must the master be? Pan Karlamp was the one person that Volodyovsky could not find for a long time. He thought, perhaps they have sent him back to Lithuania on business of some sort. In this way nearly six weeks had gone, during which time public affairs had advanced notably. The protracted battle of the candidate brothers, the efforts of their adherents, the fever and storm of passion among partisans had passed, leaving scarcely trace or memory. It was now known to all that Yen Kazimir would be chosen, for Prince Karl had yielded to his brother, and resigned the candidature of his own goodwill. It is a wonderful thing that the voice of Melnitsky had great weight, for it was hoped on every side that he would yield to the authority of the king, especially when chosen according to his wish. 
these previsions were justified in great part. But for Vishniavetsky, who, like Cato of old, ceased not one moment from repeating that the Zaporozhian Carthage must be destroyed, this turn of affairs was a fresh blow. Negotiations must be the order of the day. The prince knew, it is true, that these negotiations would either result in nothing from the start or would be broken off soon from the nature of the case, and saw war in the future. But disquiet seized him at the thought, what will be the issue of that war? After negotiations the justified Melnitsky will be still stronger, and the Commonwealth still weaker. And who will lead its forces against a chief so famous as Melnitsky? Will not there be new defeats and new catastrophes which will exhaust its forces to the last? For the prince did not deceive himself, and knew that to him, the most eager adherent of Karl, the command would not be given. Casimir had promised, it is true, to favor his brother's adherents as much as his own. Casimir was high-souled, but he was a partisan of the Chancellor's policy. Someone else will receive the command, not the prince, and woe to the Commonwealth if he be not a leader superior to Melnitsky. At this thought a twofold pain straightened the soul of Yeremy, fear for the future of the country, and the unendurable feeling of a man who sees that his services are passed over. That justice will not be done him, and that others will raise their heads above his. He would not have been Yeremy Vishniavetsky if he had not been proud. He felt within himself the power to wield the baton, and he had earned the baton, therefore he suffered doubly. It was reported among officers that the prince would not wait for the close of the election, and would leave Warsaw, but that was not true. The prince not only did not leave, but he visited, in Nyaporent, Prince Casimir, who received him with unbounded favor, then he returned to the city for a prolonged stay, caused by military affairs. It was a question of finding support for the army, which the prince urged diligently. Besides, new regiments of dragoons and infantry were equipped at Karl's expense. Some had been sent to Russia already, others were to be drilled. For this purpose the prince sent out on every side officers expert in organizing troops. Kushal and Virchal had been sent, and finally the turn came for Volodyovsky. One day he was summoned to the prince, who gave him the following order. You will go by way of Babitz and Lipki to Zaborovo, where horses for the regiment are waiting. You will inspect them, reject those unfit, and pay Pan Thaskovsky for those accepted, then you will bring them for the soldiers. The money you will receive here in Warsaw from the paymaster on this my order. Volodyovsky set about the work briskly. He took the money, and on the same day he and Zagloba with eight others set out with a wagon bearing the money. They moved slowly, for that side of Warsaw was swarming with nobles, attendants, and horses, the villages as far as Babbitts were so packed that in every cottage there were guests. It was easy to meet adventures in a press of people of various humors, and in spite of their greatest efforts and modest bearing, our two friends did not escape them. On reaching Babbitts they saw before the public house a number of nobles who were just mounting to continue their journey. The two parties, after saluting each other, were about to pass, when suddenly one of the riders looked at Volodyovsky, and without saying a word rode up to him on a trot. Ah, you are here, my little fellow, cried he. You have been skulking, but I have found you. You won't escape me this time. Eh, gentlemen, shouted he to his comrades, just wait a bit. I have something to say to this little stub of an officer, and I should like to have you as witnesses of my words. Volodyovsky smiled with pleasure, for he recognized Pan Karlamp. God is my witness that I was not hiding, said he, more than that, I was looking for you myself to ask if you still cherished rancor against me, but somehow we couldn't meet. Pan Michael, whispered Zagloba, you are on duty. I remember, muttered Volodyovsky. Come to business, roared Karlamp. Gentlemen, I have promised this milksop, this bald mustache, to clip his ears for him, and I'll clip them as true as I am Carlamp. Be witnesses, gentlemen, and you, youngster, come up here. I cannot, as God is dear to me, I cannot, said Volodyovsky, let me off even for a couple of days. Why can you not? You are frightened, I suppose. 
If you do not meet me at once, I will slap you so with my sword that you'll think of your grandfather and grandmother. Oh, you dodger, you venomous gadfly, you know how to get in the way, you know how to buzz, you know how to bite, but when it comes to the saber you are not there. Here Zagloba interfered. It seems to me that you are pressing matters rather far, said he to Carlamp, and look out that this fly does not sting, if he does, no plaster will help you. Tfo! The devil take it, don't you see that this officer is on duty? Look at that wagon with money which we are taking to the regiment, and understand that his person is not at his own disposal and he cannot meet you. Whoever can't understand that is a dunce and not a soldier. We serve under the voevoda of Rus, and we have fought men different from you. But today it is impossible, and what is deferred will not escape. It is certain, said one of Karlamp's comrades, that they are transporting money, he cannot meet you. What is their money to me, screamed the irrepressible Karlamp, let him stand before me or I'll slap him with my sword. I will not meet you today, but I give you the word of a soldier to meet you in three or four days, wherever you please, the moment I have carried out my orders. And if this does not satisfy you, gentlemen, I shall give order to touch the triggers, for I shall believe that I have to do not with soldiers, but with brigands. Take yourselves off then to all the devils, for I have no time to loiter. On hearing this, the dragoons of the escort turned the muzzles of their guns on the aggressors. That movement, as well as the decisive words of Pan Michael, produced an evident impression on the comrades of Carlamp. Oh, let him off, said they. You are a soldier yourself, you know what service is, it is certain that you will receive satisfaction. He is a bold piece, like all men of the Russian squadron. Restrain yourself, since we ask you. Pan Karlamp blustered a while longer, but saw at last that he would either make his companions angry or expose them to an uncertain struggle with the dragoons. He turned therefore to Volodyovsky, and said, Give me your word that you will meet me. I will seek you myself, were it only because you have asked twice about such a thing. Today is Wednesday, and let it be Saturday at two o'clock in the afternoon. Select your ground. Here in Babbitts there is a crowd of travelers, said Carlamp, something might interfere. Let it be over there at Lipke, it is quieter, and not far from me, because our quarters are in Babbitts. Will there be as large a company of you as today? asked the prudent Zagloba. Oh, it's not necessary, said Carlamp, I shall come only with the Selitskys, my relatives. You will be without your dragoons, I trust. Perhaps they fight duels with the aid of soldiers among you, replied Pan Michael, but it is not the custom with us. In four days then, on Saturday, said Carlamp. We shall be in front of the public house at Lipki, and now with God. With God, said Volodyovsky and Zagloba. The opponents parted quietly. Pan Michael was made happy by the coming amusement, and promised himself to make a present to Pan Longin of mustaches shorn from the light horseman. He went therefore in good spirits to Zaborovo, where he found Prince Casimir, who had come to hunt. But Pan Michael saw his future lord only at a distance, for he was in a hurry. In two or three days he carried out his orders, inspected the horses, paid Pan Theskovsky, returned to Warsaw, and at the appointed time, yes, an hour earlier. He was at Lipki with Zagloba and Pan Kushal, whom he had asked to be his other second. On arriving in front of the inn kept by a Jew, they entered to moisten their throats a little with mead and amuse themselves with conversation at the glass. Here, scald head. Is your master at the castle? asked Zagloba of the innkeeper. He is away in the town. Are there many nobles stopping in Lipki? My house is empty. Only one has stopped with me, and he is sitting in the next room, a rich man, with servants and horses. And why did he not go to the castle? Because it is evident he does not know our master. Besides, the place has been closed for a month past. Maybe it is Karlamp, said Zagloba. No, said Volodyovsky. Well, Pan Michael, it seems to me that it is he. I'll go and see who it is. Jew, has this gentleman been long here? He came today, 
not two hours ago. And don't you know where he came from? I do not, but it must be from a distance, for his horses are used up. His men said, from beyond the Vistula. Why did he come here then to Lipki? Who knows? I'll go and see, repeated Zagloba, perhaps it is some acquaintance. Approaching the closed door of the room, he knocked with his sword hilt and said, Worthy sir, may I enter? Who is there? answered a voice within. A friend, said Zagloba, opening the door. Ah, begging your pardon, maybe I'm not in season, he added, pushing his head into the room. He drew back suddenly, and slammed the door as if he had looked on death. On his face was depicted terror coupled with the greatest astonishment. His mouth was open, and he looked with vacant stare on Volodyovsky and Kushal. What is the matter? asked Volodyovsky. By the wounds of Christ, be quiet, said Zagloba. Bogan is there. Who? What's happened to you? There, Bogan. Both officers rose to their feet. Have you lost your reason? Compose yourself. Who is it? Bogan. Bogan. Impossible. As I live. As I stand before you here, I swear to you by God and all the saints. Why are you so disturbed? asked Volodyovsky. If he is there, then God has given him into our hands. Compose yourself. Are you sure that it is he? As sure as that I am speaking to you, I saw him, he was changing his clothes. And did he see you? I don't know, I think not. Volodyovsky's eyes gleamed like coals. Jew, whispered he, beckoning hurriedly with his hand. This way. Are there doors from the room? No, only through this room. Kushal, you go under the window, whispered Pan Michael. Oh, he will not escape us this time. Kushal, without speaking a word, ran out of the room. Come to your senses, said Volodyovsky. Not over you, but over his neck hangs destruction. What can he do to you? Nothing. Nothing, but from astonishment I am unable to catch my breath. And he thought to himself, True, I have nothing to fear. Pan Michael is with me. Let Bogan be afraid. And putting on a terribly savage look, he grasped the hilt of his saber. Pan Michael, he must not escape us. But is it he? for still I can't believe. What should he be doing here? Melnitsky has sent him as a spy, that is most certain. Wait! Pan Michael, we will seize him and lay down the condition that unless he gives up the princess, we will deliver him to justice. If he gives up the princess, then let the devil take him. But are there not too few of us, too, and Kushal? He will defend himself like a madman, and he has attendants also. Carlamp will come with two, there will be six of us. That's enough. Be quiet. At that moment the door opened, and Bogan entered the room. He could not have seen Zagloba looking into his room, for at the sight of him he quivered suddenly, a flush as it were went over his face. And his hand as quick as lightning rested on the hilt of his saber. But all this lasted only the twinkle of an eye. The flush went from his face, which grew slightly pale. Zagloba looked at him, and said nothing. The ataman also remained silent, and in the room a fly on the wing could be heard. Those two persons whose fates had crossed in such a wonderful manner pretended at the moment not to know each other. The interval was rather long, it appeared to Pan Michael that whole ages were passing. Jew, said Bogan, all at once, is it far from here to Zabarovo? Not far, answered the Jew. Are you going now? Yes, said Bogan, and turned toward the door leading to the anteroom. With your permission, sounded the voice of Zagloba. The chief halted at once as if he had grown to the floor, and turning to Zagloba, fastened his dark and terrible eyes on him. What do you wish? asked he, curtly. It seems to me that we made acquaintance somewhere, at a wedding on a farm in Russia, was it not? Yes, said the chief haughtily, putting his hand again on the hilt. How does your health serve you? asked Zagloba. 
for you rode off in such haste that I had no time to bid you farewell. And were you sorry for that? Of course I was sorry. We should have had a dance, and the company would have been larger. Here Zagloba pointed to Volodyovsky. This is the cavalier who came in, and he would have been glad of a nearer acquaintance with you. Enough of this, shouted Pan Michael, rising suddenly. I arrest you, traitor. With what authority, asked the Ataman, raising his head haughtily. You are a rebel, an enemy of the Commonwealth, and have come here as a spy. And who are you? Oh, I will not explain that to you, but you won't escape me. We shall see, said Bogan. I should not explain to you who I am if you had challenged me to sabers like a soldier. But since you threaten with arrest, then I will explain. Here is a letter which I carry from the Zaporojan hetman to Prince Casimir, and not finding him in Nyaporant, I am going with it to Zaborovo. How will you arrest me now? Bogan looked haughtily and sneeringly at Volodyovsky. Pan Michael was greatly confused, like a hound which feels that the game is escaping him. And not knowing what to do, he turned an inquiring look at Zagloba. A painful moment of silence followed. It is difficult indeed, said Zagloba. Since you are an envoy, we cannot arrest you. And you will not meet this cavalier with a saber, for you have already fled before him till the earth groaned. Bogan's face grew purple, for that moment he recognized Volodyovsky. Shame and wounded pride sprang into play in the fearless chief. The remembrance of that flight scorched him like fire. It was the single stain on the fame of his heroism, the fame which he loved beyond life, beyond all. The inexorable Zagloba continued in cold blood, you had almost lost your trousers, when pity penetrated this cavalier. Tfo! Young hero, you have a woman's face, and a woman's heart too. You were brave with the old princess and the lad her son, but with a knight you are a windbag. Carry letters, steal young ladies, that's your work, not war. As God is dear to me, I saw with my own eyes how your trousers were flying around. Tfu, tfu. Now you talk of the saber, for you are carrying a letter. How are we to meet you when you shield yourself with that letter? All dust in the eyes, young hero. Melnitsky is a good soldier, Krivono's a good one. But among the Cossacks there is many a cowardly sneak. Bogan pushed up suddenly to Zagloba, and Zagloba drew back with equal swiftness behind Volodyovsky, so that the two young knights stood before each other, eye to eye. Not from fear did I retreat before you, but to save my men, said Bogan. I know not your reasons for fleeing, but I know that you fled, said Volodyovsky. I will meet you anywhere, even here, this minute. Will you challenge me? asked Volodyovsky, half closing his eyes. You have touched my fame, tried to cast shame on me, I need your blood. No dispute on those points, said Volodyovsky. No harm to the consenting party, added Zagloba. But who will deliver the letter to the prince? Give yourself no headache over that. It is my affair. Fight, then, if it cannot be otherwise, said Zagloba. But if fortune favors you against this cavalier, remember that you will have to meet me. And now, Pan Michael, come out to the front of the house, I have something important to say. The two friends went out and called Kushal from under the window of the room. Gentlemen, our affair is a bad one. He has really a letter to the prince, if we kill him, it is a capital crime. Remember that the chapter Propter Securitatum Loci has jurisdiction ten miles from the field of election, and he is the same as an envoy. A weighty question. We must either hide somewhere afterward, or perhaps the prince will protect us, otherwise it may go hard with us. And to let him go free again is still worse. This is the only way to liberate our poor young lady. For when he is no longer in the world we shall find her more easily. The Lord himself evidently wishes to aid her in Skshatuski, that's clear. Let us help. Will you invent some stratagem? asked Kushal. With my stratagem I have already brought him to challenge us. But seconds are necessary, strangers. 
My idea is to wait for Carlamp. I will undertake to make him yield his first place, and in case of need, to testify how we were challenged and obliged to defend ourselves. We must also find out more accurately from Bogan where he hid the young lady. If he has to die, she is nothing to him, perhaps he will tell if we press him. And if he won't tell, then it is better that he should not live. It is necessary to do everything with foresight and discretion. My head is bursting, gentlemen. Who will fight with him? Asked Kushal. Pan Michael first, I second, said Zagloba. And I third. Impossible, interrupted Volodyovsky. I will fight with him alone, and that will be the end. If he brings me down, it is his fortune. Let him go in peace. I've told him already, said Zagloba, but if it is your wish, I yield. If it is his wish, he may fight with you, but with no one else. Let us go to him then. Let us go. They found Bogan in the main room, drinking mead. He was perfectly calm. Listen, said Zagloba, for these are important questions which we want to discuss with you. You have challenged this cavalier. Very well. But you must know that since you are an envoy you are protected by law, for you come among civilized men, not among wild beasts. And therefore we cannot meet you unless you state before witnesses that you have challenged us of your own free will. A number of nobles with whom we had to fight a duel will come here, and you will make this statement before them. We will give you our knightly word that if fortune favors you against Pan Volodyovsky you will go away at liberty, and no one will hinder you, unless you wish to make a trial with me. Agreed, said Bogan. I will make that statement before those nobles, and I will tell my men to deliver the letter and to inform Melnitsky, if I perish, that I made the challenge. And if God favors me to vindicate my Cossack fame against this knight, I will ask you to sabers. When he had spoken he looked into Zagloba's eyes, Zagloba was rather confused, coughed, spat, and said. Agreed. When you have made a trial of my pupil, you will know what sort of work you will have with me. But enough of this. There is another and more important point in which we appeal to your conscience. For though a Cossack, we wish to treat you as a knight. You carried off Princess Helena Kurtsevichovna, the betrothed of our comrade and friend, and you hold her secreted. Know that if we had accused you of this it would not have helped you that Melnitsky made you his envoy, for this is raptus pueli, a capital offence, which would be judged here immediately. But since you are going to combat, and may perish, bethink yourself what will happen to that unfortunate lady if you die. Do you, who love her, wish evil and destruction to her? Will you deprive her of protection and give her to shame and misfortune? Do you wish to be her executioner, even when you are dead? Here the voice of Zagloba sounded with unusual solemnity for him. Bogan grew pale and asked, What do you want of me? Tell us where she is hidden, so that we may find her if you die, and give her to her betrothed. If you do this, God will have mercy on your soul. The chief rested his head on his hands, and thought deeply. The three comrades watched carefully the changes in that mobile face, which was suddenly covered with such touching grief as if neither anger, rage, nor any fierce feeling had ever played upon it. And as if that man had been created only for love and yearning. A long time this silence lasted, till finally it was broken by the voice of Zagloba, which trembled while uttering the following words. If you have already put her to shame, may God condemn you and let her find shelter in a cloister. Bogan raised his sad, moistened eyes, and said, If I have shamed her? I know not how you Poles love, knights and cavaliers, but I am a Cossack. I protected her in bar from death and disgrace, and afterward took her to the desert, and there guarded her as the eye in my head. Did no injury to her, fell at her feet and bowed to her as before an image. If she told me to go, I went, and have not seen her since, for war detained me. God will remember that for you at the judgment, said Zagloba, sighing deeply, but is she safe? Krivonos and the Tartars are there. Krivonos is at Kamenets, and sent me to ask Melnitsky whether he was to march on Kudak. 
He has surely gone there, and where she is there are neither Cossacks nor Poles nor Tartars. She is safe. Where is she, then? Listen to me, Poles. Let it be as you wish. I will tell you where she is, and I will give the order to render her up. But you must give me your knightly word that if God favors me, you will not look for her. You promise for yourselves and for Pan Skshetuski, and I will tell you. The three friends looked at one another. We cannot do that, said Zagloba. Oh, as true as life we cannot, cried Kushal and Volodyovsky. Is it possible? asked Bogan. His brows were frowning and his eyes flashed. Well, why can you not? Because Pan Skshetuski is not present. And besides, you may be sure that none of U.S. would cease to seek for her, even if you have hidden her underground. So you would make this bargain with me, Cossack, give up your soul, and then we will saber you. Oh, don't wait for it. And do you think my Cossack saber is not made of steel, that you are croaking over me like ravens over a dead carcass? And why am I to die, and not you? You want my blood, but I want yours. We shall see who gets whose. Then you will not tell? Why talk to me? Death to you all. Death to you. You deserve to be cut to pieces with sabers. Try it, said the chief, rising quickly. Kushal and Volodyovsky sprang at the same moment from the bench. Threatening looks were exchanged, breasts overflowing with anger breathed more violently, and it is unknown what might have happened, had not Zagloba, who had looked through the window, cried, Karlamp has come with his seconds. The light horse captain with his two companions, the Selitskys, entered the room. After the first greeting, Zagloba took them aside to explain the affair. He spoke so eloquently that he soon convinced them, especially when he declared that Volodyovsky asked only for a short delay. And immediately after his struggle with the Cossack would be ready to meet Karlamp. Here Zagloba related how old and terrible was the hatred of all the soldiers of the prince for Bogan, how he was an enemy of the whole commonwealth, and was one of the most desperate rebels. And finally, how he had carried off the princess, a lady of a noble house, the betrothed of a noble who was the mirror of every knightly virtue. And if you are a noble and have some feeling of brotherhood, you know that the wrong inflicted on one is inflicted on the whole order. Can you let it go then unavenged? Karlamp raised difficulties at first, and said that since matters were in that state, Bogan should be cut to pieces on the spot. But let Pan Volodyovsky meet me according to agreement. Zagloba had to explain to him again why this could not be, and that it would not be knightly to attack one man from behind in this fashion. Happily the Selitskys helped him, both men of judgment and prudence, so that the stubborn Lithuanian let himself be convinced at last, and agreed to a delay. Meanwhile Bogan went to his men, and returned with the Esaul Eliasenko, to whom he told how he had challenged two nobles, and then repeated the same thing aloud. In presence of Karlamp and the Selitskys. We on our part declare, said Volodyovsky, that if you come out victorious in the struggle with me, it will depend on your will whether you are to fight with Pan Zagloba. And in no case will anyone else call you out, and this company will not attack you. You will go where you please. For this I give my knightly word, and I beg you, gentlemen who have just come, to add the same on your part. We do, said Karlamp and the two Selitskys, solemnly. Then Bogan delivered to Elyasenko Melnitsky's letter to the prince, and said, You will give this letter to the prince. And if I die you will tell him and Melnitsky that the fault was mine, and that I was not killed through treachery. Zagloba, who had a watchful eye on everything, saw not the least disquiet on the sullen visage of Elyasenko. It was evident that he was too sure of his adamant. Bogan then turned haughtily to the nobles, well, to one death, to another life, said he. We may begin. Time, time. Said all, tucking back the skirts of their coats under their belts, and taking their sabres under their arms. They went in front of the inn, and turned down to a creek which flowed among a growth of hawthorns, wild roses, and plum trees. November had stripped, it is true, the leaves from the bushes, 
but the thicket was so close that it looked black as a morning ribbon along through the empty fields to the forest. The day was pale, but pleasant with that melancholy mildness of autumn full of sweetness. The sun embroidered softly with gold the naked branches of the trees, and lighted up the yellow, sandy banks extending some distance along the right side of the creek. The combatants and their seconds went straight to these banks. We will stop here, said Zagloba. Agreed, answered all. Zagloba grew more and more unquiet. At last he approached Volodyovsky, and whispered, Pan Michael. Well? For the love of God, Pan Michael, exert yourself. In your hands now is the fate of Skshetuski, the freedom of the princess, your own life and mine. God keep you from accident. I could do nothing with this robber. Why did you challenge him then? The word came out of itself. I trusted in you, Pan Michael. I am old, and my breath is short. I choke, and this beauty can jump like a goat. He is a fleet hound, Pan Michael. I'll do my best, said the little knight. God give you aid. Don't lose courage. Why should I? At that moment one of the Selitskys came up to them. He is a trim fellow, your Cossack, he whispered, he acts with us as if he were an equal, if not a superior. What a bearing! It must be that his mother looked on some noble. It is more likely, said Zagloba, that some noble looked on her. And so it appears to me, said Volodyovsky. To our places, called Bogan, suddenly. To our places, to our places. They took their places, the nobles in a half circle, Volodyovsky and Bogan opposite each other. Volodyovsky, as a man experienced in such affairs though he was young, tested the ground first with his feet to see if it was firm. Then he cast his eye about, wishing to know all the unevenness of the place. And it was apparent that he did not underestimate the affair. He had to meet with a knight the most celebrated in the whole Ukraine, of whom the people sang songs, and whose name was known through the breadth of Russia to the Crimea. Pan Michael, a simple lieutenant of the dragoons, promised himself much from that struggle, for it was either a glorious death or an equally glorious victory. Therefore he neglected nothing to show himself worthy of such an opponent. He had an unusual seriousness in his face, seeing which Zagloba was frightened. He is losing courage, thought he. It is over with him, and then it is over with me. Meanwhile Volodyovsky, having examined the ground carefully, began to unbutton his vest. Bogan followed his example, and both threw off their upper garments, so that they were in trousers and shirts, then they rolled up the sleeves on their right arms. But how insignificant appeared little Pan Michael before the large and powerful Adaman. He was almost invisible. The seconds looked uneasily on the broad breast of the Cossack, on the great muscles visible from under the rolled-up sleeve, like knots and cords. It seemed as though a little cock had stood up to fight with a powerful falcon of the steppes. The nostrils of Bogan were distended as if snuffing blood in advance. His face was so contracted that his dark foretop seemed to touch his brow, and the saber quivered in his hand, he fixed his eyes rapaciously on his opponent and waited the word. Volodyovsky looked once more through the light at the edge of his sword, moved his little yellow mustache, and stood in position. There will be straight cuts here, muttered Kushal to Selitsky. Meanwhile the voice of Zagloba, slightly trembling, said, In the name of God, begin. Chapter 45 The sabers whistled, edge clashed against edge. The place of conflict was shifted at once. For Bogan pressed on with such fury that Volodyovsky sprang back a number of steps, and the seconds had to retreat too. The lightning zigzags of Bogan's sword were so swift that the astonished eyes of those present could not follow them. It seemed to them that Volodyovsky was altogether surrounded and covered, and that God alone could snatch him from beneath that storm of thunderbolts. The blows were mingled in one uninterrupted whistle, the rush of the moving air struck all faces. The fury of the Cossack increased. The wild rage of conflict seized him, and like a hurricane he pushed Volodyovsky before him. 
the little knight retreated continually, and merely defended himself. His extended right arm scarcely moved, only his hand described, without stopping, circles narrow but swift as thought, and caught the raging blows of Bogan. He put edge under edge, warded off and again defended and still retreated, fixed his eyes on the eyes of the Cossack, and in the midst of serpentine lightnings appeared calm. But on his cheeks purple spots were coming out. Zagloba closed his eyes, and heard nothing but blow after blow, bite after bite. He defends himself yet, thought he. He defends himself yet, said the Selitskys and Kushal. He is already pushed to the sandbank, added Kushal, quietly. Zagloba opened his eyes again and looked. True, Volodyovsky was pushed to the bank, but evidently he was not wounded yet. The flush on his face had become deeper, and drops of sweat were on his forehead. Zagloba's heart began to beat with hope. Pan Michael is a master beyond masters, thought he, and this fellow will become tired at last. In fact Bogan's face had grown pale, sweat stood in drops on his forehead, but resistance only roused his rage, foam shone from under his mustache, and from his breast came the hoarseness of fury. Volodyovsky did not let him out of sight, and defended himself continually. Suddenly, feeling the sandbank behind, he collected himself. It seemed to the spectators that he had fallen. Meanwhile he bent, shrunk up, half squatted, and hurled his whole body as if it were a stone against the breast of the Cossack. He is attacking, shouted Zagloba. He is attacking. Repeated the others. So he was, in fact. The Cossack retreated now. And the little knight, having discovered the whole power of his opponent, pushed on him so briskly that the breath stopped in the breasts of the seconds. Evidently he began to warm up. His little eyes shot sparks, he squatted, he sprang, he changed position in a moment, he described circles around the Cossack, and forced him to turn where he stood. Oh, masterly, masterly! said Zagloba. You will perish, said Bogan, all at once. You will perish, answered, like an echo, Volodyovsky. At that moment the Cossack threw his saber from his right to his left hand, a feat possible only to the ablest fencers, and gave with his left hand such a terrible blow that Volodyovsky fell to the ground as if struck by lightning. Jesus, Mary, screamed Zagloba. But Volodyovsky had fallen on purpose, so that the saber of Bogan might meet only air. Then the little knight sprang up like a wildcat, and with almost the whole length of his blade cut terribly into the open breast of the Cossack. Bogan tottered, advanced a step, and with a last effort gave the last thrust. Volodyovsky warded it off with ease, and struck still twice on the inclined head. The saber dropped from the powerless hands of Bogan, and he fell with his face on the sand, which immediately reddened under him in a broad pool of blood. Elyasenko, present at the duel, rushed to the body of the Ataman. The seconds were unable to utter a word for some time. Pan Michael too was silent. He rested both hands on his saber and panted heavily. Zagloba first broke the silence. Pan Michael, come to my embrace, said he, with emotion. Then they surrounded him in a circle. You are a swordsman of the first water. May the bullet strike you, said the Selitskys. You are a deceitful rogue, I see, said Karlamp, but I'll meet you, lest it be said that I am afraid. But though you were to slash me in such fashion as this, still I congratulate you. And you should put yourself at rest, for in fact you have nothing to fight about, said Zagloba. Impossible! answered the light horseman, for it is a question here of my reputation, for which I am glad to give my life. I have no claim on your life. It is better to drop the matter. For to tell you the truth, I have not come in your way as you imagine. Some other man better than I will stand in your way, but not I. Is that true? My knightly word for it. Then make peace with each other, cried the Selitskys and Kushal. Let it be so, said Karlamp, opening his arms. Volodyovsky fell into them, and the two men kissed each other till the echoes resounded along the bank. 
Kushal said, I did not think that you could beat such a giant. And he knew too how to use a saber. I had no idea that he was such a swordsman. Where could he have learned? Here the attention of all was directed again to the prostrate chief, whom at that time Elyasenko had turned on his back and was looking with tears for signs of life in him. It was impossible to recognize the features of Bogan, for they were covered with streaks of blood which flowed out of the wounds in his head and which immediately grew stiff in the chill air. The shirt on his breast was all in blood, but he still gave signs of life. Seemingly he was in his last agonies, his feet quivered, and his fingers hooked convulsively like claws in the sand. Zagloba looked and waved his hand. He has had his fill, he is parting with the world. Ah, said one of the Selitskys, looking at the body, that's a corpse already. Yes, for he is almost cut into bits. He was no common knight, muttered Volodyovsky, nodding his head. I know something of that, added Zagloba. Meanwhile Elyasenko tried to raise up and carry away the unfortunate Adaman, but being rather a slender man and not young, and since Bogan belonged almost to the giants, he could not. It was some distance to the inn, and Bogan might die at any moment. The Asal, seeing this, turned to the nobles. Gentlemen, said he, clasping his hands, for the sake of the Saviour and the Holy Most Pure, help me. Do not let him die here like a dog. I am old, not strong enough, and the men are far away. The nobles looked at one another. Animosity against Bogan had vanished from every heart. True, it is hard to leave him here like a dog, muttered Zagloba. Since we met him in a duel, he is no longer a peasant for us, but a soldier, to whom such assistance is due. Who will carry him with me, gentlemen? I, said Volodyovsky. Then carry him on my burka, added Karlamp. In a moment Bogan was lying on the mantle, the ends of which Zagloba, Volodyovsky, Kushal, and Elyasenko held. And the whole party, in company with Karlamp and the Selitskys, moved with slow steps toward the inn. He has a firm life, said Zagloba, he is moving yet. My God, if any man had told me that I should become his nurse and carry him in this fashion, should have thought that he was trifling with me. I have too feeling a heart, I know that myself. But life is cruel. I'll dress his wounds too. I hope we shall meet no more in this world, let him remember me kindly in the next. Then you think that he will not recover by any means? Asked Carlamp. He. I wouldn't give a wisp of old straw for his life. Such was his fate, and he could not escape it. For even if he had succeeded with Pan Volodyovsky, he wouldn't have escaped my hands. But I prefer that it has happened as it has, for already there is an outcry against me as a merciless slaughterer. And what am I to do when a man crawls into my way? I had to pay Pan Dunchevsky five hundred sequins fine, and you know, gentlemen, that estates in Russia give no income now. True, for they have plundered you there to the last, said Karlamp. Oh, this Cossack is heavy, said Zagloba, I've lost my breath, plundered us, yes, plundered, but I hope the diet will make some provision, otherwise we are reduced to death. But he is heavy, he is heavy. See, the blood is beginning to run again. Hurry, Pan Karlamp, to the inn, let the Jew mix some dough with spiderweb. It won't help the dead man much, but care is a Christian act, and it will be easier for him to die. Hurry, Pan Karlamp. Karlamp pushed ahead. And when at last they carried the chief into the room, Zagloba betook himself, with great knowledge of the art and expertness, to dressing him. He stopped the blood, closed the wounds, then turned to Elyasenko and said. You, grandfather, are not needed here. Ride with all speed to Zaborovo, ask to be placed before the prince, deliver the letter, and tell what you saw, everything as it was. If you lie, I shall know, for I am a confidant of His Highness the Prince, and I shall command your head to be cut off. Give my respects to Melnitsky, for he knows and loves me. We will give a fitting funeral to your Adaman. You do your own work, do not loiter in corners, or someone will settle you before you can tell who you are. 
be in good health, and be off. Let me stay, gentlemen, even till he gets cold. Be off, I tell you, said Zagloba, threateningly, if not, I'll order the peasants to take you to Zaborovo. And my respects to Melnitsky. Elyasenko bowed to the girdle and went out. Zagloba said again to Karlamp and the Selitskys. I've got that Cossack off. For what has he to do here, and if someone should kill him, which might easily happen, then the blame would be laid on us. The partisans of Zaslavsky and the Kurs of the Chancellor would be first to roar with all their might that in spite of God's law Vishnievetsky's men murdered the whole Cossack embassy. But a wise head has a remedy for everything. We won't let ourselves be eaten in Kasha by these fops, these parasites. And when necessary you, gentlemen, will bear witness how it all happened, and that he challenged us himself. I must order the bailiff of this place to bury him somehow. They don't know here who he was, they will think that he was a noble, and bury him decently. It's time for us two to be on the road, Pan Michael, for we have a report to make to the prince yet. The hoarse breathing of Bogan interrupted these words. Oh, the soul is seeking a way for itself, said Zagloba. It is getting dark, and the spirit will go groping to the other world. But since he put no shame on our young lady, may God give him eternal rest, amen. Let us go, Pan Michael. From my heart I forgive him all his sins, though to tell the truth, I put myself more in his way than he put himself in mine. But the end has come. Gentlemen, I wish you good health. It was a delight to make the acquaintance of such honorable men, but remember to testify in case of need. Chapter 46 Prince Yeremy heard of the slaying of Bogan with notable indifference. Especially when he learned that there were men outside his regiments who were ready at any moment to testify that Volodyovsky had been challenged. If the affair had not happened just before the announcement of Yen Kazimir's election, if the struggle of the candidates had been still going on, the opponents of Yeremy and at their head the Chancellor would certainly not have failed to forge weapons against him out of this event, in spite of all witnesses and testimony. But after Prince Karl's withdrawal, men's minds were occupied with other things, and it was easy to foresee that the whole affair would be drowned in oblivion. Melnitsky, it is true, might raise it to show what new injuries he was enduring every day. But Yeremy justly hoped that Prince Casimir in sending his answer would order it to be stated from himself how the envoy had perished. And Melnitsky would not dare to doubt the truth of the prince's words. Yeremy was anxious only that no political disturbance should rise through his soldiers. On the other hand he was glad, on Skshetuski's account, of what had happened, for the finding of Kurtsevichovna was really much more likely now. It was possible to find her, to rescue or ransom her. And the prince would surely not spare the outlay, no matter how great, if only he could save his favorite knight from suffering and restore his happiness. Volodyovsky went to the prince in great apprehension, for though in general he had little timidity, still he feared as he did fire every frown of the voivoda's brow. What was his astonishment then and joy when the prince, after he had heard the report and meditated a while on what had happened, took a costly ring from his finger and said, I praise your moderation for not attacking him first, for a great and harmful uproar might have arisen at the diet from that. But if the princess shall be found, Skshetuski will be indebted to you for life. Reports reach me, Volodyovsky, that as others are unable to keep their tongues behind their lips, you are unable to keep your saber in its scabbard, for which punishment is due you. But since you took the part of a friend and sustained the reputation of our regiments with such a famous hero, take this ring, so as to have some memento of this day. I knew that you were a good soldier and famous at the sword, but this is like a master of masters. He, said Zagloba. He would cut the devil's horns off at the third round. If your highness should ever have my head cut off, then I ask that no one else cut it but him, for at least I should go to the other world straightway. He cut Bogan in two in the breast, and then passed twice through his wits. The prince was fond of knightly affairs and good soldiers. He smiled therefore with pleasure and asked, Have you ever found your match at the saber? Skshetuski hacked me a little once, 
but I paid him back the time your highness put us both behind the bars. Among others Pan Padbipienta might meet me, for he has power beyond human. And Kushal almost, if he had better eyes. Don't believe him, your highness. No man can stand before him. And Bogan fought long? I had grievous work. He knew how to throw the saber from the right to the left hand. Bogan told me himself, interrupted Zagloba, that he fought with the Kurtsevichi whole days for practice, and I saw myself how he did the same with others in Chigirin. Do you know what you would better do, Volodyovsky, said the prince, with pretended seriousness. Go to Zamost, challenge Melnitsky, and with one blow free the Commonwealth from all its defeats and anxieties. I will go at your highness's order, if Melnitsky wishes to meet me, answered Volodyovsky. To which the prince answered, We are joking, and the world is perishing. But you, gentlemen, must really go to Zamost. I have news from the Cossack camp that the moment Prince Casimir's election is declared, Melnitsky will raise the siege and withdraw to Russia. Which he will do from real or simulated affection for the king, or because his power might more easily be broken at Zamost. Therefore you must go and tell Skshetuski what has happened, so that he may set out to look for the princess. Tell him to choose from my squadrons with the starosta of valets as many soldiers as may be necessary for the expedition. Besides, I shall send him permission by you and give him a letter, for his happiness is very near my heart. Your Highness, you are a father to us all. Therefore we desire to remain in faithful service to you while we live. I am not sure that my service will not soon be a hungry one, said the prince, if all my fortune beyond the Dnieper is lost, but while it lasts, what is mine is yours. Oh, cried Volodyovsky, our poor fortunes will always be at the disposal of your highness. And mine with the rest, added Zagloba. That is not necessary yet, answered the prince, kindly. I still entertain the hope that if I lose everything the commonwealth will at least remember my children. Speaking thus, the prince seemed to have a moment of second sight. The commonwealth in fact a few years later gave to his only son the best it had, that is, the crown, but at that time the gigantic fortune of Yeremy was really shattered. Well, we got out of it, said Zagloba, when both had left the prince. Pan Michael, you may be sure of promotion. But let us see the ring. Upon my word, it is worth about one hundred ducats, for the stone is very beautiful. Ask any Armenian in the bazaar tomorrow. For such an amount we might swim in eating and drinking and other delights. What do you think, Pan Michael? The soldier's maxim is, today I live, tomorrow decay. And the sense of it is this, that it isn't worth while to think of tomorrow. Short is the life of man, Pan Michael. The great thing is this, that henceforth the prince will carry you in his heart. He would give ten times as much to make a present of Bogan to Skshetuski, and you have done it. You may expect great favors, believe me. Are the villages few that the prince has given to knights for life, or made presents of outright? What is such a ring as this? Surely some income will fall to you, and to wind up, the prince will give you one of his relatives in marriage. Pan Michael jumped up. How do you know that? That what? I wanted to say, what have you got in your head? How could such a thing take place? But does it not take place? Are you not a noble, or are not all nobles equal? Are the distant relatives, male and female, of every magnate among the nobles few in number? These relatives he gives in marriage to his most important men. Very likely Sufchinsky of Senchi married some distant relative of the Vishniavetskys. Though some of us serve, we are all brothers, Pan Michael, all brothers, since we are all descended in common from Japhet, and the whole difference is in fortune and offices to which each may arrive. There are likely enough in some other countries considerable differences between nobles, but they are mangy nobles. I understand differences between dogs. There are, for instance, pointers, and there are hounds of various kinds. But consider, Pan Michael, it cannot be so among nobles. For then we should be dog brothers, not nobles, 
which disgrace to such an honourable order thou wilt not permit, O Lord. You speak truly, said Volodyovsky. But then the Vishnievetskys are kingly stock, almost. Ah, Pan Michael, just as if you are not eligible to the throne. I, first of all, would vote for you, if I should make up my mind like Pan Sigismund Skarshevsky, who swears that he will vote for himself unless he is ruined at dice. Everything, thank God, with us is obtained by free vote, our poverty, not our birth, stands in the way. That's the case precisely, sighed Pan Michael. What's to be done? We are plundered to the last, and we shall be lost if the Commonwealth doesn't provide some income for us, said Zagloba, and we shall perish miserably. What wonder is it if a man, though by nature abstemious, should like to get drunk under such oppressions? Let us go, Pan Michael, and drink a glass of small beer. We shall comfort ourselves even a little. Thus conversing, they reached the old town and entered a wine shop, before which a number of attendants were holding the shubas and burkas of nobles who were drinking inside. Having seated themselves before a table, they ordered a decanter and began to take counsel as to what they should do now, after the killing of Bogan. If Melnitsky should leave Zamost and peace follow, then the princess is ours, said Zagloba. We must go to Skshetuski at once, and not let him off till he finds the girl. True, we will go at once, but now there is no way of getting to Zamost. That's all the same, if only God will favor us later. Zagloba raised his glass. He will, he will, said he. Do you know, Pan Michael, what I'll tell you? What is it? Bogan is killed. Volodyovsky looked at him with astonishment. Yes, who should know that better than I? May your hands be holy. You know and I know. I saw how you fought, you are now before my eyes, and still I must repeat it to myself continually, for at times it seems as though I had only some kind of a dream. What a care has been removed! What a knot your sabre cut! May the bullet strike you! For God knows, this is too great to be told. No, I cannot restrain myself. Let me press you once again, Pan Michael. If you will believe, when I made your acquaintance I thought to myself, there is a little whippersnapper. A nice whippersnapper, to slash Bogan in this fashion. Bogan is gone, no trace, no ashes of him, slain to death for the ages of ages, amen. Here Zagloba began to hug and kiss Volodyovsky, and Pan Michael was moved to tears as if sorry for Bogan. At last, however, he freed himself from Zagloba's embraces and said, we were not present at his death, and he is hard to kill. Suppose he recovers? Oh, in God's name, what are you talking about? said Zagloba. I should be ready to go tomorrow to Lipki and arrange the nicest funeral for him, just after his death. Why should you go? You wouldn't finish a wounded man. After the saber, whoever does not yield his breath at once is likely to pull through. A saber is not a bullet. He cannot recover. He was already in the death agony when we left. No chance of recovery. I examined his wounds myself. Let him rest, for you cut him open like a hare. We must go to Skshetuski at once and comfort him, or he may die of gnawing grief. Or he will become a monk, he told me so himself. What wonder! I should do the same in his place. I do not know a more honorable knight, and a more unhappy one I do not know. The Lord visits him grievously. Leave off, said Volodyovsky, a little drunk, for I am not able to stop my tears. Neither am I, added Zagloba, such an honorable knight, and such a soldier. But the princess, you do not know her, such a darling. Here Zagloba began to howl in a low bass, for he really loved the princess and Pan Michael accompanied him in a higher key, and they drank wine mixed with tears. Then, dropping their heads on their breasts, they sat for a time gloomily, till Zagloba struck his fist on the table. Pan Michael, why do we weep? Bogan is killed. True, said Volodyovsky. We ought rather to rejoice. We are fools now if we don't find her. Let us go, 
said Volodyovsky, rising. Let us drink, corrected Zagloba. God grant us to hold their children at the christening, and all because we slew Bogan. Served him right. Finished Volodyovsky, not noticing that Zagloba was already sharing with him the merit of killing Bogan. Chapter 47 At last, Te Deum Laudamus, was heard in the cathedral of Warsaw, and the king was enthroned, cannon thundered, bells were tolled, and confidence began to enter all hearts. The interregnum had passed, a time of storms and unrest the more terrible for the commonwealth that it happened in a period of universal disaster. Those who had been trembling at the thought of threatening dangers, now that the election had passed with unusual harmony, drew a deep breath. It seemed to many that the unparalleled civil war was over forever, and that the newly chosen king had but to pronounce sentence on the guilty. Indeed, this hope was supported by the bearing of Melnitsky himself. The Cossacks at Zamost, while storming the castle wildly, nevertheless spoke loudly in favor of Yen Kazimir. Melnitsky sent through the priest Huntsel Mokrsky letters full of loyalty, and through other envoys obedient requests for favor to himself and the Zaporozhian army. It was known also that the king, in accord with the policy of the chancellor, desired to make considerable concessions to the Cossacks. As before the catastrophe of Palavtsi war was in every mouth, so was peace now. It was hoped that after so many disasters the commonwealth would recover, and under the new reign would be healed from all its wounds. At last Snyarovsky went with a letter of the king to Melnitsky. And soon the joyful news was circulated that the Cossacks would withdraw from Zamost to the Ukraine, where they would wait quietly the commands of the king and the commission which was to be occupied with examining the wrongs inflicted on them. It seemed that after the storm a seven-colored rainbow hung over the land, heralding calm and fair weather. There were not lacking, it is true, unfavorable prophecies and prognostications, but in view of the favoring reality no weight was attached to them. The king went to Chenstakova to thank first of all the divine protectress for the election and to give himself to her further care, and then to Krakow to the coronation. The dignitaries followed him, Warsaw was deserted, only those exiles from Russia remained who did not dare yet to return to their ruined fortunes, or who had nothing with which to return. Prince Yeremy, as senator of the Commonwealth, had to go with the king. But Volodyovsky and Zagloba, at the head of one squadron of dragoons, went with hurried marches to Zamost to give Skshetuski the happy tidings of what had happened to Bogan. And then to go with him in search of the princess. Zagloba left Warsaw not without a certain sadness. For in that immeasurable concourse of nobles, in the uproar of election, in the endless revelry and the brawls raised in company with Volodyovsky, he was as happy as a fish in the sea. But he consoled himself with the thought that he was returning to active life, to the search for adventures, and stratagems of which he promised not to spare himself. And besides he had his own opinion about the dangers of the capital, which he laid bare to Volodyovsky in the following manner. It is true, Pan Michael, said he that we did great things in Warsaw. But God keep us from a longer visit. For I tell you we should become effeminate, like that famous Carthaginian whom the sweetness of the air of Capua weakened to the core. But worst of all are women. They bring every man to destruction. Just think, there is nothing more traitorous than woman. A man grows old, but still she attracts him. But you might give us peace, said Volodyovsky. I repeat this to myself often, it being time for me to grow sedate, but I am too hot-blooded yet. You are more phlegmatic, in me, however, is passion itself. But a truce to this. We will begin another life now. More than once have I grieved for war of late. We have an excellent squadron. And around Zamos there are bands of marauders with whom we will amuse ourselves while going after the princess. We shall see Skshetuski too, and that giant, that Lithuanian stork, that hop pole, Pan Langin, and we have not seen him for many a day. You are longing for him, and when you see him you give him no peace. Because when he talks it is as if your horse were moving his tail, and he stretches every word as a shoemaker does leather. With him everything went into strength instead of brains. 
when he takes anyone by the shoulders he pushes the ribs through the skin. Still there is not a child in the commonwealth who could not outweat him. How is it possible that a man with such a fortune should be so dull? Has he in truth such a fortune? He? When I made his acquaintance he had a belt so stuffed that he could not gird himself with it, and he carried it around like a smoked sausage. You could flourish it like a staff and it would not bend. He told me himself how many villages he has, Mishikishki, Sikishki, Pigvishki, Sarutsiani, Tsayaputsiani, Kapusiani, or rather, Kapusiana, seventeen but adding Gloa. Baltapai, who could remember all these heathen names? About half the district belongs to him. It's a great family, the Podbipienta, among Supeters. Haven't you exaggerated a little about these estates? I do not exaggerate, for I repeat what I heard from him, and during his life he has never told a lie, he is in fact too stupid for that. Well, then, Anusia will be a lady with a full mouth. But as to your dictum that he is stupid, I cannot agree to that in any way. He is a solid man, and so clear-headed that no one can give better counsel. But that he is not a rogue, that is not difficult. The Lord God did not give everyone such a nimble tongue as yours. There is no denying that he is a great knight and a man of the utmost honor. As proof of this you love him and are glad to see him. Oh, the punishment of God on him, muttered Zagloba, I am glad only because I can tease him with Anusia. I don't advise you to do that, for it is a dangerous thing. You might plaster a wound with him, but in the case of Anusia he would surely lose patience. Let him lose it. I'll clip his ears for him as I did for Pan Dunchevsky. Oh, spare us. I should not like to have you try him as an enemy. Well, well, let me only see him. This wish of Zagloba was fulfilled sooner than he expected. When they arrived at Konskavoli, Volodyovsky determined to stay for the night, as the horses were terribly road weary. Who can describe the astonishment of the two friends when on entering the dark anteroom of the inn they recognized Pan Podbipienta in the first noble they met? Oh! How are you? How long, how long? cried Zagloba, and the Cossacks did not cut you up in Zamost? Pan Podbipienta took them one after the other by the shoulders, and kissed them on the cheeks. And have we met? He repeated with joy. Where are you going? asked Volodyovsky. To Warsaw, to the prince. The prince is not in Warsaw. He went to Krakow with the king, before whom he has to carry the globe at the coronation. But Pan Weyer sent me to Warsaw with a letter inquiring where the prince's regiments are to go, for God be thanked they are required no longer in Zamost. Then you need go no farther, for we are carrying the orders. Pan Langin frowned. For from his soul he wished to get to the prince, to see the court, and especially one little person at that court. Zagloba began to mutter significantly to Volodyovsky. Then I'll go to Krakow, said the Lithuanian, after a moment's thought. I was ordered to deliver the letter, and I will deliver it. Let's go and order them to warm up some beer, said Zagloba. And where are you going? asked Pan Langin. To Zamost, to Skshatuski. He is not in Zamost. Now, old woman, you've got a cake. Where is he? Somewhere around Koroskina. He is breaking up disorderly bands. Melnitsky retreated, but his colonels are burning, robbing, and slaying along the road. The starosta of Valets has ordered Pan Jacob Rogovsky to disperse them. And is Skshatuski with him too? Yes, but they act separately for there is great rivalry between them, of which I will tell you later on. Meanwhile they entered the room. Zagloba ordered three gallons of warmed beer. Then approaching the table at which Volodyovsky had already sat down with Pan Langin, he said. You do not know, Pan Podbipienta. The greatest and the happiest news, that I and Pan Michael have slain Bogan. The Lithuanian rose from the bench. My own brothers, can this be? As you see us here alive. And both of you killed him? We did. That is news. Oh God, God! 
said the Lithuanian, clapping his hands. And you say that both of you, how both? For I, to begin with, by stratagem brought him to this, that he challenged us, do you understand me? Then Pan Michael met him first, and cut him up, I tell you, like a sucking pig at Easter, opened him like a roast capon, do you understand? Then you were not the second combatant? But look here, said Zagloba. I see that you must have lost blood, and that your mind totters from weakness. Did you understand that I would fight a duel with a corpse, or that I would kill a prostrate man? But you said that you had slain him together. Zagloba shrugged his shoulders. Holy patience with such a man. Pan Michael didn't Bogan challenge both of us? He did. Do you understand now? Well, let it be so, answered Pan Langin. Skshatuski was looking for Bogan around Zamost, but he was no longer there. How was that, Skshatuski was looking for him? I must, I see, tell you everything from the beginning exactly as it happened, said Pan Langin. We remained, as you know, in Zamost, and you went to Warsaw. We did not wait for the Cossacks very long. They came in impenetrable clouds from Lvov, so that you could not take them all in with the eye. But our prince had supplied Zamost, so that they might have stood two years in front of it. We thought that they wouldn't storm it at all, and great was the grief among us on that account. For each had promised himself delight from their defeats, and since there were Tartars among them I too hoped that God would give me my three heads. Beg of him one, but a good one. Interrupted Zagloba. You are always the same, it is disgusting to hear you, said the Lithuanian. We thought they wouldn't storm. They, however, as if mad in their stubbornness, went at once to building machines, and then for the storming. It transpired later that Melnitsky himself was unwilling. But Chernota, their camp commander, began to assail him, and to say that he was afraid and wanted to fraternize with the Poles. Melnitsky therefore permitted it, and sent Chernota first. What followed, brothers, I will not tell you. The light could not be seen from smoke and fire. They went on boldly at first, filled the ditch, mounted the walls. But we warmed them up so that they ran away from the walls and their own machines, then we rushed out after them in three squadrons, and cut them up like cattle. Volodyovsky rubbed his hands. Oh, sorry am I not to have been at that feast, cried he, in ecstasy. And I should have been of service there, said Zagloba, with calm confidence. There Skshatuski and Rogovsky distinguished themselves most, continued the Lithuanian. Both are grand knights, both are altogether hostile to each other. Rogovsky was specially angry with Skshatuski, and beyond doubt would have sought a quarrel if Pan Weyer had not forbidden duels on pain of death. We didn't understand at first what the trouble was with Rogovsky till it came out at last that he was a relative of Pan Lash, whom the prince, as you remember, excluded from the camp for Skshatuski's sake. Hence the malice in Rogovsky against the prince, against us all, and especially against Skshatuski. Hence the rivalry between them which covered both in the siege with great glory, for each tried to surpass the other. Both were first on the walls and in the sallies, till at last Melnitsky got tired of storming, and began a regular siege. Not neglecting meanwhile stratagems which might enable him to capture the place. He confides as much or more in cunning, said Zagloba. He is a madman and ignorant besides, continued Podbipienta. Thinking Pan Weyer a German, it is evident he hadn't heard of the voivodas of Pomery of that name, he wrote a letter wishing to persuade the starosta to treason as a foreigner and a mercenary. Then Pan Weyer wrote to him, explaining how everything was and how vainly he had approached him with his attempt. The better to show his importance, the starosta wished to send this letter through some person more important than a trumpeter. And as no officers volunteered, since it was like going to destruction to venture among such wild beasts, and some had scruples about their rank, therefore I undertook it. And now listen, for the most interesting part begins here. We are listening attentively, said the two friends. I went then, and found the hetman drunk. He received me angrily. Especially after he had read the letter, 
he threatened with his baton, and I, commending my soul humbly to God, thought thus to myself, if he touches me, I'll smash his head with my fist. What was to be done, dear brothers, what? It was honorable on your part to have those thoughts, said Zagloba, with emotion. But the colonels pacified him and barred the road to me against him, said Pan Langin. And more than all a young man, so bold that he took him by the waist and drew him away, saying, Don't go, father, you have been drinking. I looked to see who was defending me, and wondered at his boldness and intimacy with Melnitsky, till I saw that he was Bogan. Bogan, cried Volodyovsky and Zagloba. Yes, I knew him, for I made his acquaintance in Rosloji. I listened. That is an acquaintance of mine, said he to Melnitsky. And Melnitsky, since decision with drinking men is sudden, answered, If he is thy acquaintance, son, then give him fifty thalers, and I will give him an answer. He gave me the answer. And as to the thalers, not to anger the beast, I told him to put them away for the Haydukes, for it was not the custom among officers to take presents. He conducted me politely enough to the door. But I had scarcely come out when Bogan followed me. We met in Rosloji, said he. Yes, I answer, but I did not expect, brother, to see you in this camp. Not my own will, but misfortune, drove me here, said he. In the conversation I told him that it was we who had defeated him beyond Yarmolintsi. I did not know with whom I had to do, he answered. I was cut in the hand, and my men were good for nothing, for they thought that Prince Yeremi himself was beating them. And we did not know, said I. For if Pan Skshetuski had known that you were there, then one of you would not be living now. That is very certain, but what did he say then? asked Volodyovsky. He changed greatly, and turned the conversation. He told me how Kravonos had sent him with letters to Melnitsky at Lvov in order to get a little rest, and Melnitsky wouldn't send him back, for he thought to employ him in other missions. Since he was a man of presence. At last he asked, Where is Pan Skshetuski? And when I answered, He is in Zamost, he said, Zamost. Then we may meet, and with that I bade him farewell. I think now that Melnitsky sent him immediately afterward to Warsaw, said Zagloba. True, but wait. I returned then to the fortress, and made a report of my mission to Weyer. It was already late at night. Next day a new storm, more furious than the first. I had no time to see Skshetuski till the third day. I told him that I had seen Bogan and spoken to him. There were many officers present, and with them Rogovsky. Hearing this, he said with a taunt, I know it is a question of a woman. But if you are such a knight as report says, now you have Bogan, call him out, and you may be sure that that fighter will not refuse you. We shall have a splendid view from the walls. But there is more talk of you Vishnievetsky men than you deserve. Skshetuski looked at Rogovsky as if he would cut him off his feet. Is that your advice? asked he. Very good. But I don't know whether you who criticize our value would have the daring to go among the mob and challenge Bogan for me. The daring I have, but I am neither groomsman nor brother to you, and I will not go. Then others, with laughter against Rogovsky, said, Oh, you are small now. But when it was a question of another man's skin you were big. Then Rogovsky as an ambitious fellow got his blood up. Next day he went with a challenge, but couldn't find Bogan. We didn't believe his story at first, but now after what you have told me I see that it was true. Melnitsky must have sent Bogan away really, and you killed him. That was it, said Volodyovsky. Tell us now, said Zagloba, where to find Skshetuski, for we must find him so as to go for the princess immediately. You will find him easily beyond Zamost, for he is heard of there. He and Rogovsky, tossing from one to the other the forces of Kalina, the Cossack colonel, destroyed them. Later Skshetuski alone broke up Tartar parties, twice defeated Berlai, and dispersed a number of bands. Does Melnitsky permit that? Melnitsky disavows them, and says that they plunder in spite of his orders, if he didn't do this, no one would believe in his loyalty and obedience to the king. 
The beer is very bad in this Conscavoli, remarked Zagloba. Beyond Lublin you will pass through a ravaged country, continued the Lithuanian. For the advanced parties reached that place, and the Tartars took captives everywhere, and God only knows how many they seized around Zamost and Grubashovo. Skshatuski has already sent several thousand rescued prisoners to the fortress. He is working with all his might, regardless of health. Here Pan Longin sighed, bowed his head in thought, and after a while continued, and I thought, God in his supreme mercy will undoubtedly comfort Skshatuski. And give him that in which he sees his happiness. For great are that man's services. In these times of corruption and covetousness, when everyone is thinking of self alone, he has forgotten himself. He might have obtained permission long ago from the prince, and gone to seek the princess. But instead of that, since this paroxysm has come on the country he has not left his duty for a moment, continuing his unceasing labor with torment in his heart. He has a Roman soul. This cannot be denied, said Zagloba. We should take example from him. Especially you, Pan Longin, who have gone to the war, not to serve your country, but to find three heads. God is looking into my soul, said Podbipienta, raising his eyes to heaven. God has rewarded Skshatuski with the death of Bogan, said Zagloba, and with this, that he has given a moment of peace to the commonwealth, for now the time has come for him to seek what he lost. You will go with him? asked the Lithuanian. And you? I should be glad to go. But what will happen to the letters I am taking, one from the starosta of Valets to the king, another to the prince, and a third from Skshatuski to the prince, with a request for leave? We are taking leave to him. Yes, but how can I avoid delivering the letters? You must go to Krakow it cannot be otherwise. However, I tell you sincerely I should be glad, in this quest after the princess, to have such fists as yours behind my shoulders, but for any other purpose you are useless. Their dissimulation will be necessary, and complete disguise in Cossack dress, to appear as peasants. But you are so remarkable with your stature that everyone would ask, who is that tall booby? Where did such a Cossack as that come from? Besides, you don't know their language well. No, no. You go to Krakow, and we will help ourselves somehow. That is what I think too, said Volodyovsky. Surely it must be so, answered Podbipienta. May the merciful God bless and aid you. And do you know where she is hidden? Bogan would not tell. We know only what I overheard when Bogan confined me in the stable, but that is enough. But how will you find her? My head, my head, said Zagloba. I was in more difficult places than this. Now the question is only to find Skshatuski as quickly as possible. Inquire in Zamost. Pan Weyer must know, for he corresponds with him, and Skshatuski sends him captives. May God bless you. And you too, said Zagloba. When you are in Krakow, at the prince's, Give our respects to Pan Karlamp. Who is he? A Lithuanian of extraordinary beauty, for whom all the maidens and ladies in waiting of the princess have lost their heads. Pan Longin trembled. My good friend, is this joking? Farewell. Terribly bad beer in this Konskavoli, concluded Zagloba, muttering at Volodyovsky. Chapter 48 So Pan Longin went to Krakow his heart pierced with an arrow, and the cruel Zagloba with Volodyovsky to Zamost, where they remained only one day. For the commandant informed them that he had received no news for a long time from Skshatuski, and thought the regiments which had set out under Skshatuski would go to Zbaraj to protect those regions from disorderly bands. This was the more likely since Zbaraj, being the property of the Vishniavetskis, was specially exposed to the attacks of the mortal enemies of the prince. There lay therefore before Volodyovsky and Zagloba a road long and difficult enough, but since they were going after the princess, they were obliged to pass it. Therefore it was all one to them whether they should enter on it earlier or later, and they moved without delay, halting only to rest, or disperse robber bands wandering here and there. 
They went through a country so ruined that frequently for whole days they did not meet a living soul. Hamlets lay in ashes, villages were burned and empty, the people either killed or gathered into captivity. They saw only corpses along the road, the skeletons of houses, of Polish and Russian churches, the unburnt remnants of villages and cottages, dogs howling on burnt ruins. Whoever had survived the Tartar Cossack passage hid in the depth of the forest, and was freezing from cold or dying of hunger, not daring yet to leave the forest. Not believing that misfortune could have passed so soon. Volodyovsky was obliged to feed the horses of his squadron with the bark of trees or with half-burnt grain taken from the ruins of former granaries. But they advanced quickly, supporting themselves mainly by supplies taken from bands of robbers. It was already the end of November. And inasmuch as the preceding winter had passed, to the greatest wonder of people, without snow, frost, and ice, so that the whole order of nature seemed reversed by it. By so much did the present one promise to be of more than usual rigor. The ground had stiffened, snow was on the fields, riverbanks were bordered each morning with a transparent, glassy shell. The weather was dry. The pale sunbeams warmed the world but feebly in the midday hours. Red twilight of morning and evening flamed in the sky, an infallible herald of an early and stern winter. After war and hunger a third enemy of wretched humanity had to appear, frost, and still people looked for it with desire because more surely than all negotiations was it a restrainer of war. Volodyovsky, as a man of experience and knowing the Ukraine through and through, was full of hope that the expedition for the princess would take place without fail. For the chief obstacle, war, would not soon hinder it. I do not believe in the sincerity of Melnitsky, that out of love for the king he withdrew to the Ukraine, for he is a cunning fox. He knows that when the Cossacks cannot entrench themselves they are useless, for in the open field, though five times the number, they cannot stand against our squadrons. They will go to winter quarters now, and send their flocks to the snowfields, the Tartars also need to take home their captives, and if the winter is severe there will be peace till next grass. Perhaps longer, for still they respect the king. But we do not need so much time. With God's help we shall celebrate Skshetuski's wedding at the carnival. If we don't miss him this time, for that would be a new vexation. There are three squadrons with him, therefore it is not like hunting for a kernel of grain in a pile of chaff. Perhaps we shall come up with him yet at Zberaj, if he is occupied in the neighborhood of robber bands. We cannot come up with him, but we ought to find some news of him along the road, answered Volodyovsky. Still it was difficult to get news. The peasants had seen passing squadrons here and there. They had heard of their battles with robbers, but did not know whose squadrons they were, they might be Rogovsky's as well as Chetusky's, therefore the two friends learned nothing certain. But other news flew to their ears of great disasters to the Cossacks from the Lithuanian armies. It circled around in the form of rumors on the eve of Volodyovsky's departure from Warsaw, but it was doubted then, now it flew through the whole country with great detail as an undoubted truth. The defeats inflicted by Melnitsky on the armies of the crown the Lithuanian armies had avenged with defeat. Polksenjits, an old leader and experienced, had yielded his head, and the wild Nababa. And more powerful than both, Krachovsky, who raised himself not to starostaships and voivodeships, nor to dignities and offices, but to the impaling stake in the ranks of insurgents. It seemed as if some marvelous nemesis had wished to take vengeance on him for the German blood spilled on the Dnieper, the blood of Flick and Werner. Since he fell into the hands of a German regiment of Radzivil, and though shot and severely wounded was immediately impaled on a stake on which the unfortunate quivered a whole day before he breathed out his gloomy soul. Such was the end of him who by his bravery and military skill might have become a second Stefan Hmeletsky, but whom an overweening desire of wealth and dignities pushed upon the road of treason. Perjury, and awful murders worthy of Krivonos himself. With him, with Polksenjits and Nababa, nearly twenty thousand Cossacks laid down their heads on the field of battle, or were drowned in the morasses of the Pripet. Terror then flew like a whirlwind over the rich Ukraine, for it appeared to all that after the great triumphs, after Jaltia Vodi, 
Corson. Palavtsi, the hour was coming for such defeats as the former rebellions had experienced at Solonitsa and Kamaiki. Melnitsky himself, though at the summit of glory, though stronger than ever before, was frightened when he heard of the death of his friend, Krachovsky. And again he began to inquire of wizards about the future. They gave various prophecies, they foretold great wars, victories, and defeats, but they could not tell the hetman what would happen to himself. The defeat of Krachovsky and with it the winter made a prolonged peace more certain. The country began to heal, devastated villages to be populous, and hope entered slowly, gradually, into all weakened and terrified hearts. With that same hope our two friends after a long and difficult journey arrived safely at Zberage, and announcing themselves at the castle, went straightway to the commandant. In whom with no small astonishment they beheld Virchil. And where is Skshetuski? asked Zagloba, after the first greetings. He is not here, answered Virchil. Then you have command over the garrison? Yes. Skshetuski had, but he went out and gave me the garrison till his return. When did he promise to return? He said nothing, for he didn't know himself, but he said at parting, if anyone comes to me, tell him to wait for me here. Zagloba and Volodyovsky looked at each other. How long since he went away? asked Volodyovsky. Ten days. Pan Michael, said Zagloba, let Pan Virchil give us supper, for men give poor counsel on an empty stomach. At supper we can talk. I serve you with my heart, for I was just about to sit down myself. Besides, Pan Volodyovsky, as senior officer, takes command. I am with him, not he with me. Remain in command, Pan Krzysztof, said Volodyovsky, for you are older in years, besides I shall have to go on without doubt. After a while supper was served. They took their places and ate. When Zagloba had quieted somewhat his first hunger with two plates of broth, he said to Virchil. Can you imagine where Skrzytuski has gone? Virchil ordered the attendant serving at the table to go out, and after a moment's reflection began. I can imagine that for Skrzytuski secrecy is important. Therefore I did not speak before the servant. Pan Yen has taken advantage of a favorable time, for we are sure of peace till spring, and according to my calculation he has gone to seek the princess, who is in Bogan's hands. Bogan is no longer in the world, said Zagloba. Zagloba related now for the third or fourth time everything as it was, for he told it always with delight. Virchil, like Pan Langin, could not wonder sufficiently at the event, at last he said. Then it will be easier for Pan Yen. The question is, will he find her? Did he take any men? No, he went alone, with one Russian, a servant, and three horses. He acted wisely, for in that region the only help is in stratagem. To Kamenets he might go with a small squadron perhaps. But in Ashitsi and Mogilev Cossacks are surely stationed, for there are good winter quarters in those places, and in Yampol, where their nest is. It is necessary to go either with a division or alone. And how do you know that he went specially in that direction? asked Volodyovsky. Because she is secreted beyond Yampol, and he knows it. But there are ravines, hollows, and reeds there so numerous that even for one knowing the place well, it is difficult to find the way, and what would it be for one not knowing? I used to go for horses to Yagerlik, and to lawsuits. I know all about the place. If we were together, perhaps we could succeed, but for him alone, I have doubts. I have doubts, unless some chance indicates the road to him, for he will not be able to make inquiries. Then did you wish to go with him? Yes. But what shall we do now, Pan Michael? Follow him or not? I rely on your prudence. Hum. He went ten days ago, we cannot come up with him, and besides he asked us to wait here. God knows too what road he took. Maybe through Ploskarov and Bar along the old highway, and maybe through Kamenets Podolsk. It is a hard question. Remember, besides, said Virchil, that these are only suppositions. You are not sure that he went after the princess. That's it, 
that's it, said Zagloba. Perhaps he went merely to get informants somewhere, and then returned to Zbaraj. For he knows that we were to go with him, and that he might expect us at this time, since it is the most favorable. This is a difficult question to settle. I should advise you to wait about ten days, said Virchel. Ten days are nothing, we should either wait or not wait at all. I think we should not wait. For what shall we lose if we move at once? If Skshatuski does not find the princess, God may favor us, said Volodyovsky. You see, Pan Michael, we must not overlook anything in this case. You are still young and want adventures, said Zagloba. But here is this danger, if he is looking for her by himself, and we look for her by ourselves, some suspicion will be easily roused in the people there. The Cossacks are cunning, and afraid that someone may find out their plans. They may have a secret understanding with the Pasha of the boundary near Kodim, or with the Tartars beyond the Dniester about a future war, who knows. They will be watchful of strangers, particularly of strangers inquiring the way. I know them. It is easy to betray yourself, and then what? The greater the reason to go. Skshatuski may fall into some difficulty where help would be required. That is true too. Zagloba fell into such deep thought that his temples quivered. At last he roused himself and said, taking everything into consideration, it will be necessary to go. Volodyovsky drew a deep breath with satisfaction. And when? When we have rested about three days, so that body and soul may be fresh. Next day the two friends began to make preparations for the road, when unexpectedly on the eve of their journey Tsaiga, a young Cossack, Skshatuski's attendant, arrived with news and letters for Virchel. Hearing of this, Zagloba and Volodyovsky hurried to the quarters of the commandant, and read the following. I am in Kamenets, to which the road through Satanov is safe. I am going to Yampol with Armenian merchants whom Pan Bukovsky found for me. They have Tartar and Cossack passes for a free journey to Ackerman. We shall go through Ashitsi, Mogilev, and Yampol with silk stuffs, stopping at all places along the road wherever there are living people. God may aid me in finding what I seek. Tell my comrades, Volodyovsky and Zagloba, to wait for me in Zbaraj if they have nothing else to do. For by this road which I travel it would be impossible to go in a larger company by reason of deep distrust in the minds of Cossacks who winter in Yampol on the Dniester as far as Yagerlik, where they keep their horses in the snow. What I cannot do alone we three could not do, and I can pass more readily for an Armenian. Thank them, Pan Krishtof, from the heart's soul for their resolution, which I shall not forget while I live. But I was not able to wait, since every day was a torment to me, and I could not know whether they would come, and it is the best time now to go when all the merchants are traveling with goods. I send back my trusty attendant whom you will care for, as I have no need of him, but I am afraid of his youth, lest he might say something somewhere. Pan Bukovsky vouches for these merchants. Says they are honest, and I think they are, believing as I do that everything is in the hands of the High God, who if he wishes will show his mercy to us, and shorten our sufferings. Zagloba finished the letter, and looked at his comrades, but they were silent, till at length Virchel said. I knew he went there. And what are we to do? asked Volodyovsky. What? said Zagloba, opening his arms, we have nothing to go for. It is well that he is with merchants, for he can look in everywhere, and no one will wonder. In every country house there is something to be bought, for half the commonwealth has been plundered. It would be difficult for us, Pan Michael, to go beyond Yampol. Skshatuski is as black as a Wallachian, and can pass easily for an Armenian, but they would know you at once by your little oat-colored mustaches. In peasant disguise it would be equally difficult. There is no use for us there, I must confess, though I am sorry that we shall not put our hands to freeing that poor young lady. But we did a great service to Skshatuski when we killed Bogan. For if he were alive, then I would not guarantee the health of Pan Yen. Volodyovsky was very much dissatisfied. He had promised himself a journey full of adventures, 
and now there was left to him a long and tedious stay at Zberaj. We might go as far as Kamenets. What should we do there, and on what should we live? asked Zagloba. It's all one to what walls we fasten like mushrooms. We must wait and wait, for such a journey may occupy Skshatuski long. While a man moves he is young, here Zagloba dropped his head in melancholy on his breast, he grows old in inaction, but it is hard. Let him get on without us. Tomorrow we will offer a solemn prayer for his success. We killed Bogan, that is the main thing. Give orders to have your horses unpacked, Pan Michael. We must wait. In fact, on the morrow began for the two friends long and dreary days of waiting, to which neither drinking nor dice could lend variety, and they dragged on without end. Meanwhile a severe winter had begun. Snow covered the ramparts of Zberage, and the whole land, in a shroud three feet thick. Beasts and wild birds approached the dwellings of men. Day after day came the cawing of crows and ravens, in flocks without number. All December passed, then January and February. Of Skshatuski there was not a sound. Volodyovsky went to Tarnopol to seek adventures. Zagloba was gloomy, and insisted that he was growing old. Chapter 49 the commissioners sent by the Commonwealth to negotiate with Melnitsky forced their way through the greatest difficulties to Novoselki, and there halted. Waiting an answer from the victorious hetman, who was stopping at that time in Chigirin. They were gloomy and depressed, for death had threatened them continually during the whole journey, and difficulties increased at every step. Day and night they were surrounded by crowds of the populace, made wild to the last degree by slaughter and war, and who were howling for the death of the commissioners. From time to time they met bands, commanded by no one, formed of robbers or wild herdsmen, without the least idea of the laws of nations, but hungry for blood and plunder. The commissioners had, it is true, a hundred horse as attendants, led by Pan Brashovsky. Besides this, Melnitsky himself, foreseeing what might meet them, sent Colonel Donietz, with four hundred Cossacks. But that escort might easily prove inadequate, for the throngs of wild men were increasing in number each hour, and assuming a more threatening attitude. If one of the convoy or the attendants separated, even for a moment, from the company, he perished without a trace. They were like a handful of travelers surrounded by a pack of hungry wolves. And thus passed for them whole days, weeks, till at the stopping place in Novoselki it appeared to all that their last hour had come. The convoy of dragoons and the escort of Donietz, from evening on, fought a regular battle for the life of the commissioners, who, repeating the prayers for the dying, committed their souls to God. The Carmelite Lentovsky gave them absolution, one after another, while outside the window with the blowing of the wind came terrible shouts, the report of shots, hellish laughter. The clatter of scythes, and shouts of death to them. And demands for the head of the Voivoda Kaisel, who was the main object of their rage. It was an awful night, and long, for it was a winter night. Kaisel rested his head on his hands, and sat motionless for many hours. It was not death that he feared. For since he left Gushchi he was so exhausted, tortured, deprived of sleep, that he would have extended his hands with gladness to death, but endless despair was covering his soul. He as a Russian in blood and bone first took upon himself the role of pacifier in that unexampled war. He came forth everywhere, in the Senate and in the Diet, as the most ardent partisan of negotiations, he supported the policy of the Chancellor and the Primate. He condemned most powerfully Yeremy, and he did this in good faith, for the sake of the Cossacks and the Commonwealth. And he believed, with all his ardent spirit, that negotiations and compromises would smooth everything, would pacify, would unite. And just then, in that moment when he was bringing the baton to Melnitsky and concessions to the Cossacks, he doubted all. He saw with his own eyes the vanity of his efforts. He saw beneath his feet a vacuum and a precipice. Do they want nothing but blood, do they care for no other freedom than the freedom of plunder and burning? Thought the Voivoda in despair, and he stifled the groans which were tearing asunder his noble breast. 
the head of Kaisel, the head of Kaisel. Death to him, was the answer of the crowds. And the voevoda would have offered them as a willing gift that white and battered head. Were it not for the remnant of his belief that it was necessary to give them and all the Cossacks something more, rescue was immediately necessary for them and the commonwealth. Let the future teach them to ask for the something more. And when he thought thus, a certain ray of hope and consolation lighted up for a moment that darkness which despair created in his mind. And the unfortunate old man said to himself that that mob was not the whole body of Cossacks, not Melnitsky and his colonels, with whom negotiations would begin. But can these negotiations be lasting while half a million of peasants stand under arms? Will they not melt at the first breath of spring, like the snows which at that moment covered the steppes? Here again came to the voevoda the words of Yeremy, kindness may be shown to the conquered alone. Here again his thoughts fell into darkness, and the precipice yawned beneath his feet. Meantime midnight was passing. The shouting and shots had decreased in some degree, the whistle of the wind rose in their place, the yard was filled with a snowdrift. The wearied crowds had evidently begun to disperse to their houses, hope entered the hearts of the commissioners. Wojciech Miaskowski, a chamberlain from Lvov, rose from the bench, listened at the window to the drifting of the snow, and said. It seems to me that with God's favor we shall live till morning. Perhaps too Melnitsky will send more assistance, for we shall not reach our journey's end with what we have now, said Pan Smyarovsky. Pan Zelensky, the cupbearer from Bratslav, smiled bitterly, who would say that we are peace commissioners? I have been an envoy more than once to the Tartars, said the ensign of Novgorodek, but such a mission as this I have not seen in my life. The Commonwealth endures more contempt in our persons than at Corson and Palavtsi. I say, gentlemen, let us return, for there is no use in thinking of negotiations. Let us return, repeated as an echo Pan Jozovsky, the castellan of Kiev, there can be no peace, let there be war. Kaisel raised his lids and fixed his glassy eyes on the castellan. Jaltia Vodi, Korsan, Palavtsi, said he, in hollow tones. He was silent, and after him all were silent. But Pan Kolchinsky, the treasurer of Kiev, began to repeat the rosary in an audible voice. And Pan Kjatovsky, master of the chase, seized his head with both hands, and repeated. What times, what times! God have mercy upon us! The door opened, and Brashovsky, captain of the dragoons of the Bishop of Poznania, commander of the convoy, entered the room. Serene Voivoda, said he, some Cossack wants to see the commissioners. Very well, answered Kaisel, has the crowd dispersed? The people have gone away, they promised to return tomorrow. Did they press on much? Terribly, but Donietz Cossacks killed a number of them. Tomorrow they promised to burn us. Very well, let that Cossack enter. After a while the door was opened, and a certain tall, black-bearded figure appeared at the threshold of the room. Who are you? asked Kaisel. Yen Skshatuski, colonel of hussars of Prince Vishnievetsky, voevoda of Rus. The Castellan Jozovsky, Pan Kolchinsky, and the master of the chase Pan Kjatovsky sprang from their seats. All of them had served the past year under the prince at Maknovka and Konstantinov, and knew Skshatuski perfectly. Kjatovsky was even related to him. Is it true, is it true? Is this Pan Skshatuski, repeated they. What are you doing here, and how did you reach us, asked Kjatovsky, taking him by the shoulder. In peasant's disguise, as you see, said Skshatuski. This, cried Jozovsky to Kaisel, is the foremost knight in the army of the Voivoda of Rus, he is famous throughout the whole army. I greet him with thankful heart, said Kaisel and I see that he must be a man of great resolution, since he has forced his way to us. Then to Skshatuski he said, What do you wish of U.S.? That you permit me to go with you. You are crawling into the jaws of the dragon, but if such is your wish we cannot oppose it. Skshatuski bowed in silence. Kaisel looked at him with astonishment. The severe face of the young knight, with its expression of dignity and suffering, struck him. Tell me, 
said he, what causes drive you to this hell, to which no one comes of his own accord? Misfortune, serene voivoda. I have made a needless inquiry, said Kaisel. You must have lost some of your relatives for whom you are looking? I have. Was it long since? Last spring. How is that, and you start only now on the search? Why, it is nearly a year. What were you doing in the meanwhile? I was fighting under the voivoda of Rus. Would not such a true man as he give you leave of absence? I did not wish it myself. Kaisel looked again at the young knight, and then followed a silence, interrupted by the castellan of Kiev. The misfortunes of this knight are known to all of us who served with the prince. We shed more than one tear over them, and it is the more praiseworthy on his part that he preferred to serve his country while the war lasted instead of seeking his own good. This is a rare example in these times of corruption. If it shall appear that my word has any weight with Milnitsky, then believe me I shall not spare it in your cause, said Kaisel. Skshatusky bowed a second time. Go now and sleep, said the voivoda, kindly, for you must be wearied in no small degree, like all of us who have not had a moment's rest. I will take him to my quarters, for he is my relative, said Kshatovsky. Let us all go to rest, who knows whether we shall sleep tomorrow night, said Josovsky. Maybe an eternal sleep, concluded the voivoda. Then he went to the small room, at the door of which his attendant was waiting, and afterward the others separated. Kshatovsky took Skshatusky to his quarters, which were some houses distant. His attendant preceded them with a lantern. What a dark night, and it howls louder every moment, said Kshatovsky. Oh, Pan Yen, what a day we have passed. I thought the last judgment had come. The mob almost put the knife to our throats. Josovsky's arms grew weak, and we had already begun prayers for the dying. I was in the crowd, said Skshatusky. Tomorrow evening they expect a new band of robbers to whom they sent word about you. We must leave here absolutely. But are you going to Kiev? That depends on the answer of Melnitsky, to whom Prince Chetvertinsky has gone. Here are my quarters, come in, I pray you, Pan Yen. I have ordered some wine to be heated, and we will strengthen ourselves before sleep. They entered the room, in which a big fire was burning in the chimney. Steaming wine was on the table already. Skshatusky seized a glass eagerly. I've had nothing between my lips since yesterday, said he. You are terribly emaciated. It is clear that sorrow and toil have been gnawing you. But tell me about yourself, for I know of your affair. You think then of seeking the princess there among them? Either her or death, answered the knight. You will more easily find death. How do you know that she may be there? Because I have looked for her elsewhere. Where? Along the Dniester as far as Yagerlik. I went with Armenian merchants, for there were indications that she was secreted there, I went everywhere, and now I am going to Kiev, since Bogan was to take her there. Scarcely had the colonel mentioned the name of Bogan when the master of the chase seized himself by the head. As God lives, he cried, I have not told you the most important of all. I heard that Bogan is killed. Skshatusky grew pale. How is that? Who told you? That noble who saved the princess once, and who showed such bravery at Konstantinov, told me. I met him when I was going to Zamost. We were passing on the road. I merely inquired for the news, and he answered me that Bogan was killed. I asked, who killed him? I, said he. Then we parted. The flame which had flashed in the face of Skshatusky was suddenly quenched. That noble, said he, it is impossible to believe him. No, no, he couldn't be in a condition to kill Bogan. And didn't you see him, Pan Yen, for I remember too that he told me he was going to you at Zamost? I did not wait for him at Zamost. He must be now at Zbarage. I was in a hurry to overtake the commission. I did not return from Kamenets to Zbarage, and I did not see him. God alone knows whether even that is true which he told me about her, 
which he as it were overheard while captive with Bogan, that Bogan had hidden her beyond Yampol. And then intended to take her to Kiev for marriage. Perhaps this too is untrue, like everything Zagloba said. Why do you go then to Kiev? Skshetuski was silent, for a moment nothing was heard but the whistling and howling of the wind. For, said Kshetovsky, placing his finger on his forehead, if Bogan is not killed, you may fall into his hands with ease. I go to find him, answered Skshetuski, in a hollow voice. Why? Let God's judgment be passed between us. But he will not fight with you, he will simply bind you, take your life, or sell you to the Tartars. I am with the commissioners, in their suite. God grant that we bring our own lives out of this. What is the use of talking of the sweet? To whom life is heavy, the earth will be light. But have the fear of God before you, Yen. It is not a question here of death, for that avoids no man, but they can sell you to the Turkish galleys. Do you think that would be worse for me than the present? I see that you are desperate, and trust not in the mercy of God. You are mistaken. I say that it is evil for me in the world, because it is, but long ago I was reconciled to the will of God. I do not beg, I do not groan, I do not curse. I do not beat my head against the wall, I merely desire to accomplish that which pertains to me while strength and life remain. But grief is devouring you like poison. God gave grief to devour, and he will send the cure when he wishes. I have no answer to such an argument, said Kshetovsky. In God is the only salvation, in him hope for us and the whole commonwealth. The king went to Chenstakova. He may obtain something from the Most Holy Lady, otherwise we shall all perish. Silence followed, and from outside the window came only the constant, who's there, of the dragoons. True, true, said Kshetovsky. We all belong more to the dead than the living. People have forgotten to smile in this commonwealth, they only groan like that wind in the chimney. I too have believed that happier times would come, till I went on this journey with others. But now I see that that was a barren hope. Ruin, war, hunger, murder, and nothing more, nothing more. Skshetuski was silent, the blaze of the fire lighted his stern, emaciated face. Finally he raised his head and said with a voice of dignity, that is all temporal, which passes away, vanishes, and leaves nothing behind. You speak like a monk, said Kshetovsky. Skshetuski made no answer, the wind only groaned each moment move sadly in the chimney. Chapter 50 Next morning early the commissioners left Novoselki, and with them Skshetuski. But that was a tearful journey, in which at every stopping place, in every village, they were threatened with death, and met with contempt, which was worse than death, worse specially in this. That the commissioners bore in their own persons the dignity and majesty of the commonwealth. Pan Kaisel grew ill, so that at every lodging place he was borne from the sleigh to the house. The chamberlain of Lvov wept over his own disgrace and that of the country. Captain Brashovsky fell ill also from sleeplessness and toil. Pan Yen therefore took his place, and led on farther that hapless suite amidst the pressure of crowds, insults, threats, skirmishes, and battles. At Belgorod it seemed to the commissioners again that their last hour had come. The crowd had beaten the sick Brashovsky, were killing Pan Nyazdovsky. And only the arrival of the Metropolitan for an interview with the Voivoda put a stop to the intended slaughter. They did not wish to admit the commissioners into Kiev at all. Prince Chetvertinsky returned, February 11, from Melnitsky without an answer. The commissioners did not know what further to do or where to go. Their return was prevented by immense parties waiting only for the breaking of negotiations to kill the envoys. The mob became more and more insolent. The bridles of the dragoons' horses were seized, and the road stopped, stones, pieces of ice, and frozen lumps of snow were thrown into the sleigh of the Voivoda. At Gvazdova, Skshetuski and Donets had to fight a bloody battle in which they dispersed several hundred of the mob. 
The ensign of Novgorodek and Pan Smyarovsky went with a new argument to persuade Melnitsky to come to meet the commissioners at Kiev. But the Voevoda had little hope that they would live to reach him. Meanwhile the commissioners in Kvestovo were forced to look with folded arms on the crowds killing prisoners of both sexes and of every age. Some were drowned through holes in the ice, some were drenched with water poured over them in the frost, others stabbed with forks or whittled to death with knives. Eighteen of such days passed before at last the answer came from Melnitsky that he would not go to Kiev, but was waiting in Periaslov for the Voevoda and the commissioners. When they had crossed the Dnieper at Tripol and reached Vorankovo in the night, from which place it was only thirty miles to Periaslov, the unfortunate commissioners drew a breath of relief. Thinking that their torment was over. Melnitsky went out two miles and a half to meet them, wishing to show honor to the royal embassy. But how changed from those days in which he put himself forward as an injured man, quantum matatus abilo. As Keisel justly wrote of him. He rode forth with a suite of horsemen, with his colonels and essals, with martial music, under the standard, bunchuk, and crimson banner, like a sovereign prince. The commissioners with their retinue halted at once. And Melnitsky, riding up to the front sleigh, in which sat the voevoda, looked for a while at his venerable face, then raised his cap slightly and said. With the forehead to you. Commissioners of the king, and to you, voevoda. It had been better to commence treating with me long ago, when I was less and did not know my own power, but because the king has sent you to me, I receive you with thankful heart in my own land. Greetings to you, Hetman, answered Keisel. His Majesty the King has sent us to present his favor and mete out justice. I am thankful for the favor. But justice I have already meted out with this, and here he struck upon his saber, on your necks, and I will mete out more of it if you do not give me satisfaction. You do not greet us very affably, Pan Hetman of the Zaporogians, us, the envoys of the King. I will not speak in the cold, there will be a better time for that, replied Melnitsky, dryly. Let me into your sleigh, Keisel, for I wish to show you honor and ride with you. Then he dismounted and approached the sleigh. Keisel pushed himself to the right, leaving the left side vacant. Seeing this, Melnitsky frowned and exclaimed, Give me the right side. I am a senator of the Commonwealth, replied Keisel. And what is a senator to me? Pan Patotsky is the first senator and hetman of the crown, I have him in fetters with others, and can impale him tomorrow, if I wish. A blush appeared on the pale face of Keisel. I represent the person of the king here, said he. Melnitsky frowned still more, but restrained himself and sat on the left side, muttering, Granted, he is king in Warsaw, but I am in Russia. I see that I have not trodden enough on your necks. Keisel gave no answer, but raised his eyes to heaven. He had already a foretaste of that which waited him, and he thought justly at that time that if the road to Melnitsky was a cavalry, to be envoy to him was a passion indeed. The horses moved to the town, in which twenty cannon were thundering and all the bells tolling. Melnitsky, as if fearing that the commissioners should consider these sounds as given out exclusively in their honor, said to the voevoda, I receive in this manner not only you but other ambassadors who are sent to me. And Melnitsky spoke the truth, for in fact embassies were sent to him as to a reigning prince. Returning from Zamost under the influence of the election and the defeats inflicted by the Lithuanian forces, the hetman had not one half of this pride in his heart. But when Kiev went forth to meet him with torches and banners, when the academy greeted him, Tamquam Moichsum, Servitorum, Salvatorum, Liberatorum. Populi de servitut lechica et bono omine Bogdan, God given. When finally he was called Illustrissimus Princeps, then, according to the words of a contemporary, the beast was elated. He had a real sense of his power, and felt the ground under his feet, which had been wanting to him hitherto. Foreign embassies were a silent recognition as well of his power as of his separateness. The uninterrupted friendship of the Tartars, purchased by the greater part of the booty gained, and by the ill-fated captives whom that leader of the people permitted to be taken from the people. Promised support against every enemy. 
Therefore Melnitsky, who recognized at Zamos the suzerainty and will of the king, was at that time so settled in pride, convinced of his own power, of the disorder of the commonwealth. The incompetence of its leaders, that he was ready to raise his hand against the king himself, dreaming in his gloomy soul. Not of Cossack freedom or the restoration of the former privileges of the Zaporozhans, not of justice for himself, but of a separate lordship, of a princely crown and scepter. And he felt himself master of the Ukraine. The Zaporozhans clung to him, for never under any man's command had they so wallowed in blood and booty. A people wild by nature rallied to him. For while the peasant of Mazovia or of Great Poland bore without a murmur that burden of power and oppression which in all Europe weighed upon the descendants of Ham, the man of the Ukraine drew into himself with the air of the steppes a love of freedom as unbounded, wild, and vigorous as the steppes themselves. Could he wish to walk after the plough of a master when his gaze was lost in the fields of God, and not of a master? When beyond the cataracts the sage called to him, Leave your lord, and come to freedom. When the stern Tartar taught him war, accustomed his eyes to conflagration and slaughter and his hands to weapons? Was it not pleasanter for him to frolic with Melnitsky and slay the lords than to bend his proud back before a land steward? Besides this, the people rallied to Melnitsky, for whoever did not went into captivity. In Stambul a prisoner was exchanged for ten arrows, and three for a bow seasoned by the fire, such was the number of them. The multitude indeed had no choice. And one song, wonderful for that time, has remained, which long afterward succeeding generations sang of that leader called a Moses, oh, that the first bullet might not miss that Melnitsky. Villages, towns, and hamlets disappeared, the country was turned into a desert and a ruin, a wound which ages were not able to heal. But that leader and hetman did not see this, or did not wish to see it, for he never saw anything by reason of himself, and he grew and fattened on blood and fire. In his own monstrous self-love he was destroying his own people and his own country. And now he brings in those commissioners to Periaslav with the thunder of cannon and the tolling of bells, as a separate ruler, as a hospodar, as a prince. The commissioners went into the den of the lion hanging their heads, and the remnant of hope was quenched in them. Meanwhile Skshetuski, riding behind the second rank of sleighs, examined carefully the faces of the colonels who had come with Melnitsky, to find among them Bogan. After fruitless search on the Dniester to a point beyond Yagerlik, the plan had long since matured in the soul of Pan Yen, as the last and only method. To find Bogan and challenge him to a death struggle. The unfortunate knight knew, it is true, that in such a venture Bogan might destroy him without a struggle or give him up to the Tartars, but he thought better of Bogan. He was aware of his courage and mad daring, and was almost sure that, having the choice, he would fight for the princess. Therefore he formed the plan to bind Bogan by an oath that in case of his death he would let Helena go. Of himself Skshetuski did not care. And supposing that Bogan would say, If I die, she is neither for me nor for you, he was ready to agree to this and bind himself by oath, if he could only save her from the hands of the enemy. Let her seek peace in the cloister for the rest of her life. He would seek that peace first in war, and then if death did not come to him, would seek it under the habit, as did all suffering souls in that age. The way seemed to Skshetuski straight and clear. And since at Zamos the idea of a struggle with Bogan had been given, now that his search along the reeds of the Dniester was fruitless, that way seemed the only one. With this purpose he hurried from the Dniester in one journey, resting nowhere, hoping to find Bogan without fail either near Melnitsky or in Kiev, especially since. According to what Zagloba had said in Yarmolintsy, the chief was to be married in Kiev with three hundred tapers. But Skshetuski sought him in vain among the colonels. He found instead many old acquaintances of peace times, such as Dedialo, whom he had seen in Chigirin. Yashevsky, who had been an envoy from the Sage to the Prince, Yerosha, a former Sotnik of the Prince, Neokolopoliets, Grusha, and many others. He determined then to ask them. We are old acquaintances, said Skshetuski, approaching Yashevsky. I knew you in Lubny, 
you are one of Prince Yeremi's knights. We drank and frolicked together in Lubni. And what is your prince doing? He is well. In spring he will not be well. He hasn't met Melnitsky yet, but he will meet him, and will have to go to destruction alone. As God judges. God is good to our father Melnitsky. Your prince will never return to his Tartar bank on the east of the Dnieper. Melnitsky has many a Cossack, and what has your prince? He is a good soldier. And are you not in his service now? I attend the commissioners. Well, I am glad, you are an old acquaintance. If you are glad, then do me a service, and I shall be thankful. What service? Tell me where is Bogan, that famous Adaman, formerly of the Periaslav regiment, who must have a high office among you now. Silence, answered Yashevsky, threateningly. It is your luck that we are old acquaintances and that I drank with you, otherwise I should stretch you on the snow with this whirlbat. Skshatusky was astonished. But being a man of ready courage, he squeezed his baton and asked, Are you mad? I am not mad, nor do I wish to threaten you. But there is an order from Melnitsky that if any of you, even one of the commissioners, should ask a question, to kill him on the spot. If I do not do this, another will. Therefore I warn you out of good feeling. But I ask in my own private affair. Well, it is all one. Melnitsky told us, the colonels, and commanded us to tell others, if anyone asks, even about wood for the stove, or ashes, kill him. You tell this to your people. I thank you for good advice, said Skshatusky. You are the only one, I have warned you alone. I should be the first to stretch another pole on the ground. They were silent. The party had already reached the gates of the town. Both sides of the road and the street were swarming with the crowd and armed Cossacks. Who out of regard for the presence of Melnitsky did not dare to scatter curses and lumps of snow at the sleighs, but who looked frowningly at the commissioners. Clinching their fists or grasping the hilts of their sabers. Skshatusky, having formed his dragoons four deep, raised his head and rode haughtily and calmly through the broad street, not paying the least attention to the threatening looks of the multitude. In his soul he only thought how much cool blood, self-reliance, and Christian patience would be necessary for him to carry through what he had planned. And not sink at the first step in that sea of hatred. Chapter 51 On the following day the commissioners had long consultations among themselves. Whether to deliver the gifts of the king to Melnitsky immediately or to wait till he should show greater obedience and a certain compunction. They decided to win him by kindness and the favor of the king. The delivery of the gifts was decided upon therefore, and on the following day that solemn act was accomplished. From early morning bells were tolled and cannon fired. Melnitsky waited for them before his residence, in the midst of his colonels, all the officers, and countless throngs of Cossacks and people. For he wished that all should see with what honor the king surrounded him. He took his seat upon a raised place under the standard and bunchuk, wearing a mantle of purple brocade lined with sable, having at his side ambassadors from neighboring peoples. With his hand on his side, and feet resting on a velvet cushion trimmed with gold, he waited for the commissioners. In the throng of the assembled mob from moment to moment there escaped murmurs of gladness and flattery at the sight of that leader in whom this throng, valuing power above all things saw the embodiment of that power. For only thus the imagination of the people could represent to itself its unconquerable champion, the crusher of hetmans, dukes, nobles, and poles in general. Who up to his time had been clothed with the charm of invincibility. During that year of battle Melnitsky had grown old somewhat, but had not bent, his gigantic shoulders always indicated power sufficient to overcome kingdoms or to found new ones. His enormous face, red from the abuse of drink, expressed unbending will, unrestrained pride, and an insolent confidence which gave him victories. Storm and anger were slumbering in the wrinkles of that face, and you could easily know that when they were roused men bent before their terrible breath like woods before a tempest. From his eyes, surrounded by a red border, 
impatience was shooting that the commissioners did not come quickly enough with the presence, and from his nostrils issued two rows of steam. Like two pillars of smoke from the nostrils of Lucifer. And in that mist from his own lungs he sat, purple, gloomy, and proud, flanked by envoys, in the midst of his colonels, having around them a sea of the unclean mob. At last the commissioner's party appeared. In front marched drummers beating their drums, and trumpeters with trumpets at their mouths and swollen cheeks, beating and blowing from the brass long sad sounds. As if at the funeral of the dignity and glory of the commonwealth. After this orchestra Jatovsky bore the baton on a satin cushion, Kolchinsky, treasurer of Kiev, a crimson banner with an eagle and an inscription. And next walked Kaisel alone, tall, slender, with a white beard flowing over his breast, with pain on his aristocratic face and unfathomable suffering in his soul. A few steps behind the voivoda the rest of the commissioners dropped in, and the rear was brought up by Brashovsky's dragoons, under command of Pan Yen. Kaisel walked slowly. For at that moment he saw clearly that behind the torn tatters of negotiations, from under the pretext of offering the favor and forgiveness of the king, another naked, disgusting truth peered forth. Which even the blind could see and the deaf could hear, for it shouted, Thou, Kaisel, art going not to offer favor. Thou art going to beg for it, thou art going to buy it with that baton and banner. And thou goest on foot to the feet of that peasant leader, in the name of the whole commonwealth, thou a senator, a voivoda. For this reason the soul was rent in the lord of Brusilov, and he felt as mean as a worm, as lowly as dust. And in his ears the words of Yeremy were roaring, Better for us not to live, than to live in captivity under peasants and trash. And what was he, Kaisel, in comparison with that prince of Lubni, who never showed himself to rebellion, except like Jupiter with frowning brow, in the smell of sulphur, the flame of war. And the smoke of powder, what was he? Under the weight of these thoughts the heart of the voivoda was breaking, the smile had left his face, and joy his heart forever. And he felt that he would rather a hundred times die than take another step. But he went on, for his whole past pushed him forward, all his labors, all his efforts, all the inexorable logic of his previous acts. Melnitsky waited for him with hand on his side, with pouting lips and frowning brow. The party approached at last. Kaisel, moving to the front, made a few steps in advance toward the elevation. The drummers stopped drumming, the trumpeters blowing, and deep silence followed in the multitude. Only the frosty wind waved the crimson banner borne by Pan Kolchinsky. Suddenly the silence was broken by a certain curt, emphatic, and commanding voice, which sounded with the unspeakable power of desperation resembling nothing and no man, dragoons to the rear. Follow me. That was the voice of Pan Yen. All heads were turned toward him. Melnitsky himself rose somewhat in his seat to see what was taking place. The blood of the commissioners rushed to their faces. Skshetuski stood in his stirrups. Erect, pale, with flashing eyes, naked saber in his hand, half turned to the dragoons, he repeated again the thundering command, Follow me. Amidst the silence the hoofs of the horses clattered along the smooth surface of the street. The disciplined dragoons turned their horses on the spot. The colonel placed himself at their head, gave the sign with his sword, the whole party moved slowly back to the residence of the commissioners. Astonishment and uncertainty were depicted on all faces, not excepting that of Melnitsky, for in the voice and motions of the colonel there was something unusual. Still no one knew clearly whether that sudden disappearance of the escort did not belong to the ceremonial of the occasion. Kaisel alone understood that the treaty and the lives of the commissioners together with the escort hung on a thread at that moment. Therefore he stood on the elevation, and before Melnitsky had time to take in what had happened, began to speak. First he offered the favor of the king to Melnitsky and the whole Zaporogy. But suddenly his speech was interrupted by a new occurrence, which had only this good side, that it turned attention entirely from the previous one. De Dialo, an old colonel, standing near Melnitsky, began to shake his baton before the voivoda, to gesticulate and cry. What do you say there, Kaisel? 
The king is king, but you kinglets, princes, nobles, have involved everything. And you, Kaisel, bone of our bone, you have gone away from us, and stand with the poles. We have enough of your talk, for we will get what we want with the saber. The voevoda looked with offended feeling into the eyes of Melnitsky. Is this the discipline in which you keep your colonels? Be silent, Daedalo, cried the hetman. Be silent, be silent. You are drunk, though it is early, repeated the other colonels. Go away, or we will pull you out by the head. Daedalo wanted to clamor more but they took him by the shoulders and put him outside the circle. The voevoda continued with smooth and chosen words, showing Melnitsky how great were the gifts which he was receiving. For he had the sign of lawful power, which hitherto he had exercised only as a usurper. The king, being able to chastise, had preferred to forgive him, which he did on account of the obedience which he had shown at Zamost. And because his previous acts were committed not during his reign. It was proper therefore that he, Melnitsky, having offended so much before, should prove thankful now for favor and clemency, should stop the shedding of blood, pacify the peasants, and proceed to a treaty with the commissioners. Melnitsky received the baton in silence, and the banner, which he ordered to be unfurled above his head. The mob, at sight of this, began to howl with joyous voices, so that for a time nothing could be heard. Certain satisfaction was reflected on the face of the hetman, who, after he had waited a while, said, For such great favor shown me by His Majesty the King through you in sending me command over the forces, and overlooking my previous acts, I give humble thanks. I have always said that the King was with me against you faithless dukes and kinglets. And the best proof is that he sends me satisfaction because I have cut your necks, and will further cut them if you will not obey me and the king in everything. Melnitsky spoke the last words in a loud voice, in a railing tone, and wrinkled his brows as if anger had begun to rise in him. The commissioners grew rigid at such an unexpected turn in his answer, but Kaisel said. The king, mighty hetman, commands you to stop the shedding of blood, and to begin a treaty with us. Blood is not shed by me, but by the Lithuanian forces, answered the hetman, harshly, for I have intelligence that Radzivil has destroyed my Moser and Turov. Should this prove true, then I have enough of your prisoners, distinguished prisoners, and I will have their heads cut off at once. I will not proceed to a treaty now. It is difficult to begin at present, for the army is not assembled, there is only a handful of colonels here, the rest being in winter quarters. I cannot begin without them. Besides, what's the use of talking long in the frost? What you had to give me you have given, and all men now see that I am hetman from the hand of the king. And now come to me for a glass of gorelka and dinner, for I am hungry. Having said this, Melnitsky moved toward his residence, and after him the commissioners and colonels. In the great central room stood a table ready, bending under plundered silver, among which the voevoda, Kaisel, might have found some of his own, taken the past year in Gush Chi. On the table were piled up mountains of pork, beef, and tartar pilav, throughout the whole room was an odor of millet vodka, served in silver goblets. Melnitsky took his place, with Kaisel at his right and Josovsky at his left, and with his hand to the gorelka, said. They say in Warsaw that I drink Polish blood, but I prefer gorelka. Leaving the other to the dogs. The colonels burst into laughter, from which the walls of the room trembled. Such an appetizer did the hetman give the commissioners before their dinner. And the commissioners gulped it without a word, in order, as the chamberlain of Lvov wrote, not to anger the beast. But perspiration in heavy drops covered the pale forehead of Kaisel. The entertainment commenced. The colonels took pieces of meat from the platters with their hands, the hetman himself placed pieces on the plates of Kaisel and Josovsky. And the first of the dinner passed in silence, for everyone was satisfying his hunger. In the silence could be heard only the crunching of bones under the teeth of the company or the gurgling of the drinkers. At times someone threw out a word which remained without echo till Melnitsky, who had first satisfied himself somewhat, and emptied a number of glasses of millet vodka. 
turned suddenly to the voevoda, and asked. Who was the leader of your company? Disquiet was reflected on Kaisel's face. Skshetuski, an honorable knight. I know him, said Melnitsky, and why did he not wish to be present when you delivered the gifts to me? He was not associated with us for assistance, but for safety, and he had an order to that effect. And who gave him that order? I, answered the voevoda. For I did not think that it was proper, at the delivery of the gifts, that dragoons should be standing over the necks of you and me. I had another opinion, for I know that soldier is stubborn. Here Yashevsky mixed in the conversation. We don't care for the dragoons, said he. We used to think Poles powerful through them. But we discovered at Palavtsi that they are not the Poles of other days, who beat the Turks, Tartars, and Germans. Not Zamoyskis, Jalkievskis, Kodkievici, Melietskis, and Konietspalskis, interrupted Melnitsky, but Korzovskis and Zayanchkovskis, big fellows, wrapped in iron. And they were dying of terror as soon as they saw us, and ran off, though there were only three thousand Tartars in the place. The commissioners were silent, but the eating and drinking seemed to them more and more bitter each moment. I beg you humbly to drink and eat, said Melnitsky, or I shall think that our simple Cossack fare cannot pass your lordly throats. Oh, if they are too narrow we can slit them open a little, said Daedalo. The Cossacks, feeling encouraged, burst into laughter. But Melnitsky looked threateningly at them, and they grew silent again. Kaisel, who had been ill several days, was pale as a sheet. Josovsky was so red that it seemed as though the blood would burst through his face. At last he could restrain himself no longer, and shouted. Have we come here to dine or to be insulted? To this Melnitsky answered, You have come for a treaty, but meanwhile the Lithuanian forces are burning and slaughtering. I hear they have destroyed Moser and Turov. Should this prove true, I shall order four hundred captives to be beheaded in your presence. Josovsky restrained his blood, boiling the moment before. It was true. The lives of the captives depended on the humor of the hetman, on one twinkle of his eye. Therefore it was necessary to endure everything, and besides to calm his outbursts, to bring him ad mishirem id seniorem mentem. In this spirit the Carmelite Lentovsky, by nature mild and timid, said in a quiet voice. May the God of mercy grant that the news from Lithuania about Moser and Turov may be changed. But scarcely had he finished when Fedor Veshnyak, the colonel of Sherkasi, bent toward him and struck with his baton, wishing to hit the Carmelite on the neck. Fortunately he did not reach him, since there were four men between them, but immediately he cried out. Wordy priest! It is not your affair to give the lie to me. But come outdoors, and I will show you how to respect Zaporozhian colonels. Others, however, hurried to quiet him, but not succeeding, they put him out of the room. When, mighty Hetman, do you wish that the commissioners should meet? asked Kaisel, wishing to give another turn to the conversation. Unfortunately Melnitsky was no longer sober, therefore he gave a quick and biting answer. Tomorrow will be business and discussion, for now I am in drink. Why do you talk now of commissions? You do not give me time to eat and drink. I have enough of this already. Now there must be war. And he thumped the table till the dishes and cups jumped. In those four weeks I'll turn you all feet upward and trample you, and sell the remnant to the Turkish Tsar. The king will be king, so as to execute nobles, dukes, princes. If a prince offends, cut off his head if a Cossack offends, cut off his head. You threaten me with the Swedes, but they cannot stand before me. Tugai Bey is near me, my brother, my soul. The only falcon in the world, he is ready at once to do everything that I wish. Here Melnitsky, with the rapidity peculiar to drunken men, passed from anger to tenderness, till his voice trembled from emotion. You wish me to raise my saber against the Turks and Tartars, but in vain. I'll go against you with my good friends. I have sent my regiments around so as to provender the horses and to be ready for the road, without wagons, without cannon. I shall find all those among the poles. 
I will order any Cossack to be beheaded who takes a wagon, and I will take no carriage myself, nothing but packs and bags. In this fashion I will go to the Vistula and say, Poles, sit still and be quiet. And if you say anything beyond the Vistula, then I'll find you there. We have had enough of your lordship and your dragoons, you cursed reptiles living by injustice itself. Here he sprang from his seat, pulled his hair, stamped with his feet, crying that there must be war, for he had already received absolution and a blessing for it. He had nothing to do with commissions and commissioners, he would not allow a suspension of arms. Seeing at length the terror of the commissioners, and recollecting that if they went away at once, war would begin in the winter, consequently at a time when the Cossacks, not being able to entrench themselves, fought badly in the open field, he calmed down a little and again sat on the bench, dropped his head on his breast, rested his hands on his knees, and breathed hoarsely. Finally he took a glass of vodka. To the health of the king, cried he. To his glory and health, repeated the colonels. Now, Kaisel, don't be gloomy, said the hetman, and don't take to heart what I say, for I've been drinking. Fortune tellers inform me that there must be war, but I'll wait till next grass. Let there be a commission then, I will free the captives at that time. They tell me that you are ill, so let this be to your health. Again Melnitsky dropped into momentary tenderness, and resting his hand on the shoulder of the voevoda brought his enormous red face to the pale, emaciated cheeks of Kaisel. After him came other colonels, and approaching the commissioners with familiarity shook their hands, clapped them on the shoulders, repeated after the hetman, till next grass. The commissioners were in torment. The peasant breaths, filled with the odor of Gorelka, came upon the faces of those nobles of high birth, for whom the pressure of those sweating hands was as unendurable as an affront. Threatenings also were not lacking among the expressions of vulgar cordiality. Some cried to the voevoda, We want to kill Poles, but you are our man. Others said, Well, in times past, you killed our people, now you ask favors. Destruction to you. You white hands, cried Adam and Vovk, formerly Miller in Nestervar, I slew my landlord. Prince Chervertinsky. Give us Yeremy, said Yashevsky, rolling along, and we will let you off. It became stifling in the room and hot beyond endurance. The table, covered with remnants of meat, fragments of bread, stained with vodka and mead, was disgusting. At last the fortune tellers came in, conjurers with whom the hetman usually drank till late at night, listening to their predictions, strange forms, old, bent, yellow, or in the vigor of youth. Soothsaying from wax, grains of wheat, fire, water, foam, from the bottom of a flask or from human fat. Among the colonels and the youngest of them there was frolicking and laughing. Kaisel came near fainting. We thank you, Hetman, for the feast, and we bid you goodbye, said he, with a weak voice. Kaisel, I will come to you tomorrow to dine, answered Melnitsky, and now return home. Donietz with his men will attend you, so that nothing may happen to you from the crowd. The commissioners bowed and went out. Donietz with the Cossacks was waiting at the door. Oh God! Oh God! Oh God! whispered Kaisel, quietly, raising his hands to his face. The party moved in silence to the quarters of the commissioners. But it appeared that they were not to stop near one another. Melnitsky had assigned them purposely quarters in different parts of the town, so that they could not meet and counsel easily. Kaisel, suffering, exhausted, barely able to stand, went to bed immediately, and permitted no one to see him till the following day, then before noon he ordered Pan Yen to be called. Have you acted wisely? asked he. What have you done? You might have exposed our lives and your own to destruction. Serene voivoda, mea culpa. But delirium carried me away, and I preferred to perish a hundred times rather than behold such things. Melnitsky saw the slight put on him, and I was barely able to pacify the wild beast and explain your act. He will be with me today, and will undoubtedly ask for you. Then tell him that you had an order from me to lead away the soldiers. From today forth Josovsky takes the command, 
for he is well. That is better, you are too stubborn for these times. It is difficult to blame you for anything in this act except lack of caution, but it is evident that you are young and cannot bear the pain that is in your breast. I am accustomed to pain, serene voivoda, but I cannot endure disgrace. Kaisel groaned quietly, just like an invalid when touched on the sore spot. Then he smiled with a gloomy resignation, and said. Such words are daily bread for me, which for a long time I eat moistened with bitter tears, but now the tears have failed me. Pity rose in Skshetuski's heart at the sight of this old man with his martyr's face, who was passing the last days of his life in double suffering. For it was a suffering both of the mind and the body. Serene Voivoda, said he, God is my witness that I was thinking only of these fearful times when senators and dignitaries of the crown are obliged to bow down before the rabble. For whom the impaling stake should be the only return for their deeds. God bless you, for you are young and honest. I know that you have no evil intention. But that which you say your prince says, and with him the army, the nobles, the diets, half the commonwealth. And all that burden of scorn and hatred falls upon me. Each serves the country as he understands, and let God judge intentions. As to Prince Jeremy, he serves the country with his health and his property. Applause surrounds him, and he walks in it as in the sunlight, answered the voivoda. And what comes to me? Oh, you have spoken justly. Let God judge intentions, and may he give even a quiet grave to those who in life suffer beyond measure. Skshetuski was silent, and Kaisel raised his eyes in mute prayer. After a while he began to speak. I am a Russian, blood and bone. The tomb of the princess Vyatoldavichi lies in this land. Therefore I have loved it and that people of God whom it nourishes at its breast. I have witnessed injuries committed by both sides. I have seen the license of the wild Zaporogians, but also the unendurable insolence of those who tried to enslave that warlike people. What was I to do, I, a Russian, and at the same time a true son and senator of this commonwealth? I joined myself to those who said Pax Vibiscum, because my blood and my heart so enjoined. And among the men whom I joined were our father, the late king, the chancellor, the primate, and many others. I saw that for both sides dissension was destruction. I desired all my life to my last breath to labor for concord, and when blood was already shed I thought to myself, I will be an angel of union. I continued to labor, and I labor still, though in pain, torment, and disgrace, and in doubt almost more terrible than all. As God is dear to me, I know not now whether your prince came too early with his sword or I too late with the olive branch. But this I see, that my work is breaking, that strength is wanting, that in vain I knock my grey head against the wall, and going down to the grave I see only darkness before me. And destruction, O oh God! Destruction on every side! God will send salvation. May he send a ray of it before my death, that I die not in despair, this in return for all my sufferings. I will thank him for the cross which I carry during life, thank him because the mob cry for my head, because they call me a traitor at the diets, because my property is plundered. And for the disgrace in which I live, for all the bitter reward which I have received from both sides. When he had finished speaking, the voivoda extended his dry hands toward heaven, and two great tears, perhaps the very last in his life, flowed out of his eyes. Pan Yen could restrain himself no longer, but falling on his knees before the voivoda, seized his hand, and said in a voice broken by great emotion, I am a soldier, and move on another path. But I give honor to merit and suffering. And the noble and knight from the regiment of Yeremy pressed to his lips the hand of that Russian who some months before he with others had called a traitor. Kaisel placed both hands on Skshetuski's head. My son, said he in a low voice, may God comfort, guide, and bless you, as I bless you. The vicious circle of negotiations began from that very day. Melnitsky came rather late to the voivoda's dinner, and in the worst temper. He declared immediately that what he had said yesterday about suspension of arms, 
a commission at Whitsuntide, and the liberation of prisoners he said while drunk. And that he now saw an intention to deceive him. Kaisel calmed him again, pacified him, gave reasons, but these speeches were, according to the words of the Chamberlain of Lvov, Serdo Tirano Fabula Dicta. The hetman began then with such rudeness that the commissioners were sorry not to have the Melnitsky of yesterday. He struck Pan Pazovsky with his baton, only because he had appeared before him out of season, in spite of the fact that Pazovsky was nearly dead already from serious illness. Neither courtesy and goodwill nor the persuasions of the voivoda were of use. When he had become somewhat excited by Gorelka and the choice meat of Gushchi, he fell into better humor, but then he would not on any account let himself speak of public affairs, saying, If we are to drink, let us drink, tomorrow business and discussion, if not, I'll be off with myself. About three o'clock in the morning he insisted on going to the sleeping room of the voivoda, which the latter opposed under various pretexts. For he had shut in Skshetuski there on purpose, fearing that at the meeting of this stubborn soldier with Melnitsky something disagreeable might happen which would be the destruction of the colonel. But Melnitsky insisted and went, followed by Kaisel. What was the astonishment of the voivoda when the hetman, seeing the knight, nodded to him, and cried. Skshetuski, why were you not drinking with us? And he stretched out his hand to him in a friendly manner. Because I am sick, replied the colonel, bowing. You went away yesterday. The pleasure was nothing to me without you. Such was the order he had, put in Kaisel. Don't tell me that, Voivoda. I know him, and I know that he did not want to see you giving me honor. Oh, he is a bird. But what would not be forgiven another is forgiven him, for I like him, and he is my dear friend. Kaisel opened wide his eyes in astonishment. The hetman turned to Pan Yen. Do you know why I like you? Skshetuski shook his head. You think it is because you cut the lariat at Omelnik when I was a man of small note and they hunted me like a wild beast. No, it is not that. I gave you a ring then with dust from the grave of Christ. Horned soul. You did not show me that ring when you were in my hands, but I set you at liberty anyhow, and we were even. That's not why I like you now. You rendered me another service, for which you are my dear friend, and for which I owe you thanks. Pan Yen looked with astonishment at Melnitsky. See how he wonders, said the hetman, as if speaking to some fourth person. Well, I will bring to your mind what they told me in Chijirin when I came there from Basiluk with Tugai Bay. I inquired everywhere for my enemy, Chaplin Ski, whom I did not find. But they told me what you did to him after our first meeting, that you grabbed him by the hair and trousers, beat the door open with him, drew blood from him as from a dog. I did in fact do that, said Skshetuski. You did splendidly, you acted well. But I'll reach him yet, or treaties and commissions are in vain, I'll reach him yet, and play with him in my own fashion, but you gave him pepper. The hetman now turned to Kaisel, and began to tell how it was, he caught him by the hair and trousers, lifted him like a fox, opened the door with him, and hurled him into the street. Here he laughed till the echo resounded in the side room and reached the drawing room. Voevoda, give orders to bring mead, for I must drink to the health of this night, my friend. Kaisel opened the door, and called to the attendant, who immediately brought three goblets of the mead of Gushchi. Melnitsky touched goblets with the Voevoda and Pan Yen, and drank so that his head was warmed, his face smiled, great pleasure entered his heart. And turning to the colonel he said, Ask of me what you like. A flush came on the pale face of Skshetuski, a moment of silence followed. Don't fear, said Melnitsky, a word is not smoke. Ask for what you like, provided you ask for nothing belonging to Kaisel. The hetman even drunk was always himself. If I may use the affection which you have for me, then I ask justice from you. One of your colonels has done me an injury. Off with his head, said Melnitsky, with an outburst. It is not a question of that, only order him to fight a duel with me. Off with his head! cried the hetman. Who is he? Bogan. Melnitsky began to blink, 
then he struck his forehead with his palm. Bogan? Bogan is killed. The king wrote me that he was slain in a duel. Pan Yen was astonished. Zagloba had told the truth. What did Bogan do to you? asked Melnitsky. A still deeper flush came on the colonel's face. He feared to mention the princess before the half-drunk hetman, lest he might hear some unpardonable word. Kaisel rescued him. It is an important affair, said he, of which Jozovsky the Castellan has told me. Bogan carried off the betrothed of this cavalier and secreted her, it is unknown where. But have you looked for her? asked Melnitsky. I have looked for her on the Dniester, for he secreted her there, but did not find her. I heard, however, that he intended to take her to Kiev, where he wished to come himself to marry her. Give me, O oh Hetman, the right to go to Kiev and search for her there. I ask for nothing more. You are my friend, you battered chaplain Ski. I'll give you not only the right to go and seek her wherever you like, but I will issue an order that whoever has her in keeping shall deliver her to you. And I'll give you a baton as a pass, and a letter to the Metropolitan to look for her among the nuns. My word is not smoke. He opened the door and called to Vygovsky to come and write an order and a letter. Chernota was obliged, though it was after three o'clock, to go for the seal. De Dialo brought the baton, and Donietz received the order to conduct Skrzytuski with two hundred horse to Kiev, and farther to the first Polish outposts. Next day Skrzytuski left Periaslav. Chapter 52 If Zagloba was bored at Zberij, no less bored was Volodyovsky, who was longing especially for war and its adventures. They went out, it is true, from time to time with the squadron in pursuit of plundering parties who were burning and slaying on the Zbruch. But that was a small war, principally work for scouts, difficult because of the cold winter and frosts, yielding much toil and little glory. For these reasons Pan Michael urged Zagloba every day to go to the assistance of Skshetuski, from whom they had had no tidings for a long time. He must have fallen into some fatal trap and may have lost his life, said Volodyovsky. We must surely go, even if we have to perish with him. Zagloba did not offer much opposition, for he thought they had stayed too long in Zberij, and wondered why mushrooms were not growing on them already. But he delayed, hoping that news might come from Skshetuski any moment. He is brave and prudent, answered he to the importunities of Volodyovsky. We will wait a couple of days yet. Perhaps a letter will come and render our whole expedition useless. Volodyovsky recognized the justice of the argument and armed himself with patience, though time dragged on more and more slowly. At the end of December Frost had stopped even robbery, and there was peace in the neighborhood. The only entertainment was in public news, which came thick and fast to the gray walls of Zberij. They spoke about the coronation and the diet, and about the question whether Prince Yeremy would receive the baton which belonged to him before all other warriors. They were terribly excited against those who affirmed that in view of the turn in favor of a treaty with Melnitsky, Kaisel alone could gain advancement. Volodyovsky had several duels on this point, and Zagloba several drinking bouts. And there was danger of the latter's becoming a confirmed drunkard, for not only did he keep company with officers and nobles, but he was not ashamed to go even among townspeople to christenings and weddings, praising especially their mead, for which Zberij was famous. Volodyovsky reproved him for this, saying that familiarity with people of low degree was not befitting a noble, since regard for a whole order would be diminished thereby. But Zagloba answered that the laws were to blame for that, because they permit townspeople to grow up in luxury and to come to wealth, which should be the portion of nobles alone. He prophesied that no good could come of such great privileges for insignificant people. It was difficult indeed to blame him in a period of gloomy winter days amidst uncertainty, weariness, and waiting. Gradually Vishnievetsky's regiments began to assemble in greater and greater numbers at Zberij, from which fact war in the spring was prophesied. Meanwhile people became more lively. Among others came the Hussar squadron of Pan Yen, with Podbipienta. He brought tidings of the disfavor in which the prince was at court, 
and of the death of Pan Yanush Tishkievich, the voevoda of Kiev, whom, according to general report, Kaisel was to succeed. And finally of the serious illness with which Pan Lash was stricken down in Krakow. As to war, Podbipienta heard from the prince himself that only by force of events and necessity would it come. For the commissioners had gone with instructions to make every concession possible to the Cossacks. This account of Podbipienta's was received by the prince's knights with rage. And Zagloba proposed to make a protest and form a confederation, for he said he did not wish his labor at Konstantinov to go for nothing. All February passed with these tidings and uncertainties, and the middle of March was approaching, but from Skshetuski there was no word. Volodyovsky began to insist all the more on their expedition. We have to seek now not for the princess, said he, but for Pan Yen. It was soon shown that Zagloba was right in delaying the expedition from day to day, for at the end of March the Cossack Zahar came with a letter from Kiev addressed to Volodyovsky. Pan Michael summoned Zagloba at once, and when they had closeted themselves with the messenger in a room apart, he broke the seal and read the following. I discovered no trace on the Dniester as far as Yagerlik. Supposing that she must be hidden in Kiev, I joined the commissioners, with whom I went to Periaslav. Obtaining there the hoped for consent from Melnitsky, I arrived at Kiev, and am making a search for her everywhere, in which the Metropolitan assists me. Many of our people are hidden in private houses and in monasteries, but fearing the mob, they do not declare themselves, therefore search is difficult. God not only guided and protected me, but inspired Melnitsky with an affection for me, wherefore I hope that he will assist me and have mercy on me for the future. I beg the priest Mukovetsky for a solemn mass, at which you will pray for my intention. Skshetuski. Praise be to God the Eternal, cried Volodyovsky. There is a postscript yet, said Zagloba. True, answered the little knight. And he read further. The bearer of this letter, the Asal of the Murgorod Kuren, had me in his honest care when I was at the Sage and in captivity. And now he has aided me in Kiev and has undertaken to deliver this letter with risk to his life. Have him in your care, Michael, so that nothing may be wanting to him. You are an honest Cossack, there is at least one such, said Zagloba, giving his hand to Zahar. The old man pressed it with dignity. You may be sure of reward, interjected the little knight. He is a falcon, said the Cossack, I like him. I did not come here for money. I see you are not lacking in a spirit which no noble would be ashamed of, said Zagloba. They are not all beasts among you, not all beasts. But no more of this. Then Pan Skshetuski is in Kiev? He is. And in safety, for I hear that the mob is reveling? He stops with Colonel Donietz. They will do nothing to him, for our father Melnitsky ordered Donietz to guard him at the peril of his life as the eye in his head. Real wonders take place. How did Melnitsky get such a liking for Pan Yen? Oh, he has liked him a long time. Did Pan Skshetuski tell you what he was looking for in Kiev? Why shouldn't he tell me when he knows that I am his friend? I searched with him and searched by myself, so he had to tell me what he was looking for. But so far you haven't found her? We have not. Whatever poles are there yet are hiding, one does not know of the other, so that it is not easy to find anyone. You heard that the mob kill people, but I have seen it. They kill not only poles, but those who hide them, even monks and nuns. In the monastery of Nikolai the Good there were twelve Polish women with the nuns. They suffocated them in the cells together with the nuns. Every couple of days a shout is raised on the street, and people are hunted and dragged to the Dnieper. Oh, how many have been drowned already? Perhaps they have killed the princess too? Perhaps they have. No, interrupted Volodyovsky. If Bogan took her there, he must have made it safe for her. Where is it safer than in a monastery? But for all that they kill people there. Uf, said Zagloba. So you think, Zahar, that she might have perished? I don't know. 
It is evident that Skshatuski is in good heart, said Zagloba. God has visited him, but he comforts him. And is it long since you left Kiev, Zahar? Oh, long. I left Kiev when the commissioners were passing there on their return. Many Poles wished to escape with them, and did escape, the unfortunates. As each one was able, over the snow, over pathless tracts, through forests, they hurried to Belogradki. But the Cossacks pursued and beat them. Many fled, many were killed, and some Pan Kaisel ransomed with what money he had. Oh, the dog souls! And so you came out with the commissioners? With the commissioners to Gushchi, and from there to Ostrog, farther I came alone. Then you are an old acquaintance of Pan Skshatuski? I made his acquaintance in the Sage, nursed him when he was wounded, and then I learned to like him as if he were my own child. I am old, and have nobody to love. Zagloba called to the servant, gave orders to bring in mead and meat, and they sat down to supper. Zahar ate heartily, for he was road-weary and hungry. Then he sank his grey moustaches eagerly in the dark liquid, drank, smacked his lips, and said, Splendid mead! Better than the blood which you folks drink, said Zagloba. But I think that you are an honest man, and loving Pan Skshatuski, will not go any more to the rebellion, but remain with us. It will be good for you here. Zahar raised his head. I delivered the letter, now I'll go back. I am a Cossack. It is for me to be a brother with the Cossacks, not with the Poles. And will you beat us? I will. I am a Cossack of the Sage. We elected Melnitsky Hetman, and now the king has sent him the baton and the banner. There it is for you, Pan Michael. Have not I advised a protest? And from what Kuren are you? From the Murgorod, but it is no longer in existence. What has happened to it? The hussars of Pan Charnetsky at Jaltia Vodi cut it to pieces. I am under Donietz now, with those who survived. Pan Charnetsky is a real soldier, he is with us in captivity, and the commissioners have interceded for him. We have your prisoners too. That must be so. In Kiev they say that our best hero is a captive with the Poles, though some say he is dead. Who is that? Oh, the famous Adaman, Bogan. Bogan was killed in a duel. But who killed him? That night there, said Zagloba, pointing proudly to Volodyovsky. The eyes of Zahar, who at that moment had raised the second quart of mead, stared, his face grew purple, and at last he snorted the liquid through his nostrils as he laughed. That night killed Bogan, he asked, coughing violently from laughter. What's the matter with the old devil? asked Volodyovsky, frowning. This messenger takes too much liberty on himself. Be not angry, Pan Michael, interrupted Zagloba. He is clearly an honest man, and if a stranger to politeness it is because he is a Cossack. On the other hand, it is the greater praise for you that though you are so paltry in appearance you have wrought such mighty deeds in your time. Your body is insignificant, but your soul is great. I myself, as you remember, when looking at you after the duel, though I saw the struggle with my own eyes, could not believe that such a whippersnapper. Oh, let us have peace! blurted out Volodyovsky. I am not your father, so don't be angry with me. But I tell you this. I should like to have a son like you, and if you wish, I will adopt you and convey all my property to you, for it is no shame to be great in a small body. The prince is not much larger than you, and Alexander the Great would not deserve to be his armor-bearer. What makes me angry, said Volodyovsky, somewhat mollified, is specially this, that nothing favorable to Skshatuski is evident from this letter. He did not lay down his head on the Dniester, God be thanked for that, but he has not found the princess yet, and what surety is there that he will find her? True. But if God through us has freed him from Bogan, and has conducted him through so many dangers, through so many snares. If he has inspired even the stony heart of Melnitsky with a wonderful affection for him, you have no reason to dry up from torment and sorrow into smoked bacon. If you do not see in all this the hand of providence, 
it is clear that your wit is duller than your saber, a reasonable arrangement enough, since no man can have all gifts at once. I see one thing, answered Volodyovsky, moving his mustaches, that we have nothing to do here, and still we must stay here till we wither up altogether. I shall wither up sooner than you, for I am older, and you know that turnips wither and salt meat grows bitter from age. Let us rather thank God for promising a happy end to all our troubles. Not a little have I grieved for the princess, more indeed than you have, and little less than Skshetuski, for she is my dear daughter, and it is true that I might not love my own so much. They say indeed that she is as much like me as one cup is like another. But I love her besides that, and you would not see me either happy or at peace if I did not hope that her trouble would soon come to an end. Tomorrow I shall write a wedding hymn. For I write very beautiful verses, though in recent times I have neglected Apollo somewhat for Mars. What is the use in thinking of Mars now? May the hangman take that Kaisel and all the commissioners and their treaties. They will make peace in the spring as true as two and two are four. Pan Podbipienta, who saw the prince, says so too. Podbipienta knows as much of public affairs as a goat does of pepper. While at the court his mind was more on that tufted lark than anything else, and he pushed up to her as a dog to a partridge. God grant that someone else may get her from him. But enough of this. I do not deny that Kaisel is a traitor, all the commonwealth knows that, but as to treaties, well, grandmother talks both ways. Here Zagloba turned to the Cossack. And what, Zahar, do they say among your folks? Will there be peace or war? There will be peace till next grass, and after that there will be destruction either to us or to the Poles. Comfort yourself, Pan Michael. I have heard too that the mob are arming everywhere. There will be such a war as has not been, said Zahar. Our people say that the Sultan of Turkey will come and the Khan of all the hordes. Our friend Tugai Bey is near, hasn't returned home at all. Console yourself, Pan Michael, repeated Zagloba. There is a prophecy too about the new king, that his whole reign will be passed under arms. It is most likely that the saber will not be sheathed for a long time to come. Man will tremble from continual war, like a broom from shaking, but that is our soldier lot. When you have to fight, Pan Michael, keep close to me and you will see beautiful things, you will learn how we used to fight in past and better times. Oh, my God! Not such people as at present were those in years gone by. You are not like them either, Pan Michael, though you are a fierce soldier and killed Bogan. You speak truly, Pan, said Zahar. Not such are people now as they used to be. Then he began to gaze at Volodyovsky and shake his head. But that this night killed Bogan, never, never. Chapter 53 Old Zahar went back to Kiev after a few days' rest, and then came tidings that the commissioners had no great hopes of peace, or in fact almost despaired of it. They were able to obtain merely an armistice till the Russian Whitsuntide, in accordance with which a new commission was to begin, with plenary powers. But the demands and conditions put forth by Melnitsky were so exorbitant that no one believed that the Commonwealth could agree to them. Vigorous arming was commenced therefore on both sides. Melnitsky sent envoy after envoy to the Khan to hasten at the head of all his forces, he sent also to Stambul, where Pan Bachinsky, on behalf of the king, had resided for a considerable time. In the Commonwealth writs for the national militia were expected every moment. News came of the appointment of fresh leaders, the cupbearer, Ostrorog, Lanskaronsky, and Furlay, and the complete removal from military affairs of Yeremy Vishnievetsky, who was able to shield the country only at the head of his own forces. Not merely the soldiers of the prince, not merely the nobles of Russia, but also the partisans of the former commanders were indignant at such a selection and such disfavor. Declaring justly that if there had been political reasons for sacrificing Yeremy while there was hope of concluding a treaty, his removal in presence of war was a great, an unpardonable blunder. For he alone was able to meet Melnitsky, and conquer that famous leader of rebellion. 
Finally the prince himself came to Zberaj for the purpose of assembling as many forces as possible, to stand in readiness on the borderland of the conflict. An armistice had been concluded, but at every moment it proved of no avail. Melnitsky ordered, it is true, the execution of some colonels stationed here and there in camps, who in spite of the armistice had permitted themselves to attack castles. And squadrons encamped in various places. But he was unable to restrain the masses of the people, and the numerous independent bands, who either had not heard of the armistice, or who knew not even the meaning of the word. They attacked therefore continually the boundaries secured by the agreement, thus breaking every engagement made by the hetman. On the other hand, the troops of private persons and of the king in pursuing robbers frequently passed the Pripet and the Gorin in the province of Kiev. Continued into the depth of the province of Bratslav, and there, attacked by the Cossacks, fought regular battles, not infrequently bloody and stubborn. Hence continual complaints from the Cossacks and Poles of the violation of the armistice, which it was indeed beyond the power of man to observe. The armistice existed therefore so far as Melnitsky on one side, and the king and hetmans on the other, had not moved into the field. But the war was raging, in fact, before the main forces had rushed to the combat, and the first warm rays of spring shone again upon burning villages, towns, cities, and castles. Giving light to slaughter and human misfortune. Parties from the neighborhood of Bar, Melnik, and Maknavka appeared around Zberaj, slaying, robbing, burning. Yeremy dispersed these with the hands of his colonels. But he took no part in this small warfare himself, as he intended to move with his whole division when the hetmans should be already in the field. He sent out therefore detachments with orders to pay for blood with blood, for robbery and murder with the stake. Podbipienta went with others and gained a victory at Cherny Ostrov. But he was a knight terrible only in battle, to prisoners taken with arms in their hands he was too indulgent, therefore he was not sent a second time. But in expeditions of this kind Volodyovsky distinguished himself, as a partisan he had no rival save Virchel alone, for no one accomplished such lightning marches. No one knew how to approach the enemy so unexpectedly, break them up with such wild onset, scatter to the four winds, and exterminate by hunting down, hanging, and slaughtering. Soon he was invested with terror and the favor of the prince. From the end of March to the middle of April Volodyovsky dispersed seven independent parties, each one of which was three times stronger than his own. And he did not grow weary in his work, but showed a continually increasing eagerness, as if gaining it from the blood he was shedding. The little knight, or rather the little devil, teased Zagloba to accompany him in these expeditions, for he loved his company above all things. But the worthy noble opposed every suggestion, and thus explained his inactivity. My stomach is too big, Pan Michael, for these struggles and encounters. And besides, each man has his special power. To strike with hussars in the thick of the enemy in the open day, break through a camp, capture standards, that's my forte, the Lord God created and fitted me for that. But to hunt a rabble in the night through the brush, I leave that to you, who are as slender as a needle, and can easily push through everywhere. I am a knight of ancient date, and I prefer to tear through as the lion does, rather than creep along like a bloodhound on trails. Besides, after the evening milking I must to bed, for that is my best time. Volodyovsky therefore went alone, and alone conquered, till a certain time when, going out toward the end of April, he returned in the middle of May as woebegone and gloomy as if he had met a defeat and wasted his men. Thus it appeared to all. But in that long and difficult expedition Volodyovsky had gone beyond Ostrog to the neighborhood of Golovna, and had defeated there, not a common band made up of the rabble. But several hundred Zaporozhans, half of whom he killed and the other half captured. The more astonishing, therefore, was the profound gloom which as a fog covered his face, joyous by nature. But Pan Volodyovsky said not a word to any man. Scarcely had he dismounted when he went for a long conversation with the prince, taking two unknown knights, and then, in company with them, went to Zagloba without stopping. Though those eager for news seized him by the sleeve along the way. 
Zagloba looked with a certain astonishment on the two gigantic men, whom he had never seen before, and whose uniform, with gilt shoulder knots, showed that they served in the Lithuanian army. Volodyovsky said. Shut the door, and give orders to admit no one, for we have to speak on affairs of importance. Zagloba gave the order to the servant. Then he began to look unquietly on the strangers, noting from their faces that they had nothing good to tell. These are, said Volodyovsky, pointing to the young man, the princes Bulajai Kurtsevichi, Yuri and Andre. The cousins of Helena, cried Zagloba. The princes bowed and said both at once, cousins of the deceased Helena. The ruddy face of Zagloba became pale blue in a moment. He began to beat the air with his hands as if he had been struck with a bullet. He opened his lips, unable to catch breath, rolled his eyes, and said or rather groaned, How? There is news, answered Volodyovsky, gloomily, that the princess was murdered in the monastery of Nikolai the Good. The mob suffocated with smoke in a cell twelve young ladies and some nuns, among whom was our cousin, added Prince Yuri. This time Zagloba's countenance, formerly blue, became so red that those present were afraid of apoplexy. Slowly his lids dropped over his eyes. He covered them with his hands, and from his mouth came a fresh groan, oh, world! 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 Then he was silent. But the princes and Volodyovsky began to complain. Oh, good lady, we your friends and relatives gathered together, we who wish to go to save you, said the young knight, sighing time after time, but it is evident that we were late with our aid. Our willingness was in vain, in vain our sabres and our courage, for you are in another and better than this bad world, waiting upon the Queen of Heaven. Oh, cousin, cried the gigantic Yuri, who in grief seized his hair anew, forgive us our faults, and for every drop of your blood we will pour out three gallons. So help us God! responded Andre. The two men stretched their hands to heaven. Zagloba rose from his seat, advanced a few steps toward the bed, tottered like one drunk, and fell on his knees before the image. After a moment the bells in the castle sounded for midday, sounded as gloomily as if they were death bells. She is no more, said Volodyovsky again. The angels have taken her to heaven, leaving us tears and sighs. Sobbing shook the heavy body of Zagloba, and it trembled, but they complained without ceasing, and the bells were tolling. At last Zagloba calmed himself, they had thought indeed that perhaps wearied by pain he had fallen asleep on his knees. After a time, however, he rose, stood up, sat on the bed. But he had become as it were another man. His eyes were red, bloodshot, his head drooping, his lower lip hung upon his beard. Imbecility had settled on his face, and a certain unexampled decrepitude, so that it might in truth appear that the former Zagloba, lively, jovial, full of fancy, had died. And there remained only an old man weighted and wearied with years. Meanwhile, in spite of the protests of the servant at the door, Podbipienta entered, and again began complaints and regrets. The Lithuanian called to mind Rosloji, and the first meeting with the princess, her sweetness, youth, beauty. At length he remembered that there was someone more unhappy than any of them, her betrothed, Pan Skshetuski, and he began to ask the little knight about him. Skshetuski is with Prince Koretsky, at Koretz, to which place he came from Kiev, and he lies there in illness, unconscious of God's world, said Volodyovsky. Should not we go to him? asked the Lithuanian. There is no reason to go, replied Volodyovsky. The prince's physician answers for his health. Pan Sukhodolsky, one of Prince Dominic's colonels, but a great friend of Skshetuski, is there, and our old Zats Vilikovsky, they both have him in care and watchfulness. He lacks for nothing, and that delirium does not leave him is the better for him. Oh, God of power, said the Lithuanian, have you seen Skshetuski with your own eyes? I saw him. But if they had not told me that that was he, I should not have known him, pain and sickness have so devoured him. Did he recognize you? He knew me undoubtedly, though he said nothing, for he smiled and nodded his head. 
such pity possessed me that I could stay no longer. Prince Koretsky wishes to come here with his squadron. Zatsvilikovsky will come with him, and Pan Sukhodolsky swears that he will come too, even if he has an order to the contrary from Prince Dominic. They will bring Pan Yen unless disease gets the better of him. And whence have you tidings of the princess's death? asked Pan Lungin. Have these young men brought it? added he, pointing to the princes. No. These knights learned all by chance in Koritz, where they had come with messages from the Voivoda of Vilna, and came here with me, for they had letters from the Voivoda to our prince. War is certain, and nothing will come of the commission. We know that already ourselves, but tell us who informed you of the death of the princess? Zatsvilikovsky told me, and he knows it from Skshetuski. Melnitsky gave Skshetuski permission to search for her in Kiev, and the Metropolitan himself had to assist. They searched mainly in the monasteries, for those of our people who remained in Kiev are secreted in them. And they thought surely that Bogan had placed the princess in some monastery. They sought and sought and were of good heart, though they knew that the mob had suffocated twelve young ladies with smoke at Nikolai the Good. The Metropolitan contended that they would not have attacked the betrothed of Bogan, but it has turned out otherwise. Then she was at the convent of Nikolai the Good? She was. Skshetuski met Pan Joachim Yerlik, who was hiding in a monastery, and as he had asked everyone about the princess, he asked him too. Pan Yerlik said that there were certain young ladies whom the Cossacks had taken, but at Nikolai the Good twelve remained, whom afterward they suffocated with smoke, among them Kurtsevichovna. Skshetuski, since Yerlik is a hypochondriac and only half-witted from continual terror, did not believe him, and hurried off immediately a second time to Nikolai the Good to inquire. Unfortunately the nuns, three of whom were suffocated in the same cell, did not know the names, but hearing the description which Skshetuski gave, they said that she was the one. Then Skshetuski went away from Kiev and straightway fell ill. The only wonder is that he is still alive. He would have died undoubtedly but for that old Cossack who nursed him during captivity in the Sage, and then came here with letters from him, and when he had returned, helped him again in his search. He took him to Koritz and gave him into the hands of Zatsvilikovsky. May God protect him, for he has never yet consoled him, said Podbipienta. Volodyovsky ceased, and a silence of the grave reigned over all. The princes resting upon their elbows sat motionless with frowning brows. Podbipienta raised his eyes to heaven, and Zagloba fixed his glassy gaze on the opposite wall as if sunk in the deepest thought. Rouse yourself, said Volodyovsky, shaking him by the shoulder. Of what are you thinking so? You will not think out anything, and all your stratagems will be useless. I know that, answered Zagloba, with a broken voice. I am thinking that I am old, that I have nothing to do in this world. 